How's it going, everyone? And welcome to the Grand Archive North American Nationals. My name is Kel, also known as Red Zone Rogue, and I am joined today in the booth by Rav. I am Rob, otherwise known as Rav. I'm sort of happy to be here for the Grand Archive Nationals, our first national event for the game. I'm super excited. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a really, really fun event over the course of two days. I do believe today we have either seven or eight rounds of Grand Archive action here at the uh, Nationals. We've been kind of like, you know, walking around the floor, talking to a lot of the players, getting the kind of general vibe of what's going on. Um, there's some spicy, spicy brews out there, I think. And we might even have a pretty spicy brew round one, but uh, we'll get to that in just a little bit. Yeah, no, talking around a lot of the players, um, but the meta is actually shaping out a lot different than what I'm expecting a little bit. Yeah. Hearing what some players are talking about, what they're bringing. I mean, we also could be getting fed lies <laughs> for all we know, but hey, um, the meta is going to be pretty diverse. I'm super excited to see what's going to be coming up uh, round one. Like I said, spicy, spicy, spicy. I really, yes. really hope it works out the way it's planned. Yeah, we were talking to some players, like uh, someone came up to me and we were chatting a little bit and we're like, okay, what are you playing? And he's like, I'm playing Fire Allen. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, that, that's that, that's pretty sweet. Uh, <laughs> talking to some other players, I heard a couple people, you know, potentially playing Rai here, which is uh, a champion that may have fallen a little bit out of favor, favor. So seeing, you know, people bringing Rai to one of the premier level events for Grand Archive is just really, really exciting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Rye on the uptick is a really, I think, major thing for myself. I'm I'm a big Rye fan. I mean, the two bands really made me cry a little bit inside. But Rye itself is a deck really near and dear to my heart at this point. And then seeing people play Rye, we had the Yeti Online Regional, I think, two weeks ago, where we had WinRye in the top eight with, or top 16 with uh, Pickle that was running it. Mm. So seeing Rye come back into the fold is, I think, a really positive outlook right now. Yeah, I agree. And I think, I think Rye just in general is like, um, a cool hero to have in the meta because it's like your your combo check, right? Because Rai is like an all-in combo deck. It like It's almost what I would consider like a turbo combo where it's less of a control and then combo off. It's just like, I want to do this as fast as possible and just try to fireball or, or arcane blast you out. Yeah, I mean, nothing feels better than drawing cards and just spell slinging away to a victory with an arcane blast or fireball, especially at fast speed. So yeah. seeing, agreed. So I'm really hoping we're going to see Rai in one of these future match tables uh, um, and then hopefully some other good spicy brews that people might be cooking up as well. Yeah, I I think like going into this event, if you look at the uh, recent top events that we've seen just you know around the world for Grand Archive, I think there's a couple of assumptions you can have, right? There are a lot of water ally stuff that you see. Water X, you know, we have water Diana, we have water Lorraine, we have, you know, water allies just in general. And I think that is one of the decks, archetypes, that we should be looking out for this weekend. Um, I think we're going to see a decent amount. Yeah, definitely. I think um, water allies is going to be probably a really representation. I heard some rumors about a couple of wind decks and wind allies yeah. coming out. I mean, oh, I think... Yeah. If we divvy it up of just allies, it's probably going to be probably most of our <laughs> meta is just ally X yep. in some form, shape, or way. Um, but, and then I think we have, what, I think 163 players qualified playing today. Yeah. yeah. I mean, huge turnout. I'm really excited to see this many people come back, especially after we have on, we had Ascent Houston, which was our, I think, oh, we had Ontario last, which was our last major yeah. in-state event, which is 200 players. So seeing this many people show up is really I think amazing for the game at this point in that we had 160 people come in with invites. Yeah. So. Yeah, it, it, it's a great turnout. And, um, you know, there's a lot of just, like, good positive vibes here. There's a lot of, uh, you know, electricity in the air. I can kind of see over there all the, all the people kind of, like, going around trying to get set up for their, uh, their first round. We will have our first round in, I want to say, 10-ish minutes or yeah. so. Um, but I think, I think our future match players got to set up a little bit, go in the room, and then um, pretty much get ready to go. But yeah, I think players are getting ready. Deck lists are probably all round tables are getting handed out. And we're going to get started here shortly. And I just, I can't wait. I'm, I'm excited to be at this event. Even though I couldn't play in it, I'm happy to be here casting to seeing all the, just the amazing community of Grand Archive come together again. Yeah, I mean, this is the first of a series of um, nationals that we're going to see in, over the course of the next like month or so. Yeah. And I think it's going to help set the stage for those future events, right? A lot of people are going to be looking to this event at the, the, the top performing decks 
as like you know the key decks to pay attention to. Yeah, I think we have. I want to say Ocean or SEA next for Nats, um, either this week or the week after, and then the following is I think the EU. Uh, I might be mistaken on that, um, but yeah, I'm happy we have all three Nats coming up. Everyone's gonna be looking, like you said, looking at this event, saying, okay, what perform well, what deck list, what spice is there, and how can I shape it to maybe go our meta. But yeah. the greatest thing so far I've seen about Grand Archive is that you could take um, our NA-based events and the overseas events, and they're completely two different metas. Yeah. I think we had New Zealand Regional at the same time as Yeti Regional, and they were completely, well, not completely, but very different yeah. in what performed well. And I think that's really interesting to see of how split the player base is a little bit in different parts of the world for what they want to think is meta. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, that's something that you see in a lot of card games, right? You have, like, these, these pockets of... Um, um, I, I'm not sure how to describe this, you know, metas that are developed in specific areas. Yeah. And when you, uh, you know, convalesce at large events like Worlds coming up, that's going to be like the real test of, you know, which meta is, plays against the other metas, basically. Yeah, I mean, especially because, you know, you have your little in-house quotation on metas, like you have your local meta, and then you have your regional meta, and you have everything else. So all of it varies a little bit differently, but... I will say it does look like a lot of our players are finally starting to be settled in. So I imagine we should be getting our match up shortly. All right. So we have, we have a couple minutes before we start. Yeah. I'm just going to ask you, what is the deck that you are keeping your eye on the most going into this event? What's the one that you're like, this is the deck that I, I, I want to see perform well? I mean, I would I, I, I would be lying if I didn't say Rye. I mean, All knowing right, that yeah. we spoke to our Fire Rye players, yeah, yeah. Rye's what got me into this game. So I'm really hoping to see Rye, Fire Rye finally take an event in a very long time. <laughs> I mean, I like that would be pretty spicy, right? Yeah. yeah. How about yourself? Um, I'm a big assassin stan. I think that's pretty obvious for anyone who knows me. <laughs> so um, any form of assassin would be very, very cool. Uh, personally, I love uh, Fire Xander. Uh, okay. Just all aggro, all in. You got the Karhazi Courier. You got your, your blazing throws and all that, all that kind of goodness. So um, I'm a little biased when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. But so, I, I, want, I want Xander to, to put up some numbers. That'd so be cool. How do you feel about the Luxem Xanders that are going around? Is that still in the quote-unquote assassin classification yes. for you? I mean, like, I think, honestly, the Luxem Xander is, like, the most Xandery Xander that you can be because it actually plays with his advanced element. Um, I do like the fire variants. Um, they're pretty close to the water variant that I personally have played where, like, a lot of the fire lists that I've seen are mostly, like, Lux. Mm -hmm. And then there's, like, two fire cards, right? Yeah. You have, like, your, basically your draw spells. Yeah. Um, the good cards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The cards that help you get to your um, kind of, like, your end game state where you just get Lux and you just reveal stuff and deal a bunch of damage and then you can kind of just, you know, you just get them. Um, I like the deck. I think it's cool. I think yeah. it's a, it's a it's a fire deck that isn't aggro, and I think that's really interesting, right? Yeah. Because when you think of fire in Grand Archive, you think oh, aggro all in, um, but this version is not. It's yeah. it's more controlling um, and wants to play for a long game where you have those sweet reveals and um, yeah. I, I like I like the deck. It's yeah, cool. I will say I know we have some Luxem Xanders playing here today. I won't reveal Spice because it was in secret confidants. But right. I've heard some spicy sideboards for these deck lists, so I'm really excited if we see one of those on the stream, um, and then pretty much see how the rest of the day pulls out. I'm expecting we're going to probably see Erupting on stream at one point, maybe. Oh yeah, I, I think Erupting is one of the decks that a lot of people are going to be paying attention to, at least like going into this event and probably you know actually at the yeah. event itself. Um, if you don't know, dear viewers, uh, the Erupting deck is a, a Merlin deck. You can kind of play with other classes too, but it's primarily a Merlin deck where you kind of just put a lot of cards in your graveyard and then you just kind of like burst them out with uh, yeah. Erupting Rhapsody. Yeah, usually they throw in a little bit of the level one Lorraine, um, at least in pick on uh, that pickle, sorry. Um, Matt G's Brew from the recent um, Ontario winner, they ran or or Lorraine with the Fire Momentum, so mm -hmm. you can, Fire Momentum is a card that lets you deal more damage based on the fire cards in your grave. Yeah. So then being able to swing those in, and then D-Level, which was the spiciest tech I think I've seen, was running, I think it's FTC, Innovate Fury. Yes. Which lets you D-Level your champion, heal five, and then pretty much board wipe for when you're facing the ally. Yeah, it does like seven damage split as much as you'd yeah. like, and seven damage in Grand Archive is a lot. Yeah. Most of the ally stats in this game, I think the baseline is like two, three, right? Is yeah, like... most of the ally lists are running the three drop two threes, yeah. if not one threes, so you could kill at least two or three units, which is pretty good on average. Your opponent's going to have to reset up the board state to re-pressure that lethal momentum they had on you. Yeah. So... So I will say, though, it does look like the overall tables have started the round. So we are officially underway of Grand Archive Nationals. Yeah. Uh, so we are good to go. I'm, 
I said, I'm excited. I'm <laughs> yeah, like I mentioned at the top of the show, we have either seven or eight rounds today. Yeah. Um, and then tomorrow we will be, be back on stream to finish out Swiss and we'll have the, uh, the top eight as well. Uh, so stay tuned for a lot of Grand Archive action today and tomorrow. This uh, event is shaping up to be one of the premier level events yeah. for, for Grand Archive. It's one of the biggest, right, that I can think of. Um, and um, yeah, you absolutely love to see it. Yeah, no, especially this is um, for those who are paying attention to Grand Archive, but not too much active in certain other areas. This is also our first event that Omnidex is alive for deck yes. lists. So this is also another huge stepping stone for the game. They've incorporated the tournament, um, tournament platform, I should say into allowing the deck list to be uploaded digitally. You no, know, I have to print out your deck list and worry about that. You could submit last minute any changes, which is a very rapid improvement. Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, gone, gone are the days of the, the paper <laughs> deck list. Yeah. Back, back in like 2001, you know, like young young me back in 2001 writing your paper deck list and you, submitting it, you know? You don't like sitting in your hotel room at 3 a.m. writing out your deck list spread out all over your hotel oh, dude, bed. And I've been there, yeah. <laughs> Or you do it, you do it like last minute in the morning, like at six a.m. You wake yeah. up, you're like, oh, I gotta write the deck list. You yeah. had a dream about some spicy brew and decide to tweak it <laughs> to, to incorporate. But no, I'm excited. The platform is doing really well. The tournament organization is coming well. I'm, like I said the game is definitely going in overall the right direction. That I'm excited for. Yeah, I mean, Al Alchemical Revolution was uh, an incredible set in my opinion. Yeah. Um, once again, might be a little bit biased, but <laughs> um, I thought it was just a, an incredible set. And we're gonna be seeing um, a lot of new cards from the set in today's meta. Yeah. Um, a lot of returning cards as well, right? We, yeah. we already talked about some archetypes, like your erupting, um, as well as like some like allies lists. Yeah. Also, um, a Fire Merlin didn't touch on the old Boogeyman, to, so right. to say, the format, where sometimes the lists were just running straight FTC cards and didn't even throw anything from the newest set into it. Yeah. Right, ain't I mean, broke, don't fix. I mean, yeah, I, I do expect to see some Fire Merlins th today as well. Yeah. Like, I think just Fire Crux Merlin does uh, just a good job, right? Yeah, Mer it does what it wants to do. <laughs> yeah, Mer Merlin is, uh, turns out, a uh, very, very good champion <laughs> in this <laughs> game, right? Yeah. Drawing drawing two cards every other turn uh, is, is pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. I, I've heard drawing cards in card games is uh, is a good thing. That's why I play Rai. I like to draw cards. <laughs> I mean, yes, Rai Ry is, Ry is definitely the, the draw cards champion, right? Yeah. So, no, I'm really excited. So, if you were here at this event, I know you see you enjoy Water Xander. Is Water Xander oh. what you would have brought to Nationals? Ooh, interesting. Hmm. I personally would have probably brought Water Diana or Agro Fire Xander. I think those are my two favorite decks right now. The that, Ally that Water Diana play. or like the Umbro version? The Ally one. Okay. Mostly because I, I don't have like multiple Carters yet. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. That's fair. I mean, Carter is sort of like the. I want to say corner pivot stone a little bit. It's the game, main game plan of the level three Diana. He's like the big payoff, right? Yeah. And for those who don't know, um, was it Carter is a three drop? I want to say three drop two three on enter kill an ally. When an ally dies, you can recover one, and also has cleave for a class bonus for a guardian yeah. ranger card. The, the cleave is like pretty good, right? Yeah. Especially into all the other ally decks, you can yeah. just like dunk them. And I think even the first turn it comes in when it kills the ally, it gets plus one attack, so you can board wipe the mirror ally list with the three yeah. attack damage, which is what I sort of I think gave birth to the water ally umber list is seeing oh i can clear the mirror match board without running something like a seeking shot which does two or three champion attack damage to an, a target ally um so i think it's a list that we will probably see at some point or it's going to be in the meta somewhat i think there's going to be a decent um, not a decent amount but more that was what i'm looking for more relevant than probably some of the other allies we want to see but i don't say more than lorraine and tony water allies yeah, I mean, I I would like to see some like uh, Umbra, Umbra action this weekend. Yeah, um, I think it's I think it's cool and interesting, and it really helps you know uh, highlight one of the the main archetypes of Alchem Alchemical Revolution. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, do you think we're going to see a Fire Tony? I know there was oh, a player for a while did. Um, hmm. I think Jimmy Lee did Fire Tony, which was pretty much big swing. <laughs> they would play the level three Tony that gets you um, your token your. Tokens come to play become weapons, and then you can uh, yes. sacrifice them for a big weapons link. Do you think we're seeing that today, or do you think not at all? Maybe. I think it'd be interesting. I don't think we'll see a lot if we, if we yeah. see any at all. Probably, <laughs> probably not very many, but um, I think it could be one of those situations if someone you know has uh, some some spicy tech that they really believe in, or if it's just a deck that they're really comfortable in. I think we could see that. Yeah. Um, yeah. For my other co-caster we haven't seen yet, Cam, who's praying for Arisana. Do you think there's a lot of Arisana <laughs> <laughs> arriving today? Okay. Do I think there's a lot of Arisana? No. Do you think there's any no. Arisana? Hmm. That's a that's a more difficult question. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. 
Big shout out to any of the Arasana players out there, both both at this event and uh, in in the audience here on uh, on the stream. We applaud I, you. I personally really like Arasana, yeah. and I think I think there's something there. It's just not quite there yet. You I, know, I think MRC will really um, help and sort of support the Arisana game plan. I think Arisana's core basics are there. I think we're just missing the one or two cards that's really going to bump yeah. Arisana to that next level. Yeah, she she's so interesting. Like we were talking about Arasana like before we went live, and I was just like, she's the kind of deck that's a combo deck, but she's not like turbo combo like Rai. She wants to go for the late game. Yeah. If you want to do the combo, you really have to play out all of your material deck. So you really want to stall as much as possible, and you want to kind of do like a, some sort of turbo fog strategy. But the way that Grand Archive works, it's really difficult because basically everything can attack the turn it comes into yeah. play. So it makes turbo fog just slightly more difficult because it's just much a faster game and you know yeah. in terms of aggression and speaking of Ari's and Rai, Ari's a little bit different where Rai really wants to banish all of its advanced element yeah. cards for the most part it wants to get rid of them all and then from there level up its game plan but Ari Sana doesn't want to see its comet falls its yeah no. cosmic bolts you hit to banish yeah you want them in you want them in your deck so you can kind of combo off but I did hear word that we might be ready yeah. for our feature match so let's get to some grand archive gameplay awesome. here all right, so we have uh, Bobo versus uh, Lee here. Um, looks like we are just running off fire right out the start here. Yeah, so looks like, yeah, basic um, Spirit of Fire start coming out from, I want uh, Bobi, Bobo, Bobi, I might, 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 Spicy Spirit of Fire right there. Yep, I think that it, I can't tell. That's either the Ontario one or an Auckland one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not Ontario, Houston, sorry. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, that is a um, a tournament winning Spirit of Fire. And looking in the opening hand here, looks like from Lee, we do have a Flame Sweep, um, Hazy Messenger, uh, looks like a I Rending Flame. I see a uh, Fast Cure. Is it, This might be... Um, at least a fire alley list. And th that looks like also one of the new promos, cremation rituals. That Grand Ah, Grand yes. Made. Love that art in that one. Little little otters. Oh, definitely. Uh, the otters, I think, are just the most adorable thing in this art. But So we do have the first turn coming down with what, AC Master discarding the usual temper, yeah. um, temper seal to get the floating memory into the grave. Yeah, this is, this is pretty standard, right? For those of you who don't uh, play a lot of Grand Archive or, or know, Tempered Steel has floating memory, and this is just uh, it's a great card to have in your graveyard so you can uh, level up your champion on the next turn basically for free. Yeah. So, so it looks like if we pass turn over the Bobby, Bobby has, looks like we do have the erupting list. Yeah, so the turn was passed. We do have the erupting list player up top, and ooh, that's a Ooh, nice, fancy, creative uh, shot. That's another spice. Look, both players are just, like, <laughs> flexing left and right here. <laughs> We're going for the full promo decks on game one. I'll, I'll take it. You can see the, the player's reaction, too. Like, Lee is like, whoa, that's, that's pretty spicy, right? Yeah, so it looks like we had sort of the mirror a little bit. Instead of using Hasty, we use Creative Shock to discard into Tempered Seal, so we can go ahead and level up fast flash speed if you want to with a floating memory. Um, but yeah, so it looks like we are, looks like past turn, Bobby's going to go ahead and materialize for the turn, and we are going to go to level one Rai. Ooh, Rai, let's go. We talked about Rai a little bit before. Um, Rai is one of those champions that, you know, likes, likes drawing some cards, so he's good. he gets that, uh, those two counters on him at the level up. Yeah, the two lane counters come up to a sort of a big factor into these matchups, because the lane counters, for those don't know, lane counters, if you have three of them, that you can get rid of three, draw a card for your turn, which in some of these decks, Rai needs this extra card draw as much as possible to sort of refill the hand after they're banishing all of it to their level up mechanics. Yeah, here we have a Library Witch coming down. Um, likely will not be protecting from attacks, but more maybe used as fodder for something like a uh, Cremation Ritual. Yeah, Cremation Ritual. Oh, uh, oh, he just showed it on screen. We <laughs> saw. I saw that. <laughs> was that was that a CSR version too? I think that was a CSR Trisket. <laughs> okay, so we're, we have. We have the spice set up. It's in hand. Yeah, so this is not a typical deck. This is a deck <laughs> running running Trisket of of all things. <laughs> um, if the time comes, we'll get we'll get to Trisket when the time comes, but it's a, it's a wild card. Yeah, I hope we get to see. I hope it comes into play. Um, and we do go into level one Xander. Yeah, CSR Xander. <laughs> Once again, both players flexing the, their, their, to their maximum potential. Yeah, I mean, it's not even just CSR. That's a CUR. That's one of the one yeah, of 70 true. serialized. Yeah, that's one of the first edition. Yeah. <laughs> it's a serialized one. It's always 70. The real spice. Yeah, especially even more spicy. I think there's only a handful of signatures on these cards, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah, so it looks like he put both cards on top, right? Yep. Both cards went on top. I think he's debating because if this is Fire Xander with a Triscuit top end, Fire Xander usually wants to start calculating how much damage it could push in one turn. 
sort of try and get that OTK, if not push a little by little at a time. And I think it's just more calculating how much of it is value because I th I'm not sure, depending on the setup here, you don't really know what your opponent's playing. You can sort of guess with a library witch and rye. It could be a basic rye, it could be erupting. There's a couple of different methods that could be um, on what Bobby's playing. So. Yeah, it'll be it'll be really interesting, right? So, I mean, Bobo's just kind of sitting there with the, the library witch. It can prevent a little bit of damage here because, uh, you know, we have the uh, the hasty messenger on board, but... Yeah, um, yeah. library witch would take one damage. Bobo gets to go ahead and draw a card, but looks like we are debating if we want to get in with that attack first just to get the draw effect, maybe put a couple more cards in our grave. Um, I do think we see, yeah, we do see the Running Flame, which yep. wants to uh, stack those fire cards as much as possible, so it gets the extra bonus damage off of the Running Flame. Yeah, discard, discarding another uh, Floating Memory card, which is exactly what you want to do here. Just kind of load up your, your bin with Floating Memory. And we do see a decent amount in hand, because we also see, uh, like, an Honorable Vanguard. Oh, yep, so Honorable Vanguard's in there, so uh, Honorable Vanguard's another Floating Memory card, and it's going to be used, uh, I think we're going to actually play it? Nope. Yeah, like well, maybe. I mean, play it, get a little bit of uh, early damage in here. Yeah, we do have the cremation ritual, so playing the honorable vanguard can get in for his one ship damage, and then can just cremation ritual it and draw two cards and put another floating memory in your grave for whatever future use you might need it for. I mean, if you want to set up to get to Triscuit, you definitely need to get to level three. <laughs> so, uh, getting that floating memory is going to be valuable. Oh, we're actually going to go ahead with the rending flame. Ooh. It looks like here. Yeah, uh, rending flame. Com rending flames coming out. Is it just going to be just a like a? Naked Rending Flames? Nope, or does we he do have, have the, the three. We he, have, does, he does have them, okay. Yeah, we have the two Temper Seal and the Creative Shock, so this Rending Flame is going in for three, possibly six damage. Um, it looks like, yep, uh, the damage was taken here. And, um, oh, so he might not be banishing. Yeah, it's just kind of going to be a little bit of chip damage here, three here. Right. And that makes a lot of sense, right? He wants to keep the floating memory in his bin to, to actually use it. Yeah, um, if he's going for the level two, level three game plan, it's going to be used a little more than on. I can't remember. There might also be a second one in. I think there's one on top of the deck. Yeah, uh, so. Rending flames on top. Yeah. Getting the chip damage in where he can is a little bit, a little bit worthwhile because you're not going to rending flame twice on average in these yeah. games. Yeah, okay. that makes sense. So it looks like we are debating a couple of different plays here at this point. Um, he's got options. <laughs> one, yeah. one of them. <laughs> just, just love seeing the Trisket in hand. Yeah. So it looks like we are debating cremation ritual. So what cremation ritual will do here is sack the hasty messenger to get us to actually do cards, and then um, pretty much look, pretty much get the running flames and the other card off the top into our hand, depending on what was going on. Yeah, I, I think it was running flames and honorable, honorable vanguard on top. Okay. So he knows exactly what he's going to be drawing into. Yeah. So I, with that, it looks like we're going to pass the turn, and we're going to have another end turn creative shock here out of the Bobo. I'm pretty much trying to, I imagine, digging for their game plan as well. I, like I said, we did see an erupting, so they could be trying to set up as much draw as possible for a turn one, not turn one, a turn two, turn three erupting game plan to just sort of blow out their opponent in that OTK style, one turn kill um, for the full for the full description. Creative Shock actually doing damage here because it's being cast, being played by a, a mage player. Yeah, that is very true. Creative Shock will actually deal two damage, which could become relevant, especially when you talk about something like Erupting, where the less you have to banish to get the level mechanic, the better the better overall it is for your sort of producing. And we went with the Safeguard aim, it looks like, off of Materialization. Yeah, that's, that's an inter interesting call here. Yeah. Um, I'm not 100% sure how, how much the Safeguard is going to come into play uh, in this weird tr Triskin deck. Yeah. Um, oh, I guess the thought process behind this too is a little bit, if you don't know what Lee's playing, so if this is a basic Fire Xander list, Safeguard Aimant comes in because there could be something with Poison Dagger that deals that's one. That's true. Yeah. Another four damage off of a Blazing Throw. So there's a couple of different cards that could come in, and if you have a turn off to get it early, might as well grab it while you can. That's true. Bobo Bo does not know of the Triscuit in hand. Nope. I, I don't think anyone's going to be expecting Triscuit yeah, no, until no, it comes no, no. down. <laughs> Especially like round one here mm -hmm. at, uh, at Nationals. Probably not expecting Triscuit. Yeah. So we did have the shield might come down to set up a little bit of a blocker. So some, like I said, I imagine there might be a little bit of thought process coming into the fact that there was already a rending flame. So it's something like a short store what shield might come down, thinking that we might have a second one in hand. So setting up a little bit of that blocker to absorb the damage if possible. Yeah. And here we have a quick silver grail coming down. And the typical target for this is to grab the poison dagger, like you said. Yeah. The poison dagger is used for setting up that OTK turn to pretty much, on, um, you pretty much would want to activate the grail at the end of your opponent's turn because poison dagger does come in tapped. So yep. using it to end of your opponent's turn will let you untap it and pretty much set up your entire combo turn. Yeah, Poison Dagger is one of my favorite cards <laughs> as a uh, degenerate Xander player. Just love it because it just tacks on one extra bonus damage to everything that you do for the turn, and it can turn like a you know middling turn into like an incredibly explosive and deadly turn. Yeah. So I think this Shieldmate setup was actually a lot more detrimental 
than I might have initially thought because looking at Lee's hand, we do have a rending flame and I think only just one honorable vanguard to deal with yeah. attackers. So honorable vanguard can't get through the shield mate unless you want to go ahead and use and use something like a flame sweep, but flame sweep still also only does one damage. Yeah, you'd have to do both, and that doesn't seem like uh, great value. Uh, so it looks like the Shumite is going to get a lot of value. Um, the turn it comes down more than, I'm not sure if it was planned or just overall anticipated. But, I mean, Shumite's going to stick around and do what it can, and we are going to have that Honorable Vanguard come into play here. Yeah, looking at Lee's hand, he's got, like, what, two fast cures. Oh, so the Honorable, honorable Vanguard immediately getting yeeted. Yep, he's going to get, get yeeted. He's going to draw into, looks like, another Hasty Messenger Cremation Ritual. Um, that's set up for uh, if we want a cremation ritual or hasty messenger. Yeah, I mean, he could drop the hasty here if he if he wants. Um, it doesn't get a ton of value out of off of it, right? Because yeah. he doesn't won't have any other cards in hand. Yeah. Um, there's also the good debate if we want to keep up the fast cure. I'm not sure. That's true. Off in hand, I think right now though, Bobo does have less influence, so fast cure isn't online. But depend as seeing the fire armor momentum and assuming probably knowing at this point you might be facing a roughing player, the fast cure could come into a heavy play for. Um, healing up that four extra damage because it does matter in these turns of math. And here we have a uh, level two Merlin come on down. Yep. Oh, another CSR. <laughs> yeah, just just max maximum <laughs> flexing max here. Value. <laughs> so yeah, Merlin two comes down. Um, Merlin two can go ahead and eat the floating memory out of graves to gain more levels. This is out for lethal fireballs, unless you have to banish for the erupting uh, uh, rhapsody combo. And uh, Lee does have some tasty floating memory to eat, right? We we at least have the Honorable Vanguard in there. Yeah, we have Honorable Vanguard. I think we still have the two Tempered Seals in there as well. I think so, yeah. So, and I, I wonder if the gameplay is going to be eating the fire uh, the fire cards to get turn Tem offline the Rending Flames. Yeah, I mean, eating a tasty little uh, fire card with floating memory is like a double whammy. Yeah. So we are going to go ahead and looks like get in one with the Hasty Messenger discard uh, Tempered Steel. Uh, tempered Steel. Yeah, might as well get the chip damage while you can. There's nothing really on the board of Lee's side, so as long as you keep getting one damage, the less you got to do later on. Yeah, I think if you're Bobo here, what are you thinking? Like, you're not getting pressured all that much, right? But you got to respect the, the ability to be explosive from Xander. Yeah, so if I was Bobo here, it's sort of... The, it looks like we had an erupting. We had um, Ember Song in hand. We do have the combo pieces, but we're not in the spot to combo off, and we do have the Grail. And not knowing whether the Grail is hiding an actual Poison Dagger or a main deck Nullifying Lantern that could turn off from game plan, I don't mind just trying to set up more to draw more cards. Because we do have, I think I saw one Spurn the Ash in hand that can help deal with Nullifying Lantern if the turn it comes in. But you, ideally you want two in this situation. Two, oh, so we're going to go ahead and fire the Spurn the Ash onto the Grail just to get rid of it. That makes sense. Yeah, and it looks like we're having a debate if we want to crack it. Yeah, so we're going to crack it in response. And we're going to actually reveal Ooh, Assassin Ripper. Interesting. So neither of the cards we mentioned, Assassin's Ripper is just a really, really efficient um, dagger, right? You can remove uh, prep counters to pump up its attack. Yeah, so it looks like that is set up to pump up its attack, probably set up for that running flame turn, and because of Assassin's Ripper is the cost one, Grail doesn't negate around the materialization cost, so you do have to pay one from the grave, which we end up paying the Tempered Steel for. Yeah, oh, that does make sense. Yeah. With, with Merlin online, getting rid of your floating memory, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So I do like seeing this part in the Ash. It definitely lets um, trigger that card early for the Grail, so you can determine if it was a Nullifying Lantern to determine how you have to set up your future turns. So I did like playing this now to just go ahead and get it out of the way. But just no, no no Nullifying Lantern, at least under the Grail. There might still be one in, in deck, uh, yeah. but we'll have to see if that's what's uh, what's on board right now, actually. Yeah, and it looks like, yeah, we are debating materialization. I did see a pause before at the level two Xander. I don't know if we're still debating if we love to Xander here or what we're materializing. Um, the thing is, when you're facing these erupting decks, you got to do the math of how, what's the board state and how much damage can they ideally do to me? Am I dead if I don't level up here? And it's always the mind game for, you, for yourself is just trying to do your math for damage as well as your opponent's overall combo math. Yeah, and you got to, no, that that's exactly what he's debating right now. Yeah, because depending if you think you don't have, if you think there is lethal Ooh, on board, a, you either want to level or get a nullifying lantern. And we do have Xander level two. Oh, so this is actually isn't even the um, level two. This is the old, vocal. This yes. is the old school one. Yeah, the, the original one. And we are going ahead and get rid of our floating memory, so Merlin can't eat those afterwards. So Merlin doesn't gain any additional levels. Yeah. Once again, that makes a lot of sense. Like maximizing your floating memory now that Merlin's online. Um. And if he wants again, if he wants to get to that Tristan and and or the Trisket end game, then uh, you gotta get to level gotta get to level three. So we did have a top deck um, thieving cut, which is really good because it does clear the way off of this shield mate. Oh yeah, uh, with the one prep counter available, thieving cut will also draw you a card. So that's uh, 
it's pretty pretty nice. Clear the way and uh, replace itself. Yep, especially because you can't. Um, Thieving Cut is an attack card, so for those who know, Thieving Cut does uh, do the attack, so you can't even Rending Flame afterwards. So the Thieving Cut will come in just to clear the way for Shield Mate and also get you the net the extra card or sort of new, uh, not neutralize, go even. Yes, because of the card draw. Yeah, it just replaces itself. It's a really efficient card. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Thieving Cut. Yeah, Thieving Cut, I think, is definitely one of the really good assassin cards you got out of FTC, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I dig it quite a bit. Though you, you see it here and there, and it's not all in all assassin decks, but yeah. it does see some play. So Lizzie, we're debating what we want to do for the turn, because the thing is also the bait. If you kill the shoemate, you're giving the floating memory counter to Merlin just to get a free level. That's true. So there is always a little bit of the thought of how much do we need to let Merlin have levels to deal lethal fireball range. Yeah, I mean, like, the earlier Merlin gets out to level 3, the, the scarier she gets, right? Every other turn, drawing cards, gaining levels, and it's just kind of like a ticking clock. Yeah. So we are going to go ahead and, looks like, do the Hasty Master here, swing one into the Shieldmate, and we are discarding Tempered Steel to add more float <laughs> into the grave. Just all the, all the Tempered Steels. <laughs> and, ooh, so we did top deck a Dungeon Guide. Oh, interesting. I mean, that would be a way to to get to that uh, to get to that Triscuit. <laughs> yeah, definitely set up that Triscuit, paying a little bit less to do it because we want to pay two out of our memory instead of the three. Um, so what? Yeah. Do we, what do we got in hand? Do we have a flame sweep? We have a fast cure. He's got, he's got a couple fast cures, I think. Yeah, a couple fast cures, um, the rending flame, and a, yeah, the dungeon guide and Triscuit. What's the card in the middle? I can't. It's, I think that's a rending flame. If that's the one you're talking about, or the flame sweep behind the rending flame. It's probably the flame sweep that I that I don't recognize. Yeah. So that might be the Flame Sweep that's a fun dungeon, dungeon Guide. And we are going to, it looks like, pass the turn over, and Merlin's going to run and eat that Tempered Steel, gain the level counter at the end of Lee's turn. The normal Merlin. <laughs> yep. You know, start those level counters early so you can um, go big when you when you need to. And here we have level three, speaking of going big. Yeah. This is level three Merlin. This is um, one of the most powerful cards in the game right now, in my opinion. And I don't think that's a hot take at all. Um, level three Merlin's an incredible card. Yeah. No, Merlin level three is incredible. It did so because of this and the way the interaction this happened. Uh, eating the floating memory at the end of Lee's turn, Merlin's going to go ahead and get the recollection counter up to two. Yes, and then being able to draw off of the first turn it comes in, which is a really, really good effect. Yeah. So for those out there who aren't super familiar, you want to keep track of Merlin's level now, uh, which is going to be really, really relevant for basically the finishing cards for Bobo, whether it be uh, Rupting Rhapsody or um, Fireball. Because uh, I do like how we just went turbo level three. We didn't do the normal erupting, just trying turbo to kill on turn one, two. We went straight level three, so we're already set up for a lethal turn if there's a nullify lantern that comes into play later on. Yeah, because like right now, if you just look at the life totals, you have four damage here, three damage there. But uh, I think it's a in a little bit more dangerous position than than one would realize, right? Both players are kind of setting up for explosive turns. Yeah, and the card that we talked about earlier, Innovate Fury, was discarded off the Hasty Messenger. Yeah. So it looks like one of those some situations where you're not seeing too many allies from your opponent. We don't really feel like you don't need the pressure as much in your hand to clear the board. There's not too much on attack damage being happened to you yeah. outside, outside of it. Yeah, you don't you don't really want to D level right now. You you want to stay at level three, Merlin, and just kind of like, um, you know, go towards your end game. Yep, and also looks like we also have the second one in hand if we really need to put the pressure on later on to do a board wipe of any sorts. Yeah, and he's likely just debating how much he can possibly do. Looking at trying to get a glimpse of uh, Bobo's hand here. He does have another tempered st steel, it looks like. <laughs> uh, you gotta run four. Yeah, okay, we have, I think, a fiery momentum and an innovate fury. I miss, I think we still have the erupting rap city. And I'm, oh no, sorry, was, I think erupting rap city hit the banish zone. And we are going to go ahead and spurn that ash, the assassin's ripper. All right, yeah, just get that off the board. I mean, like the assassin's ripper plus um, rending flames is a, is a ton of damage. Yeah, I mean, uh, Assassin Ripper gives, I think, plus two for its class bonus. Yep, it, so it'll attack for three, plus yeah. the Running Flames. That's a potential 12, not including any other buffs that you might be doing. Yeah, so definitely giving that off the board while you can is a little bit beneficial. And we didn't end up passing the turn after that, and now we're hitting, we're debating what we're going with how to materialize. Um, we are debating, looks like, our own safeguard amulets to sort of negate a little bit of a combo turn damage with erupting and fireballs. Yeah, I think safeguard here is a safe play, right? <laughs> yeah. While we're looking at the people, like, what do we say? We have uh, Channeling Stone, I think, in hand. We have level three Xander. I can't make out the other two. Is that a Varukin Soul Knife, maybe? Maybe. I, either a Soul Knife, I was going to say a Fractured Crown, but they can't be a Fractured Crown, right? I mean, Fractured Crown. He's running Triscuit, right? I mean, yeah. it, it could be a Fractured Crown. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it could be. I, I mean, Fractured Crown would definitely be a card I don't think I've seen hit the board since release. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, I, I would love to see it. And we did end up top decking our own shield mate 
for Lee, which is going to be a little bit beneficial overall. Hopefully that uh, we might see that hit the board. We are going to go ahead and do the Hasty Messenger, and we did almost have a missed trigger synchronization. So Hasty Messenger is a card that does require you to discard first before drawing. Yes. Um, there, there is this card Cemetery Sentry, which also lets you draw, then discard, which sometimes gets a little bit confusing if you're running both into a list. But So it looks like we are debating. Um, looks like we're just having a judge ruling because of the Hasty Messenger um, did come in and attacked, and I think we're just debating if there is a missed trigger right now on, on the field. Yeah, yeah, and you can kind of see the judge in the background kind of uh, giving him direction. Yeah, because there is a chance where Hasty Messenger can, uh, you can not trigger Hasty Messenger and just deal one. If the damage is taken, you just miss that extra draw trigger. Yeah, so it looks like they're going to kind of debate and go, go, through the, go through the judge call here. Yep. I think I did happen to look away. Did we, I think we're shuffling the deck in response because he did pick up the card originally for drawing. And I think their judge is uh, to okay. shuffle. That was going to be my next question. I wasn't sure if he saw the top card of the deck or not. Yeah, I, yeah we can't tell from Sally from our angle if he did look at it. But I think just having, I think the safe bet is to get that shuffle in um, just to make sure there isn't no unknown knowledge. Right? Yeah. Game knowledge. So, so while it looks like we are getting that shuffle in from the judge, um, we are going to go ahead and give it back to Lee. And Lee's going to go ahead and discard the shield mate. Uh, did present to cut to the opponent, but it looks like the opponent said now judge. Yeah, but I mean, both both players still in like really good spirits, right? A yeah. lot of like camaraderie here. Is that another Triscuit? <laughs> it is. It is not CSR. <laughs> it's a regular, regular old Triscuit. I mean, um, you got to play the CSR version, right? If you if you're casting oh, Triscuit. Of course. Triscuit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I love how he's just been sandbagging the Triscuit this entire game, right? It's just been, it's just been in his hand, right? Not discarding it, just patiently like holding on to the Triscuit. Yeah. Like this is my this is my end game. Yeah. I'm going I'm going to get this Triscuit. I'm going to close it out as quickly. <laughs> I mean, like if you have the if you have the opportunity to play Triscuit round 1 at NA Nationals, you're going to do it, right? Like, are we going there now though? Like, That's a dungeon guide. Like absolute legend. Yeah, we dungeon guide right Right on the board? Yeah, we're going to level three, Xander. Are we going to see Tristan come down this turn? Does he have enough? I think he has enough cards in hand to yeah. actually do it. Yeah, yeah. he has like five or six in hand. Yeah. So we are going to go ahead. <laughs> we and might see a Tristan here on coverage, dude. So, oh, dude, oh, the spice was revealed. He discarded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ban banish one Triscuit. <laughs> banish one Triscuit. But oh. was like, but was like, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> Why is there a Triscuit <laughs> in the banish zone? Uh, you discarded what? <laughs> Hold on, what's this card do again? So. It's, so we are going to go ahead and kill the shield, mate. Um, dungeon, uh, level, uh, dungeon, oh. For, I forgot to actually level up here, so yep. we're going to go back there, level up. Yeah. Getting a little ahead of himself, right? Yeah, round one nerves, big event. You know, uh, the after the first round, early in the morning for most of us, depending on time zone, you really got to get the gears turned in a little yeah. bit. Yeah, and he, he did do the banish from the uh, dungeon guide. He, so, he, yeah, he did the trigger from the it. The problem is, though, you can fail the find. Oh, interesting. So there might be the judge ruling right now that technically he didn't level. He declared the attack. He might have technically failed the find off of the level three dungeon guy level up. Oh, yeah. We'll have to see what the judge call is here. I'm not sure what the, the appropriate call is in this situation. Yeah. I think the judge is going over to talk to our head judge about it. Um, so we do have a little bit of a debate of what's hap what the official judge called. Oh, call. no. Yeah, at least <laughs> making the face. <laughs> uh, uh. I think he was just too excited to play Triscuit, right? Yeah, and it sounds like um, while we're having the judge call, um, they're going to go ahead and get that sorted. They're going to figure out with the head judge, and we sounds like we might be coming back to the booth for a little bit as we get that resolved. Yeah, I mean, like, dude, Triscuit, <laughs> round, round one. <laughs> round it's one. so good. The opponent's looking, going, wait a minute, is it Triscuit in your banish zone? What, what's this? What's this? <laughs> I mean, yeah, we saw we saw him banish a Triscuit, so he he knows what's coming, right? Yeah, we did we did promise him spice for round one. Yeah, so I mean, Xander, depending on the judge ruling, right, we would have, what, Xander level three, and then yeah. probably immediately followed by a, by a Triscuit. Yeah, maybe followed by Triscuit. I do have to remember what Triscuit is. I know Triscuit has 15 life. Yeah. It is a Luxum. She has a built-in attack. I don't know what it was. Uh, two or three, I want to feel I feel like I'm saying. But I'm not sure the other text on the card. For, for those of you watching, <laughs> for those of you watching, Triscuit is a card from Dawn of Ashes, the, the very first uh, Grand Archive set, and uh, it's not a card that sees a ton of play. I guess you could say, right? Yeah. Um, it's a spicy card that a lot of people would love to brew around, but it's just a really difficult card. Yeah, um, yeah. To make work. And it sounds like we did have the judge ruling resolved. We are going to go ahead and go back to the match area, as I think we're starting to get everything sorted sorted here. Yeah, and while we do that, you know what? Let me let me bust out my my handy uh, portable and see, uh, read, read off what uh, Triscuit actually does. Your so, portable index? Yes. So give me one moment with that. Yep. 
<laughs> hearing the judge rule a little bit of what's going on. Um, we'll find out shortly because we can't fully hear the judge of what the official ruling is, but we'll determine whether if he does go level three that they're able to revert or if it just is like we said, it was a technically fail to find situation. All right. So for those of you out there who don't have Triscuit memorized, which I imagine is almost everyone, uh, Triscuit is a five cost, oh. <laughs> two uh, attack, 12 health, um, ally warrior angel. And it says, fire, water, and wind elements are enabled for you. And on enter, you can banish your champion. If you do, Tristet becomes your champion with base level three. Okay. Um, notably, Warrior Angel and, and Luxum. So that they could be the, the Fractured Crown uh, and get you know maximum value out of the Fractured Crown, which would then um, give you a bunch of extra health. Yeah. And then I guess we haven't seen it yet. I wonder if, because running Triscuit, do we have wind and water in this deck list? I, we haven't seen any yet. It might just be all in one fractured crown. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so yeah, it looks like uh, since we did continue play, oh, that's yeah, a bummer. Let's, let's the judge ruling oh, was he did technically fail the find. Yep. Yeah, so okay. basically yeah, missed bummer. missed yeah. level yeah. up. Yeah, those are no fail the find. Fail the right. find means um, you just sort of look through your deck, like oh, I don't have this card, uh, but you still resolve the yes, mechanics. Target. So it's, uh, that's why it's a quote unquote fail the find. Uh, um, and so we're well, we trying to set up. Then we are going to go ahead with the even cut. Yeah, so in this situation, right, as a as a card player, you just got to kind of roll with the punches, right, and yeah. uh, not let it get to, and just can you know proceed on with the, with the event. Okay. Yeah, I mean the players are definitely in a situation where it's your round one future match cam of a big national yes. event. Mm -hmm. Pressure's on. I don't I don't envy them. I don't. <laughs> I couldn't imagine playing under that level of pressure. Yeah, I mean like like we mentioned before at the start of the show. I mean this is like the you know premier level event for Grand Archive right now. Yeah, oh, this damn. is the event I'm where so if sorry. you place top you eight, you get your cool invite in the turn. works. Yes. Yes. So we're going to have 16 players, uh, if, I'm a, if I remember correctly. I, on that I think so, yeah. Yeah, so 16 players. So it's a lot of pressure on the players in this. But this is also one of those gameplay mistakes that you make once, you're not going to make it for the rest of the tournament. Right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he just got a little overzealous, yeah. right? He's like, oh, I'm going to do Triscuit this turn. Yeah, I could do Triscuit on camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the first we, ever. We might still see a Triscuit <laughs> on camera. <laughs> but the, the problem is, is to level up to level three, he's going to have to banish some cards here. Yeah. And Triscuit, like we said, costs five to play. Yeah, um, sure. okay. And I think Triscuit has also uh, hit our memory zone. Right yes, now. I think so. So we're probably okay. not going to level it off level three this turn. Um, and I think we don't have any more floating memory left because uh, of Merlin yes, 8. The original one with the Tempered Steel, um, and uh, we did pass turn. Merlin's going to go up to level three counters, technically level six. Um, so fireballs now do up to seven damage. Erupting does six damage, um, uh, depending if you banish more fire cards. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I'll just recollect. one of the downsides here is that not being able to level up and do kind of like your your shenanigans is that you're stuck at level two, which means you have less health. Yep, and Xander level two has 22, so you're a little more susceptible to damage, unlike Merlin level three is 30. Oh no, twenty-eight. Sorry, uh, I'm thinking I'm gonna have I myself both Tony. Okay. Ooh, is this a is a fancy uh, library witch? Yeah, I think it's a foil Kickstarter primary witch promo. Yeah. Ooh. A little fancy library witch. But both players are like, you know, playing the cards that they really enjoy and uh, you know, blinging out their decks. Yeah, I'm definitely a fan of the Kickstarter promo version. It's probably one of my most favorite arts in the game. It's a very good one. It is a very good one. <laughs> So yeah, we just, we just played the rich. We passed the turn over. I think. All right. Mm. I think I think if you're Lee, you're pretty happy with that. You're like you're not dead this turn. So yeah, yeah Lee's sort of debating what's sort of the next turn now. At this point, you have to sort of reset a little bit. You have to refill your hand, reset up the overall game plan because of that, because of the one little misplay we had. Um, so it's now debating. Okay, how do I refill? How do I reset myself up to get Triska back onto the field without hurting myself too much? Yeah, and he's checking his uh, graveyard to see for floating memory. Yep. Um, yep. He's got some options. Like we said, he's kind of messing around with this Soul Knife here. Yep, so Soul Knife comes out. Soul Knife is a very unique card. I do I do like the text on Soul Knife. It is a base 1-1, one, one, mm -hmm. but also the fact that it also acts like um, has the Rending Flame text where you can banish three fire cards and then just materialize it, which I think could really set up some turns if your opponents aren't calculating that math properly for the extra one damage to make that Rending Flame's now eight instead of six. It, it might actually be relevant. So... It also has a second line of text where if it kills uh, an ally, it comes back. It goes back into your uh, material deck. Yeah, so which if you want to might come into play right here. Yeah, if you want to clear the board with Xander, let your hasty messenger get in for chip damage. I mean, something you're not skipping a materialization phase. So yeah, it sort of keeps up keeps up your tempo a little bit. Let's see how he follows follows yeah. up this up here. We do see a resolute sand off the top for Lee, um, a little bit. It's good and bad, I want to say, in this matchup because of Resolute Sand is really going to hit the fire momentums and if there's a possible running flame. So far, we haven't seen any real allies outside of AC Messenger come in from Bobo. Yeah, do you think he's just trying to set up for a really large, like, running flames turn with this with this Soul Knife? 
I think at this point, yes, because we ended up not gaining to level three Trisket. I think setting up the okay. rending, um, pirate rending flame is sort of the yep. closing mechanic at this point, uh, especially now that your opponent's leveling up that Merlin every this turn. Card. Their turn is technically ahead of yours because they're drawing their cards off of the even counters and they're also having yep. other damage cards or like fireball, their own fire momentums to push a more OTK combo. I mean, we do have another dungeon guide in hand. We gonna rip it again? I mean, maybe. What do we have? We have, it looks like, seven cards in hand, so we can't fully rip it because it's just counting five. Yep, yep, exactly. But we can level, but we can go ahead and level with Dungeon Guide and try and set up another turn, and Ritual? we're going to probably uh, try and refill this hand a little bit with the Cremation Ritual to get two more cards. Yeah, so he's just going to kind of get rid of the first Dungeon Guide, draw some cards here. Yep, and then I imagine setting up everything properly for, um, the probably setting up two Dungeon Guide, like I said, for this turn as well, um, especially if we don't see it hit the Memory Zone to pay for this Cremation Ritual cost. And like we mentioned before, Merlin is kind of like a ticking time bomb at this point, right? You're going to start accruing value, drawing two cards every other turn. You, she gets that plus two attack, and uh, it's just kind of like inevitable. So you gotta you gotta work fast here. Hey, we have the third dungeon guide. Yeah. If you, if you really wanted to set this up, you have all you have the, all the tools to do it at this point. And I think right now Lee's also doing card math in hand because of the fact you have three in memory, you have about I think five in hand. You have to do the math whether or not if banishing. Two cards from your memory, as well as technically getting going down a card to play Dungeon Guide in your hand, still lets you play Trisket, and it does. But I think it leaves you with one card in hand at the start of your next turn, unless you have something another way to draw. Yeah, it looks like he's still kind of debating what he what he would want <clears throat> what he wants to do here. Pardon me. Yeah, so you still have the situation now, though. If we, I don't think um, Broken Stone Knife is Warrior. I think it's just Assassin class bonus. I think so. Yeah. So if you do go Trisket here, you don't get yeah, either. Class bonus off the Rook and Soul Knight. You can't get you can send it back to Material Deck on the on kill, and you can't re put it. You can't summon it from your Materialization Deck if you go just get. That's true, actually. Yeah, that's actually pretty relevant. Yeah. So I think there is the debate of when do we want to do this sequencing so we could get the most value out of the Soul Knife, and we are going to go into we have four counters on my own, draw an extra card for the turn. Um, now at level seven, and pretty much time the boogie, the boogeyman fireball. What, what's interesting about uh. Uh, Triscuit is that she does have base two attack, right? Like yeah. she'll, she'll give you a, your champion a little bit of attack. Yeah, so I, I guess at that point, Rending Flame now goes in for six, 12, technically, right? If you don't use Soul Knife and you go to Triscuit, with that, you'll have three attack. Three attack off the Rending Flame for six, double that, and then 12. Yeah, so it, it's still 12, yeah. um, basically making up for what he lost with uh, losing that uh, dagger earlier. Okay. Yeah, and I think uh, it would definitely set up... Um, Definitely set up some reflection. unexpected yeah. damage as a whole because 12 is a lot more than a base rending claim for 6. But okay, it looks eight. like we are going to go ahead and have uh, the fireball come in play uh, here. The fireball card. looks like is in the stack, and we are going to go ahead take and pop four, the safeguard seven. amulet. For those who don't know, safeguard amulet five. does negate 4 damage of non-attack, uh, non-combat damage. So this fireball, instead of coming in for 8, it comes in for just 4. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. And that uh, safeguard aim does last for the turn. So if he decides to fireball again, the uh, fireball also deal only for instead of eight. It's not just one instance of damage like some of the other cards that um, have been released recently. Yeah, I mean safeguard does a pretty good job of protecting you for one turn. But now that it's gone, you know, like shields are down. Yeah, I think um, that's what Bobo's sort of looking at at this point is now debating their hand. Like, okay, so now that the safeguard aim it popped, is there a way I could set this up better for the next turn, lethal, instead of setting up for this turn per se and pushing a for less damage across the board and everything that we're doing. Um, yeah, you, you got to pop it, right? You just got to fire it off and make him make him use it. Yeah, especially I think Bobo had about uh, like uh, seven or eight cards in hand, so not knowing what's in there could have been really detrimental. And there is actually the Cemetery Center I talked about earlier. Yeah. So unlike Casey Messer, that's the unentered draw card and discard a fire element. Yeah, and, you know, it still pushes a little bit of damage here, right? It's a 2-2, two -two, so, you know, chipping him down, getting him to lethal range. Yeah. So we are going to go ahead and we are passing it. So we, well, oh. So we did have a Crater Shock in hand oh, from Lee that I didn't realize, and I think that's our fourth Hard dungeon guide. Yep. <laughs> All the dungeon guides. <laughs> the deck really said, all right, you didn't get to do it the first time, so we're going to give you everything you can to yeah, do it. Just Im time. immediately <laughs> discards it. He's like, get out of here. Yeah. I already have two other ones yeah, in my head. Yeah, I mean, at this point, dungeon guide's point also a little bit of a dead card. Um, once you use dungeon guide once, it sort of doesn't have a use unless you really want to banish cards from your memory, but there's not too many decks that want to do that outside of Arcane Rye. Yeah, true, true, true. So, so it looks like we are debating our materialization here. Um, we do have, it looks like, eight cards total in hand. I imagine Lee's also doing a little bit of math. Um, oh. Like I said, if you go down four for Dungeon Guide, we are then left with... Actually, I think we're one short off of Triscuit. So it looks like he's got, what, six in memory, three in hand, right? 
Uh, yeah, two in hand or three in hand? I think he's got three in hand. Three in hand? It's, it's hard to see with the, the, the playmat being the same color, but he's got. I think he's got three. Okay, so if, we, uh, so if we do Dungeon Guide here. So if we do have three up to ten, we play Dungeon Guide for three, banish two. Like We're down, down to seven cards in hand, which does allow us to Trisket. Yep. So I mean, we could see, we could see Trisket this turn. Yeah, we did skip the materialization step at this point. Um, I think that's also because I think everything else in the materialization deck outside of Fractured Crown does have materialization cost. Right. And right. if we're all setting up for the Dungeon Guide Trisket turn, we're not we don't want to get rid of any cards. Oh. I think we're just barely getting there. If we all get there. right. He's he's moving the cards around. He's debating. So he is going to go ahead and I think swing with the Hasty Messenger first, just to see what's on top. Of yeah. The filter. Maybe it might change the game. Plan yeah. Get, get more um, get more options. Right. Yeah. And that, that's also, I think that's an Excalibur. Is oh, it? On attack? Is that yep. an Excalibur? It, it might, it might be. An Excalibur class card. bonus is online because we go Triscuit. So he, he discards yep. the other dungeon guide. Yep. Still keeping one in hand, of course. Draw the Creative Shock, I think. That's a yeah, fancy Creative Shock. And then, yeah. Yeah, so you do have Excalibur in hand to banish <laughs> and then turn off an <laughs> element for a turn. I don't think we can do both in this turn. I don't think, we I, I don't think so, yeah. <laughs> you, have to, you have to kind of go all in. If you, if you want to do Triscuit this turn, you have to go all in, right? Yeah, but a good setup for the turn after, though, you could Excalibur into turning off. I think it turns off your base element, right? So you can choose Fire Element, and Fire is going to be offline for your oh. opponent. So the, tr so the tricky thing in here is you have to make sure you don't banish your Excalibur. So <laughs> yeah. you have to you know, yeah. keep it in hand. <laughs> and we, we see him chuckle a little bit. We are going to go ahead and go into Dungeon Guide, this time love, hopefully leveling up the level three Xander. Like this? Yeah. And they did do the roll to keep. Yep. Yeah, keep keep one yep. here. Yep. And here we go. Level three. Level three, three Xander. Yep. Mm -hmm. Get your uh, your your old school level three uh, Xander okay. here. Uh, but say, is that the original? Is that the one that you reveal Luxem, or is that the original? That's the original one. That that's not the Luxem reveal. But I don't think it matters here because um, he's probably not long for this world. I imagine. No. <laughs> I think we're gonna see. Uh, I think we're gonna see Trisket this turn potentially. So we are going to go ahead and it looks like debate the dungeon guide swing. I think probably debating what we're swinging dungeon into. Guard one at face. Yeah. So it looks like we do have to swing an attack. We are just going to go face. Yeah. A little bit. Swing little the bit face. Damage put here. damage. I mean, we have the running flame hand, so all damage you have in hand, the less you got to worry about getting off of the off of the rending flame. Yeah. 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 All right. Are we going to see the Trisket? We are debating. I I think he has enough cards to do it, right? I want to say I, he did. He needs six in hand. Unless he has five. Like I said, I don't have the exact card count in hand. We might be down to five. It might be like I said earlier. We might have actually had two in hand from previously instead of the three. Six. Fire and it grape? could, yeah. Uh, nine. So which does mess up that math a little bit. So you don't have a way to draw if you don't running something like a GCR, which okay. actually is Fraction Crown a divine relic? It is not. It is not. Okay, so we could run a GCR. Well, actually, we run Grail. We do run Grail. So he, we yeah, run he, he used Grail earlier, yeah. So it looks like we did end up passing the turn, I think. Yep, so currently level 7. So Merlin will be, um, so it looks like right now we are having some talks of what level Merlin will be. I'm talking about Merlin is level 7 right now, Could, will be level 8 next turn. And at that point, Fireball is not doing 9 damage, which puts us pretty much on the edge. Two Fireballs is Oh yeah, lethal. two Fireballs is definitely lethal. Or even Fireball erupting, because like I said, you do know your opponent possibly tried to go for the win last turn. That's why they Fireballed last turn, and you had to pop the Safeguard Amulet. So you're really debating, how, uh, do you, can you go to 15 life here off the Trisket? Yeah, I mean, yeah, erupting in a fireball is is big. I, th I think, I mean, even if you could play Trisket, that's, yeah. that's a good point. Sorry. Even if you could play Trisket, it's still risky, right? Because yeah. you go back, you go down to 12 health, okay. Okay. Yeah. and uh, you, you don't have access to your crown. Yeah, and just one fireball off the top would um, just be lethal. Even if it was in hand, I think um, okay. Bobo, Bobo also had two cards in hand, so it could have been waiting a fireball, but I think it was actually a Cemetery Century right. and another card I didn't see. And there is the Terrafing Materialize. So the Terrafing also is a good matchup for Rending because of the fact that in this matchup, yeah. you don't have to pay the five for the Rending Flames. Yeah, just going to cost more. Okay. And we are going to go ahead and swing the two into Hasty Metcher, clear the board a little bit. Um, and and it looks like we're now debating. Yeah, I, I, I think you don't go face here because if you if you got it, then you're going to yeah. be able to. Yeah, so we do see the Embersaw coming down, targeting the Cemetery Sentry. Um, doing that also adds an extra fire card into the uh, graveyard that will let us on get an extra card. And we are going to go ahead and do Fiery Momentum instead. Um, yeah, big old, big old swing here. Yeah. I don't have the exact Dungeon math in my head right now. Oh, so I think right. it's at least okay. six plus. How much? If not uh, more. Yeah, I don't know exactly uh, how many fire cards one, he has two, in his three, bin. So we're, we are going to use the sword as an extra one. So fire momentum alone is going to come in for three. <laughs> and it looks like it was 11, 10, 11. 12, 13, 14. No, 14. Ooh, that's, uh, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of damage. <laughs> Literally two off of lethal. Uh, okay, yeah. Really, uh, and so very, very close. Yep. Right. So we did uh, get really close. Yep. Uh, it really makes it so now at this point Lee can't trisk it at all. 
No, definitely not. I think that was sort of the game plan behind it. Depending on what else we have in hand, um, next actually next turn, Merlin could just swing for Leaf because Merlin, with her even level counter, says get an extra plus two attack on her for her yep. attack. So she gets the plus two and just uh, swing it with the sword for lethal. Yeah, sword will be a lethal swing next turn. Um, Putting Lee trying to determine what they can do at this point yep. to sort of try and win and deal 20, uh, 21 damage. <laughs> right. I mean, he does still have the rending flames. He has a, he has a dagger like. Does he have enough? Wow. Like, do the numbers add up? Yeah, because I mean, on board, on paper, roughly, we have one coming in with Dungeon Guy to put us up to eight. Rending Flame with Dagger will put us up to uh, six, da eight damage. So it'll put us up to 16. We have to find another 12 in our hand. Yeah. And I don't know if we have it. There is a Flame Sweep, but I think putting three down for a Rending Flame pretty much might turn off the rest of our hand. Yep. Uh, we could Excalibur, but I don't really. Uh, uh, actually. That's correct. Big Brain. Is there a play here that we Excalibur the Sword of Seeking? Oh, interesting. <laughs> hmm. Depending what's in hand, getting rid of the attack if he doesn't run into another sword, depending what's in hand, sort of getting sort of seeking off the field does possibly I buy mean, you an extra turn. I mean, that does buy him, like, it does clear, like, onboard lethal, yeah. right? You, obviously, you don't know, uh, yeah. Lee doesn't know what's in Bobo's hand, so that, that could be the play, right? Yeah. Just kind of, you know, play to your outs here and at least get rid of the onboard lethal. Yeah, especially if you're not swinging it for lethal this turn yourself. It's one of those things, like, keep this another turn by me. Oh, one next turn. Uh, so is this just going to be a. Uh, oh, your soul knife with yeah. no yeah. other yeah. effects. Yeah, it's yeah. gonna be like a naked soul knife. Yep, naked soul knife. Getting in for one, put up to ten. Um, we might be seeing the Excalibur line. Uh, talk about we'll see. We do have a channeling stone being popped. Pop channeling stone. Oh so yeah. Channeling stone does end up making the next card activate two less this turn. So we're gonna put two down, which I think is either it's gonna only be flame sweep or Excalibur. Nope, we are putting three down. Is Excalibur four or five? Wait, is he? Is he trisketing? Is he is he trisketing? <laughs> Actually, yeah, Trisket does reset Wait, your does Trisket reset um, your damage. She might actually. Once again, yeah, yeah. Trisket's a very tricky card. Maybe, maybe he's just playing Trisket. Is he gonna replace the hero? Yeah. So. Yeah, I think yeah. he is. There <laughs> we go. Yo, Trisket, round one at the yep. North American Nationals. So it does reset your life. So now he's at 12. So this is this is a way that uh, he he also survives here. Um, this is also setting up for a fractured crown turn on the next turn, uh, which will give his champion uh, extra health for every unique ally. Um, and like you said, this could be, this could be the Excalibur play that will have the bonus because yeah. Trisket is a warrior type. Uh, can we play Excalibur though? I don't think so because Excalibur I think is cost four, and okay. we already oh. used the Channeling Stone to cast Trinket. I do believe, I do believe Excalibur is, is, it two? is a two drop. Yeah. Is it two? Okay. Oh, I might be thinking of Lightweaver's Assault. Yeah, Light, light Lightweaver's <laughs> Assault. Another, another good luck some card. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So we are leaving it up. I think Excalibur is also fast speed. I, I think so as well, though that one I'm less okay. less sure of. Uh, before we collect? Yeah. But we also do, so, we might be leaving uh, cards okay, up in hand yeah. as well, so because depending on what Bobo has, we want to leave the Resolute stand up. Okay. If there's another fire momentum, to take three less damage as a whole. Excalibur is a fast, okay. fast speed. Yeah. So we have two options. We have the Excalibur, we have the Resolute stand playing at its fast speed because we're level three, which was good that we don't have to pay two cards. And we are going to go ahead and pay two. I, I and we are going to bonus, get rid of the harp. Yeah, blow up the Discordia. Crux Interesting. So for those who don't know, Discordia harp yeah. is the the tech I should say that was brought into most of these erupting decks at this point yeah, because of the fact that um, Crystal of Empowerment was banned. Uh, Crystal of Empowerment was the card to get you the plus two levels. So harp would pseudo do that because you would cast two melody cards, gain two levels of harp, and then crack the harp. So it's one of the cards that's come in, and yeah. cracking it on the Excalibur on it is a really good yeah. overall. And we did actually, I think, class bonus, too. You do get the class bonus, and so Excalibur. you got to know that he chose fire, right? Yeah. Fireball and Crux, I imagine, were just the two, el two yep. elements called. And Neat. said, okay, now what? Now Bobo can't play them, right? He just can't materialize or activate cards of those elements yep. um, until his next turn, which which is interesting because it's until the uh, beginning okay. of uh, um, of your next turn. So if he's got some fast speed like shenanigans like Fireball and stuff, you can, you can still do it, but yeah. on your opponent's turn. Yep, and I think at this point, let's go ahead and let um, Lee determine what they want to do going forward. I think we're counting how many fire cards are inside of our grave, um, mm. so we can Rending Flame and do possibly a couple other mechanics. Well, another cool thing that uh, Fracture Crown does is it gives you plus two attack as well. Oh, yeah. I think we're also, yeah, we're also looking at our floating memory. Is that oh. a... Arndite? I, I think it is an Arndite in there, <laughs> which, which does make sense, right? Because yeah. Trisket gives you access to all, element, all elements, but no, we do have the Fractured Crown coming down. Oh, I love to see it, dude. 
Sure. And I did see also, we do also run the level two death executioner proxy or vault what card inside the Wrong material deck if we need yep. it. So if, if, if you didn't know, so this is the Fractured Crown. It says uh, the linked champion's first attack each turn gets an additional plus two. And then class bonus, which is on board because uh, Triscuit is a warrior, I that champion gets plus two health for each unique ally card in your graveyard. So he was looking in his graveyard, so he's also probably counting up all the unique allies he had in there as well. I think we don't have yeah. any, though, because the only other unique ally we had was Triscuit, but Triscuit ended up going it to got the banished. Finish. Yeah. Because you're a warrior now. Oh my god. Okay. But this will give a plus yep. two, right? So yeah. plus wow, two okay. plus the rending yeah. flames. Yes. All right. um, yep. for so it. four <laughs> plus running flame for another seven, yep. 14 damage. Yeah. We're almost pushing lethal. We're four off. It, it's close. It's, 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 this matches a lot closer yep. than, you, than you think, right? It completely turned around from what we saw where Lee was at Not 23 damage. Like, literally two more damage on board, and Lee was dead next turn. I, I love Boa's, like, reaction here. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, like, would you would you personally have expected to see Fractured Crown Trisket round, round one? No. I probably would have been turning the cards and going, what does this card do again? Yeah, wh what is this? How, oh, like, what does this actually, actually do? So we are, it looks like, probably debating on our math as a whole, because I think we only have to um, deal face? pretty much a lot less damage than we had before. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, so I mean, Dungeon Guide getting in here for the chip, and the chip's going to really, really be yeah. relevant. Yeah, it really matters at this point, especially, like I said, because Running Fane's going to come on in for 14, so we're at 25. If Lee finds three more damage, we have Lethal on board. And, and we'll oh, note we'll that uh, Triscuit only has 12 health. Yep. And Bobo, you know, he's just looking for back. some uh, erupting yeah. fireball action. Yeah. yeah. So if he's I sitting on a fireball in hand, oh. or well, two okay, of them in hand, because right now Merlin is level nine, Check so it doesn't feel like it. You do need two fireballs in hand to perform lethal happen. with Merlin at in response to anything at this point. Yeah. Oh, so actually, sorry. It looks like I did miss the. We were so fascinated by Fractured Crown. I did miss. I think uh, Terrifying was popped yeah. this turn. Okay. I mean, that does make sense, right? Yeah. So we do have to pay two for every attack, which does sort of mess up the math a little bit um, of what has to be done in form of Lee side. Lee can't dungeon guide one and then go ahead and say Rending Flame. We would have to do Correct. one of the other. Yeah, he, is, he, he just has, he has exactly enough cards just to do Rending Flames. But I think we do also have another... That, that's another Excalibur, I think, in hand. I think it is another Excalibur. <laughs> <laughs> We're setting up for it. We're setting up to Excalibur our way to victory. Yep. Install the game out. All right, so th this looks like it's not going to be an erupting... Or not... Um, I'm, I'm, Apologies, not going to be a Rending Flames turn. Nope. So we're going to set for the Creative Shock, draw two cards. Um, imagine, yeah, we're going to go ahead and drop even cut at this point. If we're using attack cards, we're pretty much using them for the Rending Flames at this point to try and close out the game. Yeah, and it looks like he's keeping up uh, Excalibur, right? Yeah. Which makes a lot of sense, right? You know, turn off your opponent. Are we doing, uh, oh, actually, are we doing it now? Excalibur. Interesting. Sort of so the, the effect does last until your next turn. Yep. Uh, so if, if he does it now... Uh, Bobo can't play and uh, fire or crux cards until crux uh, Lee's next turn. Yeah, interesting. I was more expecting it to be done in response to something, just so you can sort of put the cards out of the opponent's memory a little bit. Um, but I guess it's also a dangerous card, because if they do have a combo with fireball, you're putting yourself up into a dangerous position with that. Um, and just clearing off that uh, sword, like we mentioned earlier. So then there is the Proxy's Vault uh, Brittany and Trinket. There's something materialized. Uh, well, actually... I can't say that. Technically, it does do something in this matchup because of Trisket being it does, yeah. in water. <laughs> it technically does. It could come into play. Oh. And we saw Arendite, right, last yeah. turn? I think we do have, I think, oh, that's what Lee was counting math for. We're seeing how much floating memory right. is in the grave yep. for Arendite because Arendite does gain attack yep. based off how many floating memory Arendite. you banish with the card. That oh, here we go, <laughs> Arendite. <So, laughs> it's coming in. <laughs> I do see, I did see a shield mate. I don't know how yeah. much floating memory we do uh, have banish, inside of hand. And we do have two, two Rending Flames in our memory, sorry. so we're not two. too worried about uh, banishing sorry, one of our uh, Rending Flames. Uh, this this just one. Arendite just one Fractured Crown uh, <laughs> Rending uh, Flames. <laughs> okay. yeah, so base floating. damage right now is yep. five on Triscuit? Well, no, just base. Yeah, yeah. With sword? And you can see Arendite here on the stream. Class bonus, which does she does have the class bonus. Uh, banish any amount of yep. cards with floating memory, and you get that extra yeah. extra uh, plus okay. attack. Um, so we did banish the Rending yeah. Flame, but I do think Lee does have and another one okay. inside of our hand. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure he does. I think he started off the Creative Shock. So we are going to go ahead and banish oh, yeah, Shield Knight with Arendite, counter, so yeah, we do get one Refinement counter onto Arendite, 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 and it's going to go up to three attack, and we have, I think, a base damage at this point of two. So, like, yeah, so Fresh Crown's two, Triss gets two, and Arendite is three. So seven. Yep. Rending Flame comes in for... 14? No, no 20, 10. 20, 20, 20, 20. 20. Yeah, it's 20 damage. Three. Yeah. Oh, we're just going to rip it, I think. Yeah, he's yeah, just, just slamming it down. <laughs> there goes the Rending Flames. Um, this, this is going to be a 20 three, damage Rending Flames. Six, um, does Actually, so 10, if 20. Bobo does have a Resolute Stand, I, I think he barely lives. 
I think Running Flames Banish will put him fire? up to... Yeah, Resolute prevents three. three. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll so send a swing in for Holy ten. shit! <laughs> well, it'll prevent, prevent I three, right? did because not think this would happen game one. Oh, dude, he got it. He got it. Yeah, that's really good. Dude, did he, <laughs> yeah, I think he's got it. He got it. He got game one. Trisket round one. Let's go. All righty. Yeah, that was round That was round one. Yeah. I mean, game one. Not even, sorry. Yeah, game one. And, you know, Lee recovered after the kind of... The misplay from the dungeon guide recovered and got there with the, the Triscuit, Fractured Crown, Erendite combo. Yeah. So at this point, if you're Bobo, not knowing what's in the cyborg, what are you bringing in for this matchup? I don't even know what I do. What, what, what does he even have? Like, yeah. does, does he have, like, anti material card tech? Holy shit, I'm guessing yeah, I mean, <laughs> you can blow up the Fractured Crown. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what are you bringing in? I don't think they're running Spurn Nash. Yep. Or like Varukin or something like yeah, that. Yeah, Broken Acolyte, if they're still running it, there wasn't too many. I've really. seen a lot of decks cut, cut Varukin recently, so. Yep. Um, like I said, he might have brought in Spurn Nash, because Spurn Nash is good for, say, the Scepter with a Water Ally. So if he's running a Scepter in the sideboard, that could be coming in. Spurn Nash could be coming in. That does make sense, yes. So then I guess we're also debating, you could bring in, I don't think we're running Raccoons. All right, I'm going to ask you the impossible question. If you're Lee, what do you what do you bring in? If you're playing this this deck. Blanche. If you're running Blanche, you're probably bringing in Blanche. All right, yeah, that does make a lot of sense, right? Because Blanche basically makes you answer the Blanche before you can kind of uh, and it him. does add to your fracture ground because Blanche Sorry. is a unique, is a unique ally. ally. Oh, Br Blanche, the, the the super spicy tech. The better question is, is he running Morgan? Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> you could also run Morgan as well. <laughs> Just you know, you get a little bit of anti recovery. Can't die to a couple. Um, oh, can't no. buy, die to non attack damage, and then another unique ally filling that grave. I mean, with with such a wild deck, right? Like almost anything's on board. Like yeah. any anything's game. Yeah, I can't tell you honestly what would even be the so sideboard. I have yeah, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> I imagine maybe a couple of cards for like Viridian, like the basic, like a Viridian trick, and maybe a Nullifying Lantern for the matchups. I this is I gotta see this deck list at some point, right? Yeah. This is one of the ones I'm gonna go home or go, uh, you know, go back to the hotel tonight and be like, I gotta see this list. Yeah. I mean, Triscuit Stonks just went up. Triscuit just got a game one win, round one at Nationals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Triscuit yeah. Stonks just all went up everywhere across the board. And against like a real deck, <laughs> yeah, right? Versus erupting, probably the decks that one of the decks we talked about being probably one of the most favored, um, not even not heavy showing as well as. More likely to make top cut decks at nationals. Yeah. So seeing it just beat to come back from the brink of defeat at 23 life. I mean, like uh, you're you're coming here at nationals, yeah. right? Lee Lee had to have at least some degree of confidence yeah. bringing Triscuit, and he's like, you know what? Maybe I'll just get people off their game, and I'll just I'll just get them. Yeah. So we do see a little bit um, briefly on the clock. We do have nine minutes in the round for the feature match area. They did start a little bit later than. Um, overall nationals. I think the nationals <laughs> round one for everyone else oh is about God, the good time. You life. might hear the nerves come when through. Game state, but at least like, that does not affect the future match because we do have yeah. nine minutes because of the little bit so delay because you have to get all set up and yes. everything like that on camera. Yeah, they, they do get to play out their, their full allotted time. Yep. So I didn't happen to see. I think Lee brought in a couple cards for Cyborg. He I, did. I'm for a material deck. I'm not sure what he brought in. I, I don't think. He, yeah, I don't think he brought any main deck cards. Yeah, I think uh, probably like I said, the Nova Lantern probably come in to turn off, say, the erupting combo and the flame, mo flame momentum. But I'm not sure what else will be brought in here. Um, yeah, no main deck, so no Blanche, sadly. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to see the Blanche. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of Blanche. I think she's a, she's a great card. But yeah, I, th I think um, Nullifying Lantern is a good call here. Yeah. Especially since you're already running Quicksilver Grail, so you can like you know speed in your your. Oh I'm just <laughs> the other guy, Bobo, did go ahead and decide to go first. Um, so we did see Bo drawn up. We do see the fire momentum uh, erupting. Hasty Mesher, Spurn the Ash, a Cremation Ritual. I think an Innovate Fury, and I it might be two eruptings and a Cremation Ritual in the opening hand. Yeah, it looks like he's just going to yeah, oh, run, so run out the sentry. Yep, so Cemetery Sentry's going to come down, get our discard draw, and then we're going to pass the turn over to Lee. So I guess it also makes sense. Lee's sitting here with the Fiend promo, as well on top of it, is playing Triscuit. <laughs> yeah. That was completely unexpected to be brought into this. Like, Lee's just going full flex at this point. It is, <laughs> yeah. And he got him with the, the, the Collector Triscuit, too. Yeah. So this is something that I'm super excited to see. And looks like Lee's going to go ahead and set up their turn. We do have Commissioner Joel set up the Hasty Messenger. Oh, jeez. Um, 
<laughs> so I was thinking Lee was going to swing into the cemetery century, but then wow. debated, oh, wait, cemetery yeah, century yeah. can kill my hasty yeah, she's, messenger. She's a two-two. Yeah. <laughs> that is a two-two, not a hasty messenger. Um, so we do um, imagine go ahead and deal one to face. Well, we're going to, um, looks like we're going to think about thinking about the hasty messenger trigger. I do see uh, a uh, temper seal in hand, which is going to yep, magic yep, card, and it yep. is. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so we do have the cremation ritual create a shock. I don't know if we want to do the cremation rituals just yet. Um, we could if we want to draw. Actually, if we cremation, we don't have enough to creative shock as well. So we may or may not see it. I mean, I don't hate it either way. You're getting the draw, the draw two that you're going to get no yep. matter yeah. which line. It looks like that's doing. what he's going to do as well. Yep. yep. He's going to go ahead and get our draw two. Dungeon Ooh. guide, fist, drawn Asker. In, yeah, drawn into a um, uh, dungeon guide. We're, we're set up for another Recollect turn. Um, Trisket coming in off the dungeon guide trigger. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and so we have a uh, fire resonance bubble yep. coming on in. Uh, Which like I do do like getting this first though, because of the fact that Trisket does get rid of the cards inside of the champion lineage, the fire resonance bubble would not be useful if yeah, Trisket does hit good, the board. That's a good point, actually. So heads up play by Bob to make sure you go. Bobo, sorry, sorry, not Bob, um, to go ahead and get that done out of the way early before generating some like a GCR. Oh, that's actually interesting. Yeah, I, w I didn't think about that. Once you become Trisket, you can't play your fire element cards anymore. Well, no, you can't because Trisket doesn't enable. Oh, because it enables all the elements. Yeah. Yes, yes, good. Doesn't enable everything, but it, it just sucks your opponents for bobbles. But technically, actually, actually, hold on. Does Trisket enable it, or does she become them? I, th I think she enables it. Okay, so enable so fire resin bubble won't still be working. Uh, yeah, well. that's why I double check because I'm like, oh, if she becomes it, technically water bubbles in play, wind bubbles in play, and all the other bubbles does come into factor. Yeah, she just reads literally fire, water, and wind elements are enabled. So, so it looks like we did end up having hasty match come in, get the swing with the discard, discard. And I think also their own. It looks like a cremation ritual. I was sort of dead in hand, and then we cremation ritual our own hasty to fill that hand up, ready to erupting. Yeah, and on Lee's turn, pretty simple, right? Just banish your floating, floating memory, level up to Xander level one, kind of further our game plan here, trying to get to level two so you can dungeon guide into it. And um, we, looks like we do have the, the good setup. We do have an Honorable Vanguard in hand with another Cremation Ritual, so if we wanted to, we can Honorable Vanguard, get an extra one damage, and then sack it to a Cremation Ritual, draw two again to get the other floating memory card into our, into our yeah. graveyard. Yeah, exactly. But notably, uh, Lee is going to have to dig a little bit because I don't... I don't see a Trisket in hand, right? So no. he, has, he has to actually dig for his Trisket. I mean, we do have a create. At least we have the cremation ritual. We have creative shots yes. in hand. We have a couple of cards that could let us dig and filter through our yeah. decks as much as possible. Um, I don't see. I think we have double fast gear. If not triple yeah, fast gear in hand. I I think I see double fast and resolute stand. Wow. <laughs> yep, I do see that resolute stand. Oh, sorry, that, uh, that third. Um, okay, I can't, fast I can't gear is I think a cool. Yeah, oh, okay. thieving cut. Oh, the one in the back. Made. Yeah, I, I see. Right. Yes. So we both made some so mistakes here. So, looks like we are debating our <laughs> game plan here. Um, we do have two down, which I imagine might be an honorable vanguard. I don't think honorable we can fast here. I think yeah. our influence is still too high, and healing for it isn't going to be too relevant just yet. And we are going to go ahead oh, and, yep, and play the honorable vanguard, swing okay. in for one damage while we can. And then I, we're, I imagine we're sitting here debating whether or not we want to cremation ritual or creative shock instead. Yeah, he does have that, that fancy cremation ritual in hand. I guess the debate is um, if we're putting down three to. Cremation ritual. Ritual. Uh, we are going to. All right, so actually. Yeah, he's just gonna just run yeah. it out. Yeah. And we do have the fast okay. gear. We are going to draw two. We still creative shock, but I don't think we're going to create a shock because of the fact that Ooh. we would put the three down. Drew into a rending flames. We're, we're getting there. We're set up. Yeah, he's like assembling his uh, Voltron here. Yeah, we're we are set up ready to go. I do think that we probably will see at one point um, lead using yeah. fa this fast gear either heal or for just the fast float because of the fact that yeah. we can't create a shock it because they'll go down into our memory, and we probably have to banish, depending on what we draw. And I don't know how much we really want to banish some of the cards we have in our hand right now. Yeah, I, I, I do think it could be likely that he just gets it out there to get the, the float. Yeah, especially because we know our opponent is now playing Merlin level 2. We want to probably use our floating memory as much as possible before that Merlin level 2 comes into play here. Yeah. But we do have that Cemetery Century swinging in for two. Um, that is also, I didn't realize at the time, that is the oh, SP1 sure. foil art. <laughs> it's very nice. It is a very nice one. It's one of my favorite arts. I, I love that card. And we do see Bobo just, uh, instead of leveling up, he just opts to draw more cards, right? Getting that GCR, immediately cracking it. Yeah. Is your plan at this point just to set up for just not even bother leveling, just go for a big erupting before your opponent can play Trisket? I think so. I think he was like, okay, I, I spent too much time kind of dirtling around last game. I can't let them assemble his Voltron. And uh, he's just going to try to get uh, that critical mass as soon as possible. Yeah, so you do see a Shima come down. So it does turn off something like a running thing coming down next turn, unless Lee has a couple more allies to swing. But I think we do have the Thieving Cut, though, so we can Thieving Cut away the Shieldmate if we need to during our turn. And we looks like the turn might have been was uh, might have been passed, and we are at the end of turn response. And yeah, I think Lee's debating right now setting up for the 
P2, Fasker, and if I hear, I might have heard it, I might not have. That Lee okay. might have asked what's the influence at, Fasker? depending if this Fasker would heal, heal, but I think Lee is at a greater influence than I, Bobo. I think so. It's hard to count oh, with, the, with the cards yeah, matching the same color. But. Yeah. So, no, it looks like actually Lee was less. So, he does have less. All right. <laughs> okay. That's a really, really nice Fasker, then. Yeah, so yeah, Fasker did everything it needed to do. It healed us back down to one. We have the floating memory. We are going to go with the level two. We are going Death Executioner. Ooh, so this is the other Xander. This is the new one. So this is the one where he gets to possibly get a card back if he, if he wants. Yeah, so I think he's going to... I don't think he has a fast card. No, we have two cremation rituals and a haste match. We don't have an attack card or assassin attack, attack uh, assassin reaction card and a graveyard to get back. But it does give us extra... Um, yeah, the two prep counters. Yeah, two prep counters. I'm not sure what we're running outside of assassin dropper that is that. utilizing that. And I'm oh, sorry, what thieving cut utilizes uh, Yeah, the thieving it. cut to draw cards. Yeah. So we are utilizing that a little bit. And I think, like I said, that is the Thieving Cut. No, that is, wait, is that in this place? Um, the first card. I I don't know. It's hard to tell, actually. It's spoiled, so it makes it a little bit harder. Yeah. But I think that was a Displace. I think, I it, I think it is a Displace. It, it looks like, displace. I, I think it's a win card. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay, so we do have a Displace. I imagine main, because I don't think we saw him put anything in sideboard the main board. I mean, yeah, maybe it's just, I mean, I mean, obviously it's for, for Triscuit, right? Yeah. <laughs> Once you're in Triscuit territory, you get the Displace. I guess it really gets rid of something like if you're facing the Crux Merlin, which technically you are, but these are as long as you run the Incarnate Magistries. Yeah, it just kind of clears the way so you can kind of um, smash on in with your Erendite combo. So we do have the Dungeon Guide coming up, but I don't think we, I didn't think I saw the Triscuit in hand. So we are just Dungeon Guiding. Just imagine get the life totals up there. Yeah, and you know, you're setting it up. So like getting uh, your Lux early enables you to play your crown out and, you know, you know get this accruing value. Yeah, we did hear a little bit of chuckle from play the play players play. as soon as they're like, make sure you search for your level three. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't miss your trigger. <laughs> Don't miss trigger this time. So we do have um, Xander hitting the board, and then we did end up banishing, it looks like a Fasker and a Resolute stand. Fasker did his job again at Floating Memory, so it was good enough to just banish for Floating Memory and do its job just to get into the grave. So yeah, uh, interesting thing about this Xander is he now has uh, Stealth and Spell Shroud until okay. the beginning of uh, his next turn. He also gets the extra prep counter, too. I The funniest part, not even funny, just the big brain part about this is the fact that Erupting Rhapsody does not actually count as a spell. Oh, Erupting yeah. Rhapsody is, it a skill? is skill. Yeah, interesting. So there is the fact that you can't die to a fireball, but it is forcing your opponent to have double Erupting in order to deal lethal damage at this point, which I don't think, um, we have only, I think only four cards in the grave for yeah. a that are fire anyway. I don't think we're seeing too much of a... I mean, with Xander at level three and 25 health, he's pretty yeah. far off. Um, there is, we might see if it is in there. I was supposed to say, a level one Lorraine, CUR. And now I'm a little of sad course. that Rye wasn't a CUR. Yeah, uh, yeah. I feel, I, feel a little, <laughs> I feel a little hurt <laughs> as one of the Rye players in here that that Rye wasn't a CUR, but we have a CUR Lorraine. I mean, yeah, you know. <laughs> but I did see, like I said, the Fire Momentum in hand, so we're probably setting up just to go to Fire Momentum. And I think we also have the Innovate Fury, so we can de level and then re level into Rye later on, or just go straight to Merlin, depending on the situation. But I mean, Bobo does have like a large grip of cards there. Yeah, I think I see double erupting. We have Innovate Fury, we have a Spur in the Ash. He even has a uh, re Resolute erupting. Stand, which could come into play against, uh, uh, you know, against the the, uh, the Rending Flames attacks. Yeah, so we are going to, uh, temper so we're hard casting he's, he's playing it. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. You know, get the extra counter. Yeah, I guess if you go, it's floating memory in the grave, you go level two Merlin. We are going to go ahead and pay three. Yeah, so, so we can do a fire momentum, add an extra damage. And we do have, uh, in response, Excalibur Ooh. getting rid of the sword. <laughs> so it looks like this fire momentum is going to come in for, I think, a total of seven damage? I don't name anything. No yeah, seven damage. I think so. Um, but we don't, because we're not level three, well, we're not Trisket. We don't get the class bonus yeah, off of the Excalibur. Yeah, you don't get the, the extra Trisket swag. Nope, but it does negate. So we do have, I said, um... I don't see damage being. Is there a ruling that I might have missed? Cards in hand? Uh, four. So. Four cards in hand. Yeah. Ah, so uh. Xander has uh, stealth. Ah, that's right. I forgot. So Xander does have stealth. Um, getting rid of the true sight weapon, the attack doesn't come through. So it does fizzle the attack because it cannot technically target a stealth unit. So yeah, I mean, Xander yeah. level three is coming in clutch. No, that was a really heads up play. I didn't even realize that was in hand. Because the, um, the way stealth sort of works in this game, too is that stealth can't target stealth. So if Lorraine had stealth, you can't target it, but you need True Sight specifically to target stealth units. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, and a lot of people, you know, they just run out the Sword of Seeking because it's just a really efficient sword, but it does have True Sight on it. Yeah, Sword of Seeking and Bulwark's uh, sword are two really efficient zero-drop swords. Um, that, I think these lists are starting to run, 
and just choose two sides good across the board, and we did end up hard casting the Assassin's Ripper. Yeah, Ripper's coming down, and it's potentially a lot of a lot of damage here. Oh, and that was a displaced by so it is confirmed. Displace is in the banish. It was a yeah. displaced. Yep. <laughs> And I don't know what we were sighing about here oh, from yeah, Lee. Um, Lee top deck and then sort of gave a really big oh, sigh. Um, I'm not sure if that was out of relief, oh, frustration. Um, I yep. think we're debating whether or not we can. So if we pop dagger here, a uh, ripper here. So ripper does three damage yep. with the with the prep counter. We'll Rending does three as well, this, so six. We'll be up to twelve. Twelve uh, with three damage marks. So that's what Whatever. fifteen <laughs> virtual. Yeah, we need another five to kill the range. Yeah, oh, but we do have a grip of cards from I Bobo, and we did see a resolute stand in Bobo's hand. Yeah, yeah, Bobo does have resolute. He would have to hard cast it because he's only he's only level one. Yep, and I think I he can. He doesn't have the four card yep. grip, so he can't hard cast resolute stand. That's if we didn't see it being put down for casting the fiery momentum. That's true. Okay, I don't know. Not sure what. Done. Yeah, not sure what it, uh, what's in his memory right now. And I think we just hit time on the table, so they are going to turns on the table now. We do have a fire momentum coming in, prepped. So that is going to go ahead and push Bobo up to 15. We do have the time limit here on stream now, so we got uh, five minutes in the round. Five minutes in the round. I think we just barely hit the necessity needed to hit three banish. Yeah, we yep. hit double hit. cremation and hasty. Hit exaxes. So this is yeah, this is coming in for uh, 12, right? Yep, coming in for 12. Um, I think Bobo has just got to do math at this point. Is how, can I win next turn? Because at this point, oh, did he keep resolute in hand? Yeah, that's also the question. Um, if Rezor Sam, so we'll put him up to 15, which does uh, have to give Lee another turn to possibly push lethal. We probably won't see, it just takes it. So we don't, it could be in hand or it could have just taken the damage here. Uh, we don't know, but Lee more than likely can't set up another running flame. We only have one fire card, so we're just yep. going to have to hard play running flame for three damage. Yeah, you, you mean, we still have access to Assassin's Ripper and still one prep counter, so that's still three damage yep. just from the Ripper alone. Yeah. Yep, so that would come down. Well, technically, I guess, yes. Ripper plus running flame would do five to yeah. go up to um, get to 20. But I imagine Bobo might be debating here whether or not we are going to go to level two just to make sure we don't yeah. die next turn. Yeah, I think you level up to, to get out of that range. But I think we're also in the hard spot of, I think Bobo's also because Lee's tapped out. Do we have lethal on board? Do we have enough to combo? I mean, maybe. He doesn't have a ton of fire cards in the bin. He has some. Yeah. I mean, we do have one, two, three, four, five, six cards. So we can erupting, gain six levels, go up to level seven, um, and then I think I think I'm pretty sure I saw a grip of like three eruptings in Bobo's hand. Oh, I mean, three eruptings would be kind of but it's still kind of wild. Though. It actually might be twenty. Well, actually, no, it might be. So it's twenty seven damage off the initial one, then another banish for another level. So we might get there barely. He's Discordia. Oh yeah, Discordia. Harp off, off actual levels does come into play. Yeah, we are yeah. Gonna have Discordia. I think he's just gonna go for it. He's just gonna try it. Yeah. I think he said, right, if you have lethal next turn, you have lethal. But I'm gonna go ahead and try and push my lethal this turn because you're at times or at turns like. We're just gonna win. Either I'm going down one zero, or we're going one more draw. Um, and gonna, I think okay. Bobo would rather just get the draw out of the way now. And we are gonna go ahead and swing two to push up to three. Yeah, he's gonna. So if you don't know, Xander level three has 25 health, right? So he needs 22 damage. So I do see double erupting, but I don't. I don't see the Ember Song. I don't see Ember Song either. I see like a clumsy apprentice. There's that resolute stand. So I, are we just going to try and push for a big fire momentum turn, I wonder? Potentially. Uh, yeah, because I see Innovate Fury. I see Double Spur in the Ash, Triple Erupting, uh, a Clumsy Apprentice, and I think a Fire, fire Momentum in, in Grip. So I think now at this point we're just doing the math of yeah. can we push damage or fire momentum lethal. This is like one of those uh, perfect mind situations. All the numbers are just kind of flying around his head. So we are going to go ahead and just fire momentum off the start. Um, there, there's, Lee has nothing in hand, nothing can respond to. Oh, no. oh, oh, we did have a card in the stream. So he does have, uh, he does have uh, his own resolute. Yep, and Resolute Sam will come in the gate three um, of uh, put us up to eight. So just bias an extra turn ourselves. Pass. We'll try something next turn lethal. Wow, I mean, okay. with the clock ticking yep. down, two minutes left to go. Like this is what you want to do if you're Lee, right? You're already yep. one, you're up one game. You're up one game. You'll take you'll take the match if this goes to time. And he does end up. So Bobo ends up passing the turn. Um, we're now on, technically this is turn two out of three. So we have a Grail coming down, uh, potentially with a Lantern underneath. Yeah. Wasn't in wasn't in the, the main uh, material deck, but he could have definitely sided, in, sided it in. Yeah, I think this is a good safe route. If you don't push Leafless turn as Lee, you could just, in response to something, go ahead and a shield might come down. Yeah, just yeah. shields up, I think, yeah. I think at this point, you shields up. Your, your opponent's taking their final turn, I'm pretty sure. So at this point, you could go ahead and reveal Grail in response to an erupting or something like that. Turn it offline and pretty much just lock the game out for this time limit. Okay. So we are going to see Channeling Stone come down. 
But like I said, Bobo is still looking out for the Ember Song. We have yet to see it. I mean, it's basically do or die here for yeah. Bobo, right? And we did get rid of one of Resident Evil and Spurn Ash did go into grave, so we can't um, uh, Spurn Ash something or the Lantern. That's all I got. So. So, and yeah, right. reeled his hand, didn't yeah. have it, the damage, shook hands, and Lee ends up going one oh on Trisket. <laughs> Trisket, dude. Uh, Trisket. Lot, like, Trisket, Aaron Dyche, Fractured <laughs> Crown, Rending Flames. Did. Yeah, this is going to be also the biggest flex, because uh, imagine being Lee and going you, into the fact that erupting? I'm uh, undefeated so on Trisket and Ash. Um, yeah, what, yeah, going you in 1-0. Yeah, yeah. so I imagine at this point, they might be talking about whether oh, he had the lethal line, I think? Possibly, let's see. So he's saying, yeah, because I think he's saying, yeah, I had the erupting, but I don't have the harmonize on yeah, you yeah, didn't have the Ember Song. Yeah, so it shakes him through. Holy shit. <laughs> and we go ahead, and yeah, that's just gets undefeated. I'm overall shocked. That's that's round one, and could you have guessed? Could you have guessed not only Trisket round one that came on board, but actually won? Yeah, won. And it's sort of almost a demanding fashion, too. Like, it looked really bad for Trisket play, especially after we had a little bit of the mishap with the first dungeon guide. Yeah. I was like, oh, no, this is a really bad back foot for for Lee, and the next thing you know, Lee just came on in, and it was like, he was like, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and play my second dungeon I'd of all four I've drawn this game, and go to Trisket, reset my health, and I'm gonna kill you in two turns after that. Yeah, it, it was like, it, it's such a, <laughs> it's such an interesting line, right? Like, once you assemble it, it's very powerful, right? Yeah. You have the Fracture Crown on board, you have the extra um, potential health, didn't even need the health, right? Yeah. It's just like Arendite, and even with the extra, like what, it only got like one banish? Yeah. Even with that, it was, it was more than enough to, to get there. Uh, I did hear, though, I think we are going to head to break here shortly because all the rounds are finished. We're going to end up getting all the pairings back up for the next round, and we're going to sound like we're going to take a break here ourselves. But, yeah, yeah uh, stay around and catch us shortly.
Hey everyone, welcome back to Grand Archive North American Nationals 2024. My name is Cam and I'm here joined again by Kel, also known as Red Zone Rogue. Oh, hello. Hey. Um, you know what? Let's let's talk a little bit about the last round, right? Yeah. Before we jump into round two, let's talk a little bit about round one because 
I think you could say it was a little bit spicy. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm glad we got Lee um, on camera playing maybe the most unique deck that I've seen of this format. Dude, it's so at cool. All. It's yeah. so cool. I, I, we saw the Fractured Crown come down, but when I saw Aaron died, I was like, oh, right. this this makes sense. Like, the stars have aligned. I've, I've seen what uh, he's trying to do, and right. it is glorious. Yeah, both of our players were playing like near max rarity decks, so I, <laughs> yeah. you know, I saw the match start and was like, maybe they're just trying to, you know, show off, have a little bit of fun. But that Triscuit deck looked like surprisingly strong. It, I, th I think once you get there, like once you assemble your Voltron, it's like, right. it's really powerful. Why well, you saw a twenty damage attack? Excalibur is such a messed up card when you have that class bonus and you just lock people out from from playing the game. It's not entirely copium to to like the Fractured Crowd. <laughs> yeah. I always like. I, I, I was the one to spoil that card, and I was like, you know what? There could be a situation where you're like, plus two, rending flames, do a bunch of damage, and we saw it. Right. We, actually, we actually saw round one here at uh, North American Nationals, which is just crazy to me. Yeah, super awesome to see people playing stuff that is not exactly what we figured we would see. You know, we, we figured, I, I know you guys talked a little bit about it last round, lots of water allies, lots of yeah. erupting decks. Um, but w Wind allies, potentially. Yeah. But it's great to see people are, are sort of trying to break that mold, especially with ALC being as new as it is. Um, uh, yeah. Decks are still sort of undiscovered. So. Yeah, we, we mentioned it like just you know chatting before the, the first round, right? This is going to be an event that kind of sets the stage for future Nationals events, right? right? A lot of people are going to be looking to this event as kind of like the, the first big premiere event, and they're going to be taking notes, right? A lot of the players participating in the other Nationals are going to be like, oh, these are the decks that performed well, maybe right. these are the decks that underperformed well, or maybe there's uh, room to innovate here or there. You know, people are always trying to come up with their with their super secret sauce, and you always saw it with the Triscuit, right? Right, yeah, and I'm glad to see they're doing well. It's, it's so dangerous to take such a like a new idea to to a tournament like this where there's so much on the line yeah i mean like it's a little risky right yeah. but i mean if you if you're confident in it then you can you know run run the tables yeah for sure um so yeah hopefully we're gonna have um i, I think we've selected our our match for round two we're gonna have uh Again, some some more interesting stuff um, that are not exactly decks that we've seen in a while. Yeah, so I, I do believe both players in round two are, are one and zero, right? Yeah. And one of them, at least that we know of, is is a pretty spicy list as well. Yeah. Like it's it's something that I think people will be excited to see on, on coverage. I know I'm I'm excited for it, and uh, um, yeah, it's gonna be a great, great, uh, great match. Yeah, and we'll get that to you guys in just a few seconds, but. Yeah, it's such the, the the energy in this room is just so so electric. Uh, it, it's great to see people so excited to to play the game and and competing for you know those very coveted spots of the World Championships coming up in May. Yeah, I mean people are playing here for not only money, not only prizes, but also like you said, invite to World Champs, yeah. and that's going to be like a a, a big deal. It's a huge uh, deal. happening in um, May in Las Vegas actually. Yeah. Yeah, May May 10th through 11th, I believe, is, is the date for that event. And yeah, it's 16 players. It's going to be eight from this event. So the top eight of North American Nationals will get an invite. Yeah. And I believe it's the top four from the other two um, national championships yeah, and this I, month. And I do want to note that event is not only for those world uh, players. It there is going to be an ascent as well. Yeah. So everyone out there who wants to attend a, b a big Grand Archive event, that's going to be one of the... the the most exciting ones to to go to because you have the Ascent Worlds, but you also have the world premiere event for the next set. Yes, for really MRC, hard. super exciting. Yeah, and the um the Ascent is a it's a team event. Yeah, it's yeah. like kind of the first of its kind for for Grand Archive. Yeah, it's um something that that other games have done in the past, but it's uh yeah it's a, it's like a unified format where you, between you and your other teammates, you can only run a single play set of each yep. card. Um, so it's super interesting. Um, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, you can't just run like three erupting decks, right? right? You, you exactly. actually have to you pick and choose, which I think is really cool. Yeah, I, I think it makes material decks really exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it means you can't even run like three fire decks because you only, I believe, spirit is on the same list. I, I, I think you can't. Well, you can run, run the serene spirits though, right? right? So you can get two. Yeah, so you yeah. Get two fire you get decks. two. Yeah. But you have to like also divvy up like the divine relics. Right. Like maybe someone's going to do some spicy divine relic tech. But uh, I think we're actually ready to jump into our feature match. It's going to be a really, really exciting one. So, um, yeah, let's yeah, get let's to it. <laughs> Byfall and Modest Mewtwo coming in both 1-0. Uh, we do know that uh, uh, Byfall is going to be playing 
Fire Rye. Fire Rye. Yeah. I think I think that's a deck that he's very known for, right? Yeah, by a very accomplished Fire Rye player. So he's he's right at home. He took a bit of a break uh, for ALC from playing Rye, um, but for, he's he's uh, back to cool you know his comfort I pick. And, and I, I talked to him yeah, a little bit at, earlier know, today, uh, and he's very confident uh, um, in his choice for the like weekend. Yeah, and I think I think Rye is a really interesting pick into this pack, right? Rye is one of those champions that definitely like a combo style character, but it's it's less of a wait and see. It's more of like I want to combo as soon as possible, right. turbo combo, all in kind of thing. Um, and yeah, on, on his opponent's side, we have Modest Mewtwo, who is Four playing um, a water deck. I believe it is a, a more ally based Xander. Water it's my deck. boy Xander. So yeah, we are seeing uh, more. Uh, not another Xander deck, but a completely different uh, type of Xander deck. Yeah, and we've, we've talked a lot about water allies being prevalent um, this weekend, but Xander is usually not where um, those those decks fall. They're usually either Lorraine or Diana, so it's interesting to see what the Assassin package sort of adds here. And I think his first play here, the Esteem Knight, I think this is what we're going to see a lot of from just allies' decks in general, the three-drop, two-three. Right. Like, that's kind of like the baseline. The classic. Yeah, for, for Grand Archive. Two, two, three-drop, two-three with various abilities. Um, the class bonus isn't going to be super relevant here because he's going to be playing uh, Xander. Right. Um, but still, stats are good enough. All right, so we're going to start off with an that's increasing right. danger I'm here. Right, over here. He's going to not only draw a card for Bifall, but also going to draw a card from his opponent. Yeah, Bifall, you know, playing Rai here, just really wants to draw cards, right? Just wants to draw as many cards as he can, so he can just, you know, combo off and throw some big old damaging, you know, fireballs and... Yeah. Yeah, Rai loses so much card advantage just due to the nature of his level 3, wants you to banish arcane spell yeah. cards to uh, get extra levels to allow you to cast some, some bigger, more explosive efficiency stuff. So it's great to get this card advantage early um, so that you can then later turn it into uh, levels for your arcane. Of course, uh, running out the very spicy creative shock here. We've seen a lot of players play that already yeah. <laughs> already this weekend. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm uh, curious if we're going to see anyone playing more and more creative shocks this weekend. I'm sure there's some out there. I personally don't have the yeah. fancy one. So. But, uh, you know, you love to see it. Uh, the Grand Archive players really like personalizing their decks. Back. Feature match putting us to shame, making uh, making all my decks look worse by comparison. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, we do see a dagger coming on down. Um, so this is a dagger even before we level up to, to Xander. Yeah, interestingly enough, we're putting the poison dagger into play rested. Um, usually this is something that comes under uh, like a Quicksilver good. Grail to avoid stuff like Spurn to Ash or Varrock and Acolyte blowing up that. But it seems like he's not super worried about that. He's just going to run it out, try to try to get some pressure on. Yeah, I mean, like, Modest Mewtwo, I don't think he knows what Bifall is running. Right. But maybe if he knows him, you know, him as a person, knows sure. what he's known for, maybe he's like, okay, he's running right. I he's don't really <laughs> need to protect this dagger. Yeah, you sit across from Bifall, he plays a turn one increasing danger. You're like, all right, yeah, I, yeah. I, I see what's going on here. Right. Oh, wow. Going to see a, a sea sprite wow, diver here is going to start working on those fire cards in the graveyard. Um, unclear, you know, if Bifall's doing any sort of fire graveyard stuff like Erupting Rhapsody, so it's good to just sort of nip that in the bud. Yeah, now. it's kind of, kind of an unassuming ally, but uh, you see a lot of water decks run it, if if not all water ally decks yeah. run it, because it's just a really efficient 2-3. Sometimes it costs 3, and it just eats a card. It's it, I think of it as like a, it's just a bigger raccoon, right? Right. Yeah, it's like you just said, the 3 mana 2-3, the, the standard for all of the, the allies in Grand Archive right now. And so here we have a GCR coming down and immediately cracking it for an extra card. And once again, this is, he's playing Rai. He just wants to draw as many cards as he can. Wants to try to put some arcane cards tactfully into his memory so that he can uh, banish them to level up with stuff like Dungeon Guide. But right now he's just setting up, trying to get as many cards in hand as possible. Yeah, and looking, looking at his hand, I did see a Resolute. I see um, Increasing Danger as well. Likely what he's uh, setting up to play right here. Yeah, that's always going to be the problem for Rai. We're, we're going to see how he can stem the bleeding. There's already uh, four power on the board that he's really going to have to contend with as the game progresses. Because if he gets to the late game, Rai is, is going to be his, his advantaged. But he has to work pretty hard um, to get past these these allies on the board. Yeah, definitely in this matchup, the, the Water Allies deck is the aggressor. And they really just want to push damage as much as they can. In a lot of respects, it's what you would call like a fair deck. Mm -hmm. They just want to win by attacking with, with dudes. Um, and uh, Bifall's going to be like, hey, you can't attack with dudes. <laughs> Looks like we can't attack with dudes here. We're playing a peaceful reunion, which says as long as you have not declared an attack this turn, <laughs> neither player know. can declare attacks until the beginning of your next turn. So he's going to be safe from those allies, at least for the next turn. Yeah, it basically gains him four life here. Yeah. And, well, plus whatever else that uh, 
Modest is going to end up playing. Green, I guess Very smart by Falk. Two cards in hand as his water yeah. opponent was on three cards, uh, maybe holding up a Frostbind. To yeah. Sort of interact. You always have to think about the Frostbind. Ooh, here we have uh, a Scepter. This, this makes a lot of sense, right? You want to get the Scepter out as early as possible so you can maximize the amount of damage that it's going to deal. So uh, if you get it out before you've leveled up at all, it's a virtual like 12, 12 damage. Yeah, and, and that really does add up. Uh, the first one doesn't feel so dangerous, but once yeah, you're getting into that level 3 range and Scepter is threatening 12 damage of your theoretical 25 life, that is quite a big deal. Yeah, so it's just, it adds inevitability. And that's kind of a fair deck that you're just going to be attacking with some more dudes. So we have a really interesting one here in Nia Misveld Scout. She's going to reveal uh, Byfall's memory. Show um, me your secret. Yeah, and then uh, uh, Mewtwo here is going to get to name any card, not not just one in the memory, and uh, that card is going to cost one more to activate, and that can also be material deck cards. So if he smartly yep. puts Byfall on Rai here, he can name Rai level one to make it a little bit tougher for him to level up. Yeah, or just any other card he's potentially worried about. Yeah. Um, the the old school goozle um, trick is to like turn one Nia, like get the soul read, try to make it so they can't uh, yeah they can't level up right yeah he might just name careful study or something here we'll we'll see if we can oh, figure out what what was that. named here on Nia yeah and th th that's also just a static effect too so it's just like cards with the chosen name cost one more to play yeah. so you can also just pick a card that they you know you think your opponent's gonna play you know multiple copies of and just right. kind of like. You know, tax them. Yeah, maybe they go for Arcane Blast or, or, or Fireball, something that's yeah. going to matter in the late game, because you, you know that these ride decks are, aren't really going to be removing a card like Nia from the board. So yeah, yeah. Well, unless around. he's running like some sort of like late game sweeper. You know? Yeah, some like Anger the Skies or, or Purge and Flames. Yeah. And what did he name? It's hard to see. <laughs> No, not one of the cards I named. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what that says. But so, so it looks like two cards were banished. So it looks like Rai was named here because they did banish two cards there for Rai level one. Okay. So we do have Rai level one coming on in. I mean, this is uh, all, all part of the game plan, right? You, you need to get to Rai level three, like you mentioned earlier. You want right. to get those uh, arcane cards in your banishment so you can get the bonus levels, so you can just finish off your opponent. With a, with a flurry of spells. Yeah, yeah, Rai's going to do a lot of wheel spinning for these first couple of turns. Looks like he found another Increasing Danger. Such a sort of innocuous card, Increasing Danger, but so very powerful. And the turns where you see multiples of these are just some of the best that, that you can do in this Rai deck. Yeah, it's just one of those cards where you're like, you know, I get to draw a card, and you get to draw a card, but I don't care about you drawing cards. Right, yeah. I just want the cards They're to kill better. you. Like, I don't, as long as I'm alive, I don't really care what you're doing. Right. We just saw another one cast as well. That's three increasing dangers this game. Yeah, that's just quite good. Playing all of them. Yeah, but you know, once again, it, modest is getting these cards as well. Yeah. So this is just more allies that he's going to be able to, to to pump out onto the field. Yeah, there's definitely a cost here. He's at eight cards in hand. His opponent uh, has that poison dagger on on board, and assumingly he's going to level up to assassin next turn to just pressure a whole lot. Looks like uh, he's instead going to opt for a little bit of card advantage. He knows he's not under a whole lot of pressure from Rai. Yeah, get that fire bobble. Get that fire bobble while he can. We we do know, and I think uh, Modus also knows because he saw uh, Bifal's memory that he's running um, those not not just running the resolute stands, which is pretty. Uh, standard, but he's got them. He's yeah. got them in hand. Holding them, yeah. So you have to like ca you know factor that in. You have to you know power through all the resolute stands. Right. Currently, you have to pay for them, right? True. Cannot cannot cast them for free. Um, so might now might be the time to sort of put that pressure on, make him cast these and resolute I stands. I think uh, that that's might be what. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly what he's doing right here. So again, big big heads up play from Byfall. He's keeping those two cards in hand to make sure this resolute stand resolves. And you, you got to do it right. You got to attack in, and you know if he doesn't resolute stand, that's where you can oh potentially so think about my deck. you know cracking your dagger or something like that. But he knows that he's got him in hand, so he's just like, you know, right. I, I'm gonna make you use him. Really uh, dangerous to run into something like Song of Frost here, but it, it looks like Mewtwo did not have it, so Resolute Sand is going to resolve and, and keep Byfall pretty safe this turn. And here we have another uh, two three for two. That is, <laughs> in this particular matchup, is literally just going to be a 2-3 two, for 2. It's the name of the game, 2-3s two, for 2, or 3. 2-3s yeah. two, for 3. <laughs> oh, yeah, 2-3s for 3, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have five. Five. But yeah, we, we are, I mean, 2-3 two, for 2 would be great. But <laughs> no, no, we're going to 2-3s for 3. <laughs> we we got to wait till we get to, to Carter for our 2-3s our, our for 2. I mean, Carter is, is quite strong. Sir not appearing in this match, though. No. So we do see a uh, nice little uh, safeguard amulet coming on down. 
-hmm. Yeah, an interesting choice to get Safeguard Amulet. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure exactly what they're mm, frightened of here. It can prevent the one from the the dagger. You can use. You can pop it to prevent the four from a scepter. So maybe he's just going That's to use it as sort of like a, a fast cure. I, I think the scepter is unpreventable damage, though. I I'm not is sure. It? I mean, let's take a look. But yeah, definitely an interesting choice. Mm -hmm. And it looks like we're going to go for our dungeon guide to get up to level two, assuming putting That's three arcane seven, cards seven, down in our eight, memory eight. to start pumping up those numbers uh, for our... You're right. It, you can prevent the damage from it. Okay. An interesting play, for sure. But, it, uh, you know, four life is four life, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing to sneeze at. So it looks like we're just resolve. thinking about, yeah, just how we're going to resolve this dungeon guide here. Roll. Uh, roll to keep. One, two, three, four, yeah, I think you made the right, right call. I think this, the safeguard is, like, directly to prevent the damage from the scepter. Yeah. Ride it has a... Large hand. He, he's <laughs> been drawing cards this whole game. Yeah, he's really uh, got a great early game. Uh, sometimes Ryle, he, has, he plays so many arcane cards that sometimes he's going to struggle in the early game to find playable cards or, or cards that he wants to play. But Byfall really was what set was up that? pretty well early here. Peaceful? And it looks like, yeah, we're going to go right into another peaceful oh. reunion, say no more attacks. We're just going to hang out for another turn. Yeah, that's, that's basically what you want to do, right? Just draw cards and stall the game as long as possible because you're like, hey, if I can get to my late my end game, then uh, I can just kill you in one, one fell swoop. Yeah, we're, we're getting close there. It's, it's going to start getting really scary, but the, the thing about this Water Allies one, deck, two, three, they have four, such five, a six, wide board right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. They're going to go up to Xander here to one, get two, their Assassin class bonus uh, for their Poison seven, Dagger. Three. So any time okay. that Bifall doesn't have a way uh, to Xander stop Mewtwo from attacking, it's going to be a lot of damage. That he's e e every single turn, it's going to get worse and worse. Right. right? Like, he's just going to keep amassing this you know, huge army of two threes. Um, well, fortunately, he yeah, yeah. did end up banishing a paladin, which is uh, one of the bigger two threes. Sure. I say that because she, she can get a, a buff counter on her and become, right. become a three four, which is uh, quite big in Grand Archive. So Xander leveling up to one here. We do know he runs the full Xander package. He goes, mm -hmm. he goes up to... Um, I do believe he goes up to level three in this deck list. He does, yeah. He's playing uh, the new Xander level two, and then uh, Xander Korhazi's Chosen as his level three. Yeah, I think Korhazi's Chosen is pretty interesting because of the, the stealth and the spell shroud. Yeah, it, it just makes, it, especially in a matchup like this where they're looking to throw uh, basically only spells at you. Yeah. If, you, if you get that spell shroud, it's, uh, it's like your very own peaceful reunion, right? You, you stop uh, the Rye player from killing you for a turn. Yeah, you got one turn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got one turn. And so, it, basically, it's just like how long can uh, Bifall okay. stall okay. here? Yeah. Like more, more allies are coming down. We have a Snow Fairy, um, just kind of like you know, <laughs> making it so you can't chip in with your. Uh, I mean, that'd be really good for you. That's uh, level one. Your dungeon guide at all? Yeah. Yes. But more importantly, just know, putting another body on the field. More bodies and, and another force bodies. multiplier with this the poison the dagger holes, the turns your one damage into two damage. Yeah. Byfall is going to opt to get a tariff ring here, which is a peaceful re reunion yeah. at home. Yep. Uh, <laughs> make him at least uh, at least pay to attack with some of those yeah. allies. I mean, he, Modest has been drawing cards from all of the increasing dangers, so he can pay for a little bit, right? Yeah, he's got eight cards, so that's four attacks if that's all he does, and that, that is a lot. Yeah, he, he, he can maximize that. And this dagger is just kind of sitting there, like, you know, looming on over, threatening. We three see three cards coming down. Is this another dungeon guide? It Ooh, is. Yeah. Spicy <laughs> foil signed dungeon Roll. guide. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six. So yeah, this is where, where the game gets dangerous. We're going to go up to Rye Storms here. And, Ooh, uh, banishing cards. two arcane yeah. cards. Yeah, we're going to see if we can get a count here. So he's got four, it looks seven. like. Yeah. Yep. It's like four arcane cards, so, so, so Storm Seer is going to be level seven. Base level seven, yeah. yeah. And every other subsequent well, uh, uh, arcane card, you have to keep note of it because it oh, will increase Rai's level by one, and that's really relevant because Rai wants to get as high as level as possible to do lots of damage with fireballs or make his arcane blasts really cheap. Yeah, arcane blast has uh, efficiency and is cost 11. So right now it's going to be cost him four, which is still... Mm -hmm. Pretty expensive, so he's going to look to do some more banishing of some arcane cards. Mm -hmm. He does get to pay oh, one to cast his careful study, which is no, no, very perfect. strong. Yeah, careful study is going to put a bunch of uh, enlightened counters on <laughs> Rai, and then he can just cash those in for cards later. Card? Yeah. Or, you know, various other effects. Right. 
Looks like we have another play from Rai. Another, the same careful careful study. Yeah, this is exactly what you want, is to just keep building that card advantage, especially now that you've reached your pseudo endgame. Rai level three, and you're just going to start building up that hand, start to look for the ways to actually kill your opponent. And I think he's going to be going up to, what, 12? 12 counters, and then he's immediately going to cash them in to draw some cards. Yeah. Yeah, just just still setting up. I, I don't think we're going to see any any fireballs uh, thrown just yet. Going to try to set up for a big explosive turn, maybe as soon as One next turn. Ten counters, pardon, yeah. pardon me. But we do have oh, a um, arcane sight, so that's going to increase rise level by one, draw a card. <laughs> and it makes that, that uh, next careful study absolutely free. Uh, he's he's kind of popping off. Yeah. <laughs> You're playing peaceful. We see a, so see a scry disguise in his hand as well. So if he wants to start digging, that's going to be a scry for eight uh, to start looking for. Arcane Blast, Fireballs, Erratic Bolts, all that, that good stuff. Yeah, it looks like he's just going to hold on to it. All right, I mean, he's, he's, he's content here. He's sitting on a good amount of um, Enlightened Counters and uh, just kind of, like, biding his time so he can sure. kind of, like, pop off and yeah. blast, uh, blast Modest down. you got to live in fear of those Frost Binds over there, so smartly playing around that and just passing the turn. Probably going to pop this Terra Fring in his opponent's recollection to... Stem the bleeding just a little bit, but there there is a lot of damage on board right now. Yeah, do we know if uh, Bifel has another Resolute in hand? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, the only card that I saw was the Scry this guy. Because he's, he's played, what, I think he's got two Resolutes in the graveyard right now. Yeah, it looks like we're getting a quick count. We also see a Vanish from Sight in his Banished here, which is a sort of Resolute stand-like effect. It gives your champion stealth, but you can only cast it in your opponent's okay. recollection uh, step. Yeah. Um, so that's another thing to look out for. I think he is a card short of, of cashing that one in, though. So we'll see if he has any more defense than this Terra Frame. Um, so it looks like Modest is going to go in for GCR, just to try to drop and you know possibly get some more answers. I think when you're looking at Bi what Bifall's doing, you're you know potentially starting to get a little a little scared. Yeah. Going to draw a card, see if he maybe sees one of those Vanish from Sights to yeah. play in, in Recollection. He does not, so he's going to go he ahead and, and crack that Terra Fring. Recollect. Still has some uh, Enlightened Counters, so he can always cash those in for, for extra cards. Yeah. I check your consider. Mm -hmm. Going to pop a GCR, see all of our options. And at the very least, we have 10 cards in here uh, by, by Mewtwo, and if he wants to just cash that in for five attacks, he can yeah, do that. Yeah, he could definitely do that. And that, that could be the play here. Yeah, with that Poison Dagger, if he, if he wants to pop this turn, it's a lot of damage. I don't think quite enough to get over the finish line, but you really do want to put Rai under some pressure and make him go off sooner than he wants if to. If my math is right, it's 14 damage, plus including the one damage from the, the dagger. Yeah, that sounds about right. I trust your math. I don't trust my math. <laughs> yeah, because all the two threes are going to be doing three, and the, the, the one, one attacks are going to be doing two. Yeah. But it's not quite enough. Yeah, not, Rai, not Rai, enough. Rai being level three and only taking four damage. So it's not really threatening lethal right now. Though if you can put him into a range where um, leveling up via your scepter, yeah. that, that could be a, a path. I'm going to attempt a thieving cut. Right, so we, we do see a, uh, a cut coming on in here. This is going to cost a little bit extra because of the, the, the tithe. Uh, it's going to cost four, but you're going to get that rebate you? from the Wizard. preparation counter. Perfect. Yeah, get that nice little, yeah, I'll the rebate. <laughs> <laughs> Replaces itself, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of thieving cut. Oh yeah, very strong. Yeah. Yeah. Any card that lets you draw cards is, is just excellent. Most powerful words in the game. Draw a card. Yes. Well, <laughs> draw, draw two cards. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> so here we have uh, both players kind of tanking a little bit. Yeah, this, is, this is at a, a crucial juncture, right? Um, even though one player is at zero health and the other at seven, uh, the game is a lot closer to ending than it, than it would right. appear. Yeah, so Mewtwo probably here doing some math. How much can I commit to this Terra Fring? Should I keep up three cards, whether I have a Frostbind or not, to, to sort of make my opponent play around me having a Frostbind? So just, just leveraging all of his options here to decide what he wants to do. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, do I want to put some pressure in? And it looks like that might be the case. At least a little bit. We're going to start by coming in for two. And you need to do this, right? You need to chip down your opponent to get them to a place where you can threaten lethal. For sure. And make them have lethal. Yeah, you, you can't let Rai wait around for as long as he wants to because he will just sculpt the perfect hand and kill you. you gotta, you got to make him go for it when he feels a little bit oh, unsafe yeah. whether or not he's going to get there. Yeah, and, and Rai's just, ooh. 
Gonna get a Storm Tyrant's Eye here, because he's not nearly in any danger of this killing him. It's gonna reveal cards from the top of his deck until it reveals an Arcane card. It's gonna deal him that much damage. So he's just gonna take one. It's gonna see a Voltaic Sphere right on top and put that into his hand. Yeah, it's a nice little card that just get, gets you like a big power card, basically. Didn't get a, notably did not get an Arcane Blast. True. But the Sphere can, you know, it's, it's decent removal. And yeah, can he can, he can start damage. shipping away at this board, or he can send it upstairs and, and yeah, deal a little bit of damage if he needs to get over the finish line. Yeah. Depends what his hand's looking like. Yeah, exactly. If he's got more stall cards, then he can, you know, use those and maybe send damage to the face. Right. Does have a decent size hand. I'm, I'm counting around seven-ish. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to play a Power Overwhelming to get some extra levels. I'm not sure how many he's cashing in here. So was he starting with seven and then removing four? Yep. Yeah, so he's there starting with go. seven and removing four, so he's going to have uh, plus four levels this turn. So he is, what, base level 11 now? Yeah, I believe he is the magic number 11, which turns your Arcane Blast into free. So maybe that's uh, that's his plan here. He's going to go ahead and scry the skies. <laughs> scry, scry for a whole bunch. Yeah, glimpse 11 here, and uh, he's, he's going to be able to find basically all that he needs. It's pretty unlikely that he doesn't find the card he's looking for in this top 11. Yeah, so he's just kind of immediately just slamming, slamming some cards down. Yeah. We, uh, you have the sweet combo in this ride deck where uh, Scry the Skies does draw a card into memory, but the card that you really want, you put second from the top, so then you can cash in some enlightened counters to draw the, the card off the top yeah, of the deck. Yeah, exactly. And so, like, we could see some damage coming out this turn for sure, or, or potentially, depending on what the rest of his card, the rest of the cards in his hand are setting up for next turn, for a next turn lethal. Yeah, it's, it's worth noting that um, Mewtwo is still at Xander level 1, which is a, a 19 health is not a whole lot yeah. Yeah, to deal here. Yeah, so Bifold totally doesn't like need a whole Bifold. lot. Like Arcane Blast plus Fireball, two yeah. Fireballs, yeah. two Arcane Blasts. Any, any two two of them will we'll get there. So yeah, he's going to go ahead and cash those last Enlightenment counters in to draw that top card. Looks like it was just a careful study to see some more cards. Yeah, just keep keep on digging. That first one's going to give him an extra Enlightenment counter from his inherited effect from Rai level 2, so he's going to get to draw two cards here if he wants to. Yeah, it looks like he's going to immediately cash him in to draw some cards. Ooh, is this, this a fancy Arcane Blast? Yeah, there's a fancy Arcane Blast for 11, and we're going to assume he probably has something else here. Does he, he have confident. Fireball? Yep, there's yep, a Fireball. There's a Fireball. And that's going to be a Fireball for uh, potentially lethal here, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. believe so. It's coming in for two. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. lethal. Uh, that's that that's first uh, game. Sorry, game one. You're good. It's, it's, it's it's like, man, I got you. Now we're going on to game two. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what uh, each player sideboards in uh, against oh, the respective <laughs> matchups here. Um, really? Yeah, so I have the sideboard of Mewtwo up in front of us. Uh, and it looks like um, mostly all we're going to be looking at is something like a safeguard amulet, which does do some work on those combo oh, for turns, sure. saves oh, you some sure. life. But a lot of these cards in Mewtwo's sideboard are very clearly for the aggressive deck. He does get the option to bring in a Quicksilver over his GCR to sort of protect that safeguard until it's time. Um, you know, wait until Bifall commits some resources okay, to, to pop that safeguard time. onto the board. That's a lot of good time. Turn yeah, and if you're Bifall, like, what, do, what would you think to bring in um, against uh, this kind of, like, more mid-rangey allies deck? It's, it's pretty tough. Um, I think that you do get a lot of leverage here in that the, the water decks are typically slower, and so you get a little bit more time to set up. So let's take oh, a look at their sideboard here. Yeah. Looks like they have a couple of copies of Sparkle Light, which might be good to sort of control the board so stuff like Snow like Fairy, not that it's the most like, threatening like body, but it is something that you can remove like with, with Sparkle Light. <laughs> Worth <laughs> noting that Sparkle Light is for three damage since <laughs> we're actually playing yeah. a, a mage deck, which we don't see a whole lot of. There's a Protective Trinket, possibly? <laughs> yeah, you can bring in that Viridian Protective Trinket to slow down any sort of uh, Frostbind, Song of Frost shenanigans. And then maybe, oh, again, same thing, that like Quicksilver that's... Grail if he wants to hide some information from his opponent. Yeah, or potentially he'll just keep, you know, he could opt to keep in the, the ring to draw cards yeah. and try to just to, to, you know, kill his opponent before he can do anything. Yeah, I think it was a, it was a really great start from Bifall that first game. He played a lot of increasing dangers. Yeah. He, a lot of, uh, he increased the danger by a significant margin. He, he increased lots of dangers. Uh, he also saw two or three copies of Peaceful Reunion, which is very good in this matchup. Yeah, he had multiple Resolute Stands, multiple Peaceful Reunions. Yeah. It, it kind of lined up pretty well for him, and he was able to dig uh, enough I mean, to get the, the kill cards I, I in the end. 
It's yeah, that's the really frightening part for, uh, for Death yeah, Note Fire Ride. If you don't see those pieces early, you're going to have a really rough time in the early game, especially if there's something like this water tempo deck where they look great for a couple turns on the board and then hold up interaction. So if you only found your one piece of interaction and you sort of have to spend all of your resources to cast it, you get uh, you know, you get uh, blown out by something like Frostbind. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting matchup, honestly. Yeah. The, the Water Allies deck is a uh, pretty kind of like all-arounder, but it's not like super fast. So it's uh, it's kind of like a bit of a give and take here. Though if, you know, Bifal ever has a turn where he doesn't have that sort of, uh, you know, fog damage prevention effect, right. then it could be really bad. He could just die out of nowhere, yeah. yeah. It's, it's nice that this matchup isn't one of those sort of like passing ships in the night, which is what you would get if... It was a more like aggressive fire allies deck, or even the wind allies decks that, that don't have nearly as much interaction as the water deck does, where both of these players are looking to sort of play around each other and, and, and pick their spots to, to be the aggressor. Yeah, and that's honestly why I kind of like uh, Rai as a medical. Um, we, you know, going into this event, I think a lot of folks expected to play against a lot of water allies. Yeah. And I think it has like a, a, an interesting enough matchup where they're like, hey, you know, as long as I can prevent the damage, I can kind of get there. But yeah, it's been an unfortunate time to be a mage player lately. Uh, recently, with the Crystal of Empowerment ban, it really did did hurt this deck a lot. But yeah. <laughs> we see uh, we see that Byfall and, and a few other players in the room are, are taking uh, some real success with this this Fire Ride deck. So Ride's yeah. not dead after all. <laughs> just gotta just gotta roll with the punches and you know play play around it. Yeah. And I think Byfall is like proven that you know. Yeah, of course. And Rai has taken, you know, if you're not super familiar with the history of Grand Archive, Rai has taken a couple significant hits um, in the last, uh, you know, year. It's been, a, it's been a tough year to be a mage player, but we're seeing seeing a resurgence here at, at North American National. I think some of them were, were fair, though, like Reckless Conversion. Was, oh, uh, yeah, that card's not okay. Yeah. <laughs> How would you get out of there? We, we, we can't have that one back. I think I think Bifold proves that uh, Rai is still, you know, very strong without it. Still a force to be reckoned with. And so he here we have. Uh, looks like uh, uh, Modest is going to be going first. Well, well, well. And going first, you can you know establish your board, try to get as many allies out as possible. You know your opponent's not rocking a ton of removal, so um, you know getting the early aggression is uh, is what you want to do. Yeah, the name of the game is you try to find one of these three mana two threes like we found here in Lurking Assailant, and then you keep those three cards up to either cast a Fracturize or a Frost Spine or a Song of Frost, something like that. Yeah, I think that seems very reasonable. Let's see if uh, Bifall has found any danger to increase here. That's really what we want to be starting uh, with. Two cards coming down. Looks like it. We are increasing some dangers. Increasing danger, notably uh, one of the few draw spells that costs less than three. Right. And does actually generate card advantage because it replaces itself and you draw a card, which is very powerful. Yeah. I'm going to gamble on Bill. No. And I guess this is just kind of like where where, where Bifall is uh, standing here. He's like, how many draw spells <laughs> am I like, going to get early, you know? Yeah, looking for increasing dangers, looking for creative shocks, and then, like we said, in sideboarding, looking to find these pieces of interaction to sort of stem uh, stem the bleeding as, as he gets to level three. And then Modest immediately, same same play as uh, uh, round one, actually, driving down the uh, the dagger. Though we, yeah. didn't, we didn't actually see a dagger activation in uh, the first the first round. Yeah, he was really locked down. He just never got a good chance to swing, so we'll see if he gets the chance to pop that dagger and and push a bunch of damage. Yeah, and here we have just some, some allies coming on in. We have the Paladin. This is just kind of like a, what I would call like a sad Paladin. Yeah. Uh, not Doesn't get the buff, doesn't get the draw, but it's still, once you like you said, a three cost, two, three. You have Banish for level up. Ooh, that's a pretty good Banish. Not bad here. Going to level up to Rai Spellcrafter, get a couple of Enlightened Counters, and then hopefully set up to do the same next turn. Usually you want to go uh, to level one and two naturally, and then... Dungeon Guide up to level three. Yeah, and I think you can, like, you know, as the Rye player, you want to set it up so you're get almost guaranteed to banish right. those uh, arcane cards so you have at least some going into it uh, once you hit level three. Yeah, you're looking for that magic number like we saw last game. Level 11, either through yeah. oh, uh, yeah. banished cards or through something like Power Overwhelming <laughs> to make your arcane blast free. Trying to get a little bit of a glimpse of Bifal's hand. I did see a fireball, so he does have at least some sort of uh, payoff he if he can get there. And we do see a peaceful reunion, so that is just going to, hey, you can't attack me this round or this turn. Yeah, it's sort of um, just going to allow the water player to establish a bigger board. They're not going to be able to use it this turn, but that same thing that we, we've said time and time again, that 
if there's any chance that the Water Allies deck just gets to turn everything sideways, um, it's going to be really rough. It's going to it's going to hurt. I yeah. mean, they're all like to attack, right? right? For the most part. And so let's see how many more uh, three drop two threes can come into play this turn. Yeah, so he can conserve resources here, maybe get a GCR, maybe get a, a Fire Bobble to build up this board. He can level up the Xander next turn, hope his opponent doesn't have a Resolute Stand or something, and then he can pop that dagger and, and uh, come across into the red zone with lots of damage. Yeah, I don't, I don't hate Modest just drawing a, like drawing a card here, like yeah. getting getting any of the uh, uh, Material Deck cards that let you draw a card. Right. I'm not sure if he cares all that much about uh, leveling up here, though. Noted. Oh, so we do have the uh, we do have the scepter here. I, uh, I just wanted to note that uh, the poison dagger you do need to be an assassin right. for it to be you know fully effective. Yeah, so we're not gonna not gonna be looking to pop that quite yet. But yeah, heads up play by Mewtwo looking to establish that scepter because again, if you get that early, it just puts a lot of pressure on your opponent. That if you can get them in that four life range uh, and leveling them up is is a way for you to get lethal. They sort of you know have to to go off or perish. Yeah, and if you want to use your poison dagger, I think getting the scepter out first and then leveling up into Xander so you can maximize uh, the the damage that you're dealing from the scepter makes a ton of sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's the, the name of the game for Xander is maximizing those points of damage in, in these tempo decks. Yeah. I do actually really like this version of uh, Water Allies because of the Poison Dagger. Yeah. It, it makes your turns a little more explosive than the, you know, than the, um, like the, 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 the Diana lists, for example. Yeah, it's very interesting. I'm a big fan of Nia as well. And yeah. she saw a lot of play uh, earlier in, in the game's life, but she, she's been sort of uh, fallen by the wayside lately, so I'm, I'm glad to see some some Nia shenanigans. Yeah, always happy to always happy to see Nia on the field. Well, if I'm playing Nia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if my opponent's playing, I'm like, no, I don't, I don't like this. It's sort of a, a, a strange situation in this matchup where if you make his uh, cards cost more and he can banish more arcane oh, cards, true. it's sort of a, a downside. Yeah, if it's a material deck card. Right. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So it looks like. We're just popping that Serum of Wisdom here. So you're going to get a Glimpse 3, and then he's going to draw a card into memory. Just setting up his draws, maybe looking for some more interaction. Uh, yeah, the, the Serum, one of the new Fractured, uh, not Fractured Crown, apologies, uh, Alchemical Revolution yeah. cards, one of the new potions. I think it fits right into the, the Rai archetype. Big shout-out to Bifall repping Arisana in his sleeves, but not so much on the board. <laughs> <laughs> he, he played a potion. Yeah. <laughs> So he's going to get that new Viridian Trinket, uh, like we talked about in sideboarding. Um, this is the, the new errated one from Proxy's Vault that is going to make it so any time that his opponent is casting a water spell on his turn, it's going to cost two more to activate. Yep, just makes makes those counters just that much more difficult to play. Yeah. Though, I mean, Modest did keep a sizable hand. That's true. Yeah, that's the problem with increasing danger. You, you get all these tax effects, and then you give them extra cards to pay for them. All right, so this is gonna be a, a, a small little, uh, small little scry here. Maybe a scry the skies of desperation, or his hand is just so good that it doesn't matter if he uses this card early. Ooh, we bought him it, so didn't like what he saw. Maybe just fishing for some arcane cards um, to look to have exactly two cards in his memory to level up to level two. That's a good way to do so. Scry the skies, and then you find an arcane card on top. Yeah. Though in that, that circumstance, Neo would be a, a pretty spicy play. That is true. <laughs> yeah, playing or naming Rai level two and making it uh, unable to level up. Yeah, let's see if Mewtwo's got the goods. That would be pretty good. Ooh, we have a fracture eyes. All right, so it looks like he's just going to take care of that uh, Viridian trinket. Rai's really not the type of deck that's going to get a whole lot of abuse out of having that fractal, so he's just going to use that to take care of that problem card and also get a floating memory to go up to Xander level one. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Especially using it as floating memory. So Xander goes up to level one. Mm -hmm. It's going to trigger the scepter, doing four damage. And just like that, you know, eight out of the 19 life that, that Rai Spellcrafter has. Looking yeah. like there's some real pressure here. Yeah, he's got four on board just with his allies alone. Mm -hmm. yep. So we're going to ah, see that, so that vanish from sight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah this, this is going to give Rai stealth for the turn. Yeah. Very interesting card. You can only cast it in your opponent's recollection. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I think it's it's one of the cards that uh, you you bring it or you run in the Rai deck because you really want the maximum amount of these like stall cards. And if you're like, hey, I think there's going to be a lot of allies decks, this is like a perfect counter to allies. Yeah, for sure. So we we do know that 
Modest will not be able to attack unless he has True Sight, which is uh, very unlikely. He does does have uh, the Stillwater <laughs> Patrol. I say that, and then bam, here we have a True Sight. <laughs> yeah. Stillwater Patrol gets plus one power if she's attacking a unit with stealth, so she's getting that extra point of value coming in for three. Uh, that's a pretty spicy include, right? I don't see a ton of Stillwater Patrols in, uh, in the Water Allies list. I know they pop up here and there. But uh, this is like the perfect time for it too. Yeah, that's the the galaxy brain play by Mewtwo. We weren't even talking about those in the sideboard, but he he brought them in, assumingly for more ally um, threats, but also very good against Vanish from Sight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th that's a that's a pretty spicy include. So he, you know he's able to still push some damage. You know, taking Rai to eleven. Yeah. So we're gonna level up here to Rai level two. It looks like we did hit two arcane cards. So we're we're slowly increasing that level for when we get to. Rai level three. I don't know if we have a dungeon guide here. That would be probably what Byfall is looking for. Ooh, potentially. Yeah, it is a dungeon guide. And he, he sculpted it perfectly, so he's just going to banish the two cards that he put in yeah, using that fractal. That is one downside of him having that fractal, is it will allow him to banish exactly the two cards that he wants. And of course, they are the arcane cards. Yeah. So now Rai is going to be um, big, big levels here. It's looking, looking like five. Yeah, five cards banished there. So he's going to be level eight. Allows him to cast that careful study for free, free of charge. Yeah, going up. Uh, ooh, another another, another the, one. The same careful study. The same careful study. Get another another five counters. <laughs> yeah, I think that's putting him up in thirteen or something. He's got four cards on deck, which is a lot. Yeah, so he can. He's just gonna cash in some immediately to draw some cards. <laughs> Even when you're attacking. I mean, he used a lot of resources getting up to level three, right? Yeah. So now he needs to, you know, replenish those resources. Build that hand back up. But he is under, I think, a significantly more, uh, like, a higher amount of pressure this game than he was the last. Oh, yeah. I mean, with, with Scepter online, with multiple um, allies and a poison dagger threatening him. But, I mean, being level three, he does have the, the 25 health. Got a bit of a cushion. He's got 14 life right now to work with. But I think he's really looking for some interaction. He did find, it looks like, a resolute stand at the front of his hand. So that's going to give him at least a little bit of protection from Yeah, the allies. Resolute Stand is going to be super key. Because I, I was just doing the math, and I think on board, Modest has lethal yeah. if, if he levels up. So that's four damage from the Scepter, mm -hmm. and then um, three, six, nine from the allies, mm -hmm. uh, it w and the extra one from the Poison Dagger. So I think it's 14 exactly. Perfect, yeah. So yeah, it's uh, very good for Bifall here that he found that Resolute Stand. Yeah, going to be a, a huge, huge card to play here. Actually, looks like he has a couple there. I think I see two Resolute Stands, a Fireball. So he's going to be protected pretty well from those allies, but he, he doesn't have a whole lot of great protection from the Scepter itself, so that is still going to deal some damage if, say, Mewtwo wants to go up to Deft Executor. Yeah, this is an interesting call both ways, to be honest. Bifold, you know, like you mentioned, he does have the, the, the Fireball in hand, but he doesn't have... Does he have a second kill spell? Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. So here we have just the arcane sight. Nice little uh, card that help, help, helps you spin the wheels a little bit. Go up one level for the turn and draw a card. Yeah, it looks like he's casting it on his opponent's turn to to get advantage of that Rai level two effect that allows you to get an enlightened counter on your first spell you cast yeah. each turn. So going up to two enlightened counters. Oh, we do see a fireball coming in. Oh, maybe he does have some lethal here. So this is yeah, in his opponent's recollection, he's fireballing for ten. Yeah, I, I, I do think that is 10. Yeah, it is 10. So if he has another one here, that is I mean, enough. Yeah, Xander, what, definitely less than 20 health. Yeah, Xander at 19, yeah, so just a single other fireball will do it. But oh, nope. no, just a resolute. Hmm. Looks like he's just picking his spots where he can. His opponent has two cards in hand, so he knows he's safe from a counter spell. Yeah, I, I don't hate this from Bifall because he's like, hey, any any kill spell is going to be lethal, right? If I draw into a uh, arcane blast or another fireball, right. um, it can it can get there. And c shields are kind of down for for modest right now. Yeah, he doesn't have enough cards in hand to if if he had a the uh, the frost, he doesn't have enough to play it. Right. So yeah, we're under a resolute stand here, so I don't think there's anything that can get through that in this Water Allies deck. Maybe a balanced Gildas, if we have exactly seven cards, we can come in for one damage through this resolute yeah. stand. Uh, keep in mind, dude. Yeah, keep in mind, dear viewer, that was all done okay. on Modest's turn. It's still his turn. Yeah. That was all done at fast speed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Rai is definitely a uh, fast uh, speed uh, abuser, looking to get as much done on his opponent's turn as he can. And, and so instead of attacking... 
He's just going to trade, or uh, use his uh, allies to trade into the dungeon guide. Might as well give them something to do. They were, you know, just lazing around, don't have anybody to attack, so you can take care of that 1-3, even though it's not going to be super impactful. Yeah, you know, I actually really like what Modest has been doing every single turn. When he puts his hand down, he puts how many cards he has in his hand, representing that by dice, which is great for a number of reasons. It's great from a viewer standpoint, but it's also great for a um, influence standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, great to just be very clear about things and, and communicate clearly what the what the board state is. So we're going to get a Tome of Knowledge here, um, which is going to cost one, and then assumingly we're also going to get the Tome of Sacred Lightning, which has an alternate activation cost that you can banish a Tome that you control to uh, put it into play from your material Yeah, <laughs> Tome of Knowledge doesn't stick on the field for too long. It's usually yeah. just immediately eaten. Um, I was kind of taking, taking a look at Bifal's hand, and I think I see a Peaceful Reunion, Yeah, at which... Is he? I don't know if he has enough resources to play without cashing in. Yeah, I think he, he would need a card draw here, and I don't think he wants to cash in this tome. And he doesn't have enough light encounters? He only has two? Right. So if he casts a spell here, he'll get an enlightened counter, but that means he, he still is right. down one card. Right. So it looks like he is going to be using the fractal plus. Okay, he's, he's going to do... Um, where's his pointed? Yeah, it's ah, an okay. ally, okay. Going to kill that lurking assailant. And uh, Voltaic Sphere does get some extra value from your graveyard. You can banish it to make the next arcane uh, card that you activate cost one less. Okay, he's going to get that Tome of Sacred Lightning. He left one card in his memory. He might be looking to get rid of that as Tome is. Uh, uh, rest it to draw a card and then banish card from your memory. It looks like he's going to. Looks like he's going to do that, right? Yeah. He'll get rid of this card. He probably doesn't need. Draw a fresh one. We know he still has that second Resolute Stand in hand, so I assume that's the one card that he's he's holding on to. Cast for its alternate activation cost. And it was, uh, it was one of those potions. Yeah. Not doing a whole lot here, especially when you can't cast them. So I guess he actually did lose that Resolute Stand, it looks like. Can't quite see his hand. Yeah, I'm not, not sure what he's got in his hand here. Hopefully he's got something. There's some, some real scary numbers over here with this Poison Dagger. And a couple allies on board. Yeah, if he goes to Xander too, right? Takes four damage from the scepter, but it looks like he's considering GCR. Just slowing it down. His opponent is on two cards in hand, so maybe he doesn't feel quite as threatened yet. I mean, maybe this is a turn where he's like, oh yeah, maybe I can jam in with my allies. So yeah, draw, draw an board. extra card, fill up the board. Potentially, we can see the dagger activate this turn. Mm -hmm. Yep, we're gonna see it. So Dagger's going to deal one point of damage, and it's going to make every subsequent damage dealt this turn deal an extra point. So it's going to uh, deal one to face, and then an extra point of damage coming in from the Stillwater Patrol. Yeah, very smart from you two. He attacks first, sees that Bifal has no interaction. He says, okay, you know, no intercepts, and then uh, before the damage resolves, he, he throws that Poison Dagger. And I think this is, uh, he's setting up exactly what we're talking about, drawing cards and then just slamming down a critical mass of allies. Now that he knows that there's no Resolute coming down, he's like, you know, you know, doors are open, time to just, you know, let the flood begin. Oh, wow, this is huge here. This dungeon uh, guide ooh, is going to allow him to level up and get that uh, scepter damage as well as the, the dungeon guide itself. So the scepter's going to deal five, yeah. and then the dungeon guide's going to deal two. This is, this, is, this is seven damage dungeon guide. Yeah, that is lethal if, if Bifal doesn't have any interaction here. It is exactly seven. That's what he needs. Bifal does have three enlightened counters. He can draw a card. Yeah, that's what he's exactly going to do. Try to dig for an out, right? Some sort of removal. Or, or, maybe a, or maybe a kill something. spell, yeah. Resolute would do it. He could play it for free. A fireball to kill his opponent in response would be I mean, pretty good. I mean, fireball is, I think, what he's been like really fishing for. Though, if he does have a fireball, I don't know if uh, if Modest has a frostbind in hand. Oh, that would be very good. Because he does have a pretty big grip there. Yeah, and he hasn't cast really any interaction this game, so he might be holding on to a bunch of it. So he's gonna oh, gotta crack the book. Yeah. Gotta draw another card. Crack the this book. This is this is where you know it's desperate. What did he draw? Oh, he did draw. A he fireball. did draw the fireball. Does Do he have the have counter? The oh he my has God. it. Oh no! <laughs> and then Catastrophe. Yeah. And he's just gonna take the five from the enter and then the two from yeah. the attack, and that is game. Expertly played by Mewtwo there. Really put on the pressure early. What's going on? Got across the line with that with that frostbind, like uh, you know, like we said when you have to play your one piece of interaction and it's your last ditch effort, the, those frost finds really go a long way. Yeah, I mean, we, we are playing like this mid-range, you know, tack with some dudes kind of deck, but you do have, you know, really powerful controlling options yeah. like, like the Frostbind. 
15 damage just and we are now one on one like here in uh round two at the north american uh, nationals for grand archive so it's going to be by false choice here whether to be on the play or the draw we assume he's probably going to be on the play it's it's Pretty good for the Rye deck okay, to be okay, the first yeah. player to level up, yeah, um, even though he's going to start with less cards, which is sometimes a detriment. <laughs> but and it looks like both players are going to run back the decks. Like They're not going to go back to sideboards. Like, I'm gonna be playing guys yeah, I think both players had a pretty like solid game plan going into that uh, game. It was very close, so it seems like they probably sideboarded uh, how they want to. The Stillwater Patrol is actually the, the Stillwater Patrol was super spicy. Yeah. I, I was honestly not. Uh, not uh, planning for that. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about it at all, but it uh, you know it really adds up uh, extra allies in your deck. It is a four mana two three, but uh, still bodies on the board are great in a matchup like this. And I I love it when you tee yourself up for something like that. I'm like, hey, you can't attack unless you have something with true sight. <laughs> right. Boom, here's, here's, here's something here's with true sight. Something, something with true sight. Yeah. Uh, it was like the best card to play too, right? Because right. not not only does it have true sight, but it gets the bonus attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love to see the uh, still water patrol scene some around, play. She's so, like, uh, a very cool. Uh, because you have yeah, I might have to like consider adding her into my, my sideboard for my, my own water allies list. We've got those spicy SP1 ones as well. Gorgeous. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Any excuse to play with uh, the SP1 cards, of course. Hey, this uh, this water allies deck is a pretty good place for it. Get some snow fairies. Oh yeah, you get the uh, even you get the even new the promo frostborn paladin. Yeah, even the other the two three knights. Oh yeah, steam yeah, knights. Yeah, knights. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there you go. Here's your excuse, Kel. You, uh, you you build up this water allies deck, put all your <laughs> your sweet SP1 cards in it. I mean, it is Xander. I'm, I am a big I'm a big Xander fan. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of assassins today. My boy Xander has a pretty good showing here, which is I love to see. It's good. Xander Xander's had a had a tough road for the first couple of sets, but ALC is really looking like his time to shine. Yeah, I mean, you know, Lorraine had her time. Now it's maybe Xander's time. When is it Sylvie's time, Kill? <laughs> hey, you know, maybe we, we got that cool like slime lord coming out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? It could it, that could be her. That's time. her time, but not now. Now is Xander's can, time. Can you imagine a time where everyone's like, "Ah, oh, Sylvie's so oppressive. She's so good." <laughs> I and, then, and then everyone will reminisce, like, "Oh, remember when? Remember when she was bad?" Yeah. That's that's what we're getting with Rai right now, right? Everybody's like, oh, Rai, the hero deck. Nobody's playing Rai, but, you know, nobody remembers Reckless Conversion. It's, it's been too long. Yeah, I mean, yes. If you if you think this Rai is kind of explosive, just imagine, like, this, you know, times four or something, yeah. right? <laughs> Being able to, like, get your get your hand back and do it again, and it's, it's good. All right, so it looks like Byfall is going to choose to go first. A nice friendly fist bump for the final game. Yeah, you'd love to see the camaraderie. <laughs> Gonna see if we have uh, some increasing danger. It looks like we do have a Serum of Wisdom, which is a good card to deploy on turn one. Yeah, just kind of get some cards in there to, to banish for, for level up, and you know, you're setting yourself up for a, a nice turn later. Yeah, it replaces itself, it draws a card. Yeah. I, I really do like this include into, into the new version of Rai. Yeah. All right, let's see if... Uh, Modest can enact his uh, ally plan here, so shields are down. Let's uh, let's jam in some dudes. Yeah, if Mewtwo's not looking to, to hold up a whole lot of interaction, the eight cards from going second is a perfect time to be able to deploy two threats if they're both three mana two threes. Um, yeah, I think this is a great time to do it because your opponent doesn't want to waste their um, their resolute stands right now. Right. So you just kind of want to jam in some dudes, push some damage. Um, we do have a Water Spirit with a prep counter. Yeah, we're going to deploy a, a Korhazi Trapper here, which is not the best threat in this matchup. <laughs> right. Yeah, probably not doing a whole lot. Uh, I, don't, I, I doubt we'll see that uh, prep counter used much. But hey, one all. damage. It's one damage. Yeah. That adds up over hey, time. May, maybe if he's like worried about the dungeon guides. True. But yeah, this is just going to be uh, essentially like a 1-3 that yeah. could get amplified by uh, Poison Dagger. Three mana, one three, not super impressive, but again, on turn one, you just start putting on some pressure, and if uh, that trapper stays around for two or three turns, you know that damage really does add up. Yeah. What What are the odds that Modest uh, opts to get a uh, poison dagger turn two again? Mm -hmm. I'd say pretty high. I I would also think. I would also I would say think. almost guaranteed. So that's where it's you know it's a perfect time for us to be wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you tee, tee yourself up to be. See, sometimes you tee yourself up to be to be like you know right. Sometimes it's, it's yeah. to be wrong. Just as good to be wrong. Yeah. All right. So we're just gonna get a GCR, crack it, yep. start building some card advantage. Same thing we've seen two games in a row. Rai's gonna look to build some early card advantage so he can spend that to get up to his level three. 
Yep, uh, that's the game plan. Draw some cards, <laughs> set up so you can have um, other turns where you draw cards. Right. <laughs> that's basically basically what you're going for here. Uh, here we go, uh, another turn where you set up to do that. Yeah, got another serum. Going to be able to set up his next draw. See if he can maybe find some interaction. Right now he's not under too much pressure, so he can sort of rest a bit, not have to worry about casting resolute stands, but it's going to get out of control quick. Yeah, he just got yeah three damage on board coming in from Modest, and here we see the Poison Dagger. Yep. Tales old as time. That card is is a house. Yeah. Yeah, I think Poison Dagger single-handedly keeps these uh, aggressive <laughs> Xander decks together. Yeah, I was gonna say it's it's one of the cards that really helps Rai be like competitive. Chipping on in, two more damage, one more from the the Trapper. And this damage is really relevant, right? Yeah. Um, you just really need to get to the that that turn where you can effectively use your Poison Dagger, and as we saw in the last game, you know, backed up by uh, Frostbind. Yeah, and especially next turn, like we saw in the first couple of games, we assume we're seeing a Scepter, which is going to add even more pressure. Yep, I, I imagine we'll see a Scepter as the third one, the uh, third turn, and then followed by level ups. Oh, coming Ooh. in with a Thieving Cut using that prep counter. Yeah, I, I dig it. Yeah, getting some value out of that, replacing itself, dealing some damage. Of course, you trapped her looking, looking a little bit better now. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. Got it's kind of like value. a setup and, you know, teeing off. Yeah. Looking at Modest's hand, he's got a couple Snow Fairies, right? Not, not the best in this matchup, right? Yeah. It's just like a one attack. Uh, we do see a, is that a Stillwater yeah, Patrol? Yeah, I, I think our beloved Stillwater Patrol is in there, and he's got a Frostworn Paladin he's going to deploy here. Yep, Sad Paladin sad coming in for two. <laughs> for two. <laughs> hey, she's not that sad now. She's, she's crunching in, crunching she, in for some damage. She do be crunchy, though. I mean, she looks pretty crunchy, to be honest. Look, yeah. look at all those spikes. Got lots of icicles yeah, and yeah. stuff. Yeah. So doesn't look very comfortable to wear. It, it, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's like all the spikes are pointed outwards, sure. and maybe you're like comfortable. Sure. Maybe not. Maybe not comfortable to be around. Yeah. Just got to keep your distance from the frost one. Gives really bad hugs. Yeah. I mean, that's gonna hurt. All right, going up to Rye level one here. Gonna banish an Advent of the Stormcaller, which that's is a, a spicy one. Yeah, so that's a spicy one. That's another one of those like high cost cards that has a f uh, efficiency. Yeah. I so Bifall is now under some pressure, right? Oh yeah. He's facing down five damage on board plus whatever else that, that Modest has cooking. Yeah, five damage, a, a scepter next turn, assumingly probably also seeing that Stillwater patrol coming in shortly. We did find a oh, resolute yeah. stand and gonna get a great discard off this creative shock, being able to discard Voltaic Sphere, which you can then banish later to discount your arcane cards. Very strong. Yeah, depending on what Bifall has, like the next two turns represent a ton of damage coming yeah. from Modest. He really, he really does need like a critical mass of like his stall cards here. Yeah, I see at least one. We at least have one resolute stand, but that is definitely not enough. That's sort of what we saw last game: is he had one or two pieces of interaction, but once he ran out, you know, that's uh, that's curtains for poor Rai. Yeah, Rai only being level one right now. He's uh, in a precarious situation. Looking a little dangerous. We could see uh, a potential level up to Xander here just to turn on our Poison Dagger if Mewtwo thinks he well, has I mean, like lethal. The, the, the super spice would be if uh, Modest, Mouse, or Modest uh, Mewtwo has a um, uh, Dungeon Guide, yeah. move, right? Because you can get the Scepter like he did, and then you can do the, the whole seven-point damage swing where you do the Dungeon Guide and your uh, Dagger. Right. And that is like more more than lethal. Yeah, it was a surprise lethal last game, and it could be this game too. And that that that's lethal where it's like, you know, difficult to deal with. Like the damage is difficult to deal with. Oh, so we do have uh, not not uh, not playing the resolute uh, instead of playing the vanish from sight. Kelly, are we gonna see it again? Are we gonna see the Stillwater Patrol coming in? He has it in hand. <laughs> we we saw it. I think he just put it to the front of his, front of his hand. Do it for the people. There we go. Yeah. Yep, there it is. He's there had it. He's is. had it both times. Yeah. So she's gonna be crunching on in for three. The value, we love value. And now we're under real pressure here. I, I don't. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> circus of value. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just had to say it. Uh, I had to say it. <laughs> now that's what I think every time I see Stillwater Patrol. Yeah, the circus of value. Circus of value. But yeah, the three damage is like super relevant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Gonna go up to level two here. Twenty-two health, still very reachable, especially with a scepter on board here. It's, that's what eight damage away. Yeah. 
That's like, that's two scepters. So he's gonna he's gonna need another piece of interaction could, here. If you have a dungeon guide, you could turbo level. You can go level up four damage and then dungeon guide four damage, and that that by by itself is lethal. Oh wow, this is frightening. We're gonna play an increasing danger and give some more resources to yeah. our opponent that is pressuring us to death. It's uh, Bifle's in a tough situation here, right? He's really got to find something to to stem the bleeding here. So we hope he has a vanish from sight or or resolute stand here. But like you said, if Mewtwo has a dungeon guide, he can just sort of circumvent all of that yeah. combat damage. You just, you just double just, level up. Just level up. You know, it looks like we got level one Xander coming on in. That one's expected. We'll see if we get the next one. I, I'm, so I'm very curious to see if he's going to pop the dagger here. Oh, interesting. Yeah, just for the five damage. So we have the banish. Let's see. So four damage is going to be on the stack. stack. Okay. Looks like he's just taking the four. Yep, just just four here. Like I said, you don't. You, if you have dungeon guide, you don't need the dagger yeah. this turn. And so here we have resolute paying brass tax for it, not doing the, right. the free. So let's let's see. I don't see a dungeon guide here. What's the draw step? Byfall going down to only two cards in hand. Yeah. But we're under resolute. We didn't get to see the draw step here from Mewtwo to see if it's that fabled dungeon guide for lethal. Oh, this game is this game's a lot closer than it looks, right? Yeah. If uh, by if uh, Modest doesn't have ways to 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 close out the game here, Rise leveling up to three next turn. Yeah. And I've seen Rai decks like just combo off. Oh yeah. Out surely. of nowhere. If he's got a handful of arcane blasts and something you know like power overwhelming or one of those similar cards, he can just sort of win out of nowhere here. So yeah. not out of the woods for Mewtwo. And in influences yeah eight for for Bifall right yeah. now. Down two from from level up. That's you know six plus the card six draw. Six plus the draw step. Yeah. yeah. And if he uses a materialize to get another card, he's back up to eight. Yeah, I think that's you know seven seven cards is more yeah. than enough. But we'll see if Mewtwo can find a lethal line here. He's really really hemming it over. So I don't I don't think we found that yeah. that dungeon guide. No, I, I see I see the the fairies in there. Yeah. Definitely no dungeon guide, which is would have been the optimal draw. Right. I don't think we have any other ways to draw, just from hand. But you know, as we always say, it's, it's just so much pressure here. Even if he takes no game actions, passes the turn, it's really on Bifall to make something happen. Because if he doesn't, he'll just naturally level up next turn, and that's lethal. Yeah. He has all of these creatures on board, so even if uh, he levels to level three, he's got eight power on the board, or seven power on the board. Does Modest have interaction in hand? Like, does he have a Frostbind? No, I'm not sure. He can at least bluff it, whether he has it or not here. Yeah. I think, I mean, anyone who's played against control decks like this, you you always try to bluff it, yeah. right? All right, here we have level up here. This is going to be a pretty important uh, banish, right? Yeah. He's going to want to hit some uh, arcane cards. Thank you. So this is a banish. Yes. All right. All right. Getting rid of those. There's one arcane. Oh, two non-arcane. So it looks like we got four Ouch. there. So okay. So it's going to be level seven rise storms here. Which is a, it's a tough road. Um, again, we're in that same spot where he's going to have to try to find some interaction. Oh, and apologies, my numbers were off. Yeah, so he's banishing three cards on two cards. Yeah, yeah. So he's going to have a six-card hand here instead of a seven-card hand. Yeah, he unfortunately does not have a dungeon guide, which is probably what he would have preferred to do. He does still have the Voltaic Sphere in his graveyard that he can use to gain an extra level that, and get true. a discard. Yeah, that, on, that, on that, his that's true. Hand. Yeah. Really nice card. So he's going to start off. This is a pretty way, pretty good way to start off, right? Oh, yeah. Draw a card, gain uh, plus one level for the turn. Yeah, that puts him up to level eight. That'll allow him right. to cast that for free. This is this is how you get your wheels rolling right here. And Bifall is basically looking to, to close out the game right now. He has to do it. He either has to close out the game or find a, a bunch of interaction to, to sort of stem the bleeding. But it's really dangerous for him to pass the turn. Yes, oh, oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. He, he did go up to you know level three. He has 25 health. But uh, the ideal situation, obviously, would be to find 20 points of damage. Well, 19 specifically. Sure. But uh, we ooh, found a fireball. There's a fireball, good right? Good start. And I, uh, he rise level eight right now. Yeah, so he can get level nine from Voltaic. Um, I, I think he might have erratic boldness. I mean, like, if he has level nine, double fireball is lethal. Um, yeah, and and if he has an erratic bolt here, I think that does it as well. He can cast erratic bolt for three. Erratic bolt. Okay, so he's going to cast it for retail. Okay. So targeting. That does allow him to draw two cards though, and that that should be enough. He kept assumingly just the fireball in his hand. Yeah, so this is this is looking to deal eight damage. Yeah, and then he banishes two at random. He draws Draw two, two cards, cards and then immediately follow yeah. up with fireball. So this this should should close it out unless we uh, we again might have some interaction. This is playing right into Frostbind if that's what Mewtwo has. 
is he's going to have to play that fireball and, and you know tap out, have no no cards in hand. All right, let's see what the banishes are. Oh. Is a double power overwhelming? Yeah. So that's, that's two more levels, so yep. rise up to 10 now. Level 10. He's going to draw two cards. And then he's just going to slam down fireball, right? Yeah, I don't know if he's going for the Hail Mary. Oh, he's just going to play to his outs? That gives him one more card. I don't think that helps him with... With frost, uh, Frostbind? Yeah, I think he only has seven counters here. I mean, you definitely have to play around the Frostbind here. you gotta, you got to, right. you know, play to your outs. I oh, know, maybe he had 11, so he has enough here. It looks like he has four here. So yeah, you can cash that in, get one more. He has five cards, and he can pay two for, for this Fireball. I mean, and I think you, you got to go for it. Oh, he just found an Arcane Blast. It's oh, yeah. Better. <laughs> yeah, this is an Arcane Blast for one. Yeah. Or, or for 11 damage, but it only costs one to play. One cost, 11 damage. Pretty good rate, I'd say. And then he's going to be like, do you have the counter? But even then, he's got the cards in hand, right? Yeah. So if he has two, he could have two Frostbinds. Ooh, what do we have? Oh, he's going to crack Scepter. Oh, to draw. So you can crack Scepter for five to draw some cards. And yeah, in he's response, gonna he's going to Fireball. Oh, That's oh, game. Oh, oh, oh. Ooh. Oh. All right. Byfall's yeah, going to close it out. That was a really yeah. close game. Dude, Rai going in, 2-0. Yeah. In the, in the hands of an expert, Byfall, a very talented Rai player. So no yeah, surprise. I, I, to see I, I don't want to discredit uh, of Modest. Of course, you two played very well. Yeah. A very, very close game. Yeah, and actually insanely close. Yeah. That, was, that was a do or die turn. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, exciting oh, exciting games here yeah. at uh, the Grand Archive North American Nationals. That was uh, uh, a, a pretty nice showing, right? Yeah, like we said before the match, it's, it's great to see these decks that are a little bit less played than, than the more popular decks, and especially yeah. uh, you know in uh, the hands of, of uh, two players like those playing so very well. Um, yeah, it's just great. I mean, great and and, and Byfall is just kind of like a champion of Rai, so you love to see him back in his right. element, playing his, his, his champion of choice. It's, yeah. uh, it's excellent here. Yeah, absolutely awesome. We, we hope to, to see some more of those players uh, later this weekend. Hopefully yeah. they continue to do well. And, uh, yeah, I, th I think we're going to take a little uh, break here. Um, we have a lot more action for you today uh, for... Grand Archive. I do believe we have at least what five more yeah, rounds. Yeah, there's five more rounds today of of, of action before we uh, we make our cut to, to day two. Yep, and then day two we'll have a lot lot more action. We'll have the rest of Swiss as well as our uh, our top eight tomorrow. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, if uh, that's all good for you, let's go ahead and take a little break here, and we'll be back shortly for round three. Oh my god, no way. I, I
Welcome back, everybody, to Grand Archive North American Nationals 2024. My name is Cam. I'm here behind the desk with Rav. Hello. First time I think we actually got in the cast together or talk outside yeah. that isn't actually player interaction. How are you doing today, man? Not too bad. Excited to be here. We're now hitting into round three. We just saw an amazing round two between Bifall and Mewtwo, just Fire Eye versus Water Xander. Yeah. Two lists I didn't expect to see today. Yeah, you're a, you're a big Rye player, right? How, yeah. How'd you feel about that match? Excited. Yeah. <laughs> like, I was cheering for Bifall the whole way to be not even biased. Like, just right. Rye decks are unique. Yeah, it's because, you know, we're, we're not rooting for anybody specifically, yeah. but we are maybe rooting for some champions specifically you know yeah you know if i see arisana on screen i uh, might hear a lot of screaming in my ear from here i think i think it's unfortunately looking a little bit grim on on that front but uh yeah super awesome to see um both rye and uh, a unique take on on water allies um from you two yeah the water allies end was actually a lot different but also like more than i was expecting out of say water lorraine or water tony yeah having the extra tech in there for the poison dagger to deal an extra one with the scepter trigger or right. your allies just really pushes a lot more damage than you would think it's yeah. super threatening even if they don't end up using it right like yeah. the the threat of that poison dagger on board yeah. um super powerful even uh nia uh, saw some some yeah. real um Real effect there in game one. Yeah, I mean, because what uh, game two we saw poison dagger into level up scepter yeah. damage for five into another dungeon guy for another. That was just awful. yeah, yeah. The dungeon guy for seven, very good. Just secret lethal. Yeah, I mean, as soon, as soon as we hit game three, I thought, oh man, is there gonna be another dungeon guide off the rip here? <laughs> and this yeah. is this gonna be lethal? But no, I mean that game was very entertaining to watch. It definitely was a different thing overall. Yeah, we've um, we've had a really diverse meta so far at the event, and um, we we got a chance to take a look at the meta game uh, for. Round one, um, so we, we had, like we said, some, some pretty typical stuff. A lot of Lorraine players, a lot of Xander players probably split between those um, yeah. fire aggro decks and those Luxem decks. Yeah, so Lorraine is probably one of the things that we, most of us expected to show up as a big showing between mm -hmm. you have Erupting, you have Merlin, you have um, this Fire Lorraine aggro, Water Lorraine. I um, had a lot of different breakups for what classifies under Lorraine. We have the Xander list, which is expected as well due to Luxem Xander and the Fire Xander aggro. Mm -hmm. um, Tony is another list that I'm not shocked to see up here because there's another champion as well into all the ally lists. Um, but we do have a decent showing actually of Less Diana than I expected. Yeah, le less Diana and more Rye for yeah. me. Yeah, 8% Rye is like a, actually way higher than I would have expected. Um, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, Ari and Sylvie are, are about where we expect them to be. Um, but as far as elements go for the weekend, this is, again, something that we're sort of familiar with, with fire having a really high representation. Fire is very strong. If you looked at, like, Ascent Ontario, it was, uh, I think, an entirely fire top eight. Yeah. Um, but something that is really interesting from our graphic here is we had a lot of uh, wind players. Yeah, I think wind is a list that a lot of people were testing brewing lately, especially when you're dealing with the kind of aggro decks that we're dealing with right now in the meta. That wind is just coming something really good. But... This also leads into some of the advanced element decks as well, where you have um, fire. You can go in the crux. Some people are also, I'm not sure if we're going to see it too much, is the old school wind Merlin that mm. was around during Ascent Houston. But looking at this breakdown here, we have about the 32% crux breakdown, which is what you expect between level three erupting decks, water Lorraine, allies also now runs level three Merlin, as well as a couple other items as well with Luxem and Neos and a couple of other mix in as well. Yeah, a lot of uh, a, lot, a lot of crux decks is, is what we're used to. I, I, I heard uh, someone somewhere say crux is fine, so yeah. I'm, I'm going to go with that one. Um, we also had the um, ability to take a look at who has been winning thus far. So we're going into round three. Um, yeah. So we got a list of all of our 2-0 players to see sort of how that's shaked out from the meta we, we started with um, at round one. So uh, it looks like we're still seeing a lot of Lorraine and Xander um, yeah. uh, still up in that 20-ish uh, percent, yeah. still performing quite well. We're seeing uh, Tenoris making a great uh, um, conversion as yeah. well to, to the 2-0 players. Unfortunately, we have uh, we've lost um, almost all of our Arisana players. Oof. I'm sorry. I mean, we do have some spicy lists in here, though. I mean, looking at it, we have stuff like uh, we have Rai still with a decent conversion, eight percent. I see a one-off Vantis that is two yeah. and zero. Oh. Yeah, I think we are hopefully going to get that Vinius player on uh, on coverage for round three, as they are two and zero. Oh. That's uh, that's my last bastion of hope for, <laughs> for for Claire doing well at this tournament. Rumored level three in MRC. Mm, mm. I, I, I might I might agree with that. Um, yeah, I think it is super interesting to see that Rai has uh, he's maintained his eight percent. Like yeah. uh, obviously we've lost some players, but his percent from where he started hasn't changed. So yeah. they are they are converting quite well. I am wondering if this eight percent is pure fire Rai players, or if we saw him on 
to the bike falls on or if there is a mix of that old um not even old this is even almost new the wind ride that the we wind saw ride, at the yeah. online regional recently so i don't know if it's something that's um showing up in the event as much but i'm really curious what the breakdown is between fire and wind yeah i, th I think that that deck is super interesting um I'm, yeah i'm not sure if we have any wind uh, rye players we do uh, like we said still have a lot of wind players as far as basic elements making the conversion to 3-0 we are seeing still like 58 percent fire yeah. there's a lot of fire decks that make sense right yeah. there's just more fire decks than there are of, of the other ones but um wind is also uh, converting quite well they're still at 26 percent of our 2-0 players yeah i've spoken around a couple of people there's a decent amount of people i've seen on the wind ally list i'm not sure if they're on the wind tony or the wind the rain um there's arguments of which one is better due to the game plan you want to go into this meta sure but i think uh, um, we want to see probably a decent amount going on and then going into also the advanced element that wind doesn't touch, but others like fire and water might go into. Right. We're still seeing a decent conversion rate. I think Crux is still up there as to be expected. Right. Crux is fine, as I've heard. <laughs> um, the Luxum is about the 18%, down a little bit um, yeah. from round two, but Luxum is also one of those decks that's a little bit harder to pilot and also a little bit can have those dead draws. Yeah, we're also seeing um, still some Umber decks, 15% uh, Umber decks still kicking around. I I'm curious if that's like the Water Diana decks that are playing like a single Carter and are technically an Umber deck, yeah. or if it's, you know, some more of these like fire, uh, Umbra focused Diana Yeah, the decks. high end fire Diana. Yeah. Um, I do see we also have two Arcane Rise, so that plans is my question of there's probably at least a couple of Fire Rise. Right. And there, um, I do see one Astra, so that one Arisana player. Still kicking. I think, unfortunately, the way that our <laughs> statistics work is there is one erupting player who oh, has Arisana right. for their Dusklight Communion. In that their, is right. In that is the sideboard. Unfortunately, <laughs> as much as I would like to, to you know, struggle the on, the, on the copium <laughs> that uh, that Ari's doing well, I'm, I'm afraid she is not. I'm also wondering if our Triscuit player from round one is part of that Luxem stat. Oh, it I might hope be so. 2 0. Yeah. So I really hope that they're still continuing the Triscuit yeah. trade of going 2 0 and catching players off guard. Like we said, you know, we're not trying to root for yeah. anyone's. Specifically, but maybe we're rooting for Trisket. Yeah, yeah know, we're, like we're the, we're the, the, the card itself, yeah. of course. You know, yeah, a little, something a little different. Yeah, that, that Luxem, uh, Luxem in general is it, it's got a really tough matchup spread. Even that that Trisket deck is very similar to the Fire um, Luxem decks. So um, I'm glad to see that they're still converting pretty well to 3-0 because if you know they run into the wrong matchups, they're going to have a really tough time. Yeah, and that goes for some of these decks. Like you have a decks like Dark Rise, you saw with Bifall, um is running a lot of vanishing sites, yeah. resolute stands, and if they're facing something like erupting. It's a little bit harder to you have those dead cards in your hand on average, where they really want to avoid those certain matchups, and I think it goes for a certain decks as well. But it sounds like we are ready though for our round three matchup, the show on screen here, and let's let's see what we have. Oh yeah, we we have a we definitely have an interesting one um, mm -hmm. coming up. We have uh, we have that that Vanita player yeah, we're gonna, gonna get, get, get here, here uh, facing, facing off against. Mm -hmm. Our second player, I believe, is on uh, Fire on the, Luxem Xander. Yeah, they're on the Luxem Xander. So they're on, um, I think, the original Luxem Xander list. We did see a couple of different spicy cards. I don't want to spoil just yet until we see them. Keep keep everyone in suspense a little bit here. Right. Um, but it did look like the generic Luxem Xander list that we're looking Two on the bottom, four on the top. Yep, and then I will draw six. And then one for Tony. So I'll shield me. And then I will draw. Okay, so that's one. So that's two fireballs. Mm -hmm. I will be first flex Tony. Mm -hmm. I will flex my game. In response, I will cut it. Okay. Drop it. And then I'll reflex. Mm -hmm. Drop it in. There's a, a water start into into level two Vanitas. I guess it's good because you can sit there and run cards like your Frostbind and Fracturizes still for if you're facing the erupting matchup. Sure. So having that in early on is a little bit beneficial. 
I'm really interested to see, though, um, as we're going to find out, what the split is between the actual wind and water cards. How many wind cards are in there to use the Vanitas level 2 ability, and how many water cards are in there just to avoid something that might be possibly dead in hand. Yeah, I mean, it's such a powerful effect that the um, lineage break champions from ALC uh, are all uh, a basic element. So you get to play the Spirit of Water, and then you get the extra element once you hit uh, as early as level 1 for Vanitas. He's the only lineage oh, yeah. break that has uh, a level 1 champion. So you really do get to play like a true two-color deck if you want to. And I like this opening here from Felix, because the way it's set up right now, it looks like a very basic water ally list opener. So you can really catch your opponents off guard here, because you're just going with a Spirit of Water, playing a Lurking Assailant, right. passing the turn. Your opponent doesn't know what you're running or yeah. what your game plan is, so they can't really sort of formulate their own against it. But it does look like we are going to go ahead and have a Focus Flame come out from Nyx onto the uh, Lurking Assailant to get off the field, just to sort of try and keep up as much um, tempo as possible for Nyx, just to hit that level 3 uh, Xander so they can start comp doing their combo. Yeah, really interesting heads-up play that uh, Felix on his turn did not choose to kill the Stalwart Shieldmate to, to leave that on board, but did get somewhat punished by uh, Nick then playing a Focus Flames to deal with this threat. Yeah. Um, so again, yeah, like you said, we're going back over to Felix. He's going to get a Scepter of Lumina, which is a very Water Allies start. He's looking very Water Allies. Uh, Ooh. Banishes that beautiful oh, Lunette beautiful, CSR. Beautiful Lunette CSR. That's, uh, I mean, like I said, everything you've seen so far out of Felix's hand just looks like a basic water allies. It's like, here's a Karahazi yeah. Trapper coming into play. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, looking at his list here, we, we have his list up, and it is like a pretty typical water ally shell that has just like a little bit of spice. So it's yeah. mostly water, and then you have that um, sort of top end um, of going up to Vanitas, and you have a couple of cards like a, a Tune with the Winds and some Dream Fairies that, like you said, are really just going to take people by surprise. Yeah. You, like, establish your board, you're playing against Water Allies, and they're like, okay, I'll level up, I'll go to Vanitas, I'll play a Dream Fairy, is just, like, absurd. Yeah, I mean, look at this as well. There seems to be Innovate Agility, so for yeah. those aren't aware, that's a card that can give your unit Spell Shield or Stealth, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So it's another card that's going to catch people off guard. They're trying to go for their wom uh, Wombo Combo turns, pretty right. much. <laughs> So we are going to have the opening from Nick that's going to go ahead and crack their GCR for materialization before we collect to see if they can either hit, I would imagine, probably a creative shock or something like that. Too. Yeah, they're looking for some draw power, a, a way to filter their deck, get some floating memory to make their uh, uh, level up to Xander level 3 a little bit less painful. The the Luxem decks do have a, a trouble with card advantage, especially before they, they hit level 3, and they don't have nearly as an explosive uh, end game as something like the Rye deck that we saw um, last round so and here here he is the man himself Vanitas has been materialized we have now hit Vanitas on the board taking four damage off the scepter if those aren't rare you have the on enter effect where if there's another one element card in your lineage glimpse four but in this case we're running spirit yeah. of water so we don't get the glimpse effect not gonna get our free glimpse here but yeah yeah it's like it, it's like nothing happened it's like yeah. I'll level up to Vanitas uh, deal you for a very nonchalant yeah. okay I'll play another Korhazi trapper I want to I want to get a statistic of how many of Felix's opponents lean across the table to read <laughs> Vanitas <laughs> I'm more curious how much they read the level two and go, yeah, wait a minute, well, Vanitas is swinging in for like four damage because you cast a win card? Yeah, he has power. Yeah. It's very strange. <laughs> this isn't Triscuit? Yeah. But um, so we have the Chrysalisy Trap come out pretty much just, I imagine, setting up just preparation counters to negate swings as much as possible. Yeah, and it looks like he's going to ship it back to our Xander player, hold up uh, hold up a Frostbind, very typical of these water decks, to, to keep up some interaction. Looks like, I, I believe he has a Deflecting Edge as well. Yeah. So at the end of... Felix's turn here looks like we're going to see a fast gear cast. Again, sort of making it a little bit less painful to level up. And, and we're going to see Nick level up with one floating memory up to Xander Deft Executor. And for those unaware, because of the fact that Felix had a little more, um, had less influence than Nick, uh, Nick wasn't able to get that heal for off a of fast gear. So we'll have to see if that comes into play later on. Yeah, it's, it's nothing to sneeze at. Four damage staying on the board, especially against these Scepter decks and a deceptively uh, strong level two uh, in Vanitas uh, really going to be pushing more damage than these uh, water decks usually do. Yeah, we do see a dungeon guide in the hand of Nick, but I'm also curious of what's going to be the corner that's turned where Felix realizes that, I imagine it's going to be probably here off the dungeon <laughs> going, oh, I don't really have to keep up these Korhazi trappers. Right. I'm not really getting swung at. Yeah. I can start getting in my own chip damage. Just try and push that clock before... Feel like uh, Nick hits a whole bunch of Luxem sites and starts healing damage every turn. Yeah, it's it's an interesting situation where we've left this stalwart shield mate on the board, um, which has sort of stopped Felix from getting in any chip damage. It has also stopped uh, the floating memory going into Nick's graveyard, but uh, at what cost, right? Yeah. Oh, did we hit a fail to find off of Xander? Yeah, it looks like we might have had another one here. We're gonna see see oh. how they they treat this. 
Oh, it looks like we are going to have a little bit of a judge ruling come back here, possibly here because of the fact that he did swing with the dungeon guy before leveling. It's such a tough one. I am yeah. I am number one. Uh, I do this all the time without thinking about it. You yeah. play your dungeon guy, you're like, okay, cool, I'll swing with it. Yeah, I'm swinging while I'm grabbing right. the card out of my yeah, material deck. You forget that you, you do have to declare that you're leveling up because you can fail the find. You could not have um, a level three Xander there. Um, so it's a, a little bit unfortunate, but it, it happens to the best of us. The, the bright lights of the feature uh, oh. match table are, you know, Daunting. Yeah, I always say there's a reason why I'm sitting here and not sitting in the future bedroom. <laughs> right. So, so it looks like we did end up hitting the fail fine. It looks like we are just getting a little quick judge resolution here for yeah. declaring what the ruling is and how this resolves. Yeah. But looking like because this Nick is going to be down the three cards in hand, which is going to be a little bit harder to set up in the level into their own level threes into this turn. They can't even say the shieldmate dies. We're still missing a card right. going to level three, so we have to rebuild our hand going forward. Yeah, thankfully it's a it's a pretty slow matchup here, yeah. so it's not uh, necessarily the end of the world. We're just going to try to slow the game down a little bit, start to, to creep up that card advantage to, to get to a place where you feel a little bit more comfortable about going to level 3 Xander naturally or maybe, you know, finding another dungeon guide or something like that. Yeah. Um, it, again, this, you know, shield is really, really kind of holding back a lot here. So I think that Felix is going to have to deal with it. Um, and, and so, you know, Nick's going to be able to get a little bit of value off of that. Yeah, no, especially because um, if you want Vantus to really start utilizing Vantus's yeah. ability to start swinging in for more damage, this shieldmate has to be cleared off the board as quick as possible. And we do, I think, see that's the new MRC cleric card, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, this is this is Rhyme Soul Bishop. So she's a she's a two two. She has class bonus floating memory for cleric, yeah. and uh, when she comes into play, she can banish a card with floating memory from your graveyard to draw a card. Doesn't look like we're gonna do that. But she's a three mana two two with um with floating memory, which is yeah. pretty strong. Yeah, pretty strong, especially because um depending on what's in the material deck here, you're gonna end up wanting the floating memory is probably gonna come really big into play. You could also I mean you could play Aaron you don't get the class <laughs> bonus off of it. This but, is so like, wild. This is a two in the winds yeah. coming in. Yeah, so you're gonna two in the winds. These core Hazi trappers just became oh, very serious. Yeah, these now hit the base stat line of every other three drop in the <laughs> we hit two they threes. Have, they or have two, three fours, two fours. Two fours, yeah, two they're fours. huge. Yeah, so the Karazi Trap is going ahead and clear the shield mate. It looks like the bishop's going to clear the dungeon guy and to clear the board, and we're still going to leave one untapped in case there's something different. Because to also be fair to this list is that Nick isn't running the generic Luxem Xander list where it's we're seeing Focus Flames and a couple other cards. I don't feel like where we usually ran in some of the other iterations yeah. of this list. So yeah, it, it seems like he's got a little bit more interaction for the uh, the lower to the ground decks, which is again what those Luxem Xander decks usually struggle with. So he's got some Focus Flames, he's got some Gawains in there to sort of pick apart uh, either uh, aggro decks or even the Mirror. It's very good. Yeah, and we did also see the Plant Explosives come in off Nick's side to clear that a very big yeah. <laughs> Bishop yeah. off the board yeah. um, using the Preparation Counter to deal four damage to it. It but feels criminal to, to cast the uh, Tune the Winds <laughs> in these water decks. It's just wild. So we're going to see another uh, Rhyme Soul Bishop come down here. Um, she does not have a float to eat once again. Uh, that float was used to get a Wand of Frost on Felix's turn here. Yeah. So the um, question is, do we have another Tune the Winds? <laughs> <laughs> for, uh, for Nick's sake, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, do we have two. But I do think I do see uh, Deflecting Edge in hand. It uh, looks like the Frostbind in hand. As well as, so it looks like there was a little mishap here. I don't think Korhazi Trapper became untapped. So there was um, there was a pop of the Terra Frank. So it okay. Looks like, yeah, it looks like he's just paying for the Terra Frank gotcha. attack here. Gotcha. I saw the pointing, so I, I thought, no, I missed it. And we do have an Orb of Regret. Ooh. Yeah, so uh, interesting. Felix chose to keep up his Deflecting Edge here instead of using those two to attack in for two. Maybe he's a little bit worried about... Um, like a thieving cut or something of, of that that ilk, but yeah, it looks like it's just going to be a shield mate played by Nick, and then we're going to get passed back over to Felix. He's going to grab a sword of seeking. Yeah, sword of seeking is going to be pretty good. Um, we're just going to start get, letting our champion go and get a little bit of chit damage in as possible. Um, looking at the list, we do have. Do we have any attack? Card? I don't think we have any attack cards with. Um, this uh, list that we don't have. Yeah, I think I think we're just using it for Vanitas value. I think. Oh, we like. do have inspiring call, so it's also inspiring sure. call value. So yeah. getting it to get the inspiring call that costs one less man, uh, cost one pretty much to draw a card in memory, and then make all these attacks swinging for one extra damage it really stacks up, especially as you're adding the scepter damage on top of it. Yeah, we're gonna see an absolutely brutal snow fairy here. He's gonna tap down that shield mate, get her out of the way, allow Rhyme Soul and Korhazi to come in. Yeah, and just pushing the clock on your opponent's point. Your opponent's a little bit on the back foot here because of the unfortunate mishap with the dungeon guy. Yeah. So you're just trying to utilize that tempo that you just gained as much as possible. Just keep on pushing as much damage as you can. Yeah, Felix playing really conservatively here. He's still keeping up his Korhazi Trapper here. He's he's still keeping up that uh, Deflecting Edge. I believe he also has a, a Frostbind in hand, which we're going to see deployed here to counter a prepared 
planted explosives. Mm-hmm. So are we also, uh, sorry, I thought we had double snow fairy, but that's just my monitor. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's moving a bit. <laughs> I thought we had uh, double snow fairy. But I was about to say, oh, well, we're really pushing damage. So we are going to go ahead and grab Bobble of Abundance. Wow, I love that. Yeah, just just the disrespect. You know, they've, they've, got, they've got so much pressure on the board here. Going to see a Gildas here as Gildas, well. another good card of the game. And I think we are balanced. So we don't need to crack the Bobble to get balanced. Gildas is going to go ahead and swing it for four damage here. And we have a decent amount on board. Yeah, this might just be lethal here. It's, it's looking pretty close to it. Yeah, because yeah. you also still have the swing with the sort of Seeking as well. Yeah, I, I think... Uh, we, we do have a respi- lineage release from the Spirit. Yep, so we're going to see a Recover 6 here, but no longer Fire Cards can be cast by Nick. That's going to put him up to 16 um, and leave a very, very threatening board. Yeah, which also makes sense why we would try to use the Planet Explosive to clear the board a little bit on top of just getting the value of if we're going to crack the Stream Spirit anyway. This this becomes a dead card in our hand. So yeah, we're going to see a Gawain deployed here and then immediately Frostbinded just just to, to lock this game down. And it's looking like it's it's firmly in, in hand by Felix. Yeah, so Gawain is one of the spicy cards that we talked about before. Gawain was a card that not these lists usually run. It's fairly good into these water matchups because Gawain is a card that can start banishing cards from your opponent's memory. Yeah. Which water is usually trying to get that value of putting three eight turn every time using three up three down mm-hmm. every single turn as possible and you start banishing and messing with their balance math yeah it really affects the board state more than you think yeah you can make those gills is very ineffective you can steal a cards that they're waiting on like stuff like snow fairy that they're usually going to put down if they don't have a good target for it you can snipe it before you play um, an ally that, that you want to keep um, unlocked um, let's take a look at sideboards here so of course uh, looking at the Vanita sideboard um, is for a very innovative deck. Is not not like the most um, different yeah. sideboard. Uh, we got a lot of the the usual sus- suspect stuff like nullifying lantern, safeguard amulet, Tithe proclamation, Verdian protection trinket. Um, not a whole lot of those are going to come in here. We might see the smoke bombs come in. We might see the spell shield winds come in, and maybe maybe Blanche to to interact with Lightweavers as yeah. well. I will say that's a very nonchalant spell shooter for wind at you. Like that was a card I wouldn't expect to see in most of these lists. That's that fair. We're not seeing a lot of wind decks yeah. today thus far. <laughs> we do have a lot of wind decks in the room, but spell shooter wind is uh, quite strong. Yeah, it's a card that pretty much acts like the regular spell shields. You can go ahead and front the damage for the turn, and on top of that, you can go ahead and buff your ally as well. So spell shooter wind is a really strong card, especially like we talked about earlier with something like um, the Xander trying to cash a light reaver's assault. As they stack it, if you say no response to the first one, or they hold most on often, they're holding their priority to cast two Light Weavers Assault. Right. You could just all of a sudden spell shield wind and then catch someone off guard to yeah, negate of eight of that damage. Yeah. And then make uh, something big like your Snow Fairies or your Gildas and extra Huge. buff counters. Yeah. yeah. Um, from the side of our Xander player, we're looking at one Blanche, one Fire Resonance Bobble, three Ignited Stabs, and three Spurn to Ash. Probably bringing in those ignited stabs. Might also be bringing in those spurns for stuff like scepter, wand of frost. Yeah, I think spurn ash is going to be one of those cards that's definitely going to be thrown in here because scepter is a card as you can see is just dealing four, eight, twelve. It's just all the damage yeah, stacks oh up yeah. rapidly. So if you can negate as much damage as possible, you want to bring in the spurn the ash. Um, the blanche might probably not be brought in, but like I said, the ignited stab probably be brought in because uh, there's a point where you just need to start clearing allies yeah. and using the ignited stab to do that is going to be beneficial. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty good rate, one for four. It's pretty yeah. solid. So it looks like we're gonna we're gonna get into game. Two here, Felix is going to be going first. Um, such an explosive game, uh, last game from Felix. Yeah. Just, I'm I'm still mesmerized by that uh, attune the winds. Yeah. Uh, looks like we did also see that dream fairy we just talked about. Yeah, in, in the hand now we do have the Gildas in hand. I don't think I saw any of the other cyborg card, any other cyborg cards come in just yet in the opening hand. Right. So um. we're going to go over to the glimpse six from Nick here from his serene spirit of fire. He's going to choose some to keep. Looks like he's going to keep three there, and then he's yeah. going to draw six, and then a seventh for turn. I think we put back, I think we saw double grain in the open. I think we put back both grains. Interesting. Um, which which can be understandable if the fact that you're not getting the level. Jet. Oh, sorry, sorry, we do keep one, it looked like, afterwards. Yeah, you so, don't want super, yeah. uh, like, you don't want multiples of that card. It does have class bonus, um, so you can't really do it right away. And uh, they, they don't stack up super well. Speaking but, of which, here yeah. comes Gwen. Yeah, I mean, you don't get the class bonus, but it's also a card that if you have multiple, it sort of is in a rough spot because you mostly try and get in for that one damage at a turn, and then you also, it's a dead card in your hand if this Gwen doesn't go anywhere. So you're sort of stuck. You really don't want the multiple in at any point unless you're really starting to use the class bonus on champion hit ability. 
It's interesting. We might be just using it as a stopgap here. Like, here's Egwene. She's a 1-1. She's not super threatening. But if you leave her on the board, she's going to threaten you. So it sort of, like, yeah. acts as a shield made of swords yeah. where she's going to absorb an attack here. Pseudo taunt. But we did end up seeing a Nyx hand the Spurn Ash that we talked about before. Yeah, Spurn Ash sure. was brought in, like we talked about, from the sideboard. And we do have a Gilish Resolve from Felix. And we oh, do wow. have the Rezu stand coming down on Egwene. Nope. So it was on Champion. And then Egwene was used to um, pretty much shake the Gildas hit. Yeah, so yeah, it looks, it looks like there was a Resolute stand on, on Gawain, oh, was uh, it? absorbed the Lurking Assailant hit, and then Gillis came in for four to, get, right. to get the chip across. Yeah, I mean, hey, that one damage, like you said, it was a pseudo-taunter for but your yeah, turn. Yeah, she's, she saved you seven life, right? Yeah. Or, or six lives. Oof, uh, that's burned the Ash. So it did hit the, hit the Banish on it was ended up picking, which is a little bit rough, yeah. for, um, especially because next turn you might be seeing that Scepter come into play from Felix. Right. So that is a little bit rough. We do have the glimpse to here. We're not able to fully see what's in hand. I think from what I could barely see, might be another planet explosives and something else. Yeah, I saw a dungeon guide. That's that's all I could get there. Exercise curses is off the top. Uh, that was the card we must have kept on top because we keep one on top, put one on the bottom. Um, probably used at this point because we're not facing the analyst. That's going to be used for that floating memory. Um, pretty much neutral floating memory. You don't even need class bonus for it. Yeah, looks like we have a nice clean kill. Thieving cut into Gildas here. Going to draw us a card. Control the board a little bit. There's no, uh, looks like there was no Frostbinds cast because our, uh, our Xander player here did smartly keep up two cards to play around Frostbind. Yep. And they're just going to ship it back. Looks yeah. like we're going to see an exercise <laughs> curses <laughs> from Felix. Same thing. Pay two has floating memory. A lot of people are playing this as sort of like a hedge. Like when you're against Diana, it's great. When yeah. you're not, it's two mana fast floating memory. Yeah, it's easier to find a spot to throw in a fast, fast floating memory than it is to find that rooms in your sideboard of right. your eight cards. So a lot of these lists, I think, are sort of adjusting their fast cure ratios for them. Yeah. But no, this was as far as going to happen. We're going to go ahead and see the promo Frostborn Paladin nice. come down. Nice, gorgeous. She's going to banish that exercise curses, get herself a counter, draw a card. She's really putting on the pressure here. Three fars are really difficult for the Sander deck to deal with because most of their removal typically is stuff like Thieving Cut, but we've seen that Nick is playing a little bit of a, a different list where he's playing stuff like, like Focus Flames that can deal with stuff like this. I believe we do have a Planted Explosive in hand. We do have the Planted Explosive, I'll say, and we do now because we're going to Xander level 2, are going to get the Preparation Counter back, so we can do the Planted Explosives um, possibly before Recollection yeah. so that we can go ahead and regroup our whole hand. But no, we decided to actually draw inside, and there's a Light Weaver's... A, Light Weaver's Assault, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, yeah, it looks like a Light Weaver in hand. We have a Planet Explosives and a Dungeon Guide, so yeah. we have access to level 3 as soon as we want it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if now is the turn. We might look to set up a little bit. looks like there's a Creative Shock in hand as well. So might just take the turn off. You're not under the most pressure. You understand that there's only 5 power on the board right now, and you always have to consider that you have this Serene Spirit of Fire, which gives you six more life. So you want to, you know, play with that as much as you can. So we actually do have a Thieving Cut in hand. We are going to use one of the Preparation Counter. Oh, sorry. This actually we did get this back off of the right. level two Xander. Mm -hmm. So then the Thieving Cut is going to go ahead and come in for a possible three damage on two Lurker Sand. It does go through. We draw our card. Preparation ooh. Counter is done. And ooh. Is that another Light Weavers? I think so. That's pretty good. So we did pass the turn. So at this point, Nick's in this position to go Dungeon Guide next turn. Hopefully stall another turn. Maybe getting something like a Terra Frank if they have in their sideboard to pull it out yeah. um, to stall a turn and then go into level three and they can start putting their cards down into your memory for level three Xander. Yeah, for these uh, for these board control matchups, seeing two Light Weavers this early really does help if you just start revealing those and using them to, to pick off creatures. Stuff like, you know, two Light Weavers will deal with this Frostborn Paladin, which is really impactful. So looking like we might have a, a, a pretty good place here for Nick to go up to, to yeah. level three Xander. Yep, and we did end up seeing the Dream Fairy Banish, which in this case isn't too bad of a banish. We're not dealing with too many allies yeah. on Nick's side, so Felix doesn't feel too punished by having this card banished. Right. Um, but we did get the Scepter. Oh, we actually have... Uh, I actually see two Spell Shield Winds, I think, and Felix's hand. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so we did bring him in for that Light Weavers, like you said, to try to sort of uh, bamboozle them when they when they play their yeah. double Light Weavers and you, and you play a card that hasn't been seen a whole lot of play in Spell Shield Wind. Yep, so Frostborn Pound got their damage in, passes turn over, and looks like Nick is going to go ahead and generate the GCR here to draw, more likely try and get the math in their hand properly to Dungeon Guide without having to put down their Light Weavers result. Yeah. Because the last thing you want to do is have to pay for Dungeon Guide, and next thing you know, you're banishing one of your Light Weavers result. Right. It's, uh, but it's also a very fine balance, too, of sometimes you want to throw one in there just so you get the Luxem trigger for your next turn. Of course. So it looks like we do have enough cards here. I think six is the magic number. So it should be able to put down everything but those Light Weavers, play a Dungeon Guide, and be pretty safe. Yep. Looks like we actually have three cards in hand, so we're, we're a little bit over yep. um, and start getting this going. But we are in the spot, though, where we can't hard pay for 
this um, frostbind to pay the negate cost, but this is also becomes an issue. Now that you're paying, oh, ooh, wow. the double frostbind. The double frostbind. Yeah, I, I was uh, I was assuming they were playing frostbind to make you put down the cards that you yeah, don't want. But yeah, the double frostbind gets the job done. You know, two for ones are good if they're uh, really hampering your opponent, like like countering this dungeon guide is. And now we we've sort of flopped from Nick being in a I think a very favorable position to being kind of behind the ball here. Yeah, especially because at this point Nick's going to have to if they want to go level three banish three cards of the two. So there's a right. higher chance they're hitting their light result. They could even hit both because both right now are inside the memory. Right. So they could hit both and then end up having to pay it out. And next thing you know, there's most of your end game damage. Yeah. Out of the, out of your hand. But they might just have to do that anyways. We're going to see some more pressure here from Felix. Is going to lay down a lurking assailant. He did get that bobble of abundance if he wants to keep putting on the pressure. We do see that magical attune the winds. Yeah, we can go hand. ahead and grab it with that bobble, <laughs> yeah. cast it, and then yeah. start pushing damage at this point. But <laughs> looks like um, Felix is probably feeling in a pretty good position because there's also the catch in these decks that with water lists, you want to always have three in hand. Mm -hmm. There's never a spot where you want to go shields down and then let your opponent really snowball off of that right. fact. Even if you don't have anything in hand, just leaving the three up to bluff your way through it is more beneficial at times than you would think than just going all in for a turn to get that quote-unquote combo. Yeah, exactly right. You saw how powerful the double Frostbind was. But we did Dude. find a this, second yeah, dungeon yeah, guide yeah. that yeah. we might actually get to resolve here. Yeah, it looks like it is as we're hearing from the players. He's shaking his head yes. So it looks like that is not a Frostbind in the hand out of Felix. They're going to go ahead um, and banish their two. What did we hit? We hit a fast gear. Shieldmate did, did, did their job. Did their job. Did their job. Two floating memories straight into the banish zone off of it. Um, we do have O3 Xander coming into play. Terrifying was also grabbed from Nick for this turn to... Help them stabilize for another turn so they can start setting up their Luxum turns yeah. finally going forward. Yeah, just like you said, they get this Terra Fring to sort of slow down the game for a turn. They get up to level three, Xander. They're going to try to pick off some stuff. But they're going to trade with yet another Frostbind. That is three Frostbinds played by Felix this game. But um, we are not, you know, Felix not quite out of the woods. It, it looks like uh, Nick was in kind of a rough position, but we found that second dungeon guide, and that gets us back online to our... Our Luxem Reveal win con. We're going to get to reveal two Lightweaver's Assaults next turn. But we do see the man, the myth, Vanitas, coming out. Yeah. Finally. Yeah. Turning on that Attune the Winds. Dream again. Fairy again banished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't care about those. We don't want a Dream Fairy or Dungeon Guide. Yeah. We'd prefer to stay on board. Yeah, we're good with that. Um, so there's also the situation here that it's almost a good thing for Nick that all three of these Frostbinds are gone. Yeah. Because there's no risk anymore right. of... There's been situations that you could see that a water player might keep up a lot of cards in hand for yeah. that Xander trigger so mm -hmm. they can Frostbind the Light Weaver's Assaults. Right. So seeing three out of the hand of your opponent is really good in Nick's case. And there comes the Tune the Winds. There it is. There's that Tune the Winds. going to pump up this Frostborn Paladin into a 4-5, Lurking Assailant to a 3-4. Just staggering numbers here that... You know, basically, aside from Excalibur, Xander really doesn't have a way to deal with these. No, and the only thing the two Light Results are going to get you is killing that um, Lurking Assailant at this point. And they're going to go ahead and pass the turn because of the fact that Terra Ring was popped. Correct. So we just pretty much set up the board for a lethal next turn, and we do have the Xander trigger. So Xander is going to go ahead and reveal two Luxum cards, both Light Weaver's Assault. And they are divvying their damage. They might be stacking both onto Frostborn Paladin here, so yeah. Dungeon Guy can get the cleanup. Yep, looks like it. So we did also have the materialize um, Luxera's map. Luxera's map is another good card. So I imagine at this point, Luxera's map might also be you're either fishing for your Luxem sites or Mother Light Reaver's Assault, mm -hmm. just so you start getting that heal. And because we're still fire, we haven't run really injuries. We can creative shock. Yeah, you gotta gotta take your opportunity while you can. It's it, you're not long for this world for having that that serene spirit still in your lineage. You're at 18. Probably this turn is is looking like when you're gonna have to pop it. So you get. Take your chance to cast that Creative Shock. And he did actually find a Luxem site um, with that Creative Shock, which is very strong. Yeah, we're setting, we're setting it up ready to go. We could do a couple of things to go going forward. And we did end up generating a Safeguard Amulet out of Felix, which is expected because it'll help lessen that Light Weaver's Assault damage yeah. that will come on the come into play. But yeah, Xander is like this. It's like a it's like a closing door. You know, the, the window of opportunity for this water player to close out this game is getting smaller and smaller as the game goes on. We're going to have an untapped Luxera's map here. So it's, it's going to start getting pretty tough. Um, I don't know, are we playing the Corhazi Insignia here? There, there it is. Yeah, we're we're going to see that to start to be used to put down two Light Weavers and a Luxem Site, which is just such a powerful three cards to reveal. Yeah, and then start getting your preparation counters. So you have cards like your Thieving Cut, you have your Planted yeah. Explosives coming into play that you can then use the re-upping of the Planted Explosives damage, okay. or not, should say the preparation damage to fully utilize the card, at least as long as you're still fire. So it looks like we're doing our Luxem reveal here, but there was a bit of a jumping of the gun. I don't think priority was passed over to Felix, allowing him to cast a card with, with the trigger on the stack. 
So it looks like they're they're just cleaning this up here. But we're gonna see two light weavers um, revealed. I assume those are both gonna be pointed at that lurking assailant to, to deal with that, um, unless uh, Felix has anything to say about it. Yeah, because Xander has a definitely a couple different interesting interactions because you do have a response to the Luxem Luxem Xander trigger. Yeah. You have then a response to each of the lurking assaults trigger. Uh, the, the, light the, the light weavers triggers. Yeah. Yeah, light weavers triggers. So there's a lot of different triggers that can happen over, and we're going to pop the safeguard aim. I think. Yeah, like I said, such a complex deck to play. So, so very difficult to navigate. Yeah, it looks like we are going to spell shield, spell shield the wind. And it looks like we do have a little bit of a reading happening, trying to yeah, figure yeah. out what that card does. Yeah, so we, we got a we got a reader of the spell shield wind. I but believe spell shield wind is champion. Yeah, champion. So if it is targeting the light, yeah. So we cannot deal it to yeah. Prevent the next time you don't your champion for the damage. If three or more damage are prevented this way, put a buff counter. But the thing that makes all makes a little interesting is that Laver Assault is two instances of damage at a time. So it isn't right. just a flat four. Yeah. So you go to pop the spell shield. You don't get the buff trigger anymore. Right. And then it's still another two if you wanted to. Right. But it looks like it was ended up going, the Light Assault trigger was onto the um, Lurking Assailant. So Lurking Assailant's cleared off the board. For yep. We're going to see the popping of the Luxera's map here. It looks like they did grab another Luxem site there. Just a little bit worried about this life total. Understandable. They're 21 out of 20, uh, 25 here. They do still have that Serene Spirit, so we have to consider them at six more life from the recover of the lineage release there. Yeah. But they're going to grab a site, start to set up. We know they still have a site in hand and two Light Weaver's Assaults. This is like magical Christmas land of cards to have available to and you. And an Excalibur. And an Excalibur, yeah, that they're going to use to down scepter. take care of that Scepter. No leveling up for you. I'm nice and safe this turn. Oh, oh my green. god. Ooh. Green comes in. Green has True Sight, if I'm not mistaken. She does, well. yeah. It's because we're level three. Yeah. So Going to get to uh, grab one of these cards, put it into their discard pile. So I imagine we're probably either grabbing either a Spell spell Shield Wind here or maybe a Freezing Out. I imagine probably more Spell Shield Winds just so you can hit that um, uh, Light Weaver's Assault turn and not have to worry too much about the spell shield coming through, but we actually do grab the Frostform Paladin instead. Yeah, it looks like they're just going to grab Paladin to just make sure there's no pressure. Yeah. The, the pressure is off. I get to spin my wheels as much as I want, do as much Luxem revealing as I like, and yeah, I really do feel like this door is, is almost completely closed on Felix here. He's going to have a hard time uh, getting out of this sort of pseudo lock of the, the Luxem deck. Yeah, especially now, like I said, we had the ins uh, Insignia on the field, so he's going to just keep on putting the cards down in hand if he's not right. casting at the end of this point. So I think overall, Nick's in a pretty good spot. Like I said, I think this window is almost pretty much all but closed. Um, there could be a couple instances come on. Like I said, you do have one more Frostbind, I think, in this list. True. There's a chance that you can have your opponent mess up and hold priority to do a double Light Weaver Assault and still Frostbind one of them. One. Yeah. Get the second one, so you take a little bit less damage, and it might end up stabilizing for a possibly lethal turn following. And maybe, you know, we haven't uh, we haven't seen Vanitas 2 come out yet, but there is... Um the possibility that the plan here from Felix now that uh, these Luxem sites are going to be online is to sort of set up like a big combo turn with Vanitas to uh, deal a bunch of damage, give that Nia uh, effect that Vanitas 2 has to make cards harder to cast. Yep, and looks like turn was passed over. Um, this is more likely just to leave up something in hand so you can have a little bit extra off of this reveal. We do have four Luxem triggers though. So yeah. four cards will go in the hand here. Um, we'll keep on. And we do have, like I said, we have the double Luxem Plate, double Light Reaver's Assault to start healing and dealing damage. So brutal. Going to deal four damage to the opponent, heal six life, and you do that a couple of turns, and that just closes the window so quickly. Yeah, I mean, at this point, there's not really much else a Xander player has to do. They could go ahead and, it looks like they are crafting Arbor Regret here, so you can go ahead and crack, get, throw away the fast that was in hand, the exercise curses in hand. Yeah, we don't need that float more. anymore. Just yeah. need more Luxem cards. Need more Luxem cards we can throw in there and signal to get prep counters, and we're just, we're off to the races. Yeah, efficient for stuff like Gleaming Cut, Uncover the Plot, uh, these, these just like big force multipliers for um, this Luxem Sander. And it looks like a Creative Shock and Focus Sander is drawn off of it. Which is not bad. We still mm. do have that Serene Spirit, so you can cast this Creative Shock. It Put down three of your Luxem cards. Yeah. You're not in too much worry. That's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to put three cards down. I imagine probably both our Luxem sites for now. Draw two, discard one. And I think we still have enough in hand to do the Insignia. I think we found another Gawain here. Oh. Yeah. Oh, Just picking brutal. apart Felix's hand, making it so hard for him to come back here. Um, we did add a Gildas to our hand from last turn. Gildas is going to be instantly picked off the top. Yeah. Right now, we don't we don't want four damage. Did add that Gildas <laughs> to our graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> we don't we don't want to see this card. Yeah. Um, so this is like I said. I think this window is pretty much all but closed for Felix. Uh, this is overall a little bit of a rough spot. I mean, there are also outs. You always play to your outs. Yeah, of course. You never know what you could hit. I mean, there's also the case where Nick has to present you lethal. Yeah, of course. And so, with with such a interesting deck list like Felix, he he has that. 
that sort of uh, surprise factor where uh, surely his opponent is, is not aware of everything that yeah. he's playing. And it looks but like it, I spoke too soon. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like he's he going to scoop it up here. It's reasonable. There, there's very, very few uh, situations where you get out of that lock. There, it's yeah. a bit of a bit of a rough game one for Nick, uh, but game two he, you know, found his spot, really, really stuck to it, and, and crawled out uh, from the the tempo advantage of the water deck yeah. to be able to to close out that game. So, looks like players are just going to shuffle up their decks, not changing any sideboards. No, uh, no new information has come to light for for Nick uh, seeing. Uh, a reason why you would want to change his sideboarding. I will say this is also a very smart scoop of Felix because there's also the case where some players have the issue of scooping two locks and sure. knowing that you're going to lose this game here more than likely, you're going to go into a game three, you want to leave as much time on this clock as possible, especially if facing something like this Luxem Xander. Yeah. Your games are slower. You don't want to go into the case where you're down 1-0, you're just basically trying to draw that one out, one out, one out, that you could never hit it and then draw before you even get to play a game. Right. Two. Yeah, it's not it's not a glorious skill to have, but there is, you know, there's a skill yeah. in knowing when you're dead and when to move on to the next game yeah. because you do want to leave as much time for yourself to, you know, be able to have a full game, especially against these slower decks like Luxem Sander, yeah. Yeah, especially because you, you, so you never know what could happen in game three. You can you have another situation where there's just a bad opening hand and you just blow it out the water. So you're just right. leaving yourself now, looks like 32 minutes in the future match area yeah. on the clock to try and close out a game three is... I want to say almost perfect. Yeah. Like, you just give yourself such enough time to move this game forward as much as possible. And I think, if we're not mistaken, so we're actually going to let Nick go first. Okay. Yeah, so it looks like we're, we're going to do our glimpse six, see what we got. Um, Let's see. What do we push back? We heard a little groan here from <laughs> Nick in the headset. And that doesn't seem very happy with his opening. Glimpse. Thank God for glimpse. <laughs> yeah. you know, get rid of some of these cards. Find a, find a more playable hand. Yep. So it looks like we're going to go ahead and draw back up to our six. So I wonder if going second here for Felix is for just glittering the allies get the damage in the turn they come into play. Yeah, um, going second is like very reasonable for a lot of these aggressive decks. The only thing that is pretty threatening is a start like this from Nick, where you, you leave a Star Wars Shieldmate on the board, and that means that they will probably deal with it, but if they do, you get that free advantage of the floating memory. Yeah, your turn one lurking assailant, turn one Gildas doesn't really do as much anymore because right. you just... You're Benefiting your opponent's gameplay right. and swinging into it. Yeah, it does look like uh, a Lunette is drawn by Felix. Ooh. Unfortunate that we did not go first here, as that is very powerful against cards like Stalwart Chillmate. But um, we're going to see if we deploy some threats, start getting that pressure on. Both of the games that we've played thus far in this match were um, very swingy. Um, yeah. So I, I feel like this can go either way. Felix really just has to find some pressure and start pressuring this, this Xander deck before they can... Uh, sort of secure their lock on, on the end game. Yeah, so we're still going over doing that. Good for future shieldmates. We do also still have the freezing hail in hand, unless it was just paid from memory, because we could freezing hail the shieldmate for really Get her out of the way. Get her out of the way. Put a floating memory. Um, the opponent still gets the floating memory. But at least your Luna to stabilize for any other future shieldmates that come in. They'll come in tapped, and you can start cleaning up the board a little bit easier that way. Yeah, you can even wait until your opponent's recollection if you're going to use that freezing hail so that they don't get access to the float this turn sort of put them behind the ball a little bit. Yeah, it looks like though we did end up paying down. I think I see a Gildas, I think a Fracturize, and uh, a couple other cards in hand. Uh, ooh. Oh my god, we're going to see a Song of Nurturing Blade here to save this Lunette from a non-prepped Planted Explosives. We are just bringing out all the stops here, playing Songs of Nourishing in our Water Allies deck. Sadly, no class bonus. <laughs> no class bonus. Not getting the power on that one, but, um, yeah. you know, they did trade up a card and yep. kept this Lunette on the board. And if your Xander player is dealing with Lunette, it means that they have a reason to. They're not a very ally-dense deck, but um, if they're choosing to deal this Lunette, they probably have some sort of allies in their hand that they do want to deploy. Yeah, probably another shield, may, maybe a dungeon guide that come in later on. Because, yeah. like you said, these might be a one-damage unit, but that damage, the it little bit up. chips, adds up more yeah. quickly than you expect, especially when you're playing something with planning explosives and, like we just saw, we are trying to do one big turn combos, pretty much. You don't want to have to do more math than needed. Right. Yeah, so Lunette's really been through the ringer here. She took she took another <laughs> Focus Flames to the head here. So she has been dealt with. Lunette is off the board. We're going to pass back over to Felix. He's just going to grab a Fire Resonance Bobble. Make sure that you can get your value off that before they pop their Serene Spirit. Yeah, because there are a couple of cases where you, I've seen people try and generate a Fire Bobble and then go, oh, I'm going to pop it. Like, but nope. I, don't, I don't have a Spirit <laughs> of Fire anymore. Yeah. Um, and it feels a little worse, but this is... Um, bobbles are good cards. I love Bobbles. Yeah, so it's a little early here. Yeah. He, he's thinking about it. I mean, I guess at this point, you've used two cards. Is this to get us back up the balance math for the Gilda sets in hand? Uh, yeah, I, I believe we're at seven here, but it looks like we're just going to deploy a Trapper instead. 
Yep, so Chopper's going to come down. Chopper will put the preparation counter onto our Spirit of Water, and then it will let us negate one damage, or three damage, I would say, from an attack if we need to. Mm -hmm. Especially as you, especially if Zendra did end up bringing the United Stabs like we talked about, it could come into very big play later on instead of getting the four, it's only one. Yeah, very powerful against uh, Thieving Cuts as well. It completely oh, yeah. stops that on hit. Yep, stops the on hit, can't get the draw. So and looks like we just played the Krazi Chopper past the turn, and GCR is going to come out of Nick. So we're going to go ahead and crack the GCR after Recollection, and let's see what we have in our hand now. We do have, it looks like a Focus Flame, a Planet Explosives, a Spurn the Ash, a Dungeon Guide, and I can't see what that card at the very far yeah, left is. I think it is. might be a Luxum card. Looks like maybe a Light Weavers. Yeah, so it looks like we have a lot of interaction here, and that is what Nick's deck has over a lot of the other Fire Sander decks in the field, is they do have a lot of interaction, but he doesn't really want to spend that on something like a Gorazi Trapper, not the most persistent threat, so he's going to want to try to save that for something so like a Gildas. So there is Dream Fairy coming off the top here from Felix, but we're not level 1 yet. Yeah. So I wonder if there's going to be a chance that we might be paying something to go level 1 just so we can Dream Fairy away the Shieldman that going forward. And quite strong. No longer a threat. But sadly, uh, Felix does know that there is still the Focus Flame in the turn in Nick's hands to deal yeah. with it. But it looks like we are going to go ahead and drop the Gildas down here. Um, I think we are going to be one off of balance. I think we have four cards in hand, three cards in our memory. So we won't be balanced. Gildas is going to swing in for one, but we might be swinging in with the trap here and the Gildas to clean up this shield. May just get it finally off the board. Yeah, you just got to start getting something done here. Um, but it looks like he is just going to pass. He's very concerned about giving floating memory to Xander, which I think is a wise choice. Yeah. You want to slow the Xander deck down as much as possible. Just build a wide board, and much like we saw in game one, he he left that shield mate alone until he built a wide enough board, played an attune the winds, and it was so you know his board was so huge that he just used that to basically uh, close the game in, in two or three turns. Yeah, next thing we're ahead and generate Terra Frank here to pretty much try and prevent that attune the winds turn a little bit. Yeah. So if you're going to want to attune the winds, you're going to have to pay a little you're bit extra. You're going to have to pay. <laughs> yeah. You have to pay to get this damage in. Right. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's very smart on top of Felix to not give this floating memory into the grave, though, because the fact that, as you've been seeing, is Nick really doesn't want to play his cards out of his hand right now. Right. And it's really showing that he hasn't been wanting to banish them either. Right. So trying to prevent the, as much extra banish as possible, we'll go. Uh, we may have end of turn fractures here in the Terra Frank. No, yeah, we, we saw end of turn fracturize my own GCR. Oh. I'll respond and crack it. Just just to get the floating memory to go up to Vanitas here. Yeah, it is a very good line of action. I've seen it done a couple of times. I do like it a lot because the fact that you pretty much net, net zero a card. He didn't go down, he didn't go yeah. positive. It just sort of bouncing. We actually got the scepter instead. Yeah, he's just uh, he's showing you know Nick that uh, I don't want to give my opponent a fractal. I'm I'm not super worried about your tariff ring here, so I'm going to opt instead to you know just use it as yeah, like you said, a net zero to to start progressing the board. And he's going to get scepter so that he can start dealing some damage with his Vanitas level 1 and 2. In, in a deck like this where you don't go up to level 3, you really do have to value the, that you only will get two Scepter triggers no matter yeah. what. I will say this is a little bit of a rough hand for Luke, so I think we're dealing with almost a lot of duplicates. I think we have double Freezing Hail in hand, double Song of Frost in hand. I did see two Wind Guards that might be Spell Shield Winds or Tune the Winds or something mm -hmm. like that. In our, actually, no. Those are in Innovate Agilities. Innovate, innovate, innovate Agilities. Innovate yeah. agilities. So we have a lot of duplicates in our opening hand right now, which makes it a little bit rough to deal with certain interactions as we don't want to, like I said, we don't want to freezing hail this shield mate right now. Right. Yeah, so it looks like uh, we're going to pass over to Nick. He's going to level up to Xander Deft Executor. He's going to keep one card. He's down to just two cards in hand right now. But yeah, that is a problem that the water decks sometimes have with um, Fire Lux and Xander specifically is a lot of their interaction is for these, these ally-based decks, and they just don't line up very well against the Xander deck is playing virtually no allies. Yeah, the Xander deck may have been down to a little bit of cards, but because of the fact of Xander level two, let's just recoup the planet explosives that right. we paid out before to pretty much almost not go down too much into pretty much a net zero again, just in what we're interacting with. Yeah, we such a powerful card, the new Xander that they've given. Uh, I, I think uh, this deck is maybe holistically on the back of the, the upgrade in power that we've gotten with the new Proxy's Vault Xander level two. Yeah, definitely something really excited to see that we saw Proxy's Vault is that something like Xander that was almost down in just the aggro list only, just yeah. really went up in that wow. next power level as soon as it got the new level two. For it sure. Really helped round out the deck. And we do, it looks like we have a Spurn of Ash here coming out onto the Scepter and in response to Felix, we're going to go ahead and say, all right, I can't prevent it, but I am going to pop my scepter here, draw two, maybe try and fix my awkward hand a little bit more. Yeah, very wise. Just playing the card advantage game here. He has so many more cards than his opponent, and even if they are not super impactful right now, just having access to that many resources is just so, so powerful. Yeah, and I think like we said before, is that um, because of the way the Luxum 3 Xander works, is that it's putting cards from your hand down. The more cards you can keep up for your Frost Mines, you don't have to worry about putting it down, right. is just beneficial for you in the long run of yeah. this. 
So we are going to go ahead and banish a card. Song of Frost is going to go hit the banish on. We are going to go up to level three Vantus. We can finally use our innovative agilities. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know that we want to, but we can cast them now. Which actually, now that I'm thinking about more, innovative agility is actually really good in this matchup because the Light Reaver's Assault skill is only for the Luxem reveal. Mm -hmm. Light Reaver's Assault will have to deal damage when it's cast. So having that innovative agility is really just overall good to give yourself soul shout during those combo turns. So as long as we keep a full grip as much as possible into him, it's super beneficial. And it looks like Felix is debating what to do in hand. We do have the Gillis. We do have an Inspiring Call in hand. Yeah, I see an Inspiring Call. I see a, another Trapper. And we are going to go on that line, Dream Fairy, bounce your Stalwart Shield Mage, just to sort of unlock this board here. I don't think there's any way that we're finding balance here. No, I think we have so many so many cards in hand yeah. at this point. It's just unmanageable. Yep, I was about to say, yeah. Dream Fairy does go in the memory. Our, our judge at the table did catch that. No, not in the hand, hand. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> not in the hand, which I don't blame him. There's a lot of cards that bounce stuff back to your hand. Yeah. So it's something like Imperial Recruit. Now, this is a card I think is honestly a sleeper. Yeah. This is a card I have thoroughly enjoyed for a two drop one three and then can foster itself into a two three without even being class bonus. Yeah, permanent two three for two mana is, is above rate. I think yeah. uh three for a two three is, is what we're used to. So when you can get this Imperial recruit off, especially in matchups like this where they're really not going to be dealing any damage to your yeah. allies. Um, she's super impactful. Especially as now we still have the Trapper open. In case there was something that would want to come in just to deal chip damage right. to the um, Recruit, the prevent the Foster, you can now quasi Trapper that away. Mm -hmm. And as you saw with the Inspiring Call in hand, we get, we're setting up stuff for a really big swing next turn. Yeah. So uh, we have to see what gets generated here and what gets materialized from both players. We do have an Orbit Regret coming in, probably to help filter their own dead hand a little bit of a couple of the dead cards that might not be liking. We do know that Nick has a dungeon guide in hand, so he's probably going to look to set up... And double shoe me, I think. Yeah, he's going to look to set up something here. So he's going to start with the Focus Flames, maybe yep. deal with that that Dream Fairy so he can yep. unlock these shield mates in his hand. And maybe he just deploys two shield mates here. Yeah, so or, yeah, just one shield one, mate. One shield mate's going to come down, but still, it still matters a lot more, especially when your opponent's trying to set up for their big combo, uh, <laughs> not even combo, just their big swing turns, that it really just helps prevent those types of turns as a whole because they have to at least send something into the shield mate. It's two less, three less damage than you're going to take originally. Yeah, and I mean, if they choose to pop Terra Fring here, um, looks like they're not going to, but you can save a lot of damage with this combination of cards. Uh, but it looks like they're just going to play it a little bit slower. They know that they're down on card advantage here, but they also know that their opponent hasn't been casting a lot of their cards, so they can feel pretty safe that they're not under a, a huge amount of pressure. They're at three life. They still have their Serene Spirit. They have so much life to work yeah, with. Yeah, which is why I don't mind not popping the Terra Fring here, because on board, on paper, you're dealing with technically about, what, six points, five points of damage, yeah. depending on that's just base power, without even talking about if Gildas gets balanced or anything right. like that. So you're sitting in a position where the Terra Fring isn't going to benefit you sure. to that next level just yet. And so, um, granted, if there's a two in the wind, it might look a little bit worse, but you have the shield may up to eat some of the damage, mm -hmm. for, at least for a swing. So it looks like we are debating on Felix's side what we want to do, looking at what's in hand, looking at life totals. Like I said, we are sitting on double innovative agilities, an inspiring call, double freezing hail, a song of frost. Our hand's looking a, a little bit rough. It's a lot more reactive than proactive right yeah, now. Yeah, very interaction heavy, and yeah. that's not going to do you a whole lot of good here. We can use these... Freezing hails to clear some, some board, maybe deal some damage to Xander, but not the ideal for sure. Yeah, so Vantis is going to come in, deal one damage to the shield mate, and we do have the Inspiring Call. It is going to be cast here, and pump up the rest of the board to two attack, and we might see something like um, the Quasi Trapper clear some damage as you have the Imperial Coat swinging for three, mm -hmm. and a couple other big swings. Because I, like you said before, Gildas is going to hit a really rough balance point. Yeah. To hit that balance level to get five damage in. But it looks like we are debating, because we do have a, another Karate Trapper in hand. If we really want to play another Karate Trapper and just try and deal the Shoemate with a little bit less attack damage. Yeah, interestingly, the, the way that um, Inspiring Call works is it's a persistent effect for the turn. So even if we play another ally here, we'll get that buff from Inspiring Call. Um, so he might just look to deploy that Karate Trapper to deal some extra damage. Yeah, pretty much recoup what the Karate Trapper that was thrown or whatever unit was thrown into the shield mate. Right, yeah, because somebody's going to have to waste their attack to, to deal with the shield mate, or we're going to have to waste something like a Freezing Hail. Which, I, at this point, I don't mind wasting a Freezing Hail. As we can see with the Lux Avengers, they're not really attacking too much. They're not really right. tapping a unit too much to do anything mm -hmm. with it. So I don't mind using the Freezing Hail, or it could be a damage that might really be pushing into responses on me that could catch, catch uh, Nick off guard. Sure. So we are going to go ahead and looks like push all the damage here with their crew, the Gildas. We didn't hit the balance with the Gildas. And we are still leaving the Karazi trap up in case someone comes on. And there is an Orbit Choker Freems coming in from Nick. 
Yeah, Felix really respecting Thieven Cut here. Keeps leaving this trapper up to, yep. to sort of guard against that. Which is nice. I mean, Thieven Cut's a really good card generation for Xander, and it's a card that does a lot more damage than you think, especially dealing for three for two costs and drawing you a card. Yeah. is pretty good value. We still have three cards in hand. We can still represent Song of Frost, Freezing Hail, a couple of other uh, cards as well. We can still represent the Frostbind, because we haven't seen them this game yet. Yeah. So. Yeah, we're in that point now where we see two Light Weavers and a Gleaming Cut in the hand of Nick. And so after this dungeon guide, it's starting to look really scary. Um, he's starting to create that lock that, that we saw last game. So if he can get through another turn or two here, which using Orb and Terraframe, he should be able to. Um, it's going to start uh, get, getting a little frightening for uh, for Felix. So he did banish a Gleaming Cut, which isn't the worst hit out of the lock. This is probably one of the better hits. If you're putting you'd rather keep card, the Light Weavers. Yeah. yeah, you'd rather keep the Light Weavers, keep the Luxum Sight. So Gleaming Cut, granted, it does draw you two cards on the reveal, but... Almost, that's like a Luxem Cobra floating memory in your mind. <laughs> right, sure. <laughs> so this, um, then you also hit the Shoemate that did its job. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and swing in one damage here with the Dungeon Guide, and looks like we're going to go ahead and pass the turn. So we do have two cards in hand. I don't think there's anything we could do to get um, more Luxem cards into our memory. No, I don't think so. So just going to have the one reveal. It's maybe they put down a second card. I'm not sure if they wanted to take the risk. I assume they probably just have the both uh, the Light Weavers in their hand right now. Yeah. So here comes the question. If you're Nick, are you going to pop the Terra Frame this turn? I'm not sure. You're at 10. You're not under a tremendous amount of pressure. You know it's very hard for your opponent to balance here with Gildas, so you're only really looking at, at like, five damage. Looks like they're going to pop the Choking Fumes and mm -hmm. maybe the Terra Frame. They were thinking about it. Yep. So it's Choking Fumes was popped. I'm going to go ahead and draw the card. So then the, the Choking Fumes will make everything for this turn cost one extra, try and prevent a little bit of like a tune the win, inspiring call loop combo here for a whole bunch of damage being pushed. So and we are going to pop the Terra Frame. Yeah, it looks like we're going for the combo that just says, you don't do anything this turn. Yeah. <laughs> All of your cards cost one more. It costs you two to attack with anything. You're just going to pass. Which and this? I'm going to set up for, for my next turn. But yeah, which at this point, this is all you're trying to do, is just trying to stabilize yourself as much as possible here so you can get into those turns where all those lesson cards are going to start going and hit, the, hit your memory zone for the reveals and the triggers. Is the next one that's the scary one. If yeah. Once he passes the next turn and his opponent still has this board, probably has an even bigger board, um, and he doesn't have a way to stop that is when it starts to get a little bit out of control. Now, I don't remember from this. Is Nick running Resolute Stand? Uh, I'm not sure. We can take a look at his list. I do not see any resolute stands. So okay. he is, he, oh no, we have three resolute stands. Okay, so there's a chance that we could draw a resolute stand. Uh, I don't think I've saw one in hand yet. Yeah, I don't think we've seen one in any of these games. So no. resolute would be huge here to just sort of shut off the, the turn. These water allies that really can't push over that three damage threshold. Yep. So Nick's going to go up to that 16 damage threshold here. Um, getting close to that life, not close enough for that. We're going to go ahead and pop the Serene Spirit of Fire yet, and we're going to go ahead and grab our Lexera's map so we can start setting up more cards in our hand. Uh, Xander Trigger. Cho Chose Chose to reveal the, the planted explosives. Yeah, I was about to say, there is, I about to say, I'm pretty sure Xander is a May ability. For you, just, you get into that sort of rhythm, you yeah. know, where you're like, you're revealing this, and, you know, it, it, it ultimately doesn't matter if your opponent knows if you have a planted explosive. We might even look to cast it this turn because we're pretty dangerously close to having to pop our Serene Spirit. Yep. You might look to, to get that planted explosive out. It's a great way to put down your two Light Weavers, cast a plant. Yep, I think the card off the top, or at least the farthest, did look like a Gleaming Cut. Sure. So we do have another Gleaming Cut in hand, so we could draw two. So we might even see that come down, depending on the board state Great. that we deal with, just so we start refilling that hand, because we do have the, the Luxera's map to draw another, another Luxem card into our memory. So he's just going to pass over here. He is holding up that planted explosives. Um, so actually, as I just caught a glimpse, Felix does have a Song of Nurturing in hand. Oh, wow. That's going to be huge. Yeah, so depending. So I think, actually, no, all the targets are valid for Song of Nurturing to stay alive past. Yeah, every single explosives. one, yeah. So this could be a really detrimental turn here for Nick. Let's see if they're able to at least stabilize others because we haven't, like I said, we didn't get the resolute stand, sadly. So, so we have about, what, we have five damage raw on board with no extra abilities coming through. Yeah, Felix was able to balance last turn with nine cards, so he might be able to do so again. Yeah, we did end up grabbing, so we're going to banish one for the Tide Procs are going to come in to prevent drawing, which actually comes in a big play because we just, as just said, we just saw Gleaming Cut come in. Yeah. And I think Luxera's map is also a draw in the memory ability. So if you draw in the memory and then Gleaming Cut, you can't draw a card for your turn because oh, yeah, you would I'm hit the sure. Tide. Yeah. So that's actually, this could be a really heads up play here from Felix to go ahead and generate the Tithe proc, prevent Xander from refilling their hand. At the very least, it, it cantrips, yeah. draws itself a new card. Yep, and sort of as we're seeing here, we do have, I think we saw, like I said, we do have Song of Nurturing. I don't think we have anything else right now to buff the board in Felix's side. 
Um, we do have another Gillis. We still have the Freezing Hails in hand. We did draw the Bishop again and Song of Frost as well. Song of Nurturing is so big here, though. Yeah. You just have to wait until Nick commits anything. So you get to commit this Rhyme Soul Bishop to the board and then just start attacking. And even if your opponent plays nothing, you're pushing two, four, six, seven damage here. Yeah, sadly, we have no float in the grave for Rhyme Soul Bishop to actually do its effect, which yeah, is fine. So we're going to see this plant here. Yeah. Okay, so it looks like it resolves. I guess keeping the hands up, because you do have, like I said, we have another Gillis in hand, so targeting the Gillis isn't the worst thing in sure. the world. We could play another one, especially because the way our hand is currently set up. Uh, if, depending on how many Luxon cards are triggered, we can't really keep anything up to begin with. Mm. So it might be something that's being set up for, say, playing replaying Gildas, swinging in. But we're going to go ahead and turn everything else sideways, though. So yeah, something we've seen from Felix uh, this match is he's, he's played so safe into mm -hmm. this uh, Xander deck where uh, the Xander deck can sort of um, put you in this situation where you feel pressured. Like, you, you have to act, and it's not always the case. You can play safe and, and keep up interaction and, and look to, to, like, pick your spots, and, and Felix has been doing a great job of that in this match. Yeah, I think it's really showing the level of power that the Luxem Xander list has, and Felix is showing a great amount of respect to what yeah. the deck can do as a whole. Yeah. And that he knows, especially after game two, that it could just turn that corner, and all of a sudden right. that window just went from wide open to completely shut. Yeah. So I, I definitely like the respect that we're giving it at this point. Vantage is going to go ahead and get it for one damage as well, going up to 22. We still don't look like have the Spirit of, Serene Spirit of Fire being popped. We don't really have... I understand we're not really feeling the pressure too just yet. Yeah, no no instant speed stuff for Felix to kill Nick with, so you don't have to worry about any any sort of fast spells like Fireball uh, burning you out of the game when you go to crack your spirit. So in this game, you can get pretty close to the edge yeah. uh, before you decide to crack your uh, your lineage release on your spirit. So it looks like we are debating a couple of cards, probably looking at what's in our grave, trying to debate what could come into play here to actually benefit, and we are just going to pass the turn. So we do keep about five cards in hand, so... If there was nothing extra coming out from Luxum, technically this could still represent a Frostbind or Song of Frost in hand. Mm -hmm. But we are going to go ahead and see the Insignia come down. Um, the question is if we are going to pop Luxum's up and up, we're just going to go ahead and Light Weaver's Assault trigger. So Felix only has to put two cards down from his hand, but still holding three up otherwise to represent any other combat tricks or anything in response. So we do have a response, though, to the Light Reavers. And, yep, there is the Song of Nurturing. So keeping that five up so they can go ahead and Song of Nurturing on their board so the Light Reavers Assault doesn't end up killing board wiping. Yeah, very interesting. So uh, I understand. So the question is the stacking, because there could be a response depending on which Light Reavers result was being responded to. Sure. If it's two going down the one and then responding to the second one. Um, really, really determines how things are being done as a whole. So we, and off of that, we go ahead and see... Two cards have been now drawn in for, it looks like, or one card, sorry, down for the Tithe proc. So we're going to go ahead, and as we're now hearing that, it is a search, not a draw. So it does search your deck for card putting in memory, so you don't have to worry about hitting that draw limit that the Tithe proc has come into play and sort of set on the field. So we're probably just going to find something like a Luxem site here to start yeah. turning that corner, getting some life back. I did see that Nick drew a Gawain here. I'm I'm curious. I assume they will deploy it, but it's an interesting choice where they go with it. There is, of course, that Korhazi Trapper that is keeping Gawain's on hit from happening. Looks like they're actually just going to cast a Light Weaver's Assault, reveal four cards, going to split some damage. They are going to show that they have a Gleaming Cut here. Um, and like you said, uh, since they've only drawn their one card for turn, they will be able to draw their two cards off Gleaming Cut. Yep, and then imagine at this point we're sort of looking at the stack damage, seeing how things are going to be stacked, because depending how these cards are stacked could also really detrimental, oh, should say determine how other things might interact and die on board. Um, so it looks like we are, like I said, talking about the damage right now. I think asking your opponent if they were going to pop their safeguard amulet, they said not to. We do have the one damage onto the Imperial Recruit. The Recruit, so it looks like, yeah, we are div dividing our damage right now across the board for the Light Weaver's Assault. Yeah, the interesting part about Light Weaver's Assault is when it is revealed from your memory, it is two damage that is dealt to a single target, but when you cast Light Weaver's Assault, uh, you reveal X cards and you deal X damage split however you want um, to target units. So he's going to be able to use both the five damage from casting Light Weavers and also the two damage from revealing a second one to sort of clean up the board here and, and alleviate some of the pressure. Yep, so it goes, it alleviates the pressure somewhat, leaving the one three trappers on board because a little bit less damage being pushed than these two damage, three damage units. Yeah. And then we are going to, it looks like we have another two damage being stacked off of the, yeah, it looks like the bishop is going to be cleared off of the Luxum um, Light Weavers Assault trigger mm -hmm. off of the reveal. 
Oh, two more. Oh. And then um, we're going to go ahead and imagine then healing our three now off of the Luxem site. And the question is if we are popping the Gleaming Cut or not. I said, I'm pretty sure we've only drawn one card return, which is yeah. sort of what's being represented. So we should be able to draw it without any issues. Yep. And, yep, and that's exactly what we're going to draw those do. two cards. And like we said in the previous game, just like that, Xander's turned the corner. He's cleared up the board. He has both a Light Weavers and a Luxem site that he's going to be continuously revealing. He still has that Serene Spirit, so he has six life in addition to what he already has. And he's starting to close the door here. Yep. So, yeah, we're back to 19 life. We still, like I said, have the Serene Spirit. We hero those six we want to, but we're not under too much pressure because there's only one threes on the board. Yeah, the board's been cleared up. Yeah, I'm not feeling too much pressure if I'm over here, Nick, and we're just sort of hit the point that we're going to hit uh, another Light Weaver Assault. We Luxem uh, Lux Spike again off of our turn, mm -hmm. and we don't even know what's also in hand because we could do something like Orb Regret at end of our opponent's turn, so we don't have to worry about that th tithe proc trigger for limiting how many cards we can draw. Yeah, the nice thing, at least from Felix's side, is he does have a lot of cards in hand. So he can get something going here. He uh, currently is up uh, cards on his opponent, and he does sort of have to leverage that before it, it becomes you know, too much of an issue from these Lux and Reveals, just generating so much advantage without ever losing a card. And my question, are we see Vanitas level 2? No, we're not. We're going to go Bobble. Getting a Bobble. <laughs> I was hoping. I'm really hoping. <laughs> so, yep, we're going to get the Bobble so we can do our draw a turn, or we give it in response to something, make our opponent draw a card to limit their own card draw off of other mechanics. Yeah. So we see how this played. We have Frostborn Paladin coming back down now. We can go ahead and eat the Bishop, gain our 3-4 three, four, uh, three, four Frost Paladin trigger. Go ahead. Draw a card. That's our second card for the turn. And we drew into our Fracture Eyes. So I wonder if... It, so we're looks like we're going to see three damage come in. And let's see if there's a response. Oh, we did top deck the Resolute Oh, stand. interesting. Yeah. Just going to cast a Resolute Stand here. Not blocking a whole lot of damage. It's going to block this attack for three. And it's going to block those two Korhazi Trappers. But this wasn't uh, representing lethal. But we're just going to play a little bit safe. Don't know what your opponent has in hand. And, and smartly, we see that Felix does have a Freezing Hail in hand. So you could get into that sticky situation where if you get too low on life, that Freezing Hail will clean you up if you go to, to 23. Yeah, especially because you, like you don't know how many more allies could be in hand. Um, I wonder if we're debating, because I think we are reading the Insignia right now. I wonder, because we did top that the Fracturize. If yeah. we're going to end up be Fracturizing this Insignia here to try and limit how many Luxem cards that your opponent can put into into their field, and we're actually going to go ahead and do the Orbit Regret. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so they're leveraging the fact that they hope that the cards that Nick has is not exactly what he wants to keep, so they're going to go ahead and blow up that Orbit Regret to limit the access to new cards that, that Nick has. Yeah, especially because Insignia technically isn't online right now, because if I'm not mistaken, it does require two or three costs to go down into... It is three costs, yeah. Yeah, three costs to play to gain a prep counter. Right. So hitting it right now isn't too detrimental, especially because you probably have other fracturizes in the yeah. deck. You know, but we are going to go ahead and generate a secret aim right here over on Nick's side. Um, trying to, I don't think there's any too much happening in the terms of Felix's side for non-combat damage, now that mm -hmm. Scepter has been spurned the Ashed. No. But Better to get it than to not. Um, we do still have those freezing hails to contend with, so yeah. Safeguard Amulet can uh, can block some damage there. That is true. And we go ahead and Xander Trigger. We do have the one light result in a Luxem site. Going to go ahead and resolve. Um, the more do two damage or something, if not to your opponent's face, and then heal three yourself. But as you said before, this window is rapidly closing. Yeah. I don't know if it's I want to say here. rapidly. Is this almost like a slow-moving train? Right. Just <laughs> you stuck see in the it track? coming, yeah. but you can't get off the track. Yeah, you're just sort of stuck in that full-on path of oof. This is oh wow, and we saw another light weavers drawn here by Nick, so oh. that makes that train go a little bit faster. <laughs> yeah, so this is definitely a good setup. And now at this point, I imagine Nick is just going to start setting up their hand to start paying cards down, as well as trying to recoup enough so they could just double light weavers assault here. But Green is going to come down. The trapper is still online though. Yeah, it looks like he's going to just eat both these counters. He used the Dungeon Guide to eat the first one, and then he's going to use the Gawain to eat the second one to keep this Trapper on the board, but it means that going forward, he can now do what he tried to do this turn. He can ping one of these 1-3s for 2 with a Light Weaver's Assault and then use one of his 1 damage allies to clean it up. Yeah, and Gawain come down too, like we said near, I think, at the beginning of this game, if not game 2, is that it's a pseudo-taunter. Right. Gawain's probably going to take an attack from one of these Corsali Trappers, maybe, maybe a Paladin, something to clear it off the board, so we're not banishing cards, and we're going to go ahead, though, and generate uh, Wanda Frost over on the four board of Felix. Uh, Wanda Frost comes in, and we go ahead and get to use its class bonus effect of draw a card, because Vayne... Right. Very right powerful card. Is a is a draw card. Yeah. <laughs> so we go ahead and refill our hand. I think we see a frost bind in hand. Yeah, I see. I see a couple of song of frosts, a freezing hail, a frostborn paladin, and exercise curses. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, that might be a frost bind second from the top there that they might want to hold up and 
we are Nick's at the point where he doesn't care a whole lot about card advantage. He's getting so much value off of his, his Luxem triggers, but this Frostbind does mean that he just can't cast anything. Yeah. He's just basically locked out of casting most of the spells in his deck. Like, he can't even commit a Light Weavers here um, without risk of, of being Frostbinded. So it looks like we're just going to see an Exercise Curses cast by Felix. There is... Um, he, he's just probably looking to set up yet another Frosthorn Paladin. Yep. And that's like what's coming down. Frosthorn Paladin is going to go ahead and come down. It's going to go ahead and looks like we have an in response to that. We're going to go ahead and use our Insignia in a prep counter and put three cards down from our hand, I, which I think the first two cards were the non-Luxum cards, and now I think we put down our Light Reaver Salt and our Luxum Sights off of that. So we're in kind of a dangerous position here. Thankfully, he does have Serene Spirit, but if he takes this attack from this Frostworn Paladin, there is there is a Freezing Hail in hand. Oh, but we didn't go for it. Nope. So we did go ahead and in response to paying that or to the swing, I'm going to pop Serene Spirit here to go ahead and only take heal six, technically take one, you'll only heal oh, yeah, yeah, five. Right, right. Yeah. So we're going to heal back all that damage back, go to 19, and then we're just trying to stabilize. I imagine we're probably trying to dig for this secondary Luxem site at this point. This is this board's looking scary. Yeah, uh, we we said you know this this door is closing, the, the terrain is approaching, <laughs> um, but he's really not out of the woods yet. There's so much damage on board, and he only has one Luxem site, and that's really what's going to be the important factor here. Is he can use these Light Weaver's assaults to clear some of these creatures and uh, unlock himself from um, you know being dead on board. But if he can't, he's, he no longer has that backup plan of Serene Fire lineage release, right? Yeah. So, like, if the pressure becomes too much, it will just, you know, run him over. So it was interesting, though, from Felix side not attacking the grain. They didn't go for the pseudo taunter at this point, and we just top decked another one. Oh, wow. So we could be hitting the point that two grains are going to come through and discarding some yeah. very valuable cards. Yeah, they're going to get a lot of work done here. Yeah. So, uh, but I guess also the second question comes in, are we going to be attacking into our opponent or are we just trying to clear these boards? So we do have the Imperial oh, Recruit no. on board. He's played this Gwen. Gwen is unfortunately unique. unique. So he's going to lose the first one there. Yeah. Because Gawain is unique, and he's and he's going to have to sacrifice one of them. So he did did miss his first attack on Gawain. And we played a uh, dungeon guide, so I'm not sure if we have something missing on the table here. I imagine we'll probably get this resolved here shortly. And looks like they are going to go ahead and swing four. Yeah, right. Gawain should be unique. We should lose one of those there. We'll see if we can get our table judge to, to sort that out. Yeah. Because then it looks like we do also have the Wander Frost coming through to go ahead and resolve something to negate damage here. So he was trying to clear the board as much as possible. It wasn't down quite like it happened, sadly. And that's what I was also wondering, too, because of the fact he had the Imperial Recruit, if Imperial Recruit is going to be a target here versus more, say, the Frostmore Paladin, because right. Imperial Recruit would just grow if it doesn't yeah, get attacked Yeah, you stop her from getting bigger, yeah. Yeah. So it looks like we are just going to pass the turn, and we did generate a tariff ring on the board of Felix here, so pretty much prevent another big uh, board swing for next turn. And Attune the Winds is going to come on down and close out oh the game. Oh, my God. Attune the Winds, the all-star of this matchup, just so powerful, turning these Korhazi trappers into two fours instead of one threes. It just, like, elevates all of these threats. Water Allies is a deck that doesn't have the most powerful threats. It's just lots of three mana two threes that we're used to, right? But mm. Attune the Winds turning them into three fours is so insane. Yeah. So yeah, it does look like we had a little pause there for a second, but it looks like they are resolving, so something else. But yeah, it does look like the Attune the Winds did close it. They did scoop. They fist pump. Understand who won. So we do have the Vantos going 3-0. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to the round. Very interesting deck. Great play by both players. Very, very tight match. Yeah. It's it's so hard. It, it really depends on how much pressure the water ally player can put on. Yeah. Because sometimes it's just not enough, and they turn the corner. But even in a situation like this, where Xander got to his end game and he was uh, setting up these double light weavers, he didn't have enough healing to sort of get himself out from under this giant board. Yeah, no, especially because of the fact of something like the Vanitas that comes in and enables that into this field. I mean, we didn't even get to see level two Vanitas. It's only level yeah, one. Yeah. So we didn't even get to see the other combo of the level two getting for a whole bunch of attack damage itself. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder how often that comes up. Maybe, maybe it's just in there for, like, Scepter value, yeah. and he's just using the level one to play this sort of, like, Attune the Winds. Uh, Scepter Dream Fairy. Health or something right. like that. Yeah, depending. yeah. No. Um, super interesting deck, though. Su super glad to see a cleric deck doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's not Arizona, but <laughs> know, you got the other cleric. I, I mean, it's also I'll take what I can get. also great to see we're seeing one of the new champions into three up uh, and what four zero now at this point. Yeah. Four, go, so oh, sorry, going into round four three zero. Sorry, going to go ahead and do that overall to. Because we're not seeing any other new champions outside of the 1x Arisana in there. Right. We, we, we have no Nikos today. We have no Polkox. Yeah. We had a couple of Dianas, but 
This is also one of our very few lineage break champions outside yeah. of back in the day of Merlin level two. Right. And you saw good. what happened. Even yeah. even Tristan now is yeah. is, is <laughs> you know ascending to yeah. level three when when she gets her her uh, level three Umber card. <laughs> yeah, it's um. L I, I said this a little bit earlier. It, we're so new into the format. Yeah. A ALC has only been out, what, like a, a month now. Yeah. Uh, and we've had a couple of tournaments. We had Ascent Ontario. We had uh, a couple of big regional events. Um, so we're starting to see the meta form, but this is the first time that we're having, I think, a, a real look at what the format is going to look like going into not only the rest of the national championship season, but Worlds in, in just a couple of months. Man, if we see a deck like this at Worlds in like top 16 format, yeah, give it to me. <laughs> this is a really interesting deck. I mean, uh, you know, Vanitas aside, just the, the power level of having such easy access to a two-color deck um, is really strong. And I think the the problem that Nico and Polcock have is that um, they're level two. So you, yeah. you don't get that power until much later in the game where, yeah. where uh, Vanitas, you get it almost immediately if you want it. Yeah. I will say I am actually a little surprised we haven't seen a single Nico today yeah. in the list, only because I've been watching people play Nico in these other events and sure. actually putting up decent results for mm -hmm. the most part. I figured someone probably would at least maybe tweak it and crack it a little bit. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's a bad deck. I think um, it, it's such a big stage here this yeah. weekend. There's so much on the line for these players. It's an invite-only tournament. The top eight of this event not only gets product, they get cash. They also get a very coveted invite. To the world championship. Very nice beseech the win promo invite. Uh, uh, four very nice beseech the very win nice. promo invites, of which there will only be those sixteen playsets from from the world championship. So, I understand why people aren't like taking the leap, right? Yeah. Um, and and huge respect to to you know players like uh, um, like the Trisket player and and this uh, Vanitas player that yeah. are innovating and and, yeah. and trying new things, but. You know, me personally, like I was gonna w bring Water Diana if I was yeah. playing in this tournament, right? I mean, so. I was gonna bring Fire Ride. <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> uh, at least I'm sticking true to my guns sure. here. You weren't bringing Ari Sana. Hey, listen, it's a little different. Listen, the only deck that I have with me is an Ari deck. <laughs> I I was maybe gonna play it. I I was hoping we were gonna have that deck on coverage because I know somebody in the room is playing it. Yeah. But I mean, like I said, I think uh, according to our stats, there's one that is three zero or was three That's, or two zero. Well, there, it's just it's <laughs> it's an erupting player that has the the Ari in there. In there. <laughs> No, no, I think uh, champion-wise there was an Ari, if I'm not mistaken, your stats. I think the way that our stats work is they just pull anything that's in your deck. And well, they I knew that the material, you, but this champion is like a different. Like an aggregate score? Yeah, yeah. I, I think our point two five Ari Sanos is just somebody somebody playing in there. I don't know, man. You never know. <laughs> hey, I will have you know that Ascent Ontario uh, was won by an Aster deck oh. right? because there was an Ari card in, in, <laughs> in their deck to banish with Dusklight Communion. Hey. Um, Take it. But yeah, we're super happy with the how the meta is shaping out. We have um, a lunch break for our players and for us. We can yeah. take a little bit of a break. A little bit of a break. Um, so we're going to be gone for about 30 minutes, and then we will be back uh, to you with round four and some more action in the Swiss rounds today, day one at North American Grand mm -hmm. Archive Nationals. Yeah, make sure to stick around, and we'll bring more action shortly.
Hello. How's it going, everyone? And welcome back to the Grand Archive uh, North American Nationals. Um, my name is Kel, also known as Red Zone Rogue, and I am joined once again by Rav. Rav, Rav hello. Glad to be back for another round and actually just finishing lunch break, it looks like. Getting ready to look at all the stats going into round number four. So, Yeah, uh, we have some pretty interesting stats, actually. They, they kind of give us like this stat breakdown. I have it all here on my trusty little laptop. And uh, I think one of the most um, interesting ones that was pointed out to us is the conversion rate for the top 15 basic elements yeah. in the current standing. And we have, at the, at the top, wind, actually, um, with a 44% conversion rate. Yeah, that's really good, especially because a lot of us were talking about wind early on might be a sleeper play into this. I mean, we actually have, because I think technically the Vanitas would have saw is technically classified as water, even though it is a wind element afterwards. So it's also really interesting. We have just pure wind decks converting pretty smoothly into this next round. Yeah, I think a lot of folks would have expected water and fire to be among there. And we, we do have a pretty good-ish conversion rate for water. Yeah. So we have water as the next one with a 29% conversion rate. Um, but then fire is the most um, yeah. interesting one. It's the most surprising one uh, with a 27% conversion rate. Yeah. With a lot of players like coming on in, there's only four in the top 15 right now. Yeah, which is also really shocking because if I'm not mistaken, we had about like a 58% of the player base was on fire. Yeah. So the fact that we only have four of them now are undefeated in, uh, I think, 163, 165 rounded up person tournament is just insane. Yeah, and I think a lot of people would have expected them to do very, very well. I mean, you obviously had the um, like the fire assassin lists, but we had erupting, we had Merlin, you know, yeah. shenanigans, and yeah. And yeah, Merlin, and the four. Luxem Xander. Yeah, no, we're definitely sitting an interesting spot, uh, especially going into these future rounds. I mean, we're seeing a lot of spicy brews come out. We, oh, yeah. We, we had the Triscuit round one, which I just got to look up how they're doing. We had Vanitas going into round number three. Yep. I mean, we're just getting all these innovative lists coming into this tournament, and it's, this is honestly great to see. Yeah, of course. I mean, this is exactly what you want to see at a, like, a top-level event like this. You have people playing like the expected meta, but you also have people bringing in like their signature brews or like their spicy brews obviously like you said the triscuit which, which was very exciting for me yeah. honestly <laughs> it was very exciting um but then we also saw uh rye even yeah um you know kind of a tried and true grand archive champion one of the original and uh we saw rye have a pretty good uh um you know showing today and i think it, it's a pretty well placed in the meta actually i talked to some folks after that match and we were just talking about how you know rye is a pretty good medical especially against all of these like mid-rangey slower ally decks yeah. where they can you know they have the tools to prevent the damage they can do like their fog strategy yeah definitely they're really stabilized right now especially coming into an event that's so ally focused right yeah. now for at least for the most part we're seeing meta wise uh, it's having a really good conversion rate we're talking about also with decks that we expect to be converting right now we have lorraine up there lorraine could be anywhere from allies to some of the merlin lists you have a couple of different uh, xander's now making conversion over to it diana's still alive the there, there's actually a bunch like we were looking at the top like i don't know the top five or so and we we're just kind of like clicking through the lists and looking at them there's a bunch of like undefeated dianas yeah which is amazing i mean i think also we have a couple of tonys in there so we having yep. a really strong representation of our new alc champions yeah showing sure. and really shaking up the meta into what used to be sort of the boogeyman merlin only and yep. now we're sitting there with about a really wide spread of champions that are undefeated going into this round Except for Arisana, of course. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Poor Ari. Ari's Poor Ari's not getting there. But, sorry, uh, Ari. Someday. Someday. <laughs> um, Soon. But, you know, I just heard a little uh, a little birdie tell me we oh. actually have some really, really exciting stuff to show y'all. We have some uh, unseen art, some art that we have oh. not seen before for the upcoming Grand Archive set. So let's uh, let's take a look at it. Okay. Ooh, okay. All right. Smashing Force by Dragon Art, uh, Taro Taro. Dude, th this this hammer is huge. So I will say this: uh, neither Rav or I have seen these yet. No. Like, th we are no. seeing these the first time yeah. you are seeing these. Uh, so this is going to be art for a new card in uh, Mercurial Heart. And uh, the, well, let's speculate a little bit, a little bit on this. Yeah. What to you is the first thing you think of when you see this art? Guardian. Yeah, Guardian, like Fire Guardian. Fire right? Guardian. Give me hammer. I mean, I feel like this this might not be. Is this the first card? I think we're also seeing with the actual hammer mechanic, mecha or hammer more shown, I should say. But I wonder if we're going to get hammer weapons. Now I'm looking at this. I mean, art. yeah, that is interesting. This is a big hammer. Too, yeah, right? that's a big hammer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is a big old steam powered hammer. Um, 
Also, you know, they're definitely like you know leaning more into the the steampunk aesthetic. Yep. Uh, lore wise, this is a I would guess a human character rather than one of the uh, like automaton characters. Yep. Um, yeah. I, I think it'll be definitely an ally more than a spell. I feel like it, it gives me more of that ally feel than more just like. Oh, that's interesting. I think it could be either. Really? I, I think this could be like some sort of attack. I'm about to say more or, of an attack card. Yeah, you, like like a fire hammery swing attack. Do you think it has class bonus? Oh, gar like a guardian class yeah. bonus. I think or, it's. I think or, Guardian's a really good bet. Or even like the hammer bonus, because we do have some cards in um, ALC that have shield bonuses or something. If you have a shield, it does extra or does uh. less, I should say. Do you think we're going to get the hammer bonus because it's a hammer bonus? It's hammer, hammer bonus. It's hammer time. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Sure. Let's let's go for the spicy take. Let's, let's go. With, <laughs> let's go, let's go with the hammer bonus. <laughs> I'm like Guardian bonus seems like uh, it could be likely. Um, hammer bonus. I, I, I like the hammer bonus. You yeah, know, I like bonus. everything about this art. I mean, the fact that you have the whole like hammer swing in part of the art with swirls make me think that the hammer is either like rocket propelled or like something's really happening with this hammer as a whole. That actually, now that you now you mentioned attack card, I'm, I'm really I might change my vote here. It feels like an attack card. It feels like an attack card. Yeah, I think it's it's going to be an attack card. It's probably going to attack for I don't know like what's what's a good hammer attack six. Yeah, probably. Almost like, you know, like that? almost like the Smash with Obelisk in Neo. So, you know, it's one of those yeah. high end. I mean, what? We have um, Heavy Swing. That's like six damage. So, yeah. no, I'm really excited for this card. I mean, I'm, I've am i been a Guardian man since release. And granted, I haven't been able to brew anything with Tony for my life. But I'm really excited for more Guardian cards. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to getting smashed by that card, I guess. Because <laughs> I, I will not be playing the Guardian cards. I'll be getting smashed by the Guardian cards. Yeah. Tony likes to go smash. <laughs> yeah, as I'm, I'm filling around with my, my assassin -y stuff. I'm really looking forward to the new um, Umbra Tristan. I know a lot of other yeah. folks are. So yeah, can't, um, can't um, um, okay. And then, all right. So I don't know if I'm allowed to say that one. I think I think we I think we should say it. Think you should say yeah. It? So I just got confirmation that we're gonna have another art spoiler at the end of the stream as well. So okay. stay tuned for that. Right. Uh, we do still have uh, four more rounds today, right? Yeah. We have four more rounds yeah, four today, three. and then the. Yeah, seven. So yeah, we have three more rounds going into round number four. If you count this round, then we yeah, have yeah, four. Yeah, four yeah. Yeah. So we have uh, the upcoming round, and yeah. then three after that. Yeah. So, yeah, so four You're more. Yeah. Um, we also have two more spoilers tomorrow Ooh. as well. So catch us on the live stream tomorrow. We will have the rest of the uh, Swiss rounds as well as the top eight uh, tomorrow. Man. So they're really trying to make me not sleep tonight. They're really right. making me sit here and speculate tonight as after the event and what cards could be coming out and what I could be seeing. I mean, we've gotten confirmation that all classes are going to be supported in the set, that so you could literally be like anything. Yeah, I mean, I can't wait to see more support. I'm really curious what they're going to give mage support. Like I said, I'm a Rye main, so having yeah. mage support, granted, anything that gets mage, Merlin takes it and does better. But yeah, I mean, well, it, it could be like arcane support, though. I mean, I'm hoping it's arcane yeah, support. I would love more arcane support. I would love even just a different element than arcane. Because imagine if you have mage and something else entirely. But I'm, like I said, I'm cooking. Yeah, you, yeah, <laughs> I'm, you I'm, I'm pretty much in the sauce at this point. Yeah, I mean, like, hey, we, we, see, a, we see a new uh, Umbra champion, right? We yeah. see uh, Tristan converting to Umbra. So who knows? Who knows yeah. what's going to be in the next set? Yeah, we have a lot of different things going on. And then, like I said, I'm really excited to see these upcoming spoilers. I'm really excited for MRC. Um, fact, we're even getting cards now. We, we still have two months out from Worlds, where it's also going to be revealed there. It's yeah. really nice to see that we're really getting early insight into even just the art. Yeah, I mean, I mean, not even just revealed at Worlds. There is yeah. the uh, World Premiere event. So yeah. people are going to be able to play. So if you, uh, dear viewers out there, you know, attend uh, Ascent Worlds, you'll be able to play with some of the brand new Mercurial Heart, or Mercurial Heart cards like a couple weeks early, right? Yeah, and I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, tickets are still available for Ascent Worlds. If anyone who's so, looking yeah. at attending, it is a 3v3 event. So grab your friends, grab some teammates, grab grab your mom, grab your dad, grab whoever you want. <laughs> Throw a team together and show up to Vegas. It'll be a really good time. It's going to be an amazing event. It's our first Worlds for the game, and I'm really yeah. excited for that's coming up. It's going to well. be awesome. I'm, I'm going to be there like 100%. I can't wait yeah. for it. It's going to be so much fun. Yeah, my flight's booked. I, I got the CPR version. I, I bought the Super VIP ticket. I'm yeah. <laughs> I, need, I need a Frostbind. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> I'm definitely going to play with them too. Yeah, yeah I'm, I mean, I won't play it. I'll give it to our resident cleric that you've seen on stream today with Cam, who loves cleric cards. Uh, so he, he will be very happy with that card. Yeah, for sure. But no, um, it sounds like, like I said, players are getting settled in. Everyone's coming back from the lunch break, getting ready to start their round yep. here. Um, we have confirmation that we are going to have two players on um, stream that are still undefeated. We are still showing undefeated yeah. decks. Um, I think we have what, wind allies and water allies. So yeah, I, I we looked at it's like what, uh, Tony versus Diana? So yeah. like wind, Tony, and water, Diana. Yeah, so yeah. it's going to be Andy and Violet, as I just heard. Um, so I think Violet is going to be on the Wind Allies, Wind Tony yes. list, and then yep. Andy's going to be playing over on Water Diana, which Water Diana is actually a really interesting brew looking at the list. 
it is running the card that I think is really strong is Blast Shot Pump. Yeah, Blast Shot Pump is sweet. Like, Blast Shot Pump is a card that is, like, uniquely, maybe not uniquely, but just really, really good yeah. into the ally metagame, right? Being yeah. able to basically cleave, hit two targets at the same time, yeah. uh, which is just, just really, really strong. And if you can pump it up by, you know, other bullets or whatever, then you can get a nice little two-for-one attack. An interesting one for those that don't know, with Blast Shot Pump, the fact that the secondary damage isn't part of the it's part of an attack, you can't, like, resolute stand the second part. Yeah. You have to resolute stand the initial attack to deal less damage as a secondary target, yeah. which is really interesting because some it's a really interesting ruling on that because just the whole interaction of clearing board and clearing allies is really good in that type of matchup. Yeah. So, but no, I'm really excited to see uh, Water Diana. It's going to be the first one you're showing on stream. Um, I didn't happen to look. I can't remember if it is Water Diana with Umbra, card or top end. Uh, well, you know what? Either way, let's uh, let's check it out and yeah. see what uh, the players have yeah. with our uh, round four here at the Grand Archive North American Nationals. Yeah. On the bottom, we have Violet. She's going to be the one piloting Diana. Uh, you can kind of... Uh, I was going to say... See by the sleeves, but that is not the case here. Nope. And that's like, I will say, I, like in the sleeves on both, we do have Andy Rock and Diana, Rock and Diana sleeves, staying, staying true to what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so it looks like we're going to get the dice roll out of the way here, and we're having some fist bumps saying good luck, and Andy's going to start us off here with the Spirit of Water. Yeah, I love the, love the camaraderie. So, like we said, at the top, I might have conflated them, mix them up a little bit, but top is water. Diana. Bottom is uh, what we believe to be Wind Tony. It looks yep. like a Wind Allies list. Yeah. So this is sort of going to be um, the Water Diana list uh, is going to sort of play what the Water Allies list as a whole. They're going to play the usual value three drop two threes. Yep. Keep three cards in hand for a Song of Frost, Frostbind. But it's going to be a little bit different because it wants to level up Diana to get through free attacks. Not even free attacks. Just straight attacks in with Blash Up Pump and other cards <laughs> to just try and push as much damage as possible and use like the cards to clear board as well as keeping up the tempo. Yeah, and you can see Violet here having oh. a very, very beautiful uh, spirit, you know? Yeah. Got, got the maximum flex. Yeah, for those who don't know who are tuning in for the sign, Violet's actually one of our top eight players from Ascent Ontario, um, which is where you, they got this nice little Gwendolyn spirit of wind art. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. And, uh, you know, speaking of Allies, we're just this is, this is literally just going to be like you know the battle of allies, right? This is the battle of the board states. Yeah. yeah. Um, no. Effects that yeah. get no. you two for one yeah, removal yeah. is going to be really really important. Like you yeah. mentioned, like the oh, blast shot pump. Uh, <laughs> those are the things we really need to pay attention to. Yeah, and there are some spicy tech coming in because um, depending on the hand draws, there are some cards. I think I saw in Andy's hand is a seeking shot. Okay. So yeah. seeking shot's good. Sure. The front of the main board if you expect a lot of allies because the way seeking shot works is that you pay pay the cost. It's an attack, but does more damage if it's attacking an ally. So it really helps you clear your opponent's ally board while keeping yours alive yeah there, there are some pretty big allies in the win list right some some three fours so being able to clear up those is going to be really really important yep. and right on cue yeah just thanks fire andy. it off thanks andy keep me right keep me honest clear up those three cost two threes yep so when rider vanguard is going to go ahead and die uh when rider vanguard is a class bonus which is why it doesn't have vigor to get the retaliate damage in but and we're going to go ahead and see one of the other new Th three drop two threes. Yeah, this one can become a four three, right? This yeah. is a three drop two three that has range two, one of the new mechanics from uh, Alchemical Revolution that if they're distant, they get an additional uh, bonus to their attack equal to their ranged value. Yep. And it looks like we are going to go ahead and see, looks like the favorable winds come out from Violet at the end of turn, just sort of using it to use the floating memory to go into level one yeah. Tony. Yeah, you just kind of shortcutted that, right? Yeah. And um, level one Tony is a little bit. Unique, I want to say, because it is a champion that wants you to hit him. Yeah. I mean, like, he, he's good at protecting his allies, and Gildas is a really great ally to protect. So uh, she's immediately going to drop down the Gildas and yep. crash on in. Yep. Gildas did have the uh, the balance, so she was able to trade in. Yep. And we are going to go ahead and play the Imperial Recruit. And in response to Imperial Recruit, we're going to have the Frostbind um, come down and prevent that from actually hitting the board. Yeah, negate that, and it goes into the banishment. Yep, so we're going to go ahead and go to materialization. So this is where Diana sort of pivots a little bit, because Diana can uh, go for Scepter, the normal water allies play, but if it's really feeling the pressure, it could level up into its level one Diana to start setting up for the level two to get the plash up on yeah. earlier. And a lot of the, the typical plays with Diana is you wait until you're level two, and then you kind of do it all at once, right? Yep. You get your gun, you get your bullet, and you just kind of go to town. I did take a little glimpse at Andy's... Um, Memory, he does have three back steps, I think, uh, which is... I mean, it's a good card, but I don't want three of them in my opener. <laughs> three of them and no no allies on yeah. one is a little rough. Yeah, I mean, it will be good later on because Diana is herself a card at level two. Or is it level one, actually? That does gain distant. It's a uh, level level two gets the yeah. uh, ranged bonus, the, yeah. the inherited effect. So we're actually going to go ahead and grab Tasia shot here. Well, that makes sense, right? Yeah. Uh, you want to get the Tasia shot out there and, uh, you know, punish your opponent for leveling up. 
Yeah, and we are going to go ahead, the Snow Fairy come down on Gildas, keeping Gildas tapped and swinging in for one. So this is, like I said, going to be more the interesting mirror match we're going to say. It's going to come down to a couple of different draws and what we might see from each opponent that might have teched for expecting this sort of matchup as a whole. Yeah, I, I think both players are going into this expecting yeah. th this matchup, right? Yeah. Uh, both decks, Wind Allies, Water Allies, are, you know, some of the more prevalent decks yeah. in the format. And we're going to go ahead and generate a GCR here over from Violet. Um, sort of sit on board. We don't really need to crack it out. Usually sometimes these GCRs and baubles are used to really adjust for your um, balance math. Yep. Okay. Sort of make it all work out. So we're going to go ahead and see another Gildas come down. Yep. And the way it works is that the Gildas will overwrite the original Gildas. Yeah. So we don't have to worry about that anymore with Snow Fairy. And the swing four because we're balanced thanks to the GCR. Yeah, exactly. So, nice. so we have a good old Scepter coming on down. Uh, this is you're gonna see this a lot, right? From a lot of water decks, they're just gonna drop their scepters as early as they can, so they can push as much uh, damage through. Yeah, and you use one of those three back steps, and we do actually do <laughs> the second snow fairy coming down to tap the Gildas again. <laughs> <laughs> the same snow fairy. Yeah, really doesn't want snow fairy. I mean, really doesn't want Gildas swinging in for four damage every turn. Really wants to keep that card locked down as much as possible, so they can apply the pressure and don't have to worry about four coming at themselves every single turn. Yeah. Yeah, the Snow Fairies, well, you know, they still apply a little bit of pressure themselves, uh, being able to attack in for one. Um, and like we mentioned, this is going to be like a battle of a battle of the board states, right? Yeah, um, especially especially in this part. I mean, we have to sort of, I haven't really seen what's in Violet's hand yet to see what we might be having. And we're going to go up Safeguard Amulet here. This will help prevent maybe a turn if Andy decides to try and speed level into um, a level three Diana or level two using something like a Dungeon Guide if they run it. Safeguard Amulet will come and prevent for that damage as much as possible. Hmm. So we're going to go ahead and ha play a Shimakoku Assassin in the form of Violet. And then Shimakoku go ahead and swing in two um, because of the fact that Shimakoku Assassin is a 2-2 two -two and stealth. Stealth cannot attack stealth. And then from there we're um, going to swing two because it needs a 2-2. Two, two right, so as we go into, we pass the turn here with the Shimakoku Assassin onto the board, we're going to go ahead and Give the turn over to Andy. They run ahead and swing in with the Snow Fairies onto Violet here because we don't have to worry too much about the taunt. The Snow Fairies can't kill the Shimago Assassin. Like I said, due to that interesting way stealth interacts with each other. Um, like I said, with neither one having true sight, they can't get the attack into um, into the Shimago Assassin at all. So Andy's debating what they want to do for the hand. They do still have the two back steps in hand, which sort of might make math a little bit awkward because of the fact that um, they have to, they really want to save that to go distant. They want to save it for either Diana or a unit that has distant. So they don't want to use it too early. Um, even though we are level one Diana, we don't have the distant bonus just yet. And we don't want to lineage release level one Diana to get the weapon to our level two. So, <laughs> as it, it looks like we, I might have seen a dungeon guide in the form of Andy here. We do have a trained sharpshooter as well and a couple other cards. And mostly just trying to figure out how we can deal with this board state. Um, the only way that the Shimakook Assassin can be dealt with is either tapped by a Snow Fairy or I'm not sure 100% in the list, but if Andy is running the Seeker's Rifle, which does give the gun true sight um, with the class bonus, could also help deal with the Shimakook Assassin. Oh, he's going to start swinging in with a 2 2 every turn. Oh, and he's going to go ahead and put three down. So they do have a Karhazi Trapper in hand which could help negate a Shimakoku Assassin attack or maybe a big Tony attack, because Tony usually in these lists are running Heavy Swing. Um, heavy Swing is a card that can deal um, a good amount of damage for playing, pretty much swinging in for, uh, for about four cost. Nope, Violet's going to go ahead and materialize for the turn. Um, looking at Violet's material list, we do have, I think that is a Poison Coating Oil, which will give her Shimakoku Assassin plus two attack. We have, I think, a, a Brock Sword, which looks like we are generating. Bullock Sword is one of the new yeah. cards from AOC that yeah. has a class Not bonus, gets an extra <laughs> attack for Warrior. I, it, it does I, three I attack, two, two durability, war, and then. But if you want to attack with the Bullock Sword, you have to go ahead and pay two in order to use it. So it does have a little bit of a drawback for the amount of uh, attack power it's able to generate from it. So we are going to go ahead and recollect for our turn. So, looking at Violet's hand, we do end up having, I think, uh, was that a back step or so? I don't think so, I want to say. And, uh, yep, so it looks like we have a Squirrel, uh, an Inspiring Call, and a couple other cards. And it uh, looks like I do end up having Lineage Ray Cam joining me here in the booth for a little bit. Hey. Here. Welcome. Welcome to the Ally lineup of funness. Yeah, we're, we're all about this board state. I'm a big fan <laughs> of this, uh, this second Snow Fairy that's really getting some work done, but... 
Yeah. These stealth threats are really going to be difficult for for oh, basically either it. player to deal with. Yeah, I, I forget. Didn't you also run water allies for a little bit? I did. Yeah, played a lot of water allies in my day. <laughs> So we're gonna gonna third Gildas. The third Gildas. The, the best way to deal with the Snow Fairy is to play a new Gildas and, yeah. and just get in for four. Yeah. I mean, your opponent can't have a third Snow Fairy, right? That would be so unlikely. Yeah. It couldn't, couldn't ever happen. Could never happen at all. So it looks like we are going to go ahead and use the... Oh, so we actually killed the Trapper here with, I think... Yeah, the Gildas and Shimmercook looks awesome. For a second, I had to relook at it because I've got Shimmer Cook was on the field and was a 2 2. 2 2 2. 2 2 with stealth for 3, very deceptively powerful. Yeah, of course. You lose that one point of toughness, but there's so little things that can deal with stealth in this game. Like you were saying earlier, maybe we have a Seeker's Rifle to get at some point, but that's not ideally what Andy wants to be doing here. Yeah, and the fact that Gildas with bounce did have four attacks, so the Grahazi Trapper activation did make it require the double attack, though. Right. And Swiffer Recruit was going to go ahead and hit the board. Our nice little intercept uh, floating memory 1 2. He's just going to stick back on defense, maybe hopefully block something more than these two snow fairies, but that's probably all he's going to get done here. So yeah. Absorb a couple of attacks, but you know, two life is two life, especially under you know some real pressure here is Violet yeah. um, up to eleven life and and facing down a scepter, which is something that she doesn't really have a way to contend with. A scepter and a taser shot. So I wonder if Andy's sitting here thinking about whether or not they want to go to level two because they go level two, they can go ahead and grab a blast shot pump. Use taser shot to hit and then also clear the board off of something else that they really wanted to yeah. and make it so Violet can't go with the level two to get in the heavy swing without taking a lot of more damage. Yeah, Andy can just uh, grab something like a prototype pistol here, clear that snow fairy or clear that swift recruit with the two snow fairies and then come in with a prototype pistol with the taser shot. There's lots of avenues here for Andy to connect with this taser shot and that, that is a really dangerous thing, especially under um, the, the scepter pressure. Yeah, but the real side downside is that Andy is only down the four cards in their hand. Yeah. Or should I say influence four? There's one in hand three, remember. Right. But we've done the influence four, which is really not where you want to be versus something like Wind Allies, because, I mean, at this rate, you had Violet drop three Gildas on you that you probably didn't expect. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know if they have the fourth at this rate. Well, we'll, we'll see if Andy has the, the third Snow Fairy to, to complete the cycle, right? Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be an Allies mirror if they weren't trading blows of the same card right, back and of forth. Right, of course. So we did go ahead with the prototype pistol, like you said. Um, part of the pistol is a card that gains an extra attack on enter for class mm -hmm. bonus. So it is, it's a two, two right now, right? Or two attack, three, oh, two attack, three durability, I'm sorry. Um, so we can load it with the taser shot if we want to, but usually you want to utilize the taser shot to get more into face damage than you would want to clear allies. Yeah, so we're just going to clear this swift recruit, going to load up that taser shot into the prototype pistol and come across for three damage, putting them under that taser shot ability. So now, you know, Violet's in this tough position where if she levels up, she's going to take four damage. If she doesn't level up, she is at risk of Scepter dealing another four damage. Yeah, which, I mean, Tony going up to level two does gain up to, I think, 25 life. Right. So, I mean, it does have more life than our Arisana and Rai <laughs> <laughs> favorites. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is a card that can take up the uh, the Taser Shot with being able to survive the extra four damage. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the Taser Shot's also a big threat because... Usually these Dynalists are running stuff like Shadow Twin to double apply those stats. Right. Which can be pretty detrimental. But it looks like Violet here is debating what to materialize. Um, we could be down to seeing either what? Level 2 Tony, maybe a GCR if it's still... Has, oh, sorry, GCR has been used. Yeah, she's in such a rough position because if she yeah. goes to level 2, she's under that taser shot. But if, uh, you know, if she doesn't, she's under too much pressure here, I think. She's going to get a smoke bomb to try to stick a threat, maybe keep this Gildas around. She, it's, her, it's her third one. She really has to protect this one. <laughs> yeah, can't, can't go down a fourth. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the smoke bomb could be interesting because smoke bomb, using it on, say, something like the Gildas, will swing in. But it looks like we're also using it for the card draw ability. Yeah. So, like I said, I can't really see what's in her hand, so it might be needing to really filter out the hand a little yeah, bit. GCR at home, you yeah. know, getting, the, getting that card draw the hard way. Yeah. Um, like I said, it does have stealth, so it can't be that. Oh, attuned to the winds. Man, I'm seeing a lot of attuned with the winds this uh, this tournament, and it's looking really good here. It's a good Putting card. counters on... Uh, Shimmer Cloak Assassin is so strong. It's We're also balanced. Stealth. Yeah. We're also balanced. So she's going to come in for five here with Gildas, three with the Shimmer Cloak. Yeah, putting eight damage, putting 16. I mean, really putting Diana on a clock here because Diana only has 19 life. It's going to force Andy to level if he doesn't put anything down. Um, but it looks like we are debating damage. Looks like Andy's, I think, still thinking of a response to a change to the wind right now because we are doing a little bit of, a little bit of math. It's very dangerous here. If, if he has nothing, she gets to attack with these two and then pay two for Bulwark, and that is lethal. So he does have to, you know, flinch here and, and play something. Yeah, even more so because the fact that you have to, um, like I said, because if you don't have anything in hand at all, you can't even level if you don't have a card to pay, pay right. it out. So you really have to respond with just something. Even if you take the damage, you just need cards in your memory to even... Yeah, even like level. a Frostbind here to make her put cards down, even though she yeah. can pay for it, will, we'll, you know, save him. But. Yeah. 
It would definitely save him a good amount of damage. And then, it, like I said, you have enough to go into his level two. But it looks like we do are going to have the response coming out. And we're going to backstep. Sure. So distance draw. I think we still have a Frostbite in hand. Yep, Frostbite is going to come down, like you said. Yeah, so just going to prevent Violet from coming in with Bulwark Sword here. It's it's uh, a, a strange way to, to avoid lethal, but uh, if he didn't do anything, she just got to swing in, you know, for Xaxes. So yeah, as long as it really heads up play from Andy. Staying alive is better. <laughs> as long as you stay alive, the better. So it looks like Violet is debating whether or not she wants to respond here to pay the two. And she did just say next game. I'm not sure who ended up winning that one. I'm not yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what happened there. Hopefully, we can get a heads up from our from our team here. It looks like Violet was in a pretty commanding yeah. position, but yeah, I'm, unless said he had pay two, I'm not exactly sure what happened there. But she, she might have had four cards in hand there, so she just does get to pay for the frostbind and then pay two for for bulwark yeah. and come in for exact lethal. Oh well, no, must not have because we said Gildas was balanced. So right. it was three three. Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh. Yeah, well, I guess we'll find out when the score score updates here. What can be done? But so going into sideboards here, um, I imagine there's going to be a couple cards bringing in. Violet's probably going to bring, if not already in there, it's going to be running the Verdian Protective Drinker that of we course, see. Yeah. We're going to see Water Bobble Boy come in. Mm -hmm. The usual, because if you play Water, you usually just bring a trinket because having a card pre prevents the frostbite <laughs> right. for those types of situations. Yeah, it's interesting to see what they, they have in their boards here. The, the usual suspect stuff like, you know, we saw Smoke Bombs is already in Violet's main deck, but that's something that usually is relegated to the sideboard. Um, we'll see if uh, like stuff like Still Water Patrol shows up, which is really good in these sort of fairy uh, mirror matches where both players are playing these one-twos with self that are very hard to deal with, especially on Violet's side also playing those uh, Shimmer Cloak Assassins. You really need a way to deal with stealth, so I'm sure that Andy's packing some variety of either still water patrols, maybe Eye of Argus, something that allows them to, to get through the, that wall of stealth units. Yeah, they may also be running a Seeker's Rifle to also help with yeah. a little bit of, because Diana does have the ability to have a gun that does give True Sight, and it looks like we did have an update. It looks like they did mark Andy with the win. Okay. So Andy did end up getting the win there, and then we are going to go ahead and, like I said, sideboarding in a little bit. Um, we saw Violet bring in, like I said, more than likely the trinkets, the baubles. I don't think I see Andy really sideboard anything in. I might have missed it. Yeah, maybe like you said, that, that the Seeker's Rifle, if yeah. you didn't have access to it already, it's super strong in these mid-range mirrors where you get to not only deal with a stealth threat, which is usually a problem for you, but the, the hard thing that Diana has is she always needs more bullets. Yeah. She always has access to a gun, either from her lineage release, or you get something like Prototype Pistol and it sticks around for a long time. But you just don't have a reliable way to get bullets repeatedly. And so Seeker's Rifle's uh, on uh, kill, pay to materialize a bullet is very strong there. Yeah. So interesting with Andy's sideboard, which I've been seeing more and more with these waterless, is that they are doing Shadow's Twin in the side versus the main yeah. deck. So I don't know. I feel like this might be something that might not be brought on because, as we saw, this game is very level one based versus right. needing the power level itself. But I do like the Shadow Twin in the side. I'm mm -hmm. more surprised more people aren't running it in the main, but I mean, there's only so many bullets and guns you can fit. Right, yeah. You just have a really tight um, material deck, and it's, and it's hard to fit that in sometimes. But this Water Diana deck can be so explosive. I see so many games where they spend their entire game at level one, and then they level to two, Dungeon Guide to three, they get eight damage off their Scepter, and then they shoot you with their Shadows Twin for seven, get two Creeping Torments. So you get to just sort of explode upwards, which is something that none of the other ally decks really get to do, aside from like old school uh, Wind Lorraine doing and Banner Knight Crystal Empowerment stuff. Yeah, Andy appreciating the... Uh, oh, of course. <laughs> you you got to at least look at it once. You can't just play across from it and not. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't uh, spoken to, to Violet about it, but I, I hope she's playing Wind solely so that she can play Gwendolyn. That's a great reason, in, in my opinion. I can confirm that is the reason. Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> I don't blame him. I would do that flex too. Yeah, <laughs> she is a gorgeous card. I feel like you're locked in that any big tournament. You're locked to your... You, can't, you got to do can't, it. Can't change. Sorry. So we are going to go ahead and have good old Shimmer Cloak Assassin. I think one of the not, more of sort of the underrated win cards, I think, that came out out of yeah. LLC. This is a card I sort of brushed by at first when viewing all the spoilers, and it's really showing how much of a powerhouse it is in these water ally lists. And it's such a strong turn one play, too, because it has stealth. And aside from exactly Freezing Hill, there's really no way that the water allies that can, can deal with this unless they're bringing cards like Still Water Patrol, but I think those have been pretty out of favor. It does look we do have a Freezing Hill, though. Yeah which is great for Andy to clear that off the board before it gets out of control. And he's just going to deploy a Korhazi Trapper, get that prep counter, and just sit behind this wall 
of you know that minus three attack effect. Yeah, and he seems to be really good at generating cards as we say him. He's just <laughs> seeking shot last game, freezing hail this turn. He's he's familiar with the coverage game. He, yeah. you know he gets it. He's he's doing it for for the team. Might so have to check the booth, make sure we're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Violet's just gonna get a water bottle here, get a little bit more cards. Like you said, it's all about this level one card advantage game for yeah. most, if not all, of the game. They're just trying to drain each other of resources and stick one thing that can yeah. get across the, the finish line. And I do see we do have Gildas yet again in the hand of Violet. I do see the Heavy Swing and Imperial Recruit. So we might be seeing um, a Gildas come down here Why we have the chance to go balance because yeah. we're not cracking the bobble. Yeah, she did go first. So she has that perfect seven to attack for four. And then yeah. she can even crack that bobble, deploy another threat like this uh, Windrider Vanguard, which is exactly what she's going to do here. Yeah. Coming for two, finish off that Korhazi even through that minus three effect and leave two very powerful board uh, uh, bodies on the board. Yeah. I also noted that she also has an inspiring call, um, inspiring call in hand. So if this board state gets to stay alive and really set up, we're going to see some pretty big swings. It's going to start getting guys. out of hand. Yeah, I mean, between a sp inspiring call, a tune of the winds, uh, wind allies seem to really have a lot of different cards that really help them pump and really fill the board out for really more lethal swings than you would expect. And this is the perfect spot that you want to be in, in in these Gildas decks where you have six cards. You know you're going to draw a seventh per turn, so you should be able to cast a three-drop turn on your Gildas. So it's really on Andy. He has to get this Gildas off the board. Yeah, which I think he might be able to. He does have a lurking assailant in hand. He has, it looks like, a dungeon guide as well if they want to level up. I think, is that a take game? I think I see a take game. Yeah, it was either a take game or an evasive maneuvers. It's hard to see from here, but we'll see. Uh, gonna, oh, oh, deploy Gildas. his own Gildas. The I'm best way to kill a Gildas is with a Gildas. Yeah, if you can't beat Gildas with anything else, <laughs> just generate one yourself. <laughs> I mean, so we're going to go ahead and looks like draw a card here, cracking the Wind Bobble, and imagine setting up for something else and maybe try and clear this Wind Rider Vanguard off the board. Um, thankfully not online yet. It's not bigger. It's the class bonus. Right. Not level one yet. So is this a 2-3? But we could also generate our own Lurking Assailant because, as you said before, we're in the spot where we want to play one more card overhand so we can keep that balance map right. up going into each and every turn. But water is actually only a little bit different because water has the awkward moment where they want to also leave cards up in their hand, though. Right, to, to cast frost finds and stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah, we do see a lurking assailant deployed, another two damage come across. And that's why we refer to these decks, you know, we say like words like the mirror match, even though they are very different decks. We just saw the almost identical line taken by both players play your Gildas, swing in for four, crack your bobble, play another uh, three mana, two, three. So. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's all about board control here. Yep, so we're going to go ahead and it looks like we're debating if we want to go up to level, level one, I assume, or something else on our material deck. Looking at what's in the grip here from Violet, we do have an Imperial Recruit, I think a Deflecting Edge, a Heavy Swing, um, a Swift Foot Recruit, and it looks like a couple other cards I wasn't able to see. Yeah, I think turning on this class bonus is like deceptively very powerful. Have, having a threat that can attack and also defend itself to a certain extent is very good. Not, not to say that the 2-3 body is usually going to trade on defense, but it allows you stuff like your Windrider Vanguard and your Lurking Assailant together can sort of create a, a combination where they keep people from attacking you. Um, so, yeah, it looks like she's probably going to opt to go up to level one here. She's materializing a one cost. Yep, grab that Swift Recruit. He did his job. Did his job. Good job, soldier. Yeah, I mean, perfect. Exactly what you want to use it for. We're going to go with level one. And the upside here about level one, Tony, like we said before, has taunt. So this Windrider Vanguard can go ahead and swing, or we can play a Gildas, and we don't have to worry about our own allies dying this turn because everything has to go ahead and hit Tony. It's so strong, um, and it, it works really favorably with stuff um, with, like, Intercept. Um, and, it, yeah, especially stuff like Imperial Recruit, who gets fostered. She's just going to get it for free unless... And he wants to like throw a freezing hail at this one three, but that's really not to his benefit. Yep, and we play another surfer crew ourselves. We don't have to worry about the intercept this turn because of the fact that everything's coming to Tony and we taunt, and it sort of works out that um, surfer crew got to get one extra damage in. That's why Tony is so powerful in these um, ally matchups because he just so unequivocally yeah. gets a turn where he protects his board no matter what. There's so many like people playing Resolute Stands or Peaceful Unions or whatever, there's always some way to get through the gaps, but but Tony is, is so stalwart in that he doesn't let anyone touch his board. Yeah, oh, yep. and as we, mandatory when Rider Vanguard does have to untap at any turn for yep. bigger. It's not something that we can miss. So we're going to see that going to be untapped, and Andy's now debating what they're going to materialize themselves out of their deck here. I'm trying to figure out probably if they want Scepter at level one. It's... It's an interesting spot to be in right now because there's a lot of allies on the board. They He's under so much pressure that Scepter might be too slow here. Yeah, I mean, especially because they look a little bit small, because, but the Imperial Crew is going to get an extra attack on turn this next turn, and we are going to go ahead for the stuff to play, get that Freezing Hail out of hand, which I feel like hurts a little bit because you're going to use that on something like the Imperial Crew yeah. to prevent the Foster, keep it tapped. 
and he knows better than us. He's gonna yeah. go. He's gonna go for the separate play and uh, just try to clear some board and uh, get a foothold back in this game, so that he can start getting just immense value off the scepter of Lumina, because yeah. that's really what what breaks it in Water's favor uh, yeah. is they don't have access to something that can do so much um, uninteractable damage like scepter can. Yeah, no. and then like I said, I don't blame him as well. I mean, you're only at one damage taken so far. Uh, granted, these are one, two, two, three, and soon to be a two, three ally on board. They're not really th pushing enough to threaten 14 damage. Right. Even through an inspiring call or two in the winds. Mm -hmm. So we're two in the winds would be real scary, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two in the winds would be really scary. Imagine if we had both. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but it looks like we are going to go ahead and debate what we want to materialize here. For, I mean, not materialize, play for it. From Andy here, we're going to go ahead with the train sharpshooter. We call uh, we call train sharpshooter Gildas at home in, yeah. in my play group because she is just very often a 4-3 for 3. three. Um, so a very powerful card here to stick on board. Very similar in, in, in the way that the longer she stays on board, the better she gets as you draw cards like backstep and evasive maneuvers. Yeah, no, the card is definitely, I think, a, car a card that a lot of these allied lists are happy to see because I've seen this deck, uh, at least this card ran and just basically went out. You can't yeah. ever get the class bonus on. It's just a three mana two yeah. three. It's, it's like running a Steam Knight like, yeah. like people used to. It's in, it's in that good body range that you really want to be in for just these types of lists. And it looks like I was now debating what we want to materialize here um, for the turn. So as we're looking at sort of the board state, looks like that was only a little bit ahead. Um, we do have that Imperial Group going to be phosphorized shortly. So it's going to go up to a 2-3. Imagine trying to trade into maybe one of these allies. Right. It's it's very dangerous here if Andy does have that evasive maneuvers, which I think we did see in his hand, that if she tries to trade into very specifically the trained sharpshooter and uh, Andy can get it out of range with that evasive maneuvers, it keeps that distant until the end of his next turn. So it's going to create a threat and also protect his board. So we'll see how we go here. Just coming in for three. Looks like there are no evasive maneuvers to be had, or at least he doesn't want to spend it yeah. here. Might be a little risky. Yeah, a little risky. I mean, the Bullock does get in for three to go ahead and clear out that um, ally. without Otherwise, the other allies can go ahead and clean it up either way. So I don't mind holding it back. But at this point, we do see the Inspiring Call come in. Yeah. So like Lots you're saying, of damage here. spooky swings. Yeah, it's going to come in for three, three, and then two if uh, Violet wants to commit all of her allies yeah. to the attack. She might want to leave the Swift Recruit back. We will see. Yeah, so if you go back isn't a horrible thing to do, especially because it's going to take an attack for your um, Tenaris level one if you want to. And yep, we're going to go ahead and leave it back for the intercept mechanic. Um, probably have it intercept any big attack, something like a taser shot or something yeah. that could be coming down into the field. But yeah, Inspiring Call is a good card. Yeah, who would have thought? One mana, draw a card, pump your team. Very yeah, strong. Very strong. I like it. It's also fast speed. Yeah. I've, I've been caught off card by that card a couple times. A end of turn, Inspiring Call, or beginning of Recollection, recollection Inspiring yeah. Call. Just all of a sudden, it's like, oh, okay, I guess free, sure. Yeah, and, and uh, we mentioned this earlier today. It's a persistent effect, which is so strange. So if you play allies to the board after your Inspiring Call, they retroactively pick up that plus one. Oh, and you were right. There was an evasive maneuvers. Yeah, so he, he was just saving it. Like The 2-3 was going to die anyway, so maybe he just wanted to save it. He's going to use... Um, Use it on his champion here. Actually, I wonder if the way here that's happening is he does have a dungeon guide in hand. Yeah. So he does give his Diana distant. Yep. Dungeon guides, lineage releases, gets the bullet, and just gets a huge swing in onto Violet here. This yeah, maybe he grabs like a blast pump and he just clears the board completely, or, yeah, he, or he just goes, you know, for, for maximum damage. Yeah, because Violet's second going to be at 14 off of the, both these levels up here. Mm -hmm. So unless there's something to clear the surf, yeah, blast shot pump could also clear the board and do almost... Almost close to lethal because right now it looks like it's a, a freezing round here. Oh, okay. So a freezing round is a very interesting bullet. I'm actually a big fan of freezing round myself. I think, I think that's freezing round. Yeah, or it's cascading round. Sorry. So cascading. he's going to go ahead and grab that blast pump, like he said. He's going to load up this cascading round into his blast pump to get through that interceptor. Oh, the deflecting oh. edge coming out in response to the unit, knowing that blast shot pump can go ahead and clear the swiffer group yeah. if he wasn't targeting it directly. So it is a card that now just negates damage. You could still redirect that. Actually, no damage is being done, I don't think, actually. No, it might still be one damage technically being done onto a target, sure. um, depending on what the target was. Because of the fact that um, Casting Rod also does have an on-hit effect that you mill the top two. Mm -hmm. So if that one damage does go through, it does possibly have to mill two. So it is going to go ahead and get the trigger twice. We mill the Gildas and the backstep at this point. But it looks like... That Very was, smart play to play that, that deflecting edge there. Oh, no, very, very good. No. Uh, it's definitely a line I didn't think that was in the hand. I totally yeah. missed that deflecting edge was in the deck. But she is, uh, she is up against it here. Yeah. That's 17, and uh, Andy's very low in hand size. I, I think I can't see any cards in his hand. Yeah, I think it's empty. He has nothing over there, so 
Yeah. She just has to weather the storm. But if he manages to get even enough cards to level, Tony doesn't really have a way to get out of range other than leveling up himself, right? So yeah. maybe she's thinking about going up to level two. Maybe next turn she's going to use this GCR here to just get a little bit of card advantage while you know that your opponent has nothing. They're is likely that, just passing. Is that a rose? Yeah, I think that is a rose. Okay, I'm very actually interesting. It's very interesting. I know the New Zealand regionals. There was a list running rows. Sure. And there were, was conversations inside of a Discord. I will not speak of uh, <laughs> about rows and asking about the card value. And I honestly, I didn't think the card. I thought the card was really good. I thought it was like what it was doing. It's really good because Rose is a card that intercepts at yeah. fast speed. She's a, she's a little costly, but yeah. but her effect is so powerful. And yeah. if you, you can manage to get that off, which looks like, is there four cards in Violet's hand here? I can't quite Three see. in hand, two in memory. We're one card off. Okay, yeah, from cracking GCR, playing our Rose yeah. at, at instant speed. Oh, we're in response going to Zephyr, oh. the Blast Shop pump here, preventing a bullet materialization. Very smart. Yeah. Um, friend for doing that because yeah, because only play right now is that Andy with no card to hand could only really swing in with the blast up while you're again generalizing the bullet, and that would be lethal. So, yeah, so she did have to do something here, and, and very wisely has removed the gun. Um, do we still have our level one lineage? No, we used it to get blast pump. Yeah, we used it to get the blast pump off the last turn. Um, so she should be safe. Yep, I was in a spot too where she wants to go level two Tony, which is I understand why she probably didn't do it the last turn because the fact that Andy had nothing in hand to really threaten if you're clearing out that dungeon guide. Yeah, especially she knows she has the Zephyr in hand to deal with the weapon. Yeah. So, so Andy's basically just, just passing the turn. Yeah. I think there's some confusion here on, on whether the bullet was loaded. Yeah. I, I was either bullet or I think it was I think the stacking of when the Zephyr was coming yeah. into play. But it looks like Andy is just gonna pass it over. He gets his blast pump back at the end of his turn. Violet is going to crack her GCR at the end of Andy's turn. And I think we might be leveling here, which is in a spot that, like I said, even though Vite was at 17 life, she wasn't in too much of a threat in position just due to the current board state. But but now it's a little risky. Yeah. <laughs> Level all the two is a little bit safer. You do have a gun coming in. You do have the bullet generators. Ooh, that's, Ooh, that's Tony CSR. Gorgeous CSR Tony. Still shirt on, shirt but, on. you know. Yeah, only, only 2 Respectable. A. Only 2A. But respectable. You know, we got to keep it classy. Yeah, keep it classy here yeah. on the national stream. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to just push this damage onto Diana. Um, I'm trying to think. We do have the heavy. Oh, actually, we can heavy swing here for like heavy nine. Heavy swing for nine. Not yeah. quite lethal, but quite, close. Quite One good. damage off. Yeah. <laughs> quite good. Yeah, yeah, she's she's a 22. That would put her yeah right, yeah. right to 21. We're, right on 21. We're we're really pushing the bullet. No pun intended. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so, maybe it's just the the present heavy swing for nine. You know that Andy doesn't have any interaction. He only has the one card in hand, and and sort of be like, you know, if you have it, you have it. But I I have you dead next turn. Yeah. So sort of, I, th I think that's sort of what she's doing now. She's asking like th what type of things might be generated, what can really push me up to that threshold. I mean, granted, Tony has 25 life. T Tony's in a good position where only has to really take about what six more damage yeah. to really be threatened. Yeah, eight is a, a lot to yeah. deal, especially with a, with a single card in your hand. Yeah, it's gonna go up to two cards, but at at best he can uh, like cast an evasive maneuver with his two card hand that gives him the plus two range and allows him to attack for five. But five is not gonna get it done. Yeah, five won't get it done here. And oh, we decide not to have heavy. Be, being conservative, which yeah. is also totally reasonable. She yeah. does have a commanding board position here, so she doesn't really have to push the issue. I did think I saw like another couple of win cards in hand. It could be another Zephyr or something in her hand uh, looking to do in response. Because we could also, depending on the board state, and if it is a Zephyr, we'll see what happens. But some people do Zephyr the terrifying at end of turns. Sure, yeah. Oh, wait. Is she going for the... Oh, I thought she was going for the Rose play. <laughs> I, was really for a <laughs> I was really excited for a second. I was really hoping and I was going to Rose. Do we untap our... our Wind Rider there. I'm not sure if she if uh, she got the uh, did not. Yeah, I'm not sure if we got the retaliate there for the insult to injury. But she's gonna grab her own terrifying. Andy's gonna crack his terrifying. Yeah. Everybody's paying taxes. Yep. So we're gonna go ahead and grab our own terrifying. Terrifying is paid. Ace oh. protector is gonna come in. I Big guess Ace and Protector is here. Yeah, I guess if I can't swing, might as well throw a three four body on the board right. and say deal with it. Deal with this. <laughs> I know you can't. <laughs> I dare try to win. I think Andy's sort of in. You see, they're having a good camaraderie back and forth here about the board state and what's going on as a whole. So we are, looks like, debating some materialization, looking probably at life totals, trying to figure out. I think Andy's trying to figure out what, what's our out. If, if Andy can find some way to give distant, he does have a pretty good line here. If he gets a bullet, finds a way to get distant, he can kill that ace and protector, and also with this last uh, durability of his blast uh, pump shot, deal some damage um, to Violet as well. But he does have to find a way to get distant to get over that, that four threshold. 
Yeah. I also wonder if this if he does get the bullet, would you swing into the Imperial Recruit just to then clear the Ace of Protect for free? Uh, technically for free because you want to take the Retaliate damage. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. Yeah, you, you take two instead of three yeah. if you're not looking to, to point that damage upstairs. Yeah, especially because uh, knowing how close these matchups have been going, at least game one and now into game two, that little bit of two extra one damage could really come into play. Yeah. Um, so it looks like Andy is debating what we want to do here at this point. I'm not really sure in hand, and we are just going to go ahead and pass the turn. But we do have the three card, uh, the the golden spot, I want to say. The spot where you have the Frostbite and you have the Song of Frost. Right. You have cards in hand to do do a response to something if you want and to. And here's the golden <laughs> time for Viridian Protection Trinket. Yep, here comes the trinket right yeah. on cue. Yeah. <laughs> The, the protective trinket is going to stop that, that <laughs> golden three card hand from, from casting anything. Yep, I got, yep, there is a frostbind in hand. Yeah. So it was, whole, so actually it was four. So we do have a frostbind and a fracturize, and I think double dungeon guide. And they're both looking real oh. not great. Yep, and it looks like we're going to have it in response to it. We're going to have a fracturize come down. You get that, that terrafring cannot target the protective trinket because it is not in play yet, yep. but they're going to go ahead and, and target that terrafring. But it's uh, sort of, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't, gives. Violet access to this uh, fractal, which could yep. unlock some oh. cards in her hand, like Heavy Swing. Yep, Heavy Go Swing on. going to come in, come in for lethal, and we're going to go into a game number three. I mean, these matches are actually going to lock. I'm used to these ally matches being grinds, but this right. is actually going relatively quick. Yeah, the ALC allies decks are just so much more explosive than we're used to. Stuff like Heavy Swing and, and these dungeon guide plays that uh, Diana can make with... Um, you know, Scepter and her level three, and, and, and all of these things that we've gotten over the past six months or so, it's um, it's really hard uh, to not just get exploded out of nowhere, yeah. especially when you're up in these, you know, uh, 12, 13-ish life totals, because nobody's trying to go to level three. They're all, like, slow rolling their way up there. So I think Tony only has uh, the advantage in that case because he's so beefy, you know, from 20 to 25. I actually didn't see. I know original Water Tony Alleyless were also running level three Tony for the Neos card for mm -hmm. just a one off, like sure. for the, the attack card. I don't know if Violet's Wind List is running level three Tony. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know that some. Uh, we've gone through iterations where people were playing Summon Sentinels yeah. as like their only Neos card, and then there was a while where people are just playing the level three that generates obelisks because it's just such absurd value. Yeah. Um, but it looks like. Violet herself is only running level two. That's fair. Keeping it nice and classy, right at that level two CSR. Not going anywhere past that. I do respect though the poison coating oil in the main. Most yeah. lists usually run that side. I do respect that in the main, especially to give that shimmer cloak assassin yeah. extra plus two really comes into play. So good with shimmer cloak, and it, it's even pretty good with dream fairy making you know that that three breakpoint is very uh, powerful. So giving dream fairy the ability to clear stuff like lurking assailants and. Um, I don't get a play grand. Frostborn yeah. Paladins and stuff like that. Yeah, so it looks like we do have the cuts happening shortly. We're just getting a little bit of shuffle in. I think we did hear Andy say he's going to go on the go first in this matchup, which I think is fair because in the ally matchups, it's always a weird spot because you want to go first because you can play your Gilly. You always have the seven card hand to mm -hmm. then keep your balance, where it's a little bit harder if you're going second because you're starting with eight cards in hand. It messes that math up a little bit. But I, I feel like you're also in that weird spot because if you go first, there's a chance your guildless could die. You don't right. want to lay out your guildless first because... Yeah, you hope you find something with stealth, yeah. right? Like... Uh, Violet has way more access to cards like Shimmer Cloak, uh, uh, even like early okay, Asin Protectors, Lurking Assailant. Yeah. So it's a little bit harder for Andy to find a threat that he wants to deploy on turn one that he is confident is going to stay on the board. Um, but I think he's really looking for like Lurking Assailant, Korhazi Trapper, stuff like that. But the nice thing about the water deck going first is since you're a materialization phase ahead of your opponent, it lets you very safely get Scepter. Because if you t spend a turn to get Scepter, you're at least on par with your opponent leveling up with you. So you don't, you know, get run over if they just deploy a whole bunch of uh, allies onto the board. Yeah, so looking at the opening hand, we do see, I think, a backstep. We do see, I think, an evasive maneuver, Frostbind. Um, a couple of the cards that we expect, oh, double backstep, actually, off of that. And as you said, Korhazi Trapper. Going to deploy the this Trapper, very safe, very few things that can interact with that, especially in Wind. Yeah, especially because it comes in every time. There's only one way to do it, and that's either Gilda Swing for four and then another attack on yeah. top of this to deal with the Trapper. I mean, Trapper's a very good card. It's a three-drop, one-three body that's relatively strong. Ooh, we're seeing a squirrel come in here. Oh. I don't know if this is going to be unlocking a Gildas, perhaps. Oh, uh, Asin Protector. Going for the classic Asin Protector squirrel. Oh, man. Are we going to swing with Ace? Are we, gonna, are we trying? I guess we shouldn't probably swing. I mean, we could swing with it. You get to eat the counter, yeah, basically. Yeah, eat the counter. Yeah, you, you target the trapper. They have to spend their counter. 
Um, I guess it sort of helps though if you don't leave it on top. You have an interceptor 3 4 in the field that can retaliate to a couple different things going on. And we are going to have a back step here from Andy at the end of turn just to cycle the card, get, yeah. get a draw, and then as well as make the unit distant for each side to go level one this turn. Yeah, we saw a second back step uh, in his hand, so he really doesn't need the redundancy here. It didn't look like he had any trained sharpshooters that he really wants to get value off of. So yeah, just, just going to cycle it here, but we'll see if we can deal with this Asim Protector. It is not an easy task to do with a 3 4 with intercept, and especially. Violet here has three cards up. There's lots of cards that you could have to interact. Zephyrs, Favorable Winds, any of these things that stop uh, that Ace and Protector from dying. Yeah, I will say, I think Andy's is also in a little bit of a rough spot. I don't think I see too many allies outside of, no. I'd say, Snow Fairy. Hey, that's a good one. Snow Fairy's probably the only card they can deal with outside of, like, a Gildas. That'll do it. <laughs> yep, as long as, long as you want to leave that Curse Ozzy Trapper up. So, yeah, the Gildas is going to be, I mean, the Snow Fairy's going to come down, tap that Ace and Protector. Pretty good. Pretty good. We'll see if we get uh, some some villainy and uh, some Dream Fairies or Blade here. That's really what can break up this sort of board state. You Dream Fairy bounce that Snow Fairy, unlocks your board, leaves you with a stealth threat. Unless we're game one and we're going to play four Ace and Protectors like we played three Gildases. Yeah, hey. <laughs> Could happen. wrong with that. Play my Ace and Protector to bounce my Ace and Protectors. Pure it's value. Pretty strong. Yeah. I like it. Um, I do like the fact that we do have the squirrels in the main here for, like I said, as we were talking about before about that early. Oh, wait. Yeah. Oh, Ooh. we do have Andy reading Rose. Yeah. This, is, this is a hard casted Rose, not even level two ability. Hard, hard cast Rose. <laughs> you have to read what the card does because she's it, getting in there. Yeah, because it intercept true sight and it has a class bonus act, fast activation. We don't have to worry about it because we're level one. And then has a level two ability that isn't to play, but it is a four drop two three. Yeah, I mean, Violet showed up and said, We have still water patrol too. And yeah. she, she's going to use it to clear the snow fairy, which unlocks uh, uh, the right, Asim protector, but thankfully that Korazi uh, trapper. Sitting on defense, yep. gonna protect his fellow ally. Did gonna, its own job. Did its own job. We're gonna go back over to Andy here. He's gonna materialize that ever so present scepter of Lumina. Yes. Gonna so lose a take aim. Okay, so take aim is an interesting card. I don't know too many of the water ally or water dynamics that was running the take aim. Mm -hmm. So I am really excited to see. I wonder what matchups it comes into play. Um, as a whole, because I think it gives plus two to your attack if I'm off of that card. You love to see this as Violet. Your opponent sends both of their creatures um, at you, means that they probably don't have a great way to deal with either of your creatures on board, which are both super, super threatening. Yeah, and I, I think it also feel good that your opponent keeps on having to read your card because yeah. it hasn't seen it. Sometimes it really catches people off guard, you know? You do a little bit of extra. Unfortunately, uh, after Rose comes into play, she loses all of her fancy text, but she is still a 2-3 intercept true sight. Just quite strong. True sight, not uh, <laughs> not often seen, but very strong. When it's here. So Andy did end up passing the turn here. We do have a looks like a judge guide and a seeking shot in his hand, as well as a back step and a base maneuver. And Riot's going to go ahead and get the water bobble. So probably set up the grip, um, look for grip of cards in hands. I know there is a deflecting edge. I'm not sure what else is in Riot's hand here for for setting it up. Wait. Your favorite card, Attune the Winds. Attune the Winds. Oh my God, so strong here. I'm surprised that Andy didn't uh, cash in that seeking shot. Yeah, I, yeah, maybe because of the fact that. Oh, just class bonus, doesn't it? For the for the extra power. Oh, I, I no, well, no, the extra power is not. You just can't retaliate for the class bonus. Mm. I don't know if it's a level one text though. Yeah, it might be level one. That that might be why we didn't uh, choose to deal with this Rose, who is going to eventually get that Snow Fairy off the board. Yep. Problem dealt with, which means that this Ace and Protector is now unlocked, ready to get back into the fight, which is a very dangerous prospect. And as we saw in hand with the Tuna Winds, you get, can have an Ace and Protector and a Rose on field within the Tuna Winds oh hit the field. Oh my god, it's so good. <laughs> you can have seven damage coming yeah. between two units. I don't like to think about a four or five Ace and Protector. That, that gives me nightmares. Not coming off the board. <laughs> Not coming off the board. <laughs> Not unless you really want to level up Diana, do a whole bunch of other shenanigans. And he's got to hope he's chaining these Snow Fairies like he did uh, did in game one. Yeah, so we're going to have the Surf Recruit come down. Violet, I imagine, it looks like going to be building up the board. And like I said, with the Tune the Winds in hand, having a wide enough board to then just Tune the Winds and give everything a buff counter is vastly <laughs> yeah, <and laughs> put you in the driver's seat. Yeah, it looks like she's set up to do that. Um, Andy's in the tough position where he is going to have to commit things to the board to deal with it. And when he does, he's going to have to uh, run out of cards to be able to cast Frostwind. And Vila can use that opportunity to cast and tune the winds, which I think is probably what she's thinking about here. But she does have a lot of cards in hand. It looks like six down there. Yeah, definitely got him out. Could definitely um, set up into something to try and leave two pi up at all times yeah. because of the fr possible frostbite. We're going to see Imperial Recruit come down. Um, another card that's probably not under too much pressure right now, outside of Gorhazi Trapper, that might want to deal one to keep that foster mechanic sure. offline. But no, the is going to go ahead and ship in with that one damage. And going to go ahead and looks like talking about some 
talk about the board state a little bit between both of them, and we are going to have an end of turn backs up here targeting a spear water, which we could end up leveling into distant unit here. Sure. Because I think we have the dungeon guide in hand, so we can go level and die in on our turn. Dungeon guide, blast shot, and clear at least two of these units. That's a lot of damage, yeah. too. So you level up to Diana here, you do four damage. You yep. dungeon guide, you do another four damage. You blast bump, clear your board. Yep. And that's a pretty good spot to be in. But it's the same situation that we had last game, where in order to, for Andy to do this, he's going to lose a lot of cards out of his hand. So he's going to be in that situation where he has one or two cards in hand, and it's going to be pretty difficult for him to come back against the, what is that, nine cards that Violet's holding on to here? Actually, no one I'm just thinking about. Is there a world if I, I grant? I don't think we can do it right now, but seeking shot does do more damage to an ally. If you blast shot pump with seeking shot onto an ally and redirect the damage to a champion, you get that bonus you damage do, yeah. onto the champion. Yes, yes, you do. So you could be pushing a lot more damage than. Oh, oh that's right. true. Never mind. You yeah. cannot use attack cards with guns. You must use about bullets. That. See, I'm too big brain in myself. You're thinking too hard. It's because it's going, a bow. Going too deep. It's because the card has a bow. It is, a, it is an arrow, I believe. So yeah, it is got, an arrow. Yeah. Bow win. All right, so we are going to go for that dungeon guide play. It's going to be left with one card behind. It's going to do another four damage off the scepter of Lumina. Yep. Yep. Yeah, very, very likely seeing. Um, there was the other snow fairy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually surprised to see Andy put that down. He I must, uh, must have, have a pretty have strong hand. He does also have the freezing hail in hand, unless he put. It, we saw he didn't put it down. So I think there is a freezing hail. So the freezing hail could keep this ace and protector tapped. If we need to. Well, I think there's a line here where she just dies, right? He gets Blast Bump, he just deals damage to the face. She's uh, still at Spirit. But that deals five. And she's yeah. at 11. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, attack the surf for group pump lap. But we do have a deflecting edge in hand, though, and deflecting edge. Ooh. And Frostbind. And we do have Frostbind, two cards but in hand. she does have the two cards in yep. hand. Pay two in hand. Yep. So we're going to go ahead and. So it's just going to be two damage. Yep. Two. And then you come in with the allies, yeah, and that cleans on. it up. Yeah, yeah. puts her to 13. You come with Dungeon Guide and Kohazi Trapper. And that cleans up I, I a, a, a strict 15 there. Yeah, that, that, I went a lot quicker than I yeah, thought. Yeah, maybe, um, the, like I said, so explosive out of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, Violet didn't think that she needed to level up to Tony there because she felt pretty safe. Yeah. And then just out of nowhere, Dungeon Guide Scepter is so much damage. Yeah, no, definitely a very good board save. That Snow Fairy did his job, kept the Ace and Protector tapped long enough to the fact that the Ace and Protector couldn't get an extra turn to use the intercept mechanic right. that yeah. it had. Never got to block. Yeah. yeah, and just kept that extra little chip damage every single turn. Like I said, it just adds up, adds one, up. Damage, one damage, one damage, one damage. So, yeah, it looks like that was game number three. Andy did end up taking that to move on to 4 and 0. Oh. Um, probably one of the quicker matches we've had on GTA. Yeah, today. yeah, we've had, we've had a lot of long ones, <laughs> but this is the first time we've had two allies decks going at it. So, uh, they do, you know, often end in these sort of explosive it's one way or the other. Like, uh, so, congratulations to Andy. Um, yeah. both, both players played very well. Yeah, definitely congratulations. Um, we're now coming back to us here in the booth. Um, like I said, joined by Cam again. Like, so, like I said, it was a very good match. We do still have some time left in the round a little bit. We have about 10 minutes or so left in the round as a whole. Um, but seeing the field so far, seeing if some of the matches, uh, how, do, how do you think about the allies' mirror going into this? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't say we've been saying it all um, weekend. I, I can't say I'm surprised to see allies performing as well as they are. Um, it's great to see Wind overperforming, at least in my estimation, more than I thought it would. We're seeing a lot of you know, uh, like Violet's playing this Win Tony deck and lots of similar lists. I know that the two champion um, people are playing uh, like a Wind deck as well. So it's great to see Wind decks popping up. But yeah, Scepter of Lumina is such a powerful card. Scepter of Lumina is such a power. I mean, that's why it's on category one, I think, at right. this point on the ban list. Um, but no. So we are going to go ahead and go to a quick 10 minute break here to finish out the round. Um, like I said, stick around. We're going to go ahead and bring in round number five shortly after the break. So we'll catch you guys then.
Welcome back, everybody, to North American Grand Archive Nationals. Uh, my name is Cam. I'm here with Kel, also known as Red Zone Road. And we are back. Yeah. That was uh, an exciting last round. I apologize. I had to step out real quick. So, uh, you know what? Mr. Cam, mm -hmm. regale me with the events that took place while I was gone. Lots of snow fairies. Lots of copies of Gildas. Okay, really? Okay, um, yeah. Attune the Winds pulling some weight. Oh, really? Uh, Scepter okay. of Lumina is a broken card. I mean, that's, it's good. That's, that's what we've it's, got. It's real good. <laughs> it's real good. Do they get the dungeon guide scepter yeah, play? Oh, yeah. you'd Double, love to see it. Yeah, level to level one Diana, four damage from scepter. Dungeon guide, four damage from scepter. That's get a gun good. and shoot you. Very strong. Very strong stuff. It's pretty good when you can like turbo level your champion and then also dome your opponent for eight. Right. It's pretty good. Hey, you know, it's a, it's a testament to the development team that water was in kind of a rough spot. I, actually, yeah. So people, if you don't know... With uh, the initial launch with Dawn of Ashes, water was, like, underpowered. Yeah. Like, no one played water right. at all. And, well, maybe some people did. I'm going to give credit to the, <laughs> yeah. the the water diehards out there. And then it, it got good. It took, it took like, a, a hard turn with, I would say, maybe, like, Fractured Crown-ish yeah. era. And now water is, like, powerhouse. Yeah, it's very good. Scepter, uh, Frostbind, Fracturize, all these very powerful cards. So now they get to sort of hold their own. It feels like, um, you know, I, I think the thing we were saying at the beginning of the weekend is that a lot of people were under the impression that wind was the weakest element. Yeah. But um, at least the, all of the data that we have from this weekend, it seems like everybody's like pretty well balanced. I think there's a little bit higher representation of fire. But I as far so. as winning decks, it seems like pretty uh, even between the three of them, which is great. Yeah, and you actually see a lot of different archetypes, too. We, obviously, we have the allies lists, right? Like, right. so last round, we had allies versus allies, mm -hmm. two different takes on it. But we have also seen today some, some pretty crazy stuff. Right. We had the weird uh, Triskin, Triscuit deck, which I was pretty pretty stoked about we also had rye um and we've seen erupting as well so I, yeah. ex I expect to see a little bit more erupting um and also more allies for sure yeah we've surprisingly we haven't seen like any merlin yet this weekend um and i assume there's a lot of those in the room it was just like what the round one merlin right the round one merlin versus the trisket i think right. was the only one we've seen so far yeah um which is great for you know the diversity of the game like i, I always love when we come into an event like this and everyone has these preconceived notions of what's going to be good yeah. and what's going to be represented. And then, you know, we see a much wider and more diverse field than we were expecting. Yeah, I awesome. mean, those are like the best kind of tournaments as, as a spectator and as a commentator. Of course. Those are the, those are the best kind of tournaments. Maybe if you're a player and you're coming in and you're like, what the, right. what is with this weird <laughs> this this deck Triscuit or whatever? Deck, yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe maybe that kind of throws you off a little bit. But for me as a, a fan of the game, it's very exciting. Yeah, that's what we want to see. I was thrilled to see Triscuit, Excalibur stuff going on. So. Oh, dude, like... Tris Trisket into like fractured crown, all oh, yeah. my fractured crown, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then into Arendite was like, whew, yeah. I can't believe good. we had we had been discussing fractured crown, the card, earlier this weekend. We, we literally were. We were talking about the fractured crown like at lunch. Yeah. And I was like talking about how like I think it's good, it's but it, good, it just yeah. just hasn't really gotten its place yet because there's no um, ac actual like <laughs> sure. Lux Lux champion. But right. hey, there's I guess there's Trisket, right? Hey, there she is. We got to put some put some respect on Trisket. I mean, be, be, the thing is, is like being able to play not only the Fractured Crown, but then Arendite yeah. is is pretty good. <laughs> and then rending flames. On and then, top and of then rending flames with your Arendite. We're gonna we're gonna be talking about that one for quite a while, but. We're going to be talking about, hopefully, a uh, another round coming up shortly. We have yes. our, our players sitting down and, and getting pairings all settled right now. We're not sure exactly who we're going to be covering yet, but we have a, a couple of yeah. people on our on our radar. There's lots of lots of three O's left. We have lots of um, or lots of four O's left. We have lots of undefeated people, and still uh, three more rounds of action to come. Yep, yep. Uh, three more rounds today, and then we have much much more Grand Ar Grand Archive tomorrow. As we mentioned at the start of the round last round, we do have one more. Uh, Mercurial Heart teaser at the end yeah. of the stream today, as well as more tomorrow. That's awesome. Yeah. I was uh, I, I was sad. I was watching from the sidelines. I saw you guys getting the art leak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, um, but yeah, it looks super cool. I mean, I'm pretty I'm pretty excited for it. Um, mostly because I'm just really really stoked for new Tristan. But yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's hard not to be. I, th I think a lot of us are Tristan fans, and uh, I spent a lot of time playing Tristan in DOA, like before FTC came out. Um, but you, you know, without going to level three, you're, you're missing something, right? Like yeah. you, need, you need a little extra oomph to, to get over the finish line. And so I, I think it's really exciting that we're going to get, um, some more powerful Tristan stuff. To yeah. Do. I, I really like seeing, and you know, even though that, uh, Merlin is just insanely powerful these days, Merlin only started out as like the level two, right? Yeah. It was just the level two for a while until she kind of got her, her glow up right. as it were. And so now Tristan hopefully is getting the same sort of glow up, um, 
Maybe she'll be as strong. Maybe she won't. Maybe. Either way, I'm pretty st pretty stoked. I, I think the reason why Merlin got her level three in the first place uh, is because she was such a fan favorite. And I, I, think, oh, yeah. I think that's what's happening with uh, Tristan and with the Sylvie recollection deck as well. So if you are a fan of somebody who is underpowered, if you're the biggest Alan fan in the world, make sure that you let the, the developers know that you really want Alan support. I, I've heard a lot of people like speculate on Alan. <laughs> I've heard like, oh, Neos Alan. I've heard a lot I of Neos I'm trying Alan. to imagine what Neos Alan would like look like art-wise. Yeah, I don't know. Like maybe it's just Alan head and he's just got this buff Chad body. Yeah, right? how do you feel about Alan in a mech suit? Yeah, yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's just like this cute little tamer boy and he's, yeah. Yeah, now he's just got a Gundam. Then you get, yeah, like robot dogs and stuff. Yeah, I don't sure. know. It, it writes sure. it Self is all I'm saying. You can take that to the bank. Yeah. <laughs> Get in the Ava Allen. <laughs> Get in the Ava Allen, or, or Sylvia will have to do it again. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, anyway. anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, this next round should be should be pretty exciting. The players are still kind of getting situated, and we're still kind of uh, determining what the feature match is going to be. Uh, we have a couple options that I've heard, and they both sound really exciting. Yeah, and we're um, we're getting down into like the the nitty gritty, where yeah. we're we're getting to the point of the tournament where people are going to start, you know, thinking about that day two, thinking about making that top yep. thirty two cut. So it's going to start getting real serious. Yeah, this is where you start getting a lot more people who are at the at that X2 range, right? Yeah. And that's where they really need to run the gambit, right? Mm -hmm. They need to basically go undefeated right. throughout here. You, you can't really go X3 in a tournament this size, and that's basically uh, like a death sentence, right? Yeah, yeah. 163 players, if, if we haven't mentioned that on, on coverage yet. Uh, huge turnout for Nationals, and I know we've said several times there's just so much on the line for these players, so... I'm glad, glad that they're they're all bringing their A game. We've had some really great matches on stream so far. And yeah. I'm sure we have a bunch more to come. Yeah. The cool for the players, the tomorrow we won't be streaming this, unfortunately, because we're going to be focusing on nationals, but there's also going to be a regionals event. So anyone yeah. who doesn't make day two, they still have you know games to play tomorrow, which is pretty sweet, actually. Yeah, the first regional event, I think, of... Uh, yeah, I think the first regional event of the new season uh, that's awarding the new invite cards and, and oh, starting, yeah. Yeah, starting yeah, yeah. the new um, Nationals 2025 uh, invitation circuit. Speaking of the invite cards, I don't know if these are going to show up very well on screen. Mm. I They're shared gorgeous, these. Though. I shared these on my Twitter. Let me see if I can see these on screen. Oh yeah, those look Ooh, pretty good. You yeah. can kind of. I'm, I'm looking at the the TV yeah, to yeah. see. Do look. These are the uh, collector versions of uh, the They're so of nice. the cards. This one's one of my favorites. The uh, glittering orb. Oh, it's so pretty. I really like the, uh, on the Orb of Regret, you definitely can't see it, but they drew like a little face in their signature. Yeah, there it's, is. It's, it's, it's super, really cool. It's super cute. You guys uh, find, I think these are on Index. I think you should be able to look the, at them on um, on Index if you want to see the full arts. But they are so gorgeous. So get yourselves out if you're not here at this event. Get exactly. yourself out to, to these regionals that are coming up. There's going to be a bunch more regionals this next season for the 2025 uh, Nationals um, season. So. Yeah. Get yourself to these events. Get yourself a pretty card. Yeah, what's really cool about these, if you didn't know, if you're like maybe newer to Grand Archive, you don't know how the tournament structures work. So if you win a regionals um, or get like top X, depending mm -hmm. on the tournament, right, you are awarded one of these. And these give you basically an invite. This is your ticket to get into the, um, the invite-only events. Yeah. Um, and then once you do show up to said event with your card, they are not this fancy version, right? Uh, you kind of cash it in. You keep your original version, and you get another fancy version too. Like yeah. you get them both. You it's, get an invite to the event. Yeah. You get a fancy card. What's not a lot, not to like, right? Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, they have a really really cool like, uh, you know, tournament structure like that. I think it's really cool. Yeah, and I think it's it's getting much more robust um, in the coming years. Obviously, Grand, uh, Grand Archive is such a new game. We haven't even hit our our one year anniversary yet. It's coming up in a few months. Yeah, yeah. like this year alone. So we have the the next. Very, very big event. We have Ascent Worlds and the World Championship. Yep. And that's coming up in May mm -hmm. uh, in, in Las Vegas. And then after that, we have a Midwestern uh, Ascent. We yeah. don't know exactly where it is yet, but we do have a mid Midwestern Ascent. And mm -hmm. then we have one in Canada, right? Yeah, there's one in Toronto. I think yeah. there's uh, there's one in Singapore yes. as well. Yes. I, I think there's one other one that I'm missing. Don't uh, crucify me for that. But um, lots of uh, events coming up. We're, we're super excited to you know see competitive Grand Archive take off. Uh, as a, you know, we we love this game and uh, are happy to see it grow. Yeah, especially like you said, we have the one year anniversary coming up yeah. just in a few months or so. It's crazy. Feels like it's been so much longer than that. With how you know how it much does, the game it has grown. It does and, actually. Yeah. You know how uh, how like robust the game is for a new game. There's only three sets out, but it feels so you know diverse. We're seeing all these cool decks that people yeah. are bringing to nationals this weekend. For whatever reason, it feels like there's like four four sets out of like right. four or five. I'm like. 
I guess there is three sets, yeah, huh? Right? Yeah. So there's DOA, Fractured Crown, and then and uh, LC. LC. But then we have Mercurial Mercurial Heart coming up uh, just uh, in May. Yeah. I've, I've opted to only say MRC because I, I can't say Mercurial ever. Mercurial. Yeah. It's difficult. We're Try get, to say it. Get, like a phonetic uh, pronunciation, you know, on the screen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to mess it up like every single time. <laughs> I'm going to go for it, though. Yeah. Got to go for it. But that's coming up. That's, uh, yeah, that's like middle of May that that set's coming out, which is yep. godlike. It's going to be a set that uh, has support for all of the classes mm -hmm. thus far. I expect to see some some pretty spicy stuff there. So yeah, 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 yeah. Super exciting stuff, and we'll get to play that early at Worlds. Yeah, there's the premier event, the world premiere event. Yeah. The, I think that's what I'm personally looking forward yeah. to the most. Yeah, it's super exciting. Yeah, Kel and I will not be playing in Worlds, you know, because we we don't win all the the big tournaments, but we will be playing in the the MRC preview event. There's the exciting. ascent, ascent as well. That ascent is true. Worlds, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a team event. It's yeah, it's cool. open invite, so you just have to sign up. It's yeah. in Vegas. It'll be a great time. We all recommend that you come. Tickets are still on sale. You can uh, find all that information at worlds.gatcg.com. Yeah. MRC art spoilers is, is uh, something we we have to to talk about as well. Art spoiler. Oh, you want to show up the same one? We we can take a look at it. We're gonna take a look at. Let's what take was a look the, at it. What was the card name? We have the card name, but not the text, right? I, I think so. so, 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 so Smashing Force. Oh yeah, so Smashing Force definitely sounding like an uh, attack, right? Yeah, I, I think so. A, a very, they they do a great job with telling you what color the card is in the art. So it's very obviously <laughs> uh, a fire. Card. This, oh, this is a water card, yeah, right? This is a water card. I'll be blown away. It's all steam. It's, it's just a, it's just hot steam, that's man. That's true. It is hot steam. <laughs> um, yeah, this could be Alan. This is the mech suit we're talking about. He just dyed his hair. <laughs> He's just going through a little bit of phase, yeah. right? Um, just kind of like you know got built up a little bit, yeah, yeah, working yeah. out. He's getting buff. Yeah, I mean, you've got to be pretty strong to hold that hammer, like yeah. one-handed. One hand. Like, yeah. geez, that, that thing is huge. So yeah, we, this is a Guardian card, right? I, I think it's a Guardian card. Yeah. We don't know yet. I mean, I think the easy guess, like Guardian Fire card. Guardian Attack. Attacking for, I don't know, Guard a, a Guardian, Guardian amount, yeah. like 15 or something. Big, big number. Yeah, your so, life total. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's your life total? That's, that's what this is attacking for. Right. Yeah, super yeah. exciting to see some more MRC stuff. Um, as we get closer, I believe, um, like, official spoilers are, are beginning of May is when that starts. Yeah, I think they're going to be starting, like, a little bit before the uh, the world premiere event. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think they just kind of lead up to the event, and then we'll have the big event, and the people will have be playing with the cards and stuff. Yeah. And then we all open signature cards. Yeah. I'm, I'm manifesting that now. And I'll, so I'll, that, I'll yeah. open <laughs> a, a, um, a CSR for the event. It'll, it'll, it'll be... Uh, Hmm. Probably an assassin card. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. New new assassin. Maybe it's maybe it's uh, Tristan. <laughs> Tristan. Yeah. yeah. Just I slide mean, that one in I mean, there. I mean, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Hey. You gotta yeah. manifest it. You know. You just gotta you know hope it into existence. Yeah. Every, every CSR that I've opened, I, I have to tell myself that I deserve it, and then I open it. <laughs> so I. It's worked. My, I, I promise. My luck has been all over the place. I've had decent decent luck opening them. Yeah. But this like, I did open up a Xander, and then I opened up what. Uh, Actually, take that back. My luck has been really good. Yeah. And now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, and no, my, my luck's been really one, good. And then that other one. Yeah. I was like, well, I did open up a Merlin. So yeah. it was like the alternate art Merlin one. Ooh, Merlin yeah. B. You got yeah. Claude too, right? I did, I did recently open Claude. Yeah. 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 Claude. Yeah. He, has, he has yet to find his place in the, in the game, I think. Yeah, I think he's super cool. But he's like very automaton pilled. <laughs> There's not really like an automaton deck right now. There's just not enough. I like I looked at if you go into index and you you do subtype automaton. Yeah. There's like only like a, a dozen or so automatons, so it's it, it's I hard. Th I think it's one of those things like all of the 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 seasonings are there, right. but the dish isn't quite ready to be consumed. Yeah. And I think we're just a, a couple <laughs> couple more ingredients is away. Is he consuming the robots? Is that, is that what's happening? Mm, I don't. I mean, I think a little. He's, he's right? kind of yeah. he's a little creepy. He's I don't a know. little creepy. He, he might be consuming, <laughs> the, consuming robots. the robots. That's that's why he gives them back to you. I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe in Mercurial Heart, maybe uh, maybe he's got the the sweet uh, I, automaton tech. I think he's doing some sort of evil machinations. Yeah, so. I, I definitely think he and like Vanitas are like yeah. among among the baddies. Right. I think uh, I think Rob mentioned it earlier. Rumors on the street and rumors are unfounded. They're just people on the internet mm. thinking we're getting a Vanitas uh, level three in MRC. He feels like the big bad guy, right? Yeah, I feel like he, he deserves it. I, I feel like he's going to get a Merlin turn, right? Mm -hmm. He's just going to be like, I'm only level two, and then boom, I'm the big bad, right? And it's going to be super good, like, yeah. like like Merlin level three is? Yeah, I, I think the what we saw earlier today, like the Vanitas on stream might be like... It's like an omen of the future. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a portent of, portent of dark tidings. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, maybe. Hey, that deck looked pretty sweet. Yeah, I, I think he's a cool character, too. Yeah, he's cool. Yeah, yeah. He's wearing that, like, weird sheer shirt, you know? <laughs> yeah, he, he's got, like, that, that definite, like, I don't know, like, punchy monk dude vibes. Yeah. But he's got, like, I don't know, the weird one-eye thing mm. going on. But Very anime. Um, I think our players are sitting down, getting ready to go. I don't think either of them is playing Vanitas, but we'll see what they're playing when uh, when they sit down. Uh, like we mentioned a little bit earlier, we have we have a, a, a few pretty cool um, decks that we're looking at to, to hopefully get on stream, and uh, it's great to see people playing you know cool stuff still in the four O bracket. Yeah, we're still following uh, undefeated players right now. Yeah, I mean, we've been basically just following undefeated players the whole day, and we've seen spicy deck after yeah. spicy deck, right? Like, we're not we're not watching, like, you know, 0-2 players. Right. So it's been a really exciting event from that perspective. Yeah, very talented players and, and doing, you know, like, innovation, right? Of yeah. either existing archetypes or trying whole new things. Um, it's really cool. Yep, and this is the kind of event that can reward multiple types of players, right? You right. can reward the players who are, like, diehard this type of hero, you know, I only play Rai or whatever, mm -hmm. or players who are like, I'm, I'm, brewing, I'm bringing my spicy Triscuit right. deck. Yeah, it's great to get both. Hey, maybe, yeah. you know, maybe they're diehard Triscuit players, who knows? Yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe maybe this event will make some diehard Triscuit players. I, I hope so. I, I know the first thing that I'm doing when I get back is just putting, putting that go, Triscuit go deck find together. How many oh, Triscuits yeah. do I even own? Going to go find my Triscuits? One, one or two, maybe, but yeah. I don't have that CSR. The CSR is oh, beautiful. Oh, so gorgeous. So many dollars, though. So many dollars. Yeah, yeah. Deservedly so. It's true. She does deserve it, and I'm glad uh, glad she's performing. Um, but yeah, we uh, we still have some some allies uh, players to watch. We have some oh for sure some Merlins doing quite well. So you, you're going to start to see some of the more powerful stuff as as we. I climb think we'll see towards. more Dianas. Yeah. Uh, throughout the day as we as we progress. It was um, a surprisingly low amount of Dianas in our um, like uh, round one statistics. Yeah. Uh, when we looked at the last round, we had a bunch of 3 0 Dianas. Sure. So, so they're rising to the top. Yeah. We'll have yeah. to see how they convert. Mm -hmm. um, I do know the we're kind of setting up right now, getting the, the feature match all ready for y'all. Yeah. For yeah, just a, just a couple of minutes now while the players sit down. We see that everybody else is seated. We're just getting our feature match ready to go so that we can uh, bring you guys all the action. Yeah. So I, I, I do think we have a couple potentialities, right? And I actually, I think we might be ready, right? Yeah. Yeah, let's if we are, down. let's cut it down to the feature match area. We have uh, Subasa 4 and O versus Evo 4 and O. And we're kind of already in the thick of it here with a uh, wind deck starting off with a, a nice little early materialization here. Yeah, so it looks like we're going for a Beseech the Winds. I believe Subasa is playing a wind Merlin deck, perhaps? Oh, interesting. Looks like they're starting with a level one Lorraine, but I believe their intent is to do some wacky wind mage. Ooh, are, are you very familiar with the, the wind Merlin deck? Um, so I played it a little bit. We played a version of it, me and um, some of the Lineage Break folks at Houston. Okay. Um, but I think it looks a lot different now than it did then. Um, it's got a lot of access to cards like Beseech the Winds, Dungeon Guide, and, and a lot of them will like flicker their Dungeon Guides okay. to, to level super quickly. So they can get to level three faster than almost anything else, but the question is, what do they do when they get there? I, I gotta say, huge props to Sivo rocking the Uther sleeves. Yeah, very, 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 very sweet. We've we've got some we've got some nice sleeves. We've got some Uther sleeves. We've got some Crux Knight sleeves over there. People representing. And he's ro he's rocking the pristine or the um, is it called the pristine spirit? The serene spirit. Serene, yeah. sp the serene spirit. This is the one that uh, you can lineage release and. Uh, Heal six, which is pretty nice, which yeah. tells us kind of the type of deck that he's going to be playing. Right. I, I would wager it's some sort of like uh, maybe like a Xander Lux kind of build. Yeah, I think it looks like like Steve is indeed playing a pretty typical Luxum Fire Xander deck. It's got a got a couple of couple of spices to it. You know, All people right. like to add their own little uh, little taste to it. But yeah, it does look like we're we've got a Fire Luxum on the bottom here. Yeah, and Subasa is going to just do a little bit of card selection, grab that uh, that Beseech, it, and just kind of like uh, you know turbo into his uh, turbo into his Merlin. Yeah, yeah. Taking a look at Subasa's list here, yeah, it does look like we are playing some Wind Merlin. Got some very uh, familiar uh, suspects in Incarnate Majesty, Ghost of Pendragon. So that's what we're looking to do when we get there: is play these very powerful Crux cards. I've heard Ghost of Pendragon is a pretty good card. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. It's seen. <laughs> it's seen some play. I think. I think I just saw. I think I just saw one of the Sylvie art cards. Ooh. Yeah, he 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 like discarded one of the 
cards drawn by Sylvie. Yeah, he is. Uh, he is playing three copies of Train Talk. That might might, that be, might be the Train Talk. Be train Talks in a sec here. See this gorgeous CSR Merlin. Oh, you love to see it. And as you called, yes, this is a uh, Wind Merlin deck. Yeah, four and zero here. And they're getting a fast start. Uh, their, their opponent Ve has no cards very in play. Fast. They're on a Serene Spirit of Fire, and Subasa here is level two, sword uh, in play. It's, yeah, Subasa's opponent has had one turn. Yeah. Right. He, all he's done is materialize my spirit pass. Yeah. I'll draw my hand. You go ahead. Meanwhile, uh, Subasa's got like a dungeon guide, a sword, and a level two Merlin. Yeah. And it's going to be really tough, um, especially for these Lux and Fire um, decks that are so predicated on using floating memory to level up. If Subasa just sits here on this level 2 Merlin, oh, just eats true. all of their floating memory for the entirety of the beginning of the game, it's going to be really hard for them to uh, to crawl out of this. Yeah, and the, uh, the the Fire Lux deck really wants to go like late game, right? You want to, yeah. you want to assemble your, your Voltron. You want to get all of those uh, Lux cards in order and start revealing. And once you can start doing that, you can accrue all of this advantage over time. And it's going to be really, really difficult to... to for your opponent to win once you can establish that and, and stabilize. But the way that Subasa is like turboing out here, we might not even get to that point. Yeah, they're, they're showing up and the Lux and Xander deck thinks they're the level three deck. And then right. <laughs> Subasa's here. Well, I'll show you. I'll get to level three before you're even level two, right? right? Which is a very real possibility here. So it looks like they're, they're thinking about their hand and they have stuff like Fast Cure that they can cast that has floating memory. But again, if they cast any of those things, it just gets eaten by Merlin. So yep. they're in a really tough spot here. Looks like they do have a dungeon guide, so they at least have a way to turbo themselves, but they really don't want to play that until they're level two. So it looks like, is he just going to do no effects at the end of turn and just kind of materialize a level zero card? Yeah, might just uh, take a while to get started, maybe grab uh, a card draw. So yeah, yeah, he is. Oh, wow, he's going to grab uh, Chalice of Blood. He's going to wait really long for that card draw. You can only activate Chalice of Blood when you've taken 20 or more damage. Um, but it is a banished draw, too, and very strong, yeah, but it's it going to take a while good. to get there. So definitely setting up for the late game. Yeah. Uh, like th this is the kind of play, if you see your opponent do this, you're like, okay, they think this is going to go very, very long, and they're prepping for that. Yeah. So we do have a nice little thieving cut. Yeah, so here, like I said, we're going to displace our dungeon guide, so she's going to leave play. She's going to come back into play rested, but when she does, you're going to get that on enter again, so he's just going to turbo up to level three. I mean, that that is like... You know, a blessing and a curse for Stevo here, right? Now he doesn't have to worry about his uh, memory being eaten, at least. Yeah. <laughs> but now, but now he's staring down a level three Merlin already. Right. And Merlin is one of those champions where, like, it can snowball really, really far out of control. They're going to start gaining level counters, drawing extra cards, getting a you know bonus at, like plus damage to their attacks. Um, and now Stevo is on like a very real clock. Yeah, I think uh, the Majestic Spirit um, coming off of Incarnate Majesty out of these Crux decks is a really hard thing for Luxem to deal with. They basically just have yeah. Excalibur, and they sort of have to lean on those. So I think Subasa correctly here is going to try to set himself up to get an Incarnate Majesty out as fast as he can. Yeah, I, I don't have Stevo's list. I have seen some of the Fire Xanders run like a couple uh, Uthers here and there, and he, ha he is rocking the Uther sleeve. That is true. So you might have a, like a you know one or two of Uther in there that that could help deal with that kind of stuff. Let's hope he's a believer. Unfortunately, it does not look like he is. No, no Uthers in so Stevo's list. Just rocking list. the Uther in spirit. Just rocking his his spirit, but. Uh, so here we have just the level up for Xander. Gonna get that uh, that counter and get a glimpse. What does he have on the top of the deck? It looks like uh, a Creative Shock plus something else. Didn't see the first card. Creative Shock looking pretty good here now that he has, uh, like you said, have has his uh, graveyard released from Merlin's control. He can uh, play a Creative Shock here, maybe discard something like a Fast Cure that's not doing a whole lot of, uh, of work. But we'll see what he's gonna go for here. He's pulled something to the front. So it looks like he's going to cast something. Might so, be that dungeon guide. He's yeah, really I, thinking about it. I see some dungeon guides of his own. I mean, th this is definitely the battle of like the level threes, right? We've right. seen in Grand Archive decks that only get to like level one, level two sometimes. Mm -hmm. And this is these are definitely decks that like really only do their thing once they hit their max level and yeah. have that uh, advanced element unlocked. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I very much enjoy about Grand Archive, where you have both of those strategies that are viable, right? You yeah. can go no advanced element, or you can go really all in on them, and both of those strategies are like viable and yeah. very strong. It looks like we are doing just that and going all in on on leveling up. Gonna go ahead and grab Xander Deft Executor. 
which allows him at the very least to get a card back, which uh, is helpful if he wants to do the double dungeon guide yeah. play here. He is getting that. Uh, he's getting that cut back. So. Yeah, it yeah. looks like it's just going to go for the second yeah. dungeon guide. Say, we're both level three now. Let's uh, let's start setting up these win cons. All right. This is going to be a very, very interesting game. Uh, so we, we have Merlin, who's going to be, you know, once again, accruing value over time. And now we have Xander, who is going to slowly start to assemble his Voltron. Yeah. Uh, the crucial cards here is you're 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 looking for the Luxum Sight, mm -hmm. and then you're looking for the uh, Lightweaver's Assault, right? So yes, sir. you want the damage, and you want the, the healing. And so just doing that turn after turn is really what uh, makes this deck really strong. Though you have to have some way to put those cards into your memory, um, either through the, the new um, Material Deck card, yeah, um, the Corhazi insignia. Yeah, the, the insignia, or just playing, you know, you know, playing a card, draw yeah. cards, or whatever. Yeah, so we're gonna see if we can bridge the gap here. Uh, definitely gonna be looking for, like you said, Luxum Sides, Light Weaver's Assaults, so maybe cards like Gleaming Cut that give you a burst of card advantage. Yep, yeah, Gleaming Cut is a great one. I wouldn't, you know, be totally surprised to see something like uh, Luxera's Map coming out soon, oh, yeah. so he can go tutor for one of those cards, mm -hmm. uh, whichever one he needs. Start getting the ball rolling. I would I would guess Lightweaver's Assault with with the life totals being what they are now, um, but uh, you know yeah, I think a lot that's of a safe bet. But the uh, the Luxem players always shock me. Um, the last time we had them on camera, it's, it's such a hard deck to play. So it's always so impressive to see these uh, Fire Luxem players uh, do the the work that they do with this deck. Yeah, it's uh, it's a really really sweet deck. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm a big fan of the water version of the deck, but uh, not f I have not played the fire version yet. It's a really uh, Really sweet deck. It. So it looks like there is a judge call here. The players. So yeah, it look, looks like they're they're settling something here. I'm not sure. So we played the second dungeon guide, and I I didn't see any attacks declared. I'm not sure if we're back in that that same spot where uh, somebody missed materializing their um, champion off of a dungeon guide. Um, so it looks like they're resolving something here. So it'll just be a minute or two before we get that settled. But we should uh, should definitely be settling in for for the long haul with with this matchup. So everybody get comfortable, get yourself something, yeah. you know, a drink, a go snack. go get a coffee or yeah. a tea or something. Yeah. With with the health totals being what they are, with these decks being what they are, it could be a little bit. Yeah, right? we're gonna we're gonna be here for a while. But you know, I, I find these matchups so exciting. There's so so much about little incremental advantages that add up over and over and over again, um, which is super cool to watch uh, happen in real time. Yeah, yep, for sure. All right, so it looks like we are getting our level three Xander here. So that, that has <laughs> resolved. All I, right. I, I do, I would like to say for the players' parts, it, it's, it's great to see both of them having like such a good time with it. You know? Yeah. The, the sportsmanship in the room has been terrific, um, which is great. The, yeah. the Grand Archive community as a whole is, is so very lovely, so it's great to see players enjoying playing against each other, even in such a high-stakes environment, these, these players. Yeah, I mean, like... This is North American Nationals, right? There is like what is a fifteen thousand dollar prize pool yeah. up for grabs. There's uh, worlds invites. There's special promo cards. Yeah. There's like a lot of stuff up for grabs, and so very high stakes. Seeing so. like this, uh, you know, level of camaraderie is is great. So yeah, it looks like that was the judge call. They were trying to see if um, if Stevo here had missed his opportunity to resolve the dungeon guide effect to put. Uh, Xander Blotting Steel into play. Looks like the answer is yes. Um, so they're just figuring that out here. And then we will get on the way. Yep. It, it, it looks like they have agreed to resolve it, I yep. think. So he is he's good to go. And uh, once they are settled there, we will get back to the game. Yeah, and, and, and looking at the both, both players' hands, right? So we have uh, three cards for Merlin, and Merlin's going to be able to accrue bonus value over time, because yeah. she has to basically draw two cards every other turn. Um, and um, Xander, I was going to say Uther. Uther. <laughs> Xander here is really going to need to sculpt his hand into like the perfect hand. He both needs the cards, like the big payoff cards, but he also needs um, ways to put them into his memory. Like you mentioned, the Insignia, mm -hmm. um, other great cards to do that, or anything that lets you draw cards, yeah, so yeah. like a Creative Shock and all that, all that kind of good stuff. It's a very interesting like quantity versus quality thing where Merlin gets such a quantity of card draws because yeah. he just gets raw card advantage, where Xander's, once he finds the cards that he needs and he reveals them, they all uh, generate advantage without ever spending a card. Um, so it's really interesting to see who will come out on top here. Like you said, I think it's really up to Xander to find his pieces and find them soon. Yeah, and as someone who really enjoys playing that, that type of deck, it, it feels really strong once you get there, yeah. but it's always kind of... Uh, 
you know, a dangerous situation until you actually get to that yeah. point. You're like, I just got to survive until I can get to this point where I can just lock the game down. Yeah, it feels like he's always on a nice edge, and then eventually he gets there, or, you know, that, that scale tips back on, on top of him. Yeah, and then this was going to be a really interesting matchup because of, you know, there's not a lot of exact pressure right now. I feel like the Wind Merlin deck, you know, in a lot of intents and purposes kills through like uh, the same way that an ally deck would right you kill yeah. through attacking you don't have an erupting card or something like that um, yeah creatures on the board like this very powerful ghost of pendragon that just bounced they're sort of seeking to draw two cards uh oh my god we're seeing a disorienting <laughs> oh, oh. wins oh, for no. free so that's uh <laughs> that's return target ally to its owner's hand draw a card it has efficiency so it allows them to for free pick up their ghosts play their ghosts again Bounce another thing, draw two more cards. Yeah, the, the ghost is quite good. It's a 3-4 it's that lets you draw two cards if you uh, put a card from your material deck, like back into the material deck. Yeah. It is uh, it's a big game. And here we do see the Luxera's map, as, as I mentioned. Uh, we also see a revealing a Gleaming Cut, so uh, going to you know be able to banish that and draw a couple cards. It's a good start. So we go up to four cards in hand, and you get that fifth card off of Luxera's map. Looks like we found a Sight, at least, pulled to the front of his hand. Yeah, I'm trying to see. Oh, oh and no. a Lightweaver. Yeah, as well. there is a Lightweaver. At least one Lightweaver's in hand. Is that is the front card? Yeah, it's a lot of sight. I think. There's I think, a sight. Okay. I think it's sight. Lightweaver's planted explosives, and I'm not sure what the fourth card is. But you can use that planted explosives here while relatively shields down from Merlin to deal with the Ghost of Pendragon. But it looks like we're just gonna go for a Creative Shock, yeah, discard an Exercise Curses. Yep, draw some cards, discarding a card that has Floating Memory, which. You know, it, it can have some use here or there. There's still some cards left in his material deck. Yeah, we're on, uh, like, Orb of Choking Fumes on the side of Steve-O, yeah. so that's a good way to get your GCR at home uh, yeah. card advantage. You get your freebie orbs in. Yeah. My early version of the uh, the Luxem Xander, I called it Orb Xander Orbs because Xander. I, cause I read a bunch of orbs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, orbs are pretty good, man. Choking Fume, the Blinding Orb, yeah. All of your baubles. He likes pondering his orbs. Even the Luxair's Mac kind of looks kind like of a orby. Kind of yeah. looks like a big orb. Orb shaped. Yeah. Or Xander, fan of orbs. And who isn't, you know, a fan yeah. of orbs? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a lot of damage coming across, though. At 18 already, thankfully, as we have seen several times today, we are on Serene Spirit of Fire. So we have that lineage release for six extra health. But you yep. can't forget that sort of sneaks up on people that go for lethal and you say, oh, I'll recover six. Yep, the, the big downside is like you lose access to your fire, but then again, we're already Lux, and you just yeah. kind of want to do Lux things and reveal and get a lot of value out of that. But here, here we have a big play. Here's the big horse. <laughs> yeah, I guess it, is, I guess it does look like a horse. I always assumed it was like a big old dragon dude. But yes, Incarnate Majesty, uh, between efficiency and uh, the uh, other cost-reducing effects, we have... Uh, the Majestic Spirit, which is what? The four, 410. It four says ten. anytime another Crux unit you control would be dealt damage, it's dealt that much damage half to round it down. Uh, including your champion. Including your champion. Yeah. And including cards like Ghost of Pendragon on the board yep, right yep. now. Uh, oh, answer right off the bat. Yeah, so that's that's exactly what the Doctor ordered. That is the only way for this Luxem deck to deal with cards like Majestic Spirit is Excalibur. We're going to see two Luxem sites and a Lightweaver's Assault re revealed here. So we're going to recover six. Get two damage to point probably at the face. Yeah, I mean, like you can maybe kill the you can maybe kill the Pendragon right here, right? Yeah, we can. Uh, we can also use this planted explosives to to deal with Pendragon now that uh, but, Merlin is is out of cards in hand. They're all down in memory. So it looks like it is going to be face. Oh no, you can't do. It. I'm sorry. I thought it was two light weavers, one one uh, Lexa. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, he only has two damage to, to around, throw around. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So not enough to actually kill kill the Pendragon here. The cool thing that, that you see these Luxem decks do a lot is you use like a Light Weavers to um, cover breakpoints and then you use yep. like anemic cards like Dungeon Guide to finish off things that have been dealt yeah. damage by Light Weavers. So we might see some of that here. Yeah, this is like a just kind of like the most grindy kind of strategy, right? right. It's not a real bursty strategy. It can be though. You can actually play the Light Weavers from hand to finish off your opponent, but mm -hmm. the the real game plan here, like the real meat and potatoes is you know, just slowly revealing them turn after yeah. turn. Here's some damage. Here's some healing. Maybe I get to draw some cards this turn. Um, but it can be really hard to overcome yeah. if you can use these cards to keep track of your like your opponent's board, keep it in check, mm -hmm. and then just heal turn after turn. Yeah, it looks uh, like we found a very powerful hand in the hands of Stevo here. He's found a lot of his Luxem cards. He also has found another copy of Excalibur to give him insulation against that majestic spirit coming back. 
he even has the planet explosives that he can use to, to deal with this ghost of Pendragon if he sho so chooses. I, I do have to say I'm resisting the urge to yell Excalibur. Yeah. Excalibur. <laughs> Excalibur, yeah. yeah. It looks like it, too. It yeah, looks like it's it. it's true. Uh, but yeah, that, that Excalibur is going to be really, really important in this matchup. Oh, it, yeah, it's, it's huge. It's the key card that you need against the Majestic Spirit. Because how do you deal with that thing? It's a 410 that... that, that it, it, it's a big boy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a big, it's a 410 that... So it protects you, but it also just kills your opponent because yeah. it hits for four every turn. And it's bigger, so it untaps every turn. Yeah, it's yeah. just just an absurd monster. But I mean, you have to jump through a lot of hoops to get That's there, true. right? You have to enable, you have to enable the crux element, and you have to, you know, get to that uh, that eleven break point to be able to play the card. But speaking of absurd monsters, it looks like we're pulling a train talk to the front of our hand here. <laughs> 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 we, we, oh no. I thought we were going to get that lovely train talk getting into the red zone. But yeah, get it on there. Yeah. The, the Sylvie drawn train talk. Yeah. Be best art. Uh, looking at his hand, look what else does uh, Subasa have? He's got obviously the dungeon guide, which is basically just a 1 3 at this point, unless there's some D level shenanigans. Yeah, I mean, it's what we had said earlier. He has so many cards in hand, but so many of them don't seem very effective. It's that quantity of card advantage, but you do have to find yeah, like some way to convert them. He's got to be looking at the dungeon guide and the the fairy and yeah, just being like, like, what these, do I do with these? These don't do anything. Yeah. I guess you can play them. Three mana, one threes are okay. Yeah, uh, it, it deals one damage, right? It's got to get there somehow. And you, we mentioned earlier, we have the uh, the Krohazi Insignia coming down. Uh, this is a card that allows them to put uh, additional prep counters on, but mm -hmm. more importantly, you have to pay for it, right? Yeah. And that you put the cards in your memory, and then those are great cards to reveal. Yeah, and we, we are going to get advantage uh, from that prep counter. going to use it to prep a planted explosives here. Like we said, trying to take care of that Ghost of Pendragon, but we might yeah, four see damage. Some, some interaction going on here. Ooh, yep. So he's going to Zephyr his Ghost of Pendragon. That's a lovely foil SP1 Zephyr. So when it comes back, it is going to get that on-enter trigger again. Probably bounce that sort of seeking. Draw yep. some more cards. Get rid of the sword, draw some cards. I mean, and he's going to have a lot of these sort of effects. Yeah. Ooh, so now we have a double reveal. So we have yeah. we have two heal triggers and two light weaver triggers. And this um, is getting into that dangerous zone where if uh, Xander hits ten cards, that's when he bursts you. That's that's yep. the magic number. Yep. It's it's really rough when they can when you do that and then also reveal other light right. weavers. So yeah. it's just tons and tons of damage. And so now uh, Xander's healing for six, dealing mm -hmm. four a turn. It is pretty good. And he just needs a couple more turns of this. He found an uncover the plot off the top, which allows him to double up on those reveal triggers yeah, if he it does. wants. And Pretty draws cards, gets prep counters. Pretty nice. Looks like we're going to go for a scry this guy's. <laughs> Look at the top three, see if we can find yet another Luxem card. Hoping for a Light Weavers. Oh, yeah. What's great about this in this particular deck is that you put it the card face down yeah. into your memory, and that's just another card that you can use to reveal. Steve, we're doing a quick count and saying, are you dead? But not yet. Yeah, I mean, like, Merlin level three still has a you know a decent chunk of health, but... What are they, like virtual 24? Yeah, yeah 24 they, now? they have 28, so they're, they're, they're four life down. So 24 is a, it's a tall order. Not not easy to do. But I, I have seen like double Lightweaver plays, right? Yeah, oh yeah. That, yeah can, that can be rough. Two Lightweavers by themselves does 16 damage. And if yep. you get any extra reveals off of other Lightweavers, it just, you know, compounds after that. So Yeah, and you can set up a turn where you have your whole hand down, reveal it, deal the Lightweaver damage, draw, you know, get oh, collect, yeah. and then just blow them out. That might be the plan here. Thinking about playing this uncover the plot looks like. Just get some value. We love the circus of value. <laughs> I was thinking, I was thinking <laughs> it. Uh, yes. Uncover the value. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is good value though, yeah. right? Oh yeah, very good. It's gonna heal six, deal four damage. He gets two prep counters too. Ooh, we put a jungle knives down there. <laughs> so we have one light weavers and uh two sites, so he's gonna heal for six, going only down to four, right? Yeah. And Wind Merlin isn't the kind of deck where they can just kind of, uh, it's not the same as like erupting, right? They can't just blow you out of nowhere. Yeah, so so Fire Merlin usually has access to like Fireball, right? That you get to use all these level counters to leverage into a big damage spell, but Wind Merlin doesn't have that. So yeah. she has to sort of peck away at you, which makes it very difficult in this very grindy Luxa matchup. Yeah, I mean, like the units are strong. Uh, you know, you have your, your ghosts, you have your yeah, spirit, okay. <laughs> but they still have to like deal damage, right? right. They don't just kill you. They do have to attack and... Uh, yeah, yeah, not burst you all at once. Yeah, they they kill you by the va the value that they get, right? The value. They don't kill you. Well, they also do that. They also <laughs> kill you. Banner Knight is a good one though. That does pump oh, up nice. a lot of these uh, cheaper pump, bodies. Pumps up everything. Pumps up the sword too. Yeah, 
makes Dungeon Guide look a little bit more scary. Banner Knight's actually one of my early favorite cards from Grand Archive. Yeah. It's just... So powerful. It, yeah. For only two, right? It's, it's yeah. a one-three that pumps your whole team. Pumps the squad. And your swords coming in for two here with Merlin, two more with Dungeon Guide, one more from Banner Knight himself. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is a good amount of good amount of damage, right? Oh yeah, he's gonna play a disorienting winds on his ghost of Pendragon there. How many times has this how many times has this ghost come into play? I believe like, it is this one ghost of Pendragon has been in play it's five the same, times. It's the believe. same ghost. Someone in chat. So count how many times this ghost of Pendragon has come into play. My over under is five. I think it's been five it's, times. It's, I, I think it's around that, yeah. It's that's so not if, a if it is five, that's like ten cards. Yeah. He's drawn like ten oh, yeah. cards. All of, them all of them currently still in Tsubasa's hand. Yep. Not actually, but you know. He's got a he's got a fairly fairly good grip. But yeah, Banner Knight makes all of these look a little bit more impressive. Maybe we see that beautiful train talk at the board. Ooh, so crashing in for three. <laughs> right, right. So this is a pretty tempered play, right? He's the opting not to play any more cards, just passing the turn, keeping that uh that, that ghosts in hand. Interesting, we got a quick silver grail here. I wonder Yeah, I wonder, what wonder what's he, hiding under there. I wonder what he dunked. Oh, you, you think it's just a dagger, right? It's got to be like a poison dagger. I don't think they play poison dagger. Yeah, I'm not really sure what it is. Oh, it could be a safeguard amulet if he's worried. Oh, possibly. But I don't know what he's worried about in the wind deck. Interesting. An interesting choice. Yeah, I guess we will find we'll out. We'll find out, yeah. We'll be bamboozled just like Subasa will. Yeah. So we have, what, two light weavers triggers, two heal triggers. And he's just going to use it to kind of clean up the board yeah, a little clear, bit. Clean up the the Banner Knight. We, uh, he did show us a Juggle Knives that he might use to get a little bit more damage, uh, I think put he, some cards down. I think he marked two damage on Dungeon Guide. I think he marked two on Dungeon Guide and sent two at Banner Knight. Mm. And I wouldn't be surprised if he Juggle Knives and uh, finished off the... Finished off the uh, dungeon guide. Well, unless I think, unfortunately, is target champion, but it could be wrong. I think it is only champion, actually. Yeah. I think, I think you're right. So he, he is going to cast it here. Going to deal one damage, draw a card. That's so great. You get to put two cards down. You get to replace itself. Such a strong card. Joe Lives is sweet. Look at that new altar art with Xander throwing knives at you. He's got a lot of knives. It doesn't look like he's juggling them very much. He's just throwing them. <laughs> he's just throwing them. <laughs> All right. So looks like we're just uh, pondering here. If we want to do anything in the end step is Tsubasa, as I believe Steel was passed over. Okay. Yeah. So so we're on we're on Tsubasa's turn. In a shocking turn of events, that Ghost of Pendragon coming back. The same Ghost of Pendragon. Ghost like of Pendragon actually, though, number six. It's actually. like actually the same one. <laughs> And so he's going to get rid of the, the tariff ring. Get, get rid of the ring, draw some cards. And he is on an even turn now, so um, Merlin's looking a little scary. She does have that plus two attack right now. How many cards does Subas have in his hand? Uncountable. It's just like, you know, a quarter of his deck. There it is. Yo, there's the hawk. Let's go. The trained hawk here to do battle. Ka -ka. Cower in fear as the trained hawk armada is... is Slowly arriving. <laughs> Look, that, that hawk is battle-worn, is ready for combat. It's trained its entire life for this moment. You know, a surprising card that has no glass bonus. It's just a 2-2 two -two true side bigger, which is yeah. pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's like pretty good. Going to get in for some damage here. Smash. If only we still had that, that banner knight, we'd be looking at so much. Like a squadron of hawks coming on in. Eight damage this turn. Those hawks are unfortunately, I think, going to fall to uh, to some light weavers' assaults on on the next turn. But yeah, for now they're doing battle. Easy, easy pickings. Though you know, like Xander is kind of like slowly chipping away at Merlin, trying to get to that uh, that crucial threshold where he can just kind of uh, pop off. Oh, I think I think this Quicksilver Grail must be a. Never mind. I was going to say Orb of Choking Fumes, but there is an Orb of cho Choking Fumes. Hey, out of said the it earlier. There. Xander loves his orbs. He does love pondering some orbs, and that one is going to let him draw a card and protect him a little bit. We're going to see a big Veiling Breeze here, though. <laughs> I can hear the players. Like they're, they're basically saying, let me see what you got. Yeah, Subasa says, what if you didn't kill me? All right, let's see what we have. We've got the the big flex uh, judge promo veiling breeze on the top there. 
love to see it. You yeah. have some fairies, which are more or less useless. But yeah, this Veiling Breeze is a, is a large one here. Yeah, it's for seven, I believe. So it just says you're not going to do any damage to me this turn. Yeah, so protects his champion, but that means like these Light Weaver triggers can... Start picking apart the board. Start yeah. picking apart Hawks, unfortunately. So, going to heal six, and then pick off the Hawks. No. Cool call. They fought so <laughs> well. <laughs> They're so sad. Well, they lasted one turn. They, 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 uh, they had trained their entire life for this moment, <laughs> and that moment has passed. They did some damage. That damage was immediately removed by Luxem Sight. They were then immediately killed. <laughs> yeah. It's a sad day to be a trained hawk. They did their part. They're doing their part. Their part is now, now, now <laughs> to, be, now is now to be in the graveyard. Yeah. All right. Ooh, so we have another Uncover the Plot. So this is going to get some nice old uh, reveal triggers. We're, we're getting to the point here where you have to think as the Merlin player... What am I out? What what do I do here? How do I escape this this lock? All right, so yep, just gonna double up on the, that ghost. Finally, he's gone. Finally, hitting the graveyard after only thirty eight appearances and drawing <laughs> you know eighty eighty three cards. Um, the scariest part is when we see the crux sites uh, come to bring that ghost of Pendragon back it, from the graveyard. Yeah, I mean, it's just also one of probably four. Oh yeah. Surely that. One down, four to go. We're on no crux sites, so that Ghost of Pendragon is dead. He is not he coming is back. He is dead. Uh, we do have Steve activating his orb, though. It's going to make it a little harder for Merlin to play the game here, but not so much. I mean, his, his, I have 15 cards. Yeah, his hand is, is absolutely massive. I think we see another Majestic Spear there. Nope, that was just Rose. She has a light background. Yeah, we, we definitely do see a Banner Knight, which is nice. Can help push the that, that crucial amount of damage through. I think we got to get this veiling breeze moved off the board here. These players are they've got too many cards, too many things going on. <laughs> yeah, the veiling breeze no longer uh, no, no longer, longer relevant. Active, yeah. Now he has three dream fairies, I think, in hand. <laughs> Just start casting them. One twos with stealth. Gonna die to light weavers anyway. <laughs> yeah. Start getting them on the board. What else does he have in hand? I think it's also another dungeon guide still. Yeah, I see a dungeon guide, some dream fairies, some zephyrs. I think he has two rows. I, I did see rows. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there is exactly two rows eternal paragon in the list. I would like to note to everyone, this is still um, round one. Game one, seven <laughs> to yeah. eight. Like we said, you're going to settle in for a long one here. Kelly, you'll be happy to know there is indeed a third trained hawk in the list. Oh. So it's not all over yet. That's our win con. We find <laughs> the, the third hawk. The third trained hawk. He takes it all the way home. He's just going to slam it down. It's going to win by itself. You can't kill it. It's animal cruelty. You would never do that. Except for the other ones. It, well, it, yeah. <laughs> that died immediately <laughs> after. All right. So uh, same song and dance here. We're going to see if he's going to actually banish this, uh, this, uh, this cut to draw some cards. Yeah, we're, we're in the scary zone now. He has enough cards to kill... Merlin at a moment's notice, basically. So, really got to be careful here. Yeah, Merlin taking nine damage so far. Keep in mind, Merlin has a total uh, of 28 health. Yep. Up to 13 now. Shields so might be down. 15? 15 looking at? Doesn't look like there's a whole lot. There's a resolute stand in hand, but that's not going to help you against Lightweaver's Assault. Nope. This, doesn't doesn't do it. Might be all she wrote, but it's up to Stevo to make that decision. Because if he walks into a Veiling Breeze, if he goes Lightweaver's Assault... Hold priority, play another Light Weaver's Assault. He gets yeah. so blown out by uh, by a Veiling Breeze like last turn. All right, let's see. He's got he's he's, he's playing some cards down. Okay, Creative okay. Shock. Just doing some digging, taking yeah. a look. And once again, you just want to you know put as many cards in your memory as you possibly can, so yep. you can get those all those reveal triggers. Yeah, I think he still has ten cards in hand, so he can still go for double uh, Light Weavers here. Maybe even after this. Ooh, he can go even maybe. Potentially more, depending on what we have on top of the deck. It looks like we found a dungeon guide there's and an another, Excalibur. There's another Scry as yeah, well. Yeah, a Scry, yeah. Those are both pretty good. Probably takes the Excalibur, leaves the Scry on top. I think he, he put he put both on top, yeah. Doesn't want that dungeon guide. Not doing so much. No, yeah, no. It's just a 1-3. You mean, he already, he already has a dungeon guide in hand. He's he got plenty. He doesn't yeah. need another one. Dungeon guides and spades. 
Here's here, Rose. Here's that Rose. So Coming Rose in. Rose can push a little bit of damage. She's a 2-3. That's that's not nothing. Yeah. That, that means 2. 2 damage. 2 is something that gets immediately healed. By <laughs> I mean, yeah. But I mean, you still have to like do the you damage. Got, you got to pressure, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, it's all about uh, pressure is the name of the game. If you d if you just throw up your hands, you're never going to be able you to. You got to give right? them a reason to heal, right? Right. You got to put some pressure on them. Got to got to at least do a um, 6 points of damage so they can heal it all back up. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean we're we're kind of uh, having a little fun at it, but I mean the very real reality for real reality the the reality for Subasa is he has to push at least seven points of damage right, to, to deal one going. right, yeah. which is so tough. And so like th I mean that's a really crucial threshold, and in a deck like this where it's just like really board focused, and with Steve-O having the ability to easily wipe that board, mm -hmm. it's just going to be really really tough for Subasa to get back in. So here's the Xander Reveal trigger. Yes. Oh my god. Three. Ooh, three light light weavers. weavers. Yeah. So he's just gonna heal full and now he's got six damage to to see uh see as he fit. See yeah. as he sees fit. He, now he can just throw the six damage at his opponent, and then any light weavers is, is basically lethal. So you just cast a single light weavers, you don't yeah. have to commit super hard. Uh, he's cleaning up the board, it looks like. He is he is taking a sweet time and and enjoying every second, which is, you know, totally fair to play safe and, and make sure that you're playing around every possibility that you're playing. Yeah, I mean like have. like a single light weavers, right? You reveal two light weavers right. in the first light weavers reveal. Yeah. And that that's like really safe too, so Yeah. It's like Deal eight damage. Yep. Yeah. With Merlin at fifteen here, it's looking Little dire. Starting to get there. Virtual 13, 13 health. But he really just, he, oh, yeah, he's finding, he found the third light, we, or the, the fourth. fourth. Yeah, it's the fourth, fourth light weavers. And a Luxum site. So he's he's going for the. Full Monty. For the full Monty. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure he just dunked that light weavers into, yeah. the, into the memory and. He's going to play light weavers? Oh, oh the plot. Well, interesting. Is he going to reveal four light weavers I here? I hope so. I think I think he's just going to hear us four light weavers. Yep, yeah. there's four light weavers. How do you feel about this one? Uh, probably not great. Not great. <laughs> if I had to guess. It no, looks like he's loving it. Look at him. Yeah, we still have we still have 30 minutes. We still have 30 minutes on the clock, so it looks like Sabasa has had enough. He he gave a gave a slight nod to his opponent. Yeah, that that'll do. And we'll we'll uh, we'll go to the next. Yeah, game. four four light weavers every single turn. <laughs> I'm, I've I've seen you enough. got it. All right, you know, <laughs> like healing for six and dealing eight every single turn. That that's that's kind of a lock though, yeah. right? That that's what you're playing towards. Yep. That's the inevitability. And yeah, uh, we mentioned this a little bit earlier. These are long games, and the next one's gonna go long. And it's okay to accept that. Yeah, I'm not getting out of this one. Let's you know try it again in game two. Yep. Looking at the. Wind Merlin's sideboard. Unfortunately, not looking like a whole lot here is going to be able to come in. There's one copy of Sudden Steel, which is just a, a way to push some more damage. Um, a virtually free attack for five once you get to a high enough level. Um, looks like a Cry for Help, an Innervate Agility, a Viridian Protective Trinket. None of these are coming in. Maybe a Smoke Bombs. Uh, so I've been kind of keeping an eye on what Tsubasa is putting in. He opted not to put the smoke bomb, but he did put in the um, the damage prevention amulet, the safeguard amulet. Sa yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It does stop uh, these, these like double light weavers turns that we're talking about. Um, so just sort of a, a safety net. Yeah, it kind of just buys him one extra turn or so, you know. Um, yeah, it, it puts it puts Stevo in the in the position where he can't really afford to waste his light weavers if there's a safeguard on play. So he does sort of have to go for the slow plan like he did game one and just keep revealing them over and over again, which does give Subasa more time to sort of mount an offense. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what Subasa needs, though. Yeah. Like, I think, well, I don't think, the, the, the Xander deck definitely uh, excels in the late game, right? You get to that point where you can just lock your opponent out and, um, you know, you want to speed up your game plan as much as you can uh, or slow them down. It looks like the Fire Sander player does actually have a very good sideboard plan into this sort of matchup. They do have two copies of Spurned Ash to deal with stuff like Corvazi oh, okay. Insignia, and they also have three copies of Gawain, who is really, really good into these slower decks that are trying to set up cards like Goza Pendragon or Incarnate Majesty, and you just get to take those cards away from them. It's very strong.
I love how the players are showing off the, the change in life. Yeah, totals. the life totals. <laughs> That's exactly what a Xander Xander one looks like, right? Yeah, they're they're framing that one, uh, putting it on the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> It's like it feels like an infinite spiral almost, yeah. you know. Yeah, so we're gonna see who's going first here. Um, what do you think uh, is the the choice here? If it's your decision, uh, what, what do you choose to go first? It's interesting. I don't think that either player really has the ability to mount an early offense. They're both very light ally decks, so I would almost opt for going second for the extra card. Yeah, I mean, it is maybe maybe it's a little bit hand dependent, right? Maybe yeah. maybe you have a hand like uh, Subasa had um, in game one, where he was able to level up very very quickly through a combination of um, dungeon guides and uh, wins, mm -hmm. and it's basically like a you know a race race to level three and right. then trying to establish your end game. So yeah, we will we will see what Subasa chooses here, whether to go first or second. Let's see. Looks like they're grabbing their material deck, so they are going to go first. Okay, so he's, he's opting for the um, more aggressive, yeah. aggressive line. And, you know, in this matchup, he would be the aggressor, right? Yep. Uh, he, he is the aggro, even though he also has a very you know strong late game as well. Hey, you know. Starting off with the Besiege of the Winds is very good. Yeah. It's a good start. We'll see if he has, uh, like, a dungeon guide to follow it up which is usually their MO. It does look like he has a Ghost of Pendragon in his hand, so we at least we have the end goal. That's yeah. what we're trying to get to. Trying to draw even more cards with yeah. Ghost of Pendragon. I drew 12 last game. I'm going to draw 14 this game. Getting rid of a cry for help. Oh, interesting. It's not going to do a whole lot of work here, so understandably put that card down as fodder for the Besiege the Winds. Yeah. Trying to glimpse at uh, what's in his hand. It doesn't look like there's another dungeon guide or anything. But there is, like you mentioned, the ghosts. Yeah, I see a, I see a ghost. I see another Besiege the Winds. Yeah, so we can take that route. So maybe uh, he has two cards left. Maybe those are his worst cards in his hand. He opts to go hard level up to uh, Merlin two, and then he can use that Beseech to go up to Merlin three. Yeah, and if you don't really have any allies to to throw down and start the aggression, that that might be the correct play. Yeah, you just get so much card advantage for the longer that you're yep. Merlin Kingslayer. So might as well start early. Drawing two cards every other turn is pretty good. All right, so we're going to look at our opening seven here as we are Serene Spirit on Steve-O's side. He does have a dungeon guide, so he has some, um, you know, early ability to kind of turbo out there. Mm -hmm. Has a lot of Luxum cards in his hand, which is a blessing and a curse. At this stage of the game, it's probably a curse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you really want those, uh, those draws so you can, you know, kind of set up your game, level up really quickly, and mm -hmm. then you can start uh, sculpting your Lux hand. Like, getting a Gleaming Cut right now is not great. Yeah, looks like he has a Gleaming Cut. Uh, Luxum Sight there that he's, that he's flicking between. So a bunch of, just a bunch of swords <laughs> just coming down from uh, uh, Merlin, what is currently Lorraine. Yeah, looks like they opt for the Drawn Blade there. Just get a little more, uh, little more card advantage. Just yeah. going to play a Star Wars Shieldmate. I don't know that Shieldmate is ever dying in this matchup. Hey. Probably not, but it just makes it so he can't, I guess, do chip damage with uh, dungeon guides or something. Yeah, it gives you an interesting choice with Thieving Cut that you can play a Thieving Cut to remove their shield mate, but also they sort of draw a card. So it gives a, an interesting choice to Steve-O, should he have one. Yeah, St Steve-O also has, like, removal with reach as well. Yeah. You know, he's got, like, his, um, you know, the uh, planet explosives. Mm -hmm. Considering dungeon guiding... Likely, all right, looks like we're going to scry first. Just going straight, draw a card into memory. Yeah. Maybe put some bad cards down that he wants to use to level. I think he's happy to wait right now, right? Yeah. So yeah, it looks like we are going to hard level up into Merlin. The Incarnate Majesty was the draw from Subasa, so that adds to our end game plan. We just have to find a way to get up to level three here. Yeah, and if he makes use of these weapons, they will actually you know, help power out that Incarnate Majesty. Yeah. So we're going to hard level up into Xander Prepared Scout, do a little glimpsing, see if we want to draw one of these cards. Hopefully it's a non-Luxum card. That's what we're really looking for right. here. Creative Shocks or something of that ilk. Yeah. He has to be a little bit careful right now because Merlin could potentially eat Floating Memory. True. 
Yeah, you sort of play this game of chicken where you have to wait until Merlin levels up, and then you yeah. say, okay, I'm safe to level up now. Hmm. The cards must be uh, fairly relevant. He's in the tank about this uh, this glimpse here. In terms of Lux cards, it's not the best, right, in hand. He does have Lux cards, but they're kind of like the more dirtily ones. So he can maybe afford to lose them if he's looking to, to level up. Yeah, just just a gleaming cut. Gleaming cut. I can I can speak <laughs> as well as the uh, uh, the the sight. The sight, yeah. And usually your life total is not really going to be in that much danger in this matchup. There was kind of an explosive crux start last game from Subasa, but I would say that's probably atypical. All right, Subasa. Now on his turn, yeah, just bobble, draw some cards. We all love drawing cards. Let's see. I mean, there are a decent amount of cards that are just kind of not great in Tsubasa's deck in this matchup. Right. Like, seeing the fairies again is just like, yeah, this very does nothing. Yeah, with the eight-card sideboard, you just don't have enough room to take out all of the dead cards, so you're still going to be stuck with some, yeah, cards like Dream Fairy that, at best, are a one-two with stealth, and that is not, not saying a whole lot. Yeah. One-two with stealth that, uh, you know, <laughs> can maybe get there someday. You put out your dream fairies to die to removal so that your train talks can get across the finish exactly. line. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what you do. All right, going up to Xander Deft Executor here. Probably going to rebuy that, that Juggle Knives. Oh, not rebuying that Juggle Knives. I... Going to respond, playing a Juggle Knives, then going to rebuy that Juggle Knives. Yeah. How many times can I say Juggle Knives in one sentence? He's ju he, he is juggling knives. He's juggling like knives. Actually, knives. juggling knives. Found some more Luxem cards. Yeah, I mean, those, those will be great in a few turns from now. Looks like we're going Our for that dungeon and, and by a few turns from now, I mean literally the next turn. Yeah. Hey, I think they'll also be great a few turns from now. <laughs> Because we're going to keep seeing them yeah, yeah. flipped up over and over again. So we have uh, Banish. We have we have the, the Potion Banish. And I can't ex quite tell what the other card I was. I believe it was an Uncover the Plot, which is an interesting choice. Maybe his hand is just so full of Luxem cards that he's choosing to Banish Uncover the Plot, which is normally a very strong card. Yeah, he definitely kept at least the uh, the Luxem Sight. Yeah. And I would assume the, uh, the Cut. But... Yeah, so powerful here. He can just go into Kor Korhazi Insignia, activate it before his recollection, then activate his Xander trigger. Yeah. But it looks like we're going to see a dungeon guide on the opposing side as well. Dueling dungeon guides. Yeah, I see your dungeon guide and raise you a different colored dungeon guide. Yeah, raise you a fancy promo dungeon guide for the flex. Absolutely love to see it. Subasa so going to be going down a little bit, but uh, of note, he does still have that uh, Pendragon in hand. Yeah, Pendragon and Incarnate Majesty. Oh, I do see the Incarnate. Yeah, both uh, ready to go. Incarnate Majesty is still pretty far off, but definitely worth noting. Going to get some, some stuff started here. Right. Draw a couple of cards. I hear drawing cards is good. Here's the first ghost. Looks like we have a Displace in hand. If we're really trying to power through some card draw here, you can Displace that Ghost Pen Dragon. Yeah, maybe, maybe attack with your sword and, yeah. you know, ghost it up. Get a little bit of value. Does he want to enter the Circus of Value? I think he might. <laughs> I'm just kind of like, gonna, are you going to flicker him? I think, yeah, I think he has a Zephyr and a Displace and a Fairy Whispers in hand, so he is just... Full of options to flicker this Ghost Pen Dragon. Maybe yeah. he waits for a removal spell, something like a. Yeah, yeah, use it as protection. Yeah, like an Excalibur or a couple of Light Weavers trying to trying to pick off this Ghost Pen Dragon. And uh, you you called it perfectly. Here is the uh, Insignia coming on down. Yep, gonna activate it before Recollection to to get some reveals off of this Sander. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Get get your you know maximize your reveals. Maximize your own circus. Of value, <laughs> right? I don't. I don't think he has any light weavers yet. Yeah, it looks like a gleaming cut. I say that as sight. I try to peek at his hand. Yeah, it's hard to see, but we're gonna see it all in a second here. Well, we nope. Well, so we do have we do have a heal and then a potential draw four. I like your ghost of Pendragon. What if I drew four instead? And then, yep, yeah, just going to draw four. And, you know, fingers crossed, 
that he drew into. Hey, wait, I, th I think he did. I, I, think, I do yeah. see a light weavers. We've made it. And another one right off the top? Oof. With the health totals being what they are, and Xander already beginning to sculpt his Xandery hand, I... I'm feeling a little worried for Subasa here. Subasa needs, like, power and fast. <laughs> like, he needs bodies that attack for big, and he needs them, like, yesterday. Well, thankfully, to all of our uh, joy, I saw he just drew a train talk. So the bodies <laughs> yes. are on the way. <laughs> Re reinforcements are on the way. Reinforcements <laughs> are here. <laughs> train hawk going to take it home. Hey, if, if, if you have enough train hawks, you can get there. <laughs> hey, hey, you know he drew, uh, he drew a banner? It takes a village, a village of train hawks. Yes. <laughs> I'm just imagining the village elder being a train hawk <laughs> with a mustache. <laughs> He does have a banner knight as well, which makes some of these threats pretty yeah, scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looks like he's not going to deploy it. He might just be going for, here's my card of majesty, show me an Excalibur. Yeah, so what, what level is he currently? I believe he's got three counters. No, two counters. He might be level five here. Okay, so level it'd be, five. So it'd be seven to, to cast. He's counting it up here. So yeah, he, he did just bounce the, uh, the knight, the Pendragon back to hand. Going for a little fairy whispers, replaces itself. Maybe there's finds some more there's stuff. There's another Incarnate Majesty. Looks like he actually missed, so he's going to put two normal cards to the bottom, Incarnate on the top, say, here, this is coming. You're going to worry about that soon. Yeah, I mean, like, did we see any Excaliburs in Steve's yeah, hand? I don't think so. Also worth noting, we have a Blanche at the top of the hand here, which is really powerful if your opponent walks into it. Yeah, unfortunately, you can... Point the Light Weavers at uh, Blanche. Yeah. Kind of take her off the field. So we're going to see the same Ghost of Pendragon coming on down, drawing some cards. Drawing cards is good. Uh, you're using it to, to clean up the board rather than to go face. He's run out of things to bounce, so he does have a, a Zephyr to flicker this Ghost, but he doesn't have any Recalia to bounce anymore. That's true. So the Ghosts are on standby for the moment. Gonna see a juggle knives and a turn here. Just juggling all the knives. Juggling so many knives. I think all th three points of damage have been dealt by juggle knives. Gonna get a map here. Probably get that third light weavers once we're allowed to, and then uh, that might be all she wrote after that. So we get get a couple turns here from Subasa to mount an offense. I mean, I think he's starting to get what looks like what he needs in hand. Like I think yeah. I think getting the banner knight's a good start. Oh yeah. He's just going to have to Banner Knight plus a bunch of allies in the same turn, do a ton of damage, and pressure like uh, apply enough pressure that he can finish him off in like you know a couple turns. That is disgusting, though. Heal yeah, six, heal six, four, steal draw four. two. You think he's going to, for the, the, the Light Weaver's triggers, go face or try to kill this Pendragon? Um, probably, I don't know. I would try to kill a ghost. At, at worst, your opponent's going to spend a card that you know they can't get value off of if they like flicker it. They have nothing to bounce. So. Yeah, I think that's the right call. And he's not even going to protect it. He's just like, yeah, it's dead. You got it. Yeah, he probably wants to save those Zephyrs and stuff to protect his Incarnate. That makes sense. Yeah. You, you definitely want to protect the, the 410 who yep. ha halves all damage. Yep. I mean, yeah. that, that's, that's basically his game plan at this point, right? Yeah, get, it has get, to be. Get the uh, Majestic Spirit out and protect it for dear life. Because uh, Lightweaver is pretty bad in that card. It is. Yeah, it's just <laughs> one, one point of damage. Yeah. Not, not the best. Has he assembled the maximum light weavers? Just passing here. All right. You know, this is the, once again, this is the slow game. Yeah. They're just kind of like setting up. The These life the totals are going to change out of nowhere. It's going to be 1 to 25. Yeah. Know? Yeah, exactly. Just out of nowhere. So they're both sort of trying to pick their spots. That's the hard thing about these control matchups. You really like, you get one shot um, and you have to. Pick the right one. Just pondering his his options. Hey, it gets hard when you have 35 cards in hand. Which ones do you want to cast? Yeah. They're all options. So it looks like just kind of getting in for a little bit of chip oh, damage no. here. Yeah, it looks like we're going for the Incarnate. We're not going for the Trade Talk. Big. Sadness. Big horse. Big horse is here. Coming in for four. No Excalibur. I mean, yeah. If you're Subasa, you'd love to see it, right? Yeah. You're basically just praying for no Excalibur. Yeah. And no, like, 
backup Excalibur. Right. We do have, uh, still have another Incarnate Majesty in hand, so, you know, he's like, okay, well, if Excalibur's my dude, I can still at least get him back. Yeah, so he has, he has Maj Majesty in hand, and he also, I think, has a Displace in hand, so he has two yes. forms of protection for the big horse. The real question is, is, is Big Horse going to be able to do enough damage? Yeah, that's the problem. To close the game out. It's uh, It stops you from dying, but it also doesn't really kill your opponent if they're revealing two Luxum Sites every turn. I think you uh, hit the nail on the head with Banner Knight being super important here. We're going to have to look to have a big burst turn where you play a bunch of allies, play your Banner Knight, crash it. Oh, I mean, Banner Knight's going to make it so that Shieldmate can attack. That's true. So that's something. She, she'll finally be able to do something. She's wild good. One, two, getting in there. She's been chilling this whole match, just watching everything unfold. Waiting for her, her time. Put me in, coach. You can put that hawk on. Oh, I put it on put the, the bottom. Put the hawk on the bottom. He's determined to lose. <laughs> the disrespect. <laughs> no, no, see, no, no the yeah. thing is, is he, he's already got hawk in memory. That's all he needs. Right, he just needs the one. Yeah, yeah he's already got it. He did, uh, did find a, a Veiling Breeze, which is very strong. That's true. And t to be fair... Uh, I'm not sure if a 2-2 two -two is going to be no, the card. No, definitely not. Yeah. To, to Joke, jokes aside, Train Hawk probably not getting it done here. Yeah. Uh, more more cards like uh, Banner Knight, though. Yes. Like, just these cards that give you, like, exponential is not the right word, but this uh, incremental uh, yeah. attack value. Yeah, you get the, the, the force multiplier if you get a couple of them. Like, two Banner Knights? Oh, a lot uh, of damage. Oh, that's sweet, yeah. We have a draw three here. So he's cracking, cracking his orb. Once again, orb Xander, pondering his orbs. He loves those orbs. Might also crack this Luxarius map here. Similar to an orb, looks like one. Oh, I see. He was cracking orb and recollection, so we're going to get our recollection trigger here. And then maybe crack that map, which is slow speed only. Yep, slow, slow speed only, yeah. Ooh, so he's going to do some shenanigans. Oh, no, we found the Excalibur. Ooh. So... Oh, he's just going to let it go. He's like, I'll just cast another Incarnate next turn. Oh, there was the, the trigger from Xander made him put his hand down yep. so he no longer had the display. So yeah, so he's doing this with uh, with that on the stack. Very yeah. smart, very smart. Yeah, we, we know we have another Incarnate, so Horse yep. is uh, coming, coming back out. Still one Incarnate Majesty, but uh, shields are down now. Yeah, shields are down, and there's a lot of damage... 21 is not out of the realm of possibility, especially since he assumingly just tutored his third copy of Lightweavers, which makes his other two in hand much more powerful. So yeah, it looks like he has enough cards here to just go Lightweavers, Lightweavers you, and that is 20. So if he can find one more point of damage, maybe he finds a third Lightweavers here? Yeah, maybe, maybe he just kind of sets up for next turn. But then again, I mean, he doesn't know that his opponent has another Incarnate Majesty. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'd be tempted to just uh, deal 20 damage here and hope, you know, you can find, uh, find another point. Yeah, I mean, with so many cards in hand, with so many Lightweavers, Lethal might have been on the table. Yeah, I, th I think he was, he's a card short now that he's played Scry, so he's just going to wait till next turn. Again, nothing wrong with being patient. I think the longer the game goes, the more advantage Xandard is, so, so he doesn't have to rush into anything. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um... Looking at Subasa's hand, I mean, like he can he could run back out the the spirit, and that looks like that that's what he's considering. But it does take a considerable considerable amount of resources, right? Yeah, he's level six. I believe he has no swords in Spanish, so he's looking at a uh, six cost for this Majesty. Yeah, and he's pretty happy to pretty happy to play it, keeping a Banner Knight and some protection in hand. It looks like. Yeah, he might just be better served to run something out to the board here, because he's not going to get to keep his hand from that Xander trigger. But he's just going to attack with the horse, deal five, untap the horse from Vigor, pass over to Xander. Yeah. This is a very tempered play, you know, not running out the Banner Knight and instead keeping the protection up for your, uh, for your spirit. We're getting the all-powerful Null Lantern to send a message. Yep. They're all norm now. <laughs> that, that, that's the message. He uh, he might be playing around Cruxite. He he doesn't have a deck list, so Subasa could theoretically be running Cruxite, which Null Lantern does shut off. Yeah. Gonna go for this Veiling Breeze in response to the trigger. Only has three cards though, so only preventing three. Train talk doing work. 
Yeah, Trey, Trey Dog doing work. Being revealed. Yeah, both players on the, the reveal <laughs> reveal strategy, right? Yeah. So it looks like this is coming at the horse. So yeah, he's, he's dealing the damage to the horse, and then he's going to reveal and probably deal a bunch of damage to the horse. Yeah, so four damage is marked, and we have oh. three light Yahtzee, rivers, so goodbye. six more damage. Those are the magic numbers. Second horse defeated. Maybe the last horse. Horse down. Yeah, I, I, I think he should be able to button it up here. Gonna yeah, go for a creative shot. I'm just trying to think, like, if you're Subasa, like, what can you do in this situation? Yeah, it's, it's so it, tough. It's... The safeguard amulet does save you from dying, um, so you're not dead to double light weavers. I guess that that might be the plan. You hope that your opponent, you know, runs out a couple of light weavers because once you run the Xander deck out of light weavers, they really don't have a way to kill you. So you just have to find a way to make him cast them. So maybe yeah. things on the board that are that are pressuring him, or you get him to run them into a safeguard amulet. But it's going to be a tough road. He's going to get an orb of regret here. Get rid of probably some of these like dead normal cards, dungeon guides, exercise curses, stuff like that. Because yeah. even the wind cards still have value with failing breathe. That's true. That is true. And uh, what's the end game here for Subasa still? Like try to get your horse back? Yeah, I guess so. Try to get your horse and protect it. Because the horse basically stops you from dying to light weavers. It's very hard to kill um, through the horse. So it, it's difficult with Steve being up a game that theoretically you could use that horse and try to play for a draw, but. If you're down a game, that's not a winning line. Yep. Yep, that is true. And, uh, you know, Steve-O has done just an incredible job this this matchup, um, you know, establishing your, your Xander lock, right? Yeah, expertly played. It's really important to know, you know, uh, what your spots are and, and when you're supposed to, to take them. Um, a lot of Xander players, you know, like uh, rush into uh, trying to cast their spells too quickly, but Steve-O's being very, very patient. And yeah. he's paying off here. Here we have Ghosts coming in. There's a 3-4. Draw some cards. Um, as powerful as it is, unless we're drawing into Incarnate Majesty, it might be a little... Um, you know, not, not enough. Going for the beatdown. Four damage across. Yeah, we know we have two Luxite reveals. Yep. So once again, he's uh, he's at that like seven break point. Unless he deals seven damage, he's not really doing any damage. Gonna go ahead and get a choking fumes. He has an exercise curses. Oh, or a stall word to get rid of to pay for it. Yeah, free free orb. Free orb draws a card. You, you love, love your free orbs. Orb. Hey, from this distance, even the lantern looks like an orb. It's true. Orb shaped. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Insignia has a light aura around it that looks very orbish. Rings are rings kind, are like orbs, kind of orb shaped. Yeah. Orbs with holes. Oh in them. wow, that yeah. is a three of a kind multiplied by two, right? Yep. So heal nine, deal six. I think that's what the, they call that a full house in poker. I was gonna call it a full <laughs> house, and I'm like, wait a minute, this is too many cards. Too many for, cards. This is too many cards for that. It's the fullest house. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Extra full house. But yeah, you know, healing nine, dealing six a turn is... Uh, I think that's okay. Pretty yeah. hard to overcome. I would say that's all right. And is he just kind of pointing it all at face? Yeah. Yeah, same situation where almost even a single Light Weavers is enough to get it done here. Ah, so Subasa is considering using his amulet. Hmm. Yeah, sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you pop it here, he just says pass, and then he casts Light Weavers on your turn because it's uh, fast speed. Yep. He's opting not, not to activate it. Uh, of course, when all of those are separate, uh, you know, reveal triggers, so right. he had an opportunity to, to respond to any one of those. Mm -hmm. um, opted not to respond to any of them. Gonna see a planet explosive. Try to try to force his hand. Be like, you want to pop that safeguard now? Here's four damage on on the stack. Yeah, it's a pretty tough situation because you know he's got the light weavers. Ooh, Blanche. Blanche here to save the day. Yeah, Blanche is coming in to you know protect. But then again, we have some we have some light weavers coming on in. So yeah. poor 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 little Blanche isn't long for this world. She's doing her job. So I'm here, guys. All right, we have the sword coming back. This is just the never-ending sword. 
So it looks like uh, during material phase where you get the the orb pop just to tax Subasa's hand for the turn. Just make it a little bit more difficult. Just trying to, you know, sure up your uh your end your end state here. Yep, yeah, if you can run Subasa out of cards in hand, you're pretty safe to to go for um for a kill here. So just if they want to cast things, make them pay a little bit more for them. Yeah, Stevo's biggest challenge or biggest uh, question here is just like the uh, sense of the unknown, right? Does he doesn't know what's in Subasa's hand? Yeah. So he's he's playing like the the safer game, right? If you're wondering like why doesn't he just jam out the jam out the light weavers? He's he's playing for the safe. Yeah, it's because he doesn't have to, right? So yeah. Don't force yourself into a a pattern that you don't need to take. You can take it slow. Yeah, this is you know. It's, it's uh, a banner night time. It's double banner Ooh. night time. It's I mean, this is triple uh, banner yep. night time. This is what you, this is what he's been waiting for. <laughs> Trip banner nights. This is gonna give uh, each other banner night plus two plus uh, plus two attack, and then everything else gets plus three. Coming in for so six. this is a six damage um, ghosts. This is a way to to push the damage through, right? Yeah, Kel, we found that seven uh, breakpoint. It's it's right here. Yeah, <laughs> here yeah. it is. A little bit more than seven. It's a, it's a How, few. However, we mentioned. Oh well, he's got resolute stand. All right. That's pretty good. Still gonna take some damage here. Yeah, though. he'll take three from it, right? Take resolute only prevents three. And then I guess the one power. Yeah, allies so get one damage in each. Yep, yep. And then. And then Lorraine gets some damage in. Sorry, yeah. Merlin gets some damage in. Ah, uh, yeah. But yeah, looks I, like that's I think Subas is gonna scoop here. <laughs> I've had enough. I, I did my triple banner night play. I mean, like, he's got the three light weavers. Yeah. He's got the three sights. It's like, all, I don't want to say impossible to, to overcome, but it's it pretty, is it's pretty tough. It is a it is a Sisyphean task, right? Yeah. You push the boulder up, and it's just rolling back <laughs> down over you. Yeah, Subasa was a really good sport about it. Uh, very well played by both players. So it's so difficult to navigate these control mirrors, especially you know games that go this long. It's very fatiguing once you're in minute. 40 of game one. Yeah, I mean, without the ability to just OTK, it's, like, really, really hard. Yeah, it's to tough, tough to be a win deck into these Fire Zender decks where normally the plan is to cast Fireballs, right? Like, they try to kill you. You say, I'll double Fireball you. You play this weird game of chicken forever. But Wind just doesn't have access to that. Yep. I mean, they have powerful allies. Yeah. Uh, allies that draw them, like, 15 cards or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Disorienting 16. Winds look really strong there. It was, it was yeah. cool. Disorienting Winds, your ghosts. Which is pretty good against most of the other control decks. It's just Luxem Xander specifically has a has a good. Yeah, and I think if he could have set up a turn where he actually had the triple banner knights mm -hmm. and the Blanche earlier, yeah, uh, before his opponent got the the, the triple uh, triple light weavers, the the triple triple, then um, maybe could have got there. But like I said, it's uh, almost an in insurmountable task. Yeah. Um, but uh, we have more action coming to you. We're going to take a short break, um, just five or six minutes, and then we will be back with some more action here at the North American Nationals for Grand Archive. Yeah, we'll see you then.
How's it going, everyone? And welcome back to the Grand Archive North American Nationals. My name is Kel, also known as Red Zone Rogue, and I am joined once again by Rav. Welcome, welcome. Hey, hey. glad to be back in the booth. So we are now just about to get started here for round number six. I think we only have one more round after this. Yep, round six of seven for today. And then, of course, tomorrow we have the, uh, the rest of the Swiss rounds and then, of course, the top eight. Yeah, no, I'm really excited. I mean, this day's been flying by more than I expected it to. Yeah. I mean, we've had a lot of good matches on camera, a lot of unique matches on camera. So it's been like an overall very fun event to be casting. Yeah, I mean, like, I know a lot of folks going into this expected to see certain types of, uh, you know, decks being represented more than others. And we've been, you know, featuring, you know, undefeated decks. And yeah. they've been, like, pretty spicy throughout the entire event, right? Yeah. A lot of folks are like, oh, it's going to be all allies or all erupting. And we've seen a, a nice mix of stuff. Yeah, I mean, getting last round, we had the Wind Merlin versus Luxem yep. Xander. Wind Merlin was something I sort of rattled off. I was going like, oh, we're not going to see a Wind Merlin today. This earlier in the day. And all of a sudden, Wind Merlin's, what, 5-0 and originally? Yeah, though they were 4-0. Four 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 um, Sorry, unfortunately, going, going up against the yeah. uh, that that uh, monster of a of a Xander deck. I mean, yeah. once you get to that three and three, revealing you know yeah. healing for nine, dealing six is pretty rough for yeah. a deck that wants to win through fair means like, yeah. by attacking. Yeah, no, but it's a little bit hard, but no. I mean, like I said, seeing the win Merlin, then going the round before we had Ally. I think the only first ever expected matchup we've had was Allies, and yeah. that was. A Two rounds ago now, technically. Yeah, it was like what uh, you, you did that one. It was yeah. uh, water allies and wind allies. Yeah, and so far, like I said, everything else we've shown on stream is very unique. We've had the Triscuit, we've had Fire Rye, which is yeah. sort of old but also unique because Rye's sort of fallen off. The yeah, radar. a lot of a lot of people like discounted Rye, like coming yeah. to this event. They're like, nah, Rye's not here. And uh, at the time, I'm not sure of his standing currently, but uh, he was, what, 3 you know, I think, I at think the time. I think he's, actually, I think he's X3 or X2 now. I just okay. talked to him before I walked over here. We're at the point in the event where X2s still have a shot, but X3s don't really have a shot for, for uh, day two. Yeah, I've been hearing there's a decent amount of ties going around at the same time, though, so it's going to be really interesting to see what's actually going to make it out of yeah. the woodwork. I've been seeing a lot of different decks, people that... I haven't met personally or just come up like, yeah, we're doing excellent, we're doing really good. And it's yeah. just, I'm glad to see the diversity and how, out of all these players, like how many people are here doing really good at this event and how widespread isn't like your usual players. Like, you're not the people you expect to be doing well. It's people that you might have not seen before, are really good at the locals, and then they're coming out and just performing well. Yeah, you know, I mean, like, this is. We mentioned it multiple times uh, already today. This is one of the, the, the premier level events for Grand Archive. And this is one of the places where you can make a name for yourself, right? Yeah. If you're coming into the game, maybe you're not more of a well-known person in the in the scene. This is your opportunity to do so. Yeah. Like, not only this Nationals, but the, the next couple Nationals as well as uh, Worlds. These are events where you can solidify yourself as a, like, renowned Grand Archive player. Yeah, and that's sort of what most people... I wouldn't want to say dream, but sort of a, a mini inspiration. Because, you know, when you yeah. become good at a TCG and you get your name out there, it's really surprising how many people might talk to you like, oh, I know you because of this and X because of this. And it's just one of those things that's sort of a great feeling to have. Yeah. You know, especially yeah, for sure. in any form of recognition. Yeah. And I mean, like, the, the, it comes down to that also for, for winners, but also for, like, people who champion certain yeah. styles of decks, yeah. right? Um, so if you're, like, once again, like, the Rye players, like, I'm the Rye player, this yeah. is what I'm known for, and then people, you know, know you for that, right? Yeah. And even if you, you know, potentially don't win the event, people are still like, oh, you played Rye, I play Rye, and, you know, yeah. you can kind of form that kind of... Uh, um, yeah. A relationship, you know. It's one of the great things about Grand Archive is being the, um, the smaller end TCG right now we are. You guys are growing, uh, I want to say, pretty at a pretty good pace at this point. I oh, mean, yeah. We're sitting here with 163 people at a national event for the first one. Is that uh, The community is also close-knit enough that people really interact and know each other by name through other forms of media as a whole. Oh, yeah. And it's been really nice to see how many people are just interacting, saying hi. We saw the same thing at Ascent Ontario, Ascent Houston, of just people walking up, finally getting the meet for the first time or if not others, and it's just been an overall fun event um, just to meet everyone. Oh, yeah, man. It, it's only the beginning, right? Yeah. Uh, only going to get uh, bigger from here, and we have a lot of uh, really, really cool Grand Archive stuff coming uh, coming for the rest of this year. We already talked about some of the events, but we have even more events planned. We have the, uh, the Midwestern um, Ascent. We have the Ascent in Ontario. I think we have one in uh, Singapore. Singapore, yeah. Taipei, and Taipei, yeah. Toronto. Yep. So, we, yeah, we have four major events coming up. Um, two of them are overseas, if you're in the NA. Uh, one of them's in Canada, and another one's going to be still in, hosted in the U.S. So it's going to be another opportunity to see all these people again and still play at a high-level competition, but get the funness of an ascent 
where you get to meet the artists, get to do all the yeah. little fun side events. I mean, and then Worlds is literally two months away from now. Yeah, and we've already mentioned it multiple times on stream, but uh, Worlds, the World event itself is Invite, but there also is an Ascent Worlds at the, happening at the same time. So uh, if you didn't make it into Worlds, then you can... Um, you know, just go to the Open Invite Ascent. Uh, it is a team event. It's the first of its kind for Grand Archive, so you and a couple buddies can enter this team event. It's a really interesting team event where you can't really duplicate cards in the yeah. team, so you have to... There's a lot of innovation in building all three decks for the team, right? Yeah. So if two players are like, oh, I want to be fire, well, it's going to be tough, right? You can technically make it happen because you have the Spirit of Fire and then you have like the Serene Spirit, yeah. but then you don't have a lot of cross cards, yeah, right? Yeah, you can't all run Creative Shocks. You can't all run Increasing Danger. So depending, yeah. you have to really come up with a couple of different methods of how you want to, if you want to be the same spirit to build your deck around. And I think it's something that's really fun and I want to say almost unique into these types of events because usually... In some other games, you might have a little cross on it, but something great with Grand Archive is having this diversity build of different element spirits, different level three, and yeah. then trying to figure out how you want to build it for this 3v3 event overall, which is going to be our first 3v3 event for Grand Archive as well. Yeah, I'm really excited to see how that shakes out, honestly. Yeah. I think it's going to be a really cool event. Um, yeah. But... Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's going to be great. I mean, if you're in interested in Grand Archive, if you want to you know, come to one of these events and play in it, you have a lot of opportunities throughout not just the United States, but like, like uh, uh, Rav said, you know, Canada, APAC region. Um, it's going to be excellent. Yeah, it's definitely going to be excellent. The game's definitely growing. I know the dev team has talked about that they're looking to add more events. They're really liking yeah. Ascents. People have given great feedback about Ascents. So this is an event that people really enjoy coming to. I think it's one of those events that... Even just coming to spectate of the game itself has been great. I mean, you have the artist alleys, not artist alleys, but a couple of artists that show yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just an overall fun event for people who might just like the game, but might not even play it, who just like to do the art style or anything of the sorts. Yeah, I mean, honestly, this is something that I've uh, said before, and I'll say it again. For the Ascents, they really make them feel like, like an anime convention almost. That's <laughs> yeah. what it really felt like to me. Yeah. There's a lot of just like... Uh, um, you know, cool banners and, uh, you know, um, just, uh, just stuff everywhere. There are the artists. There's usually, uh, like, a, like, a merch booth. Yeah. Um, you can win tickets, and you can cash those in for, like, uh, play mats or whatever you, whatever you want. Yeah. I mean, the banners are insane alone. I mean, we have a nice one behind us for the event. Yes. There's the banners out on the floor. Um, we're probably going to see some form on the Grand Archive Twitter or maybe on the website or something after. But we have the overall champion spread or ally spread banners which are really nice. Yeah, they <laughs> um, do a great job of like immersing you into this game. Unlike yeah. a lot of other card games that I've played, to be completely honest, yeah. uh, you know, other card games will have like maybe a banner here or there, yeah. but like I said, it really feels like a more of a anime kind of uh, uh, anime con expo experience, which I think is really cool. No. Um, yeah, I think yeah. it's definitely a great event. Um, like you said, sorry for a little bit of delay we had. We did have a repair that came through. Um, we're just getting everything settled in, getting everything configured. Um, we found out we're going to have at least one player. We found out one of our players that's going to be possibly on a Tenaris deck, which is new for the stream. Uh, think, yeah, we had one We had one well, Tony deck. Well, I should was, say was different Tony. than yeah. the ally Tony list. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I would say so. All right, so this is the um, as it is heard. The Jimmy played this at Ontario. So this is oh, okay. the interesting big swing Tony fire ah. deck that I've alluded to probably way near the beginning of the stream of hmm. a possible build. But that's a list that's very unique. I mean, I'm I like Guardian. I like the setup. So this is a list that I really enjoy. It does a lot of big damage turns. Yeah, big big smashy. Yeah, big smashy for like 36 in a single swing that just sort of comes out of left field. It's pretty big. Yeah. yeah. And you go, oh, you're going to Resolute stand? And I still take 33. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, Resolute's good if it's a lot of like small instances of damage. Not so good if it's doing anything more than three. Yeah. So I am going to go ahead and work on pulling up the deck list for Jimmy here in the meantime. But yeah, no. So they like said, this is the deck that I'm really excited to see because it's also utilizing the other instance of Tenaris. Tenaris really was a card that had a lot of domain abilities. Yeah, that wanted yeah. to activate with domain cards. So let's just utilize it, something like the um, the, uh, the Assassin's Market, which oh, is okay. the unique domain. It has the domain that also lets you use your domains to pay for memory costs. 
Okay. And I think it also runs the level three Tony that, um, for those who don't know, Tony is the abbreviation that most of us call Tonaris. Tonaris, <laughs> yes. Tonaris. And Tony's a spin the abbreviation since it was spoiled that also generates domains that yeah. either let you protect yourself or anything of the sort. Yeah, that's the one that I, I do believe comes in the starter deck that uh, at the beginning of your turn, you get to pick one of the ones that you haven't chosen before. One mm -hmm. of them is one that makes uh, automaton allies, another one... Um, they, they, they're basically just great value over time, essentially. Yeah, so it does actually, I also forgot, pulling up the deck list now, that um, this list also runs both versions of level 3 Tonaris. Oh, okay, okay, I see. So there is an instance where you go to level 3, that generates stuff, and then you would also de-level yourself. Oh, interesting. To then go into the other Tony, because the other version of Tonaris lets you... Um, if you generate a token, you can generate a sword instead. Yeah, it's like a 3-1 sword. Yep. So yep. instead of generating like the ally tokens, you can generate the swords, and then you can like use those swords for various things. Yeah, and they mostly that's how it sort of sets up the gigantic swing turns. I mean, looking at the rest of the list, we have Dungeon Guides, we have the Creator Shocks, we have Navigate the Streets. Oh, interesting. Which is a card I liked early on, and I was sort of blasted by one of our co-hosts for saying I was cooking too much and saying <laughs> I like Navigate the Streets. It's a good card. But no, then we have, um, like I said, Eternal Kingdom, Flame Sweeps, some Focus Flames, Spurn the Ash, Varuk, Assemble the Ancient, which is another card that's used to set up those tokens with the level 3 Tenaris, as well as the Summon Sentinels. Yeah, Varuk is actually a really interesting one. It makes it so that damage can't be prevented on uh, fire sources that you control, so um, they might not be able to stop the damage anyway. No, which is really good. Um, it, the only downside is the deck does have some issues into Song of Frost that we've seen some of these wild uh, ally yes. lists running, because Song of Frost does end the combat phase. So yeah, I mean, if you're coming in with one big 30 damage attack and get Song of Frost, <laughs> you're pretty sad. Yeah, sort of hurts a little bit. Yeah, so. yeah. But no, and then the sideboard, it looks like the ZF Safeguard Aim, another Focus Flame, another Spurn, another Varuk, a Blinding Orb, uh, Archon Broadsword, which is the other sword um, that's in Neos. But it sounds like we are ready to cut over, though. Yeah, let's uh, get into the action here. Looking forward to seeing in uh, in action. So we have uh, Jimmy on the bottom, Mitch on the top. We're not 100% sure what Mitch is playing, but it should be pretty obvious in just a moment. Yep. We're on the the big die here. So as I'm pulling up Mitch's deck list as we're rolling, those are massive dice. <laughs> they're, they're they're large dice for sure. So it looks like we do have Mitch on Spirit of Fire Lorraine. Um, looks oh, like this Fire Lorraine, interesting. So actually looking a little more, this looks like it is an erupting list. So yes, it is an erupting Ah, uh, gotcha. List. Okay. So it does have the Lorraine level one if you want to use the fiery momentums and such. But it, Ooh, um, maximum Einth Flex. Yep, Jimmy using the Einth that's been sort of used. Oh, let's see, show that it does have Spirit of Fire and then swapped it over for the, right, for, yes. the, for the Flex value. Yeah, he's like, well, I have the Spirit, but I also have the better Spirit. Yeah, so we're going to go ahead and use that. Um, looks like in the opening hand, we do have a couple of domain cards, and we're just going to use the usual Creative Shock opener to draw two. And uh, I'm trying to see what else is in the hand here. Uh, it looks like a Resolute Stand. Assemble the Ancients. A uh, two Assemble the Ancients. Yeah, those are some of the new Neos cards, right? Yeah, those are the new Neos cards. Those are the ones that um, let you summon a couple, I'm pretty sure a couple of allies, and then instead it, you will then change them to the swords if you're using the other Tenaris card. Um, yeah, we see one of those Resolute Stands getting discarded. Yep, and we do have the other domain on the field. So this domain is one that I've sort of liked personally. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this is the one that if you level, you can glimpse to unlevel. Okay. Yeah, so it's a card to really tell, filter your hand a little bit, filter what you're going to be drawing, and then be able to sort of set up that perfect combo turn. Yeah, I think this domain deck is really interesting because I remember a lot of people thinking like, oh, our domain's going to be a thing. Can you actually make a, a viable deck out of them? And here's Jimmy at 4-1 and one at uh, NA Nationals or NA... Uh, Nationals, and uh, yeah, it turns out, yes. Yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah, you can make a, a pretty good list with it. So it looks like Erupting Player did end up opening into a couple of Hasty Messengers, Increasing Dangers, a Creative Shock. Yeah, I see a lot of just kind of like card draw, card yeah. filter in hand. Which is what Erupting usually wants to do at the early point of the game. Erupting is pretty much trying to fill up their graveyard as much as possible with fire cards as well as just drawing, getting as much value as possible out of them. So it yeah. can get, turn into big Erupting turns um, when it needs to our fiery momentum. I do see a Clumsy Apprentice in there, one of my favorite cards. It's just all... It's, it's very aggressive, right? Yeah. It's just a 1-1 one, one for 2 and deals you 2 damage and draws you a card. Yep, and that's also the nice uh, Christmas promo art. Yeah. So it looks like we're going ahead and do the increasing danger here, give Jimmy a card and herself a card in our memory, as well as draw one for off of it, and we're going to increase the danger again. Yeah. It's good well. once, so be good again. Increasing the danger further. <laughs> danger levels rising. 
and we're going to go ahead and go uh, PC Mesher and discarding the shield mate, getting that floating memory into yeah, the grave. Good, without good value. To, yeah, without having to worry about it. Um, pretty much dying to an attack and then getting one damage and drawing a card. And looks like we're going to pass on back on over to Jimmy. Yeah, I mean, seems like a great first turn for erupting, right? Filling up your bin a little bit, uh, drawing a bunch of cards and uh, setting it up for future turns. Yep, so Jimmy's going to go ahead and go up to level one Tenaris here just to set up the taunt on attack. But just trying to, at this point, I imagine the game plan is just to hit level three Tony as quick as possible so you can try. This is pretty much a race of who can combo first. Ooh, banishing one of the, the black markets there. Oh, yep, the black mark goes in the banish. Um, going to be one of those, I, I like it. It's a card that lets you definitely filter cards as you're trying to ditch cards as much out of your memory as you're leveling. So getting able to refill that hand as quick as possible is usually ideal. Yeah, very, very nice. Um, so you said it's uh, basically a race here. For the, for the first level three, Tony, do you just opt to go for the ones that generates the uh, the obelisks? Yeah, so I if I remember correctly from watching this list before, it goes at the obelisk to get a little bit of some of the domain cards because you have a domain that generates swords, protects, as well as um, gives you uh, tokens as well. So it's a sort of a race where you're just trying to hit the level three Tony as quick as possible, get your domain for a sword, and then sort of de-level to go ahead and get another one. To, um, to go back to the other level three Tony to just get that big swing in as quick as possible. It looks like we have like two, what are these, like the trading posts? Yep, so that's actually, um, yeah. So we have the one Oasis trading post. That's the one that lets you pay to glimpse, pay to make a token, and then it does um, another ability as well. So pretty much it's, a th I think, a three, four, five on its costs. So oh, yeah. summon a one, one automaton yep. token. Yep, the yeah. five does untap, summon a one, one autom automaton drone token. The fourth is a tap and gather. So. Gather is also the herbs that you get off of Gather yeah, are also tokens. Yeah, they are tokens. That's that's true. So you can use this card to generate tokens off of the level 3 Teneris if you really needed to generate a token that way. But it is um, a little interesting mechanic to see come into, come into play. Yeah, it looks like Mitch is going to opt to level into Rai instead of Lorraine here. Yep. Uh, level 1, um, he's the messenger going to swing in, discard Tempest Hill, add more float to our grave, another fire card. We, it looks like we do have the combo, though, in Mitch's hand. We do have, I think, an Ember Song and an Erupting. So we do have the combo in hand for when we're ready to pretty much pull the trigger. Yeah, you know, he's just kind of slowly filling up his bin with fire cards. Here we have that Clumsy coming down, taking two damage, drawing a card. Um, really, really efficient card. Yeah, the cl Clumsy Apprentice is a really good card, especially that it replaces itself in your hand, gets the one damage in, start ticking your opponent up in damage. As much as you're playing Erupting, the two damage, you don't really worry too much about it, depending on the matchup. This yeah. might be one that might hurt you a little bit more because of the fact that it's going to try and get in for those big swings. Right. That yeah. It could accumulate over time. But for the most part, you're not too worried about taking damage. You're trying to combo off quicker than your opponent. And yeah. I think we're going to go ahead and we have two down here. Are we. Did I see two or three get put down? Three. Oh, yes. So, yep. We have the Creative Shock. This will actually do some damage because Rai is a, is a mage here. Yeah. Rai is a mage. It's if we discard a fire, we did hit the shield me off the top, so we could end up wanting to discard for the floating memory, which won't get us the damage bonus. So I wonder if that's what Mitch is sort of debating about at this uh, point. Yes. Does he want the floating or does he want the damage here? He's, going, he's going for the damage. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and do the damage. Uh, two to face. So to put our opponent up to five at this point. And we, like I said, we can still set up if we really want to the shield mate to worry about a swing or hasty messenger just still discard it if we if we really want the floating memory into our graveyard. Yeah, and every extra point of damage here is just going to be, you know, help, help him get to that end game where he can do his uh, erupting combo. Yep, so it looks like as we're debating, I think we're starting to do a little bit of card math because this, a lot of these games are a little bit of the math component of, all right, how much is in my hand? How much do I really need to do the combo this turn? How much do I need to do X, Y, Z? And a lot of these decks are really just trying to calculate how quickly can they hit that level. Yeah, he's going to play that uh, cremation ritual. And you know what? The apprentice has done her duty. Now <laughs> now she will draw some cards. Yep, more cards. She'll draw more cards. She'll be really extra value. She did one damage, got to draw three cards. She's, she's doing it all at this point. <laughs> trying to put yes. the deck on her back. But, so it looks like we went ahead and passed the turn, and we are debating on our materialization, I think, from Jimmy, I want to say. It... it yeah, it may, it may still be Mitch's turn. He might be contemplating. Gotcha. Okay. If he has one more play left. Yeah, because I know he does have, I think, another looks hasty like he's messenger passing. in hand. Yeah, it is yeah. passing. I know he had the other hasty messenger in hand he could play. But there is also always the threat of, depending on the matchup, where you could just get cleared out. And we are going to go ahead and go to level two. Tony, uh, Tony we're going to get rid of the Assemble the Ancients and then get rid of the Focus Flames. And because of the domain trigger goes on the stack that we are going to be able to glimpse to off the top of our deck and then set them up either way we want. Yeah, Tony here getting an extra little plus three. We'll have to wait and see if uh, Jimmy can make use of that extra attack damage this turn. 
It is another two A Tony. I'm a little, I'm a little sad. Yeah, I oh, yeah, yeah. would have seen a Tony it, Two B on screen. Yeah, Tony Two B, also known as shirtless Tony, <laughs> is the best Tony. Yeah, is is the best Tony hands down. Yes, but so we are going to. It looks like we're going to go ahead and use the Oasis's ability here. Possibly it is tapped. Yeah. Not exactly sure, or if it just happened to be like that for a reason, but it looks like we are going to, I said hit level two. Um, Tenaris isn't usually going to attack on this level two because it is already coming for its initial four, but it's mostly just trying to just, like, get the one big combo turn. There might be a situation, because I know Jimmy does run dungeon guides. You could also level up here with dungeon guide and then still get the extra attack bonus if you decide to, and if you have another combo piece to go with it. Yeah, I wonder if he has a dungeon guide in hand. Yeah. He still has a you know decent-sized hand, right? Still yeah. has six cards. I think I do see a dungeon guide. It's on his far left. Uh, I think I, I saw it briefly. Uh, yeah, I thought I might have saw one, uh, seen one too, but I wasn't 100% sure. Yeah, so we'll have to see what the play is on this part. Um, for the, I think, yeah, we're still debating. I think we're trying to do math here. Like I said, because you could go up to the dungeon guide, but then you're down yourself into only two other cards in hand, and you can't really combo off too much with it otherwise. So there's nothing, there's no combo piece that links into it. Yeah, or does he just want to, you know, Run something. He's, he's going to run out to the black market. Yep, black market's good, especially because if we don't have the influence for the card, we can use the draw ability as long as you're under that influence cost. You don't have to worry about its upkeep mechanic. Yeah, and just immediately slamming it down, drawing another card. Yep. It makes a lot of sense here. And it's just one more domain you have on the board, too. Yeah, one more domain gets you on the board. Um, these domains sort of stack up for the starter deck. Tony does all of its abilities that each generate domain does have abilities that cost less equal to the number of domains you control. Yes. So the more domains you have on the field, the better it is to pretty much set those up to get either free abilities. Yeah. And everyone loves free abilities, right? Yeah. I mean, cards for free are good. I can never argue it. So we are going to go ahead harp. and get the harp. So we do, it looks like we have a reading real quick of what the harp does. So the harp is a card that whenever you activate a harmony or melody card, put a music counter on it. And this is a card that, between your melodies with Erupting and Ember Song, you can put the counters on it as a replacement for the Crystal of Empowerment. Yeah, so you can more or less get uh, plus two levels from this. Yeah, so I wonder if getting the Harp now, or if we're pulling the trigger, or we're just setting up for an extra turn of sort of what's going to happen next. Because we, we do have the combo in hand. Yeah. Does he have enough? I guess the question here is, does he, does he have enough? Because yeah. uh, level two Tony is a large lad, right? Yeah, it is 25, and we definitely have a big dice on the harp, too, for the counter. I that, do like that, it. That all, yeah, there's also <laughs> a large dice. So, yeah, we do have... Oh, we have double erupting in hand. Ooh, okay. Well, here we have a, one erupting. Yep, one erupting, and I think... Are we debating... I think we are cracking the harp to in response, it possibly. It looks like it. I see the harp being activated. Yep, two so counters. Two counters. It looks like we're doing the uh, damage off of also being level one right. So we have one level plus I think about seven or eight cards in our grave, and then also double the erupting. Second, double erupting for a game. Yeah, that's a long. That's a lot of damage. That's a lot. Hey, you push it. Sometimes you have that damage. Like I said, this is where I said before. It's it's a race. So you have the D Tony deck that's going to go ahead and try and get that level three, so it can go ahead and get the big swing, and then erupting is just going to try and just generate cards as quick as possible to combo. I think that was almost turn three or turn four. That was that was quite fast. Yeah, Tony. Yeah. Tony was like. You know, turn, turn off to or turn or two off. Yep. So this is uh, Lisa. This is always going to be sort of the rough spot. So if we go ahead and look into the sideboard for Jimmy. So Jimmy's sideboard here, we have a safeguard in it, which I imagine is going to come in. Oh, for sure. Yeah, we have a focus flame. I don't think it's coming in. We have a spurn the ash, and then we have Rook, which might come in, probably not. And then we have blinding orb, archon broadsword, and provoke. So provoke obstinance is a card that, if I'm not mistaken, is the neo spell shield equivalent. I think so. Yeah. So it is a card that can. Negate some damage from the erupting. Granted, you are level three. Yeah, you, you have to get there first, and yeah. in, in the first round or in the first uh, game. Yeah. Unfortunately, he was not able to get there. Yeah, you gotta get there first. But it might be a card that comes in. Um, I think we're probably gonna see the secret aim come in. I think we already have. Yeah, we do have the nullifying lantern already in the main, so we have to worry about grabbing those. Um, and then if we go on over into Mitch's sideboard here. Yeah, I, I definitely think the safeguard is a. Uh, a safe bet. <laughs> we <laughs> yes. might see an earlier, like a, even an earlier uh, lantern come on down. Yeah. Um, try yeah. to, you know, protect himself a little bit more. Definitely. And then in Mitra's sideboard, we do have a fire resonance bobble, which is going to imagine oh, come of course. in for this yeah. case, because it is your face in fire. We have the astrolobe. So for those who don't know, the Alation astrolobe is used because you do have a new card called Dustlight Communion. And Dustlight Communion goes, if you play this card and you banish a card from your tail deck, if it is Astra, you may destroy a fra uh, Fantasia. Okay. So this is the tech people have been bringing in for, say, where water players end up wanting to fracturize their lantern, so the lantern ability is forever on the field. 
you would bring this card into your material deck, then you would go ahead and just like commune in it to get rid of the fractal so you can then combo off for your turn. Gotcha. Um, I think that's probably going to stay in the side. We do have one resolute stand and uh, two Rook and Alkalites. I'm not too sure what's going to come into this. Uh, there might be a resolute yeah, stand. Yeah, companion. I can see resolute. You know, once Tony's got the ball rolling. Yeah. There might be an argument where an Acolytes could come into play because depending if um, what's being used for attacks, if you are able to resolute stand for that turn and still live, you can then Rook and Acolyte away the bigger weapon if you need to. Yeah. And she's, she's also like a 3-1 as well. Yeah, three one, which is your level three. Um, very rarely, I think we're hitting that unless, well, with the harp, I say it comes into play more, especially because the harp will then activate. So it's an extra three damage that you might be able to get around something like a safeguard aimlet comes in. The get you might be off a little bit of damage. That three attack could come into play to just get around and push that final bit that you need. Yeah, we we did see the repting combo come off like yeah. pretty early. Yeah, pretty early. Harper's already in the field. No more repting. So it looks like our players are going ahead and finishing the shuffling. Going to present those for cuts. But no. Very, very quick game. Yes, yeah. I mean, like, that that's kind of what happens when yeah. erupting pops off. Sometimes it just pops off, and it can, you know, win before you you get to level two, and uh, sometimes you don't draw the eruptings, and you have to kind of dig, and it takes a little bit more time. Yeah. So it looks like, we're, like I said, we're getting their final shuffle in. I'm not sure who's going to be going first in this matchup. I imagine Jimmy might want to be on the going first, because usually in this, yeah, you want to go ahead and get that card adventure done early. You want to level up earlier before erupting can go ahead and combo off, combo off on you. Yeah, 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 for sure. And it looks like uh, Jimmy's just going to be going first here. Yep, so Fle flexing that ninth again. I'm, I'm jealous. I, w I wish I could have won one at Houston. Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but, hey, it's one of those cards. So we're going to go ahead and open up with the usual Creative Shock and, uh, from Jimmy by debating what two cards to, uh, what card to keep, what card we want to get rid of. We're going to get rid yeah. of the Shield Mate. Yep, Floating Memory card. Yeah, floating Memory is always good. Get us a nice early level, and we're going to play we're gonna play the Domains again. All right, yeah. Same song and dance here, right yep. off the bat. Yep. I mean, hey, as long as you go level one your next turn, glimpse two, try and look for maybe that card that you look for to maybe make you survive erupting, you got to take it. So it looks in the opening hand from Mitch, we have double hasty, it looks like an innovate fury, spurn the ash, and I think a double cremation ritual, and still erupting ember song then. So we have the combo technically in hand, ready to go online if we need it. Yep, now you just need to kind of uh, assemble... Uh, assemble the troops, as it were. You know, fill up your <laughs> fill up your board with uh, fire cards and get to a point where you can just banish them all and close out the game. Yep, and we, we hit double erupting too. So Mitch has the combo in hand, ready to go. If he's able to populate the graveyard enough with enough fire cards, and then pretty much activate everything online. Yeah, this is a you know a great start, right? Yep. You uh, double cremation ritual and or discard a cremation ritual, then play the cremation ritual. Uh, that you drew. Yeah, the only thing I made it better for is a library witch or like a, something with floating memories yep. just so you get the extra card draw. But overall, this is probably one of the more sought after hands you're looking for out of Mitch's side. You drew a bunch of cards and then filled up your bin with a bunch of fire cards. Yep, and hit the combo exactly as you need it. So it looks yeah, like. Yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty good. I wish I, I wish I could draw like that. Yeah. So it looks like we're going to go ahead and go to level one Tony here. Just going to shield me, trying to get that life total up as much as possible, try and prevent that combo turn. Yeah, t Tony here is just like, all right, I need to... T basically, in this, this kind of matchup, Tony's the aggressor, right? He needs to be able to apply enough pressure before the erupting can combo off. He doesn't know that Mitch has the combo in hand, yeah. so he needs to just assume that he does and, like, play as such. Yep. It looks like we finished the glimpse trigger. Go ahead and draw, and then we're going to go ahead and set up our turn. I think we do have another creative shot coming in. Drawing cards is good. Yeah, I mean, Creative Shock, if you're playing Fire, you're basically playing Creative Shock. And another Shieldmate. We're going, we're going right. We're going perfect. We're getting everything. Ooh, we have a Black Market. Black Market, I do believe, is active, right? So he's going to... Yeah, he does have six in his influence, so he is going to draw, but I think we are going to run into the upkeep trigger next turn. Um, yes. That will have to be discarded, sadly. But heck, I mean, it does give you another, another card in hand. Or I should say your memory, because it does draw into memory. Yeah. All right, so we have uh, Fire Bubble coming down, just cracking it in. As uh, your, your your second GCR or your first, depending on uh, what you're rocking in your deck. Yeah, definitely. Your, definitely, the bobbles are good. Bobbles is probably one of my, one of my more favorite non-champion material deck cards. I've started including like the the full rainbow bobble yeah. in, in a lot of my decks. I mean, it hurts a little bit because you're really holding three cards out of your like every time, just so you can include the bobbles or or sideboard cards. Yeah, or yeah. sideboard cards, just because you really want the bobbles to be ready at any point. Drawing two extra cards in a game are really beneficial. They are, yes, very, very good. 
best. So I do see the double grip of Innovate Fury in hand. So Innovate Fury is really good when you're facing those ally beatdown decks. It sort of helps you clear the board, D-level, gain a little health. But yeah, that's, that's one that lets you D-level, gain, and then deal like seven damage split as you'd like. Yeah. Did we just see a third? Yeah, that, that is a third erupting. Well, <laughs> we, we we have the grip. We, ha we have everything ready to go. We're going to go ahead and get another hasty into the grave. We're going to discover one of those Innovate Furies, and we have the Shuma in there to level in the Rhine next turn. Yeah, and he basically just needs a critical mass of fire cards in the graveyard, as well as enough to be able to play all of the Eruptings and the uh, the Song in the same turn. I think we also have a Fireball in hand. A really, a, a Fireball as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mitch probably has probably one of the better openings that we could ask for at this point. I mean, you have Triple Erupting, you have the Fireball ready to go. You're, you're sitting in what feels like a pretty good spot. Yeah, this is, you know, this is the power of the uh, Erupting deck, right? Yeah. This is what it wants to do. Uh, you have a lot of cards that are, uh, you know, form redundancy cards that let you draw cards and let you discard cards. And the discarding might seem like a downside at the, at the start, but it's actually really, really good because you use those discards to fuel your Erupting. Uh, it's just kind of like a very synergistic deck. Yeah, and this is always the hard part if you're the opponent facing this Erupting deck. You always have to look at the board and evaluate, like, all right, do they have, is there a chance they can combo off me? Do I get the Northern Lines and do I level? And it's always that fine balance of which way you want to do. And there's never really too much of a right or wrong play because either one works. You're getting more health. It's like we're almost trying to make your opponent have to do more in response. But yeah. at the same time, the no family sometimes might be able to save you if they don't have a spurn the ash to get rid of it. Yeah, that that that's true. I mean, Mitch has been drawing cards left and right. So you have to you have to think, you know, like does he have it or does he even have the like you mentioned, the, the removal. Yep, but we decided to go level two scenarios here. It looks like we're debating what we want to do. I think we're doing a little bit of math how many fire cards are in your opponent's grave and just trying to figure out what exactly could happen on the next turn. Do we have to say dungeon guide here to go up to level three to get that 30 health to make that damage a little bit harder to get the combo lethal? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that is a, a viable alternative, right? Just level up so much yeah. that you have enough health to survive. Yeah, 30 damage is a lot. <laughs> It is, it is. It takes a lot of a lot of cards to deal 30 damage. So it looks like we are putting a couple cards down. Looks like three, so potentially Dungeon okay. Guide. Yeah, I think I did see a Dungeon Guide. Yep, there is, I think, that second card in the middle there is yeah. a Dungeon Guide. So we can't Dungeon Guide here, but... It's like, still a bit in the tank about it. Yeah, and I think, so we are declaring a little bit that the three damage is live on Tony, because once you go up to level three, technically because you did Dungeon Guide, the on enter ability of Tenor's level two is technically still active. Yep, so his attack, is, his next attack will get plus three. Yep. Which may or may not be relevant here, especially if he's going to do a big old, big old swing. Yeah, and I've seen this deck pop up. I've seen this deck do a bunch of combo damage in a single turn that you just didn't expect, and it comes out in the left field. And I think that's sort of what we're doing now. We're trying to do the ma uh, hand math, because this is something I do myself. I'm horrible. I would put cards. I'm like, yeah, I have enough cards to do it. And then I'll put the cards. I'm like, oh, right. I can't count for the card I'm casting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been there for sure. So I, I got I to gotta literally put down the, my cards in my memory. I'm like, okay, I'm casting this with this, and do, do math that way. It's the only way I can really visualize it. I think that's one of the challenges if you're a Grand Archive player, especially if you're like a new Grand Archive player, you know, doing the hand math, right? Yep. So this is one of the newer cards. This is one of the new Ultra Rares. I'm going to say the Eternal Kingdom. So the way this card works is that all your domains are now, can be used for memory. So you can tap your Black Desire Market. You can tap yeah. your Thrones. You can tap all these cards to then pay for pretty much the hand costs. Yeah, so it basically just makes them all reservable, right? But then you do have to at least pay for the Eternal Kingdom during your upkeep. Yep, so you do have to pay the upkeep for two, but the upside is that you could pay technically with Eternal Kingdom itself in another domain. Yeah, that's true. So if you have at least three domains, then you're uh, you're up at yeah. least one. Up every time, keeping a card in hand as much as you need it, and looks like we're going to go ahead and get with a hasty match here, discarding the Spurn to Ash. Yeah, you mean just going to keep filling up filling up the bin, discarding yeah. another Spurn to Ash. Another Spurn to Ash. I mean, I, I think we just drew into a third. <laughs> yeah, well, he's got like six fire cards in his bin right now. Yep, it looks like six or fire cards seven, in his bin. Six or seven? Yes, no, let's see. Yeah, definitely six fire cards in the bin right now. And we're, I think we're just, as I said, back to doing math. I don't think we're going to fully pull the trigger this turn yet, only because we didn't grab that harp. Yeah, <laughs> if we grabbed the harp, um, it would have probably been the more signaling fact that we're going to try and combo. But we might right. be also doing math right now because we have triple erupting in hand. I mean, you, you might not even need yeah, it, right? You might not even need it. You might just be trying to do math right now. If you could just pull lethal. I mean, yeah. I so how many how many cards do you need in hand to play all of it, right? So you need to play the Ember Song. Yep, Ember Song three. And then you need uh, at least two Erupting? Yep, so that's going to be another three cards each for the site. So two for the cast, one for Erupting. So you need a total of nine just for the double Erupting Ember Song turn. Um, if you were trying to use all three, you need 12. But we don't... I Look at the hand. I don't think we have 12 cards in hand. I don't think so. Okay. If six, nine... I think he's got nine cards in hand. Yeah, so he does have enough to do the, the double Erupting combo if we want to. Um, and then it's just doing math. Because right now you can deal seven. Or sorry. You would be able to do eight. Because not counting the Ember Song that's going to go into the grave. Right. 
So you have eight um, damage in hand with the level one Ronnie. Then you can do it again for another 16. Um, your opponent is still alive, though, because they are at 25 life, and you only have them at five. Yep. So you can only put them up to... Let's see. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll be at 21. I think that's exactly what he's, like, uh, calculating right now. Yeah, and this is sort of the, the downside, not downside, but one of the challenges of the Erupting deck, because there's a lot of nuances with the deck where you have to start calculating your hand math, calculate the damage math, and it's all about trying to calculate that right moment to pull the trigger, because one mishap can really set back your entire game. Um, if you mess up your entire erupting math, you combo out and you don't have lethal, you're down your one or two eruptings. You're down sort of some key cards in what you're trying to establish as a whole. I, I always imagine, when I see a card player tank like this and, you know, calculate the numbers in their head, I always imagine, like, the meme with all the numbers floating oh, around yeah, their head. That's definitely. exactly what it is. <laughs> definitely. Uh, that's how it feels like, too. You're sitting there trying to yeah. figure out every little line. I mean, honestly, it feels like you're doing calculus at the point. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... <laughs> You know, they, they, they said that math in school would come in handy someday, and it turns out it does. Yep, my card games, my hobbies. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Couldn't escape it. Yeah, <laughs> you, little would you know that uh, the math will actually be fun. Yeah, so it looks like we are going to create a shock, discarding Tempest Seal, throwing two more fire cards into our bin here. I'm more likely to probably set up for the combo next turn, and that's yeah. going to be the question is, and Jamie Stern, are we going to go up to level three, or are we going to get the Nolan Fine Lantern? We did yeah. see your opponent discard, though, to spurn the ashes. Yes, so um, you got to think, if they're discarding Spurn Ashes, they probably have a third. So yeah, six cards in Graveyard, going up to eight. That's nine with Ember Song, so that's a lot. Yeah, so we'll be at 10 total damage with it. So let's see what Jimmy ends up materializing here. Like I said, the North Atlanta was already in the main board as a whole, and we are going to get Wayfarer's map. Okay, interesting choice. The Wayfarer's map is um, a very interesting card for the most part. Um, it does cost uh, zero. It comes in to let you also draw a card if I'm not mistaken here, with that um, also synergizes with domains, which is the whole point of the card. It really fits into Tenaris's whole plan with uh, domain synergy. So it looks like uh, Jimmy is just going to be like, hey, you know, I'm just going to forward my strategy and, uh, you know, try to get there my, on my own way. Yeah, I mean, you just try and get there. We have another Sanctum of Truth coming down, adding more, um, sort of more domains to pay the cost as we now go ahead and see the um, the Palace as well. This is one of the very unique cards, I want to say. I do enjoy um, sorry, the um, Concourse here. is because That's the one I was talking about before. At the beginning of Recollection of Age, you get to also glimpse one as well. Oh, yes. So it's another card. It's not even unique. So every turn, you get to end up glimpsing one off the top of your deck, which can really help set up the whatever the perfect way you're going to go about it. And we do see a Dungeon Guide come down. Yep, and go, go to level 3. Tony, as you mentioned, he did crack that, uh, that map to draw card. Yep. And then we discarded the Fast Gear and the Flame Sweep off it. Faskier did a job, which a little hurts at times, because Faskier is a card that really might save your life a little bit because of the fact you get to free cover four. And it is it looks like a Cronation Will. So this is the one I talked about before, that if you will summon one or more tokens, you may summon that many Greatsword tokens instead. And then all the weapons have, if you sacrifice it, target weapon gets X attack at the end of turn, where X is the object's power. Ah, yes. So sort of the way it works is that you want to combo, yep, in here, Ooh, we are so seeing it. Yep, some of the ancients come down, knowing that Tony, Tony's going to get in for a huge swing here, going ahead and just go straight into game three. Yeah, I mean, like, why do you need to get a nullifying lantern if you can just kill your opponent? Yeah, if you have the math in your hand, you can go ahead and just combo off. And that's what I mean. This is what the deck can just randomly just explode in power. This is... Yeah, yeah. so essentially what he did is he played Assemble the Ancients, and he's just going to sacrifice all of his domains, get a whole bunch of three-power token or three-power swords, and then crack all the swords and punch them for, like, a ton of damage. So the interesting part is that with Assemble the Ancients and the way that it works with these drone tokens and that they come in and get a buff counter... The way with Aegis, I mean, the um, Tony works is that the fact that the swords will also get buff counters. Yeah, they do. So the swords will also get even bigger. So the deck will be four two swords. It buff swords. Yeah, buff swords, stack all the swords to the one big sword, swing in for 36 damage in one swing. Does the job pretty well. Yeah, he, he had a, a, a large amount of domains right there. Yep, so we are going to go into game number three. I don't imagine too much being changed sideboard-wise from either player. I imagine if I brought on the cards, I want to pretty much play into this matchup. Um... And that's what I mean, though. The, the Tony deck looked like it was all behind in the back foot. We knew that Mitch had a whole bunch of combo, had to get win this turn. And all of a sudden, it went from level two to level three, just combo. Yeah, I mean, like, that was down to the razor's edge, right? It really did feel like Mitch was going to win on the next turn. Yep. And it turns out, you know, Jimmy was like, no, nah, I, got, I got the win. Yeah, I got the win. And I think that's sort of why we were in the thing to a little bit on that turn previously, trying to debate if we go level two into level three. It's like, can we get there? And I think we were only, like, a card or two short to get the full combo off. Yeah, and you know, like, Jimmy's uh, experienced enough to know, like, you know, I'm going to set up for these couple turns, and maybe he has the kill, but if he doesn't, then I can pressure and get the kill before he can. Yeah. 
So we do have our players shuffling up here. Um, one of the good to try to determine who's going to be going first after the shuffle. Um, I imagine there might be either Mitch or Jimmy. Uh, maybe Mitch going first because it's one of those games where, like I said, you're you're racing. If you yeah. get to go first, you get to combo off. You get to go ahead and play, say, a library rich in the cremation ritual, draw three cards, and just try and set up as much as possible to get that turn. Because as you said, Mitch was a turn off. If Mitch went first, Mitch probably might have taken the game. Yeah, it, it was very, very close. Like, he did the math. It was like, you know, a couple points of damage off. Yeah. Um, or rather, maybe a couple cards in hand off to be, to be able to do the full thing. Yep, so it looks like we have a little, a little good camaraderie going on between the players here, a little chuckling about probably about their combo lines and... Other things, because you know, it always, you always got to tell you, when, oh man, I, I had it next turn. If you just gave me one more turn, I had it. Oh man, like that, that always feels like how it is, though, right? <laughs> if you're playing, at least for me, I'm like, oh, I had it, you yeah. know? Yeah, but, sure. It's like, yeah, I had the combo. See, I had it. Oh man. Just, I would always feel zone training card games. You always hit that turn. It's like, oh, if I just had one more turn, I was there. I was, I was yeah. gold. Yeah, yeah. That, and honestly, that makes it a lot of fun to me, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, oh, maybe, maybe the next game I'll be, I'll be the person that's one turn ahead, and I'll, I'll have it before you have it, and it's, uh, you know, that that kind of back and forth that makes it really enjoyable. Yep. So as we thought, Mitch is going ahead and take that first turn. We're going to draw our seven. See what good cards we get in our opening hand. See if we can set up a little bit more. Yeah. I did see creative shock is a good way to start. Yeah, creative shock, uh, erupting ember song with combos again in hand. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So once again, he just needs to kind of go through the motions, fill up the bin. So we did pass the turn here. Usually this is um, a little bit of an indentation because the way that the creator shock, you might as well just use it at the end of your, end yeah. of your opponent's turn. Put the cards fast down. Speed. Fast speed, discard the shield mate into the, into the grave or get the floating memory if you need it. Um, as well as maybe see what else is in hand. I think, though, we do have, I think, a Fireball, Ember Song, and um, Erupting in hand. We're, we're off to the races again. We're, we're ready to go. Yeah. He's got, he's got the damage in hand. Now he just needs to, to make it happen, right? Yep, so it looks like we did end up having the opening here from Jimmy. We're going to go ahead and play the Trading Post um, card. Like I said, even if you don't use some of the other abilities on it, it's still good for when you get the Internal Kingdom down that you could use it for um, re reservable cards. Yeah, or you can turn your uh, Gather into a 3-1 sword. Yeah, I mean, hey, we take anything we can at this point. Yeah. So we're going to head draw three. So we did end up seeing the Temper Seal, which I think is going to be the yeah the main yeah, discard nice target. Discard. So we can have that in there as a fire card if we need it later on. I don't imagine we're going to level up just yet. We don't need to go to level one. And we might just get a card draw for the most part. Yep. Yep. Right. As you said it, here comes the the GCR down immediately, cracking it for a card. Yep. And we are going to do this at the pre recollection step because there is a chance if he does hit another creative shock that he can recall, um, play creative shock before recollection to get more value out of it and discard another card and then get recoup the entire hand back as normal. Yeah. Once again, creative shock at fast speed being very, 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 very strong. Yep. So it looks like we're going to head and set up. Uh, we have four down. Uh, Cemetery Century. I yep. imagine it's going to come on down here. Yep, we're yeah. going to see Cemetery Sentry, discard the fire card, so we can go ahead and draw a card off the top of their deck, the Innovate Fury. As you know, the opponent's not really uh, going too ally-heavy at this point. Yeah, I mean, once they play their allies, it's more of a combo, right? Yeah. So uh, at this point, you're just sort of, I don't need the Innovate Furies. I'm dying in one swing anyway. I might as well just dis uh, discard it for a Cemetery Sentry and get the card draw while I can. Yeah, and that extra two, little, you know, two damage here might be relevant. All adds up, little by little. I mean, uh, like I said last time, we were literally four damage off of getting lethal the turn before, so the extra two damage could always come into play at any point. And it's just, just going to be kind of annoying for Jimmy, honestly. This 2-2 two -two is just going to be sitting here, like, poking him for two damage every single turn. Yep, and this okay. also at the end of turn, we do have the trading post using for the Glimpse 2 ability, just so we can filter off the top of our deck, filter our draws a little bit better, um, seeing what we can get. I imagine if we don't have a dungeon guide in hand, we might be soft digging for that dungeon guide just so we can go to level three um, when we need to. And yep, looks like we're going to ahead and present our memory, and we're going to pay one and end up getting rid of a Focus Flame, which is sort of a dead card in this matchup. Not fully. We do have Cemetery Sentries. We do have yeah. AC Meshers that could come into play, but the fact that, on average, you're not usually casting that Focus of Flame. So it's a pretty good hit, I would want to say, on, the, on his side. Yeah, definitely not one of the key cards that yeah. he wants to keep. So we're going to pay four, and there's that Eternal Kingdom coming down, and paying another two. To cool. play, to play another one. Yep, to play the market and get a, get draw a card in the memory and pass the turn. We're we're filtering our cards, we're setting up everything as much as we can just to try and set up that wombo combo again. Yeah, and once again, having at least three domains is really really good. It means you can use two of the domains to pay for the Eternal Kingdom and still have uh, one left over to to pay for any other costs. Yep, and upside you don't have to use your black market. The black market could just be used for its regular ability still because of the fact that the Eternal Kingdom and the Trading Post can pay for itself for the upkeep yeah. of Eternal Kingdom. Yeah, it's true. So we're still doing Gold Star Market online if you need to, and if we end up leveling as well, Gold Star Market upkeep costs won't come into play. Yeah, a small thing to note, both Glomspire and the Eternal Kingdom are unique domains, so you can only have one out uh, at the field at a time, so that does limit a little bit the number of uh, domain spam that he can have, but yep. I think these are some really 
good key ones to have on board. Yeah, it does look like Mitchie was doing math, probably trying to figure out if their opponent could go level two, level three combo next turn. Probably it might judge a little bit what they're going to materialize, what other responses they might have. Because this is a very unique deck for the most part. I haven't seen too much of this outside of Jimmy themselves running. So these are a lot of cards you're probably not playing against on average. Oh, I mean, I, I'll be honest. Like a lot of folks and myself included, don't really didn't really take too much of a note on a lot of the domains. They're like, yeah, these are domains. They're kind of like silly, janky things. It's like, haha. And then Jimmy's like, nah, dude, I'm gonna kill you with them. That's it. You're not you're not a domain lover. You're not a lover of the domain synergy. I, I am a fan, actually, after seeing Jimmy play. It's, it's yeah. a pretty sweet deck. Yeah. It's, it's one of those decks where it, it, I feel like it kind of came out of nowhere for a lot of folks who didn't know, and uh, you're like, this, this is pretty spicy. Yeah, it's a spicy list. I mean, as you can see, it's 4-1. I think at the last event, Jimmy did well as well there, Yeah, for pretty pretty much up until near the end. So this is a list that can definitely win games because, like I said, there's not too many answers to it. You can't resolute stand the big attack because resolute stand, three damage isn't a lot when you're swinging in for 36. Yeah, basically... Just hope uh, your opponent isn't playing water and they don't yeah. uh, don't frost you. Yeah, no song of frost, nothing, no, not fracturizing or anything, anything like that. So looks like we are debating what we want to do on the side here of Mitch. Um, I think Mitch is uh, trying to do their math a little bit of how many fire cards can they put in their grave if they can come off this turn, or if they're even dead to Jimmy on the following turn. Yeah, y you know that uh, Mitch has got to be thinking after you know the last round getting smashed so big. He's like, okay. Now I gotta really, really respect this. Yeah, I gotta respect everything my opponent's doing. I really gotta count these domains more for reservables I didn't really count for before. So there's a lot of different things coming to play, and we are looks like we're gonna go ahead and level here. The Tempered Seal was put into the Banish Zone from the Grave. I think we're debating whether or not we're gonna go Rai or Lorraine, but we are end up gonna go Rai. Yeah, it looks like he's going for Rai. So Rai's pretty good. Um, Rai's gonna get us our two and light encounters. We have, like I said, the Innovate Fury in hand for really need to do level, but in this case we're not gonna do level. And I think we just top deck increasing danger as well. Yep. Increasing danger in hand. Let's see what else he's got cooking. To double fireball. Double fireball erupting an ember song. Yeah, he's got a lot of damage. He yeah. just needs to get to the point where he can actually use it. Yeah, needs the cards discarded in the grave. And this is where it becomes a weird situation too, where you can play the increasing danger, but how much how many more cards you want to give Jimmy? As you realize, giving Jimmy cards just really scary. Yeah, yeah. Really pretty much moves forward his game plan to let them combo off sooner. Cemetery Sentry coming on down. We'll apply a little bit of damage here. Eking yep. ever so slightly closer to that uh, critical threshold. Yep, I do see. I think we top decked the fire momentum at this point, so the fire momentum is in hand. Um, not too. It is relevant, but it's only going going to go ahead and push three extra if we were Lorraine. But in this case, we're Rai, so we're not too worried about the fire momentum. But might also might use it depending at the end of the turn just to put another fire card into the graveyard. Yeah, but we are just going to go ahead and pass the turn on over, and we're going to go ahead Ooh, and get nullifying. that nullifying lantern. Yeah, the nice SP and the nice uh. Merch Day pr art promo. Oh, yeah, I really love the art in that one. I love uh, it, too. This but feels, feels like my favorite. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, this feels like a little bit more of a, um, the, the safer play, right? Yeah. As uh, we saw in the last um, in the last game, opting not to go for the Nullifying Lantern, but the fact that he is this game might be a tell to Mitch that he doesn't have everything he needs to kind of just uh, wombo combo off. He's yeah. like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna be needing this for a couple <laughs> couple extra turns. Yeah, it's definitely one of the safer plays too. Um, no fan lantern is just a good card. At this point, if your opponent doesn't have to spurn the ash, it just sort of sits on board. It shuts shut down most of the things your opponent's trying to do with erupting. So yeah, playing the safe plays never hurts. I mean, we could also have double dungeon guide for all we know in this hand. We can't fully see it, so there's a chance that double dungeon guide could come into play and just power level ourselves. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult to see Jimmy's hand right now. I mean, Mitch does have eight cards in hand. We know what uh, most of them are, but Jimmy does not. Yeah. We know that uh, at least half the hand is like damaging spells between the uh, erupting, the song, and the fireballs. Yeah, I think it's probably, probably one of the most perfect times to play a Fire Lantern as well. I think so, yeah. I mean, probably without knowing your opponent's hand, it probably came in at probably the most opportune time more than Jimmy might, might even realize. Yeah, I think so. So we are going to go ahead and put three, I think three down here, debating between a couple of cards in hand. What we're gonna do, we're gonna go ahead. Oh, just another, so another Eternal Kingdom here. Um, we do have the issue that, about to say, Eternal Kingdom is a unique yeah, domain. Yeah, yeah, I mentioned this earlier. Both Eternal Kingdom and the Black Market are unique domains. You can only have one on the field at a, at a time. Yep, and because it was already casted, we do have to resolve it. So Eternal Kingdom does come in overriding the original Eternal Kingdom. Yeah, the, the small upside is now you can use the new Eternal Kingdom for reservable, but uh, definitely not ideal. Yeah, definitely not ideal. It would have been. It would have been the next step in the extra domain, a little bit of extra memory, so you can keep some other cards up, like your training post up, so you can glimpse the filter back of your deck a little bit more. Keep having to tap it or at your upkeep. It does hurt us a little bit. It does. 
So we are going to go ahead and look at our hand. We're going to untap our cemetery sentries. And now the question is, do we have a spur in the ash? I don't think I saw one yet from Mitch. I didn't see one yet, but we'll have to see what he draws into. Yeah, there might be a case that we might grab something like a fire bobble here to go ahead and start filtering. Um, it could be even something as simple as a terror frame, because if your opponent's going to try and combo off, if you do have a terror frame in there, you could play the terror frame and try and make yeah. them, if they're already tapped out fully, to just like, hey, you can't attack me this turn. Yeah, it's going to basically force them to have an extra two cards in hand. Yeah, which I would say, as we noticed a little bit before, in the last game that Jimmy did fully, I think, paid the hand fully down just to I think so. combo off. Yeah, I think it was, it was all he got. Yeah. So we are going to go into Think Tank a little bit, and this is where I keep on reiterating that the fact that this is this is what Erupting does. I much you think Erupting is a, a very synchronized or sequenced line of action. During that, the deck does require a lot of mental math of, okay, do I need to draw? Do I need to do harp? Can I get this? Can I get this? Do I have to think deal with Lantern? There's a lot of different scenarios running through your head in this type of deck. Yeah, you have to maintain, like, you know, number thresholds and a lot of different spaces, right? You have to maintain number of cards in hand, number of cards in your graveyard, and, uh, you know, calculate if the damage all adds up to lethal. Yeah. And I think, especially we have the 4 extra damage coming in with the Cemetery Sentry, you put your point up to 10. It's just more, do we have this point Ash in hand, too? So I think if this point, if we spurn the Ash, we, I think we still have a card short the combo, because we do have 4 in our memory and only 4 cards in hand, and we draw up to 9. So we will be 1 card short. So if we get the Fire Bobble here, it might see... We are going to see the harp oh, coming do down. See the, do see the harp coming down. Keep in mind, everyone, that level two Tony does have. Uh, well, wait, actually, wait. Tony's only level one now. Yeah, level one. He can yeah. even last turn too. So uh, taunt's already over. It's only twenty health on level one Tony. So I'm not too worried about that. But we're going to get our four damage in while we can. Yeah. So the the kill threshold is much much closer than I had anticipated. For some reason, I, in my head, I was like, oh, he's level two, right? He's got twenty five health. But no, no, no. He only has twenty health here. Yeah. This is a much more scary uh, proposition. So we do have the so we do actually have the shoemate in hand. I wonder if we're gonna see the shoemate come down to try and soak up that lethal swing turn possibility that could come down in the fact of Jimmy. Um I, but we also have a cremation ritual, so we can also still do that if we need to. And yeah. See Mitch doing what I do. We're putting cards down to do math here. Right. Yeah, he's we, like, How much how much I, do I have to yeah, play? Yeah. Do I have the right amount of cards here to do what I want to do? I need I need to not see the card in my hand to visualize this properly. Like with just well, actually, never mind. He only has three Three cards in his graveyard. I was gonna say with just fire, uh, just uh, erupting, is it enough? But it's not enough. No, sadly, only the three. Uh, for commissioner here, we can go ahead and put an extra two in there, and I'll show me just to try and stay alive an extra turn until we could draw the spring dash. Yeah. Actually, what we're doing, go ahead and discard one of the cemetery century sacrifice to a drop into another erupting and a clumsy. Yeah, clumsy, clumsy's not too bad. Yeah, clumsy's not bad. Clumsy can go ahead and set us up into drawing into even enough another card to replace itself. So if we really wanted to show me this turn, we can. So it looks yeah. like we are debating the proper line of action that we want to take here. Because that Nullifying Lantern is really just shut down the game plan for Mitch. Because without that Sprint Ash, those, those Eruptings don't do much. Yeah, so he, he basically has to draw into some answers here. And, the, you know, the, the, the Clumsy can help him get there. Yeah. And the Clumsy, yeah, Clumsy will help filter a couple extra cards, uh, an extra card off the top of the deck. And then we're, like I said, I think we're just trying to do all the math here, trying to debate if we need to do this line in order to live for another turn, and then just figure out the best line of action. Yeah, because like what rise only level one. Even if you, I'm trying to think of a a, a potential play where you, because because he's got double fireball, right? Yeah, he and does have double fireball. I wonder if also the mind going through the game plan going through his head. I wonder because these are the disrupting list, and it looks like I see here they are running the level three King Slayer Merlin. Okay. Yeah. So, so I wonder if the game plan might be going in the head like, do I have to go the route of going level three because I don't have to spurn the ash so I can get the longer fireball. But on the, on the other side, you do have the curse of that Jimmy is trying to do one big swing at once. So Jimmy doesn't care too much how much longer the game goes on. It's, if they could set up for their combo, they could set up for their combo, and it's all good for them. Yeah, I mean, this is like a battle of combo decks. Even though like the the combos are you know vastly different combos, they're still essentially combo decks, right? Yeah. One of them just burns you out. The other one hits you for you know thirty damage. Yep, and it looks like we are. The Putting two cards down, we're going to go ahead and shieldmate. So we're going to do it in the reverse order. We're going to head to shieldmate first and then clumsy apprentice afterwards. Take the two damage and draw an extra card. See if we draw into something that can help us. And it is a library witch. Okay. Library witch is not irrelevant here. Having intercept is pretty solid. Yep. Get in for the one extra damage. And at this point, too, because your opponent isn't playing too many allies, we could have set the point where we're just going to, we're going to win by just pure swinging. Yeah, here we have uh, just a fast cure. It, it is active, so it will recover for health. Yep, we are going to go ahead and then discard it for the floating memory, go up to level two uh, Tenaris. Let's say discarding one card. Let's see what we hit. Ooh. Ooh. I mean, not, ex not exactly one you want to hit. Yeah, not exactly the ideal hit. We might have another one in hand, though. 
Um, but we did have to pay everything. We do pay the upkeep cost. Training post and the Eternal Kingdom are being used to pay for Eternal Kingdom's upkeep cost. And just delete the Gloom Spire online so we can go ahead and use it to draw another card into our yep, memory. Yep, that makes sense. His influence is uh, pretty low. Yeah, pretty low. I think we're only at influence four or five, I want to say, if I counted it correctly earlier. It's, yeah, definitely something close to that. So now it's a sort of debate of how much is, am I dead? Is my opponent, am I, I'm looking at my opponent digging for answers at the point. Am I knowing if my lantern's safe, or is there a route where I have to level up here again? Because we're all at seven life, and we're just going to keep on taking the strip damage from these allies. Yeah, Mitch does have, what, four, seven, nine cards yep. in influence? Yeah, nine cards in influence. Oh, maybe might be able to bluff the Davis, burn the Ashen Hand, and maybe make Jimmy do a little bit of an alternate play. But even if they don't, like I said, three of the turns coming in, we are going to go ahead and go for the creative shock play. And it looks like we're debating what we want to go ahead and discard here. Like I said, we can't sadly see what's in Jimmy's hand yeah, too much. Yeah, he's just kind of, you know, also digging for answers, digging for, um, I mean, that's a good discard. Yeah. Showmate's going to do its job. It's going to go into the discard pile. We're going to go ahead and play another Sanctum. So the same thing comes down. Add an extra domain. We can now use the Eternal Kingdom, the Sanctum, to pay for the Kingdom's upkeep cost so we can keep trading posts up, which I think is the ideal situation because now we can at least start using a trading post to do the glimpse to, to start filtering for that card we're looking for and yeah. keep on digging. Yeah, and this, you know, the Sanctum is not nothing. If he levels, you know, chooses to level up into level three, he can get a little bit of card filtering from his hand, uh, maybe get rid of some useless cards and hopefully draw into some cards that'll help him win the game. Yeah, I do think we do have, I think, four or five cards into the memory zone here. Um, so there was two down for the Sanctum, three down for, so we have five. We have yeah. five cards in the memory down for the, um, for, for Jimmy. Ooh. And Terrafring is going to come down. So yeah. this is why I said, yeah, the Terrafring might come down because of the fact that knowing that he only has about six cards, it might he has to fully commit his hand in order just to hit level three and attempt a combo, but the Terrafring could really put a hold on things. Yeah, I mean, Mitch definitely respecting the uh, the Tern Tenor's power this time around, right? He's got his uh, shield made up. He's got his Terrafring up. And he's just kind of like trying to, to, to wall up rather than to just go all in on the, uh, on the combo. Yeah, they don't mind stalling this game a little bit more if they can. Go ahead and try and push the extra, put, up, put your opponent up to 10. I mean, this might be a slow grind fest. Sometimes this is how the game goes for erupting. If you can't hit the combo piece you need, these slow grinds with this ally beatdown is your new game plan. Yeah, I mean, Nullifying Lantern, putting in work here, right? Yeah, we do also have the Library Witch as well for an Interceptor, too. If we really wanted to play the uh, Library Witch down, just to, in case the Shoemate dies, we have a backup for it. So it looks like we're going to jam out. This is two down. Is this an increasing? It yep. is. Increasing yeah. danger is going to go ahead and get jammed down here. We're going to end up drawing a card to memory, draw a card to hand, just trying to filter some pie so much for the spur national. And we drew into another clumsy apprentice. All right, yeah. I mean, like, basically, he's just digging for removal, right? Yeah. Anything to get that uh, nullifying lantern off the board so we get his combo. We, we have the grip port. We have the ember song. We have double rafting. We have two fireballs in it. Like, we're ready to go as soon as we find that last combo piece. Yeah. He's got more than enough cards to pay for it. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and play the Clumsy Apprentice, draw one, and uh, draw into another fire. I think another fire momentum, if I'm not mistaken. I, I think so, actually. <laughs> so get the extra damage in for the Clumsy Apprentice where you can. I, like we said before, every little bit of chip damage here matters in the long run. And it looks like we are just going to go ahead and pass the turn, a couple cards in hand, and we are going to go possibly into level three, Tenaris over on yep. Jimmy's side. Yep, we see one banish already from Floating Memory. Yep. I have a feeling you are correct. Yeah, we're going to banish another two here. So, yep, one, two, two. Yep. We're going to go up to level three. Now, the question is, which oh. one? Ooh, the second assembled angel. That's kind of rough. That is really rough. Now, I guess the question is, what level three are we going? Oh, he, he windmill slammed that one. Yeah, I think that is the that is the booster box one. That is the I, creation's I, will. Yeah, I think that's the token one, right? Yeah. I think that is the token one, not the one that uh, generates tokens. Yep, that is creation's will. That's the token one. So, I guess now the question is, because we have the domains. We have four domains in play right now. Yep. Four domains in play. I think we paid for the cards for hand for Eternal Kingdom's upkeep cost. I might have missed that. Um, the question is, do we have enough in our hand to assemble the Ancients and pay? So actually, no, we did not pop the Terrifying, actually. Ah, interesting. Oh, no, oh, sorry, we're some recollect. That's why. Okay, so Terrifying is getting popped here. Okay. Yes, that sorry, makes sense. I thought he, it looked like he recollected. That's why I had to double check here. It's sometimes difficult to see with the sleeves being the same color, you know? Yeah, sometimes a little rough. But anyway, so Terrifying is popped. So now we do have a Focus Flame coming down onto... So Ooh. Shieldmate is going to get Focus Flame. Is this a kill turn? Does he have it? We have three. There's a symbol. Oh, he's got the third he's got one. Got two cards in hand, and yeah, Jimmy's going to go ahead, I think, and win the game. So I think he's going to make him show the combo on stream. Yeah, yeah. And he said, "We're the future match. You're showing me the combo." So here we have. We have four 
swords coming down. Yep. Like you mentioned, they, they will get buff counters on them, right? Yep, we'll get buff counters because of the way that Creation's Will works and the interaction works between the Summon Ancient's ability coming in and then seeing the Creation's Will mechanic of the replacement effect. And so this is, what, 12 damage between the swords? Yeah, I think so. So they going sadly swing with one of them. Or, um, I mean, 16 damage. Yes, math, swing math. them all, did the math, showed it all on stream. And yeah, that is lethal. Jimmy's going to move on to 5 and 1. Whew. This fire, fire Tony is showing pretty much everything it can do. It looks like, yeah, the judge then asks, oh, on, what's this card do again? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, this was a battle of the combo decks. Yeah, and now you see Mitch is trying to pull, like, oh, here's my spurns. Like, I just couldn't, I couldn't hit him. I couldn't hit the spurn, the ashes, the combo off myself. And it was just a race to who gets it. Yeah, wow. That, uh, that domain Tony deck is, uh, is the real deal, huh? I'm all for it. Like, Tony was probably one of my favorite cards spoiled out of ALC. And I was really debating about building a Tony deck. I couldn't find something that worked. But now, like, seeing Jimmy play this, I'm like, oh, man, this really makes Tony look fun. It's a really sweet deck. Yeah. And I like how you have the options between going for the uh, Obelisk Tony or just going straight for, like, the, the token combo kill Tony. Yeah. Um, yeah, it seems like a really, really cool deck. And a really, really cool take on, like, a combo deck, right? Yeah, no, it's definitely a list that I will probably steal for locals and other events as a whole. But yeah, so we are back in here. Like I said, that was round um, near the end of our future match for round number five. We do have, I think, ten minutes left in the round though um, um, for the round of all, and we're probably going to go ahead and take a ten-minute break here shortly ourselves as the round finishes and we get everything else configured. Yeah, so stay tuned. We'll be back for the final round of the day, yeah. as well as a little little sneak. Peek at some uh, oh, yeah. some some extra art for I the upcoming set. We had yeah, more spoilers. Let's go. Yeah, so stay tuned for that. We'll be back in uh, ten minutes or so.
Hey, everybody. Welcome back to our final round of Day One Swiss of the North American Grand Archive Nationals event. My name is Cam. I'm one of your casters. I am here with Rev. Hey. Hey. Glad to have you back in the booth for the final round. We are back. We are here to do the final round. We also are very excited. We have an MRC art spoiler that we're going to be doing after the round, so stick around for that if you guys are interested. I'm sure, because I know that I'm here, yeah. that it's going to be... An Ari card. That's surely, surely what they did. It's gonna, it's production be a male would never lie to me. They, they would never do that. It's gonna be male cleric. Don't worry. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, we have our last round of Swiss coming up. Um, we're gonna have an exciting one. I think we are going to have uh, fan favorite Cabin yep. from True Champion on um, playing his his one and in, which is very exciting. Um, sort of like a, 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 as close to a household name as you get in Grand Archive these yeah. days. I think you see. Uh, one of two players, right? That's top eighted every <laughs> ascent. I feel like every time I look at a yeah, I feel an like event, yeah, him and Isaac, I think both. Yeah, because technically he went to Auckland, so yeah, he did top eight Auckland, yeah. and then flew back in the states for Ontario and yeah. top eighted that event as well. Very impressive ascent winner, uh, two two top eights under his belt, and God knows how many regional wins. Yeah. So, so we're gonna be watching his match. That's gonna be awesome. Um, but yeah, we are we're very excited. We're we're down to. The wire now. Yeah. Lots of people are playing their winning ins to get into day two. We are cutting to top 32 for day two tomorrow. I believe it's going to be four rounds of Swiss and then the top uh, top eight cut. Yep. So very exciting. We're we're going to see who makes it. We're seeing a lot of these allies decks yeah. rise to the top. Um, a lot of erupting as well, yeah. sort of as we expected. Yeah. But I'm curious to see if any of our dark horse picks have have rose through the ranks. Yeah. I've unfortunately uh, talked to a couple of people that we've had on coverage today, and uh, their events did not go nearly uh, as, as well as planned. But yeah, I heard my fire eye, a fire eye didn't make it. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, that is true, but we're super uh, excited to have some more some more action coming to you just pretty soon. I think people are sitting down. We're, we're making sure that everybody's getting settled. Yeah, make sure no repairs happen or anything of the sort. But yeah, we're in the exciting time, yeah. uh, elimination time. Yeah. You know? So we are looking at a couple of lists, though. We do have Cabin's um, Wind Lorraine list, Wind Allies, I should say. Yeah. Looks like it's fairly standard. We are seeing some throwback cards, though, in this yeah, list. Yeah, yeah. This is looking like uh, what the what the kids on the internet call Ferrari Lorraine. Yeah. It's a very, very classic Wind Lorraine, Tactful Sergeants, Phalanx Captains, going into that uh, level three Spirit Ruler yep. for like Drawn Blade value with Spirit Blade Ascension. No longer yeah. flickering Sword of Avarice, but still <laughs> flickering uh, Prismatic Edge. So yeah. lots of lots of classics for people who have been around the game for Which a while. Which will be interesting. I don't think we. I think it's been a very long time since we've seen a Prismatic Edge like on stream yeah. or really like start doing its flicker mechanics right. as well as like to start getting because the great start about Prismatic Edge of Wind. It's banishing cards from your opponent's yeah. memory. Hey, your opponent can't play the game anymore. And it's a really, it's a really interesting choice because there's so many water decks, yeah. and that is ideally what you want your opponent to be yeah. because the water trigger is draw a card. So you get to steal a card from them, you draw a card every time you flicker it. It, it turns into that like pseudo sort of avarice where you're, you're getting two points of advantage every time you flicker it. And the upside, if I am hearing correctly about who the opponent is, we do have their opponent on Water Tony. So yeah, the, ups, the upside for our prismatic edge yeah, player. Upside sure, the prismatic yeah. edge player. We have the water Tony sitting on the other end. Um, it looks like the overall the usual list, like you respect from the water Tony. We have the dungeon guides in there. We have a couple of guildesses. We aren't running the level three version though. Interesting. So, yeah, so I know some of these water lists we're doing the water allies with Neo's top end. Mm -hmm. um, but nope, this one is not. It is running. All right, this is a card I got to ask you about. How do you feel about Storm of Thorns? Um, I think it's pretty good. The fact that that card has floating memory makes it. Uh, like a hard card to not include. It is yeah. class bonus floating memory, but I think the most important part about that is when you have these allies that have pretty big um, health totals, like these threes and fours, um, the fact that Storm of, uh, Storm, Storm of Thorns, there you go, you got that's it. a tough one, um, doesn't target. It, it prevents yeah. to all of your units. It's, yeah. it's pretty strong. Which is a really strong card. There's a lot of situations where it comes in, and it also deals one back to your opponent, which is pretty good. Yeah. So, I mean, that card, when I saw it, I was like, oh, this card's amazing. Yeah, I'm card. surprised we haven't seen as much of it as I sort of expected. Yeah. It was like sort of ubiquitous in a lot of the water decks. Yeah. Right when ALC came out, but it seems like some people have, have passed over on it. Same thing with, like, we have the diffusive blocks as well, which yeah. is another good two drop, prevent two damage to whatever you're targeting with it. So it looks like a very standard water um, Tonaris list that's coming out. But one card I actually we, I glossed over because we talked about it off air mm. originally when looking at Caven's list. We have four dungeon guides and four academy guides. Yeah, we're playing eight guides in this list. We're really trying to get to level three. Yeah, really <laughs> trying to get level three, really trying to get the prismatic edge aligned and just start pretty much locking out your opponents in the game as well as just going, okay, what can you do to you having no memory and top decking every single turn? 
and then as I just slowly beat you down with my own allies or my own sort of swords. Yeah, I mean, it's such a testament to like Ghost of Pendragon yeah. and even Spear Blade Ascension that are the Crux cards are so powerful that you can afford to play eight copies of cards that are usually card disadvantage for you to sort of progress this game plan to get to your Crux as soon as possible to start overtaking your opponent with, with that repeated card advantage. Yeah, I'm really curious. Uh, I think this will be the first time we have a uh, Academy Guide on stream today. Yeah. And uh, that card is so feast or famine. Um, yeah. If it sticks on the board, it feels like the most broken card they've ever printed. And if not, it you know it's a 1-3 it's a with no text. Yeah, I remember Academy Guide on Spoil. People would talk about probably one of the greatest cards printed mm -hmm. in the set. And it's a card that we've seen thrown into originally these Water Tony lists. Yeah. Uh, Water Tony, at least the control version, was running it to go into level 1 sooner and level mm -hmm. 3 a little bit quicker. So the fact that we're not seeing it as much, and this is the first time we're seeing it on stream, with Dungeon Guide, let alone, so we have the 8-guide system, is going to be something really interesting to see how often it comes into play, and when it sticks, how much of an impact has it changed, keeping that one extra card off your level and other mechanics and such. Yeah, I think it's a really interestingly balanced card where yeah. it, it never feels too good because yeah. it, it can be interactive with it, but if your opponent does not have the way to stop it, it just sort of runs away with the yeah. game. It feels really good on like your turn one, turn two when you want to level up, and a little bit a little bit less so later on as the game goes on. Yeah, but it's going to be hard for this yeah. Lorraine deck. It's, it's harder for her to protect it than it is Tony. Tony just goes to level one, he gets taunt. It's very easy to yes. stick that Academy Guide on the board. Even something like Sylvie has a an easier way of, of protecting this than Lorraine does, but she's going to have to hope for... I don't know, Zephyr's, Favorable Winds, something yeah. like that to, to keep it around? Something like that. Um, I, hopefully we'll see, like I said, hopefully we'll get to see this again come into, the, come into play, see how well it could stick on board and just sort of um, just sort of stabilize, see how it goes from here. But I didn't happen to notice, I sort of caught me in the corner of the eye. We're running three copies of Hurricane Sweep. Yeah, yeah, Hurricane Sweep. We are a Lorraine deck, yeah. right? It, gone are the times of us going to, to Merlin every game, so you are really going to get value off of that, that Hurricane Sweep. Yeah. And it sounds like we are ready to cut it over to the game, so we're going to go ahead and get us over there and turn in and see how these matches go. Excited to see who our opponent is for uh, for Caben here. It looks like playing against Brawl. Not sure what he's on. It looks like a water deck. They're going to be going first. Yep. So it looks like we're, yeah. So Brawl's going to end up going first here with the water list. Um, but we do have the nice, ironically, Crux sleeves. Yeah. <laughs> the nice Lorraine sleeves on the other end here. So it looks like in our opening hand, we end up having a Storm of Thorns that we talked about, a Dungeon Guide, I think a couple, uh, one Song of Frost, a Snow Fairy, a Heavy Swing, and a Fracture. Yeah, so it, it does look like it is that deck we were talking about, a, a very sort of standard Water Tony deck. They're just going to pass it over to Caben, probably play something on their turn, maybe something like a Storm of, Storm of Thorns, a Diffusive Block to, to get some, some floating memory going here. So I don't get to see too much. I think I do see, um, I can't really make out what too much. And I do see, I think, an inspiring call in the opening hand. Um, oh, that is the Ambassador promo night in Caben's hand. Yeah, I do know that the Caben does have his full set of Ambassador uh, hey. promos, so hey, he, he will be here flexing. When you're an Ambassador and you're at Nationals, this is, this is the time to bring the card this out. That's how you do it. We're going to start with a Swift Recruit coming in for one. Not going to leave it back to block. Not really scared of, of water pinging these cards down. Um, but it looks like that's all we really got going here. He, got, he has a couple of Crux cards and a Banner Knight that's really not going to serve him until later. I think he is holding a copy of that SP1 Reclaim. Yeah. So maybe he's thinking about reclaiming this uh, Swift Recruit, yeah. getting a little bit of value there. I think I also saw, I could be wrong, it could be with the Reclaim. I think I saw the Hurricane Sweep also in hand. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I can't. I think it's a little hard to tell. They, I they mean, look very similar. Yeah, Caben's also running the foil, so they'll look really nice. Right, of course. <laughs> Sometimes you catch a little bit of glare. That's... A little hard to tell. So an interesting turn one tariff ring from our Tony player here, and then they're going to follow that up with a Snow Fairy, going to lock down the Swift Recruit. Same thing, if we're looking to get some value here, you can just reclaim that Swift Recruit and play it again next turn. But um, a pretty efficient answer, and then they're going to follow that up with an Imperial Recruit. Yeah, a card, like we said, has really been put in work every time we've seen it on stream. It's a card that either has to be responded to with damage every turn, or is just going to get the usual 2-3. And where it looks like you're right, we're going to go ahead and reclaim that Snow Fairy in the hand, it no longer has to be, I mean, that's so very sorry. Swift Recruit is another effect by Snow Fairy and recollect it. And we're going to go ahead to go to level one Lorraine using that Reclaim Floating Memory. Yeah, it's all about these one-for-ones in these ally matchups. You always want every card that you play to trade for at least one of your opponent's cards. So the fact that they can get value out of this Reclaim, unlock their Swift Recruit, and then probably play it again this turn. We also see a Dream Fairy here, which could be deployed to deal with the Snow Fairy, maybe deal with that Imperial Recruit if, like you said, we're worried about that 2-3 being a little bit too much value. Um, or we can simply just deploy another Swift Recruit, 
<laughs> Leave her back on defense. So do you think, no, it did look like Brawl, if I'm not mistaken, it did pop the Terra Frame this turn. Yeah, so so not going to be a whole lot of attacking. Going to be a pretty safe board. They may be doing that to protect their Imperial Recruit. Yeah. Make sure they get some value. Very strange uh, turn one Terra Frame, though. Right. Um, Sometimes if you have the hand for it, and we are going to go ahead and, like I say, see the Gene Fairy down. Going to go ahead and banish that. Well, not banish, but put in the memory um, into the Imperial Recruit. I mean, it's a little bit of a banish because of the fact that that card can't be played anymore as long as that Dream Fairy's on the board. Yeah, I think it just goes to show that both uh, both players here, how much they respect the tempo of a matchup like this. You know, the, the early Terraforming, the, the Dream Fairy to stop that Imperial Recruit from getting extra power. It is all about tempo here. The first person that gets the stick aboard and run away with it is probably going to be able to take the game. So they're both very cognizant of that. Yep, we are going to have a GCR materialized over here on both sides. Um, pretty much setting up, just depending on what's in our hand here. I know we saw the Storm of Thorns. I know we saw, I think, a couple of Song of Frost. I'm not exactly sure what else is in our hand. We do have the Imperial Recruit, but sorry, we can't play it, so it's going to be more likely used for reserve cost. Yeah, that's the that's the boon and the bane of this sort of Water Tony deck, is they have so much interaction. And his hand is filled with interaction, but if he doesn't have a way to get onto the board and start pressuring Kaven, it's going to be really tough for him. He does have an Esteemed Knight here, mm -hmm. which is a good body, especially in this situation. Yep, three drop, two threes, always good. Um, depending, I don't think we do have any version of Lorraine, just how we won't get that intercept class bonus online. But like I said, a three drop, two threes, good. Um, I know some of these lists are also tweaking those a little bit, so they're running a split. Just in case I Dream Fairy comes on targeting one, they're not too stuck on running four copies on it. <laughs> yeah, I've even seen some people running like trained sharpshooter with yep. no way to get that <laughs> class bonus just as a way to split up their three mana two threes for Dream Fairy value. Three mana two threes is a good card. Yeah. <laughs> even if it's vanilla. Yep. So it looks like we like I said, played this scene night, and I think we ended up passing the turn back over. Yeah, um, got a little bit of damage in, put some pressure up, and then we're going to yeah. see how Kaben handles that. Kaben is playing a deck that we're not... Uh, not typical for these sort of ally strategies where he is actively going to be looking to level up. I don't know if he's going to do that here, but if he does have that hurricane sweep, which is what that looks like, yeah. he might have an avenue here to have a pretty hurricane, a pretty big hurricane sweep yeah, and that, draw a couple of cards. Yeah, drawing two cards off the hurricane sweep is really good. Um, hurricane sweep, if I'm not mistaken, is also the efficiency bonus as well. It is, yeah. So, yeah. so it's only going to cost him three, so he can cast it with his current hand if he decides to level up here. Yeah, so Hurricane Sweep could come in um, if we want to push that damage, and thankfully, because of the sweet mechanic, we can go ahead and hit the Snow Fairy and cl clear the board, even though it has stealth. Just going to opt for that foil first edition Grand Crusaders <laughs> ring. Hey, if we want to talk about flexing cards, I mean, we have a CUR on screen, foil, Dream Fairy, we're, we're just going all out. Gaben doesn't mess around. Nope. I mean, which is, uh, I almost want to say the signature look of PC <laughs> Gaben on stream. It's usually the fully foiled deck. Oh, yeah. So, And we did end up... I think, is that another Hurricane Sweep in hand? Um, yeah, it looks like a second sweep. Looks like we have a second Swift Recruit as well. So we can look to deploy a couple of Swift Recruits. A lot of Crux cards here yeah. filling up the hand. Double Crux Sight, Spirit Blade Ascension in hand. So a little bit awkward, but at least you can use them if, depending on your game plan, to just pay out costs at this point to just sort of filter out the cards that we need. Yeah, I think it's pretty reasonable here to just um, to deal with the threat, you know, play a, a couple of Swift Recruits, try to deal with this Esteem Knight. Assume that probably some of those Swift Recruits will die on the... Um, on the crackback, but Storm of Thorns going to show a lot of work here. Very difficult now that all of the attacks that Caben was looking to present this turn are one power, and the way that Storm of Thorns works, it is going to prevent all of that damage. Yep, as you can see, Dream Fairy went ahead took one damage off of the Storm of Thorns as well. So it's uh, Storm of Thorns has been a really good card depending on the matchup. This, yeah. thankfully, in this list, we're not running a squirrel. So squirrels don't have to worry too much about dying to a storm of sure, trigger. Yeah. But it, it is some interesting mechanics that happen with that card because of that. It really messes up game plans. And we're going to go ahead and see that Swift Recruit come on down again. Yeah, I think we'll see the second one as well. And they might just stay back on defense here. And uh, at worst, going to give some floating memory and allow uh, us to look for a Hurricane Sweep level 2 yep. um, as, as early as next turn. But something worth noting, like we said, this Water Tony deck has so much interaction that even if Kaben does go to level two, gets his floating memory, gets this sweep off for three, four damage, um, it's not out of the blue that Tony has enough interaction to deal with that. Yeah, we did see a Song of Frost on the list before. We are going to go yeah. ahead and level up here to level in Tony to give ourselves taunt so our allies are a little bit safe this turn, depending on if it's a hurricane, unless a hurricane sweep comes down. Right. But we did get rid of the Factualize, which is a card that... I'm not too familiar if Water Tony wants to see as much into this exact matchup. Yeah, not a, not a whole targets. lot of um, targets. Probably picking up like that sort of seeking if they yeah. really cared about it. Guess it'd be good into like the prismatic edge that we talked about before, sure. as well, responding to the trigger or yeah. something of sorts. But yeah, we are going to go ahead. We do have a grip though of double heavy swing, two song of frost, a dungeon guide, the imperial recruit that's sadly unplayable, 
and another snow fairy in hand. So we do have the song of frost in case there is a hurricane sweep that comes by and comes into the next turn. Do you uh, do you think there's an angle here to just start throwing heavy swings and and put some real pressure on? I I it's almost a consideration because of the fact that very rarely at least you get the one turn we get to get the nine damage in with the right. heavy swing if you go up to level two. Yeah. But then but that's also like your big combo turn. That's mm-hmm. the turn you're really trying to push as much in as possible to push lethal. So almost pushing this through would sort of be beneficial, but not at the cost if it's putting us under a snow, a, um, Song of Frost. Right, right. So it's sort of the calculations got to take into consideration here. And we are going to go ahead and I think have a Snow Fairy come down. Snow Fairy number two, going to lock down the same Swift Recruit. She's having a really tough day today. Yeah. But Swift, Swift Recruit's not allowed to be active. You know, We really don't like Interceptors in the board. And we are just going to go ahead and swing in for a couple extra damage while we can um, with the Snow Fairies. And we're going to pass the turn, leaving three, o- uh, three up so we can Song of Frost. Yeah, like you said, this, this Song of Frost is going to be really important here because this is looking like a pretty juicy hurricane sweep. Second reclaim. Yeah. So, and we do, I think we have, yeah, we have a Swift Recruit and a Reclaim in Grave. We do have two Floating Memory. So if we want to go level two, we can banish the two cards from our Floating Memory to level up to level two Lorraine if we want to. And I think that's what we're doing. Here. Yeah, it's looking really tempting. It's going to be a really big Hurricane Sweep. And this is the sort of do or die moment that if this Hurricane Sweep were to resolve, that probably wins you the game on the spot. But this Song of Frost is looming. Yeah. So let's see if there is, uh, let's see if we develop more into a little more sideways board into it. We're just going to go ahead and just rip the Hurricane Sweep, draw more, and then just to try and see what else we can cast off the two, or in this case now three extra cards. And we do see the Hurricane Sweep come on down, and in response, Rolls going to go ahead and Song of Frost it to like, pretty much end the combat phase. Yeah, so it looks like probably a follow-up here with um, a Banner Knight might be a good way to clear, but that leaves it a little bit vulnerable on the board. So Cayman's just going to opt to maybe redeploy the Swift Recruit and just hang out for a bit. Yeah, hang out for a bit while I can. We did end up swinging the, I think the Dream Fairy went one in the face. Yeah. So more than likely um, showing that we're not going to go ahead and play or play the Banner Knight at this point. We might play the Swift Recruit just to leave the Interceptor back up um, for the most part since we don't, we're not really clearing anything else off the board. He's holding on to a lot of these Crux cards still. He has not gotten rid of any of them, so he is really looking to go up to level 3 and take advantage of those powerful cards. So probably not this turn, but we'll see if that's the, the plan and that we'll starts gonna, setting up for. Yeah, we're just going to go ahead and pass the turn here, pass it, pass it back on over, leaving the three cards in, in our hand. Could sort of represent another Zephyr or a Reclaim if mm-hmm. we need to. Might be one of those situations where it might be better to fake the card in hand and bluff your way through it than actually having it, because it makes your opponent maybe change your game plan a little bit if you do or don't. Yeah, the other option is just to play a Swift Recruit, which doesn't seem super appealing. So keeping up some interaction, um, as it were, is is maybe a better idea. So it looks like we're going to go ahead and get a Bulwark Sword that is going to give us just a little bit more pressure. Probably not going to use that to uh, send damage face, but um, I guess this deck this is, is pretty shields down to just you know heavy swing you for nine. Yeah, so I guess this also brings back to your earlier conversation of the heavy swing. Is there the situation where we're heavy swinging our hand fully down? with Bullock Sword just to push as much him as possible because we have about four damage on board with allies. Heavy Swing plus Sword is going to be, I think, another... It's nine, nine. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's almost lethal, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that puts, puts that, that up to 20. Uh, no, sorry, I'm, we're level two now. We're level, we're level two, level. yeah, so we're, so we're safe. But, yeah, like like you said, I, I think we're a little bit safe now on, yeah. on the side of Water Tony. Now that level two Lorraine has already come out, even the Hurricane Sweep now, if he has another one, at worst does clear your board, but it's not giving him any card advantage. So it might be a pretty safe spot to just throw down the hand, send nine damage, Say, you know, if, if you don't answer the board that I have, I'm going to kill you next turn. Yeah, but it does look like we decided to swing the allies and pass a turn. We might be setting up for something like end of turn, going just to go for the big swing and go Bulwark Sword, level two Terneris, on top of heavy swing just to push 12. Yeah, it's a, it's a little hard to see Brawl's hand here, um, but we, we can only assume he's holding up a bunch of interaction as this Water Tony deck, right? Yeah, like I said, we knew we, I think we had two Song of Frost in hand. I think we haven't, we haven't banished one, so we still have two in hand sure. at least. So that's still um, available to us. If we, there was another Hurricane Sweep that would come into play. Yeah. But looks like we are debating what we're going to materialize here in the Caban side at this point. Um, probably looking through, we do have something like a Nullfire Lantern. We do have, I think, a Sword of Adversity. Is that what we're... Actually, that might be what we're generating right now. Yep. Yeah, it looks like we're having a Sword of Adversity, which is looking a little anemic right now, but a sword yeah. is a sword. Yeah, so it's a 1-1 one, one that comes in solid because of the fact that the Dream Fairy, we don't get that class bonus effect on the sword. But it's one of the things that could be set up later on in case your Dream Fairy is answered to, or could set up a, a turn that if it's stabilized enough, that could really be punishing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the Academy Guide and Dungeon Guide in hand. Am I seeing that? Am I at least a Dungeon Guide, yeah. and that that might be the plan here to to go up to level three. So we're going to deploy a Banner Knight first. 
Maybe go for a, a hurricane sweep here. Do we have a second one? I don't think we do. I Looks like just holding crux cards in hand in that that dungeon guide. Yeah, I think that's also a zephyr in hand. Yep. Yeah, so, yeah, it's the SP one zephyr. Yeah, so we do have a zephyr, uh, two crux site. Uh, no, one crux site, a spear blade ascension, a swift recruit, and the dungeon guide. And in response to the dream fairy attack, we're going to song of frost again. So we're going to try and keep those allies alive as much as possible here. Yeah, a little bit less value on this one uh, because. You are going to be able to come across for two with Lorraine here and that Banner Knight to, to clear up the Esteem Knight if there's no other interaction. Yep. And it looks like we are going to go ahead and clean up the Snow Fairy here with the um, with the Lorraine level two. Thanks to the Banner Knight getting the extra attack yeah. on the sword. You go ahead and clean up that uh, Snow Fairy off the board here. Mm -hmm. So I guess now that we have Banner Knight, I guess the question is whether or not if we want to go level three at Escape or if it's one of those situations because of the fact that we might banish these crack cards out of our hand, which is sort of needed for the combo with Spear Blade Ascension. If we want to risk putting those into our putting those into the memory right. to risk the banishment to go up to level three with dungeon guide, it would be pretty powerful here. You'd be able to get that sort of seeking back that dungeon guide and the banner knight could clear the esteemed knight. So it does look pretty appealing here. Um, you get really blown up by a by a frostbind here though. Yeah. So I think that's what Caven is is considering. Yeah. Bulls are leaving up the extra three cards, representing that it could be another frost uh, a frostbind in hand, something that could really punish a full shields down type of play. Yeah. So it looks like they are having a little bit of debate, uh, or at least Kevin's having a little bit of debate internally what he wants to do. Um, like I said, there is a chance you can go shield down, but you don't really know your opponent's hand at this point. Um, but all we could do is see. You are under a decent amount of pressure as Kevin here, so he does sort of have to make something happen. He is behind on life totals and currently a little bit behind on board. Yeah, there's always a chance to, if he really wants to, if it gets really behind, there is a chance you could Zephyr your own Dream Fairy. Sure. Um, it's really not the most optimal play. But if there's something that's really punishing or coming in for a decent amount soon, it might be sort of the get out of jail free card. Just to right. like rip in, just like, okay, buy me the extra turn that I need. So it could also be what we're trying to represent here as a whole. So it looks like he's made a decision here. So we do so one, two, probably the third. Uh, Maybe the third? We might just be, play Swift Recruit. Yeah, might be deploying a Swift Recruit here. And that does the same job. It does give him that three damage if he wants to try to kill this Esteem Knight. Two from Swift Recruit, one from Banner Knight. Yep. And is going to clear it off the board. Keeps so, the board nice and clear. Swift Recruit coming out for the third time this game, really, yeah. trying, to, really trying to do its job properly. <laughs> it's been having a rough time. So we are going to go ahead and pass the turn on over. We might see a level two come out here, Bolt. So the situation that we're into right now, because of the fact that we might be shields down on Caven's side, Going level two here might give us the heavy swing combo with the Bulwark Sword. Mm. But instead, we're going to go ahead for the Great Sword. I said, we might be... Uh, actually, so I'm wrong. We have five cards in, I think, Bull's side. So it does make it a little bit harder to do that exact line with the heavy swing. But Great Swords can give the Snow Fairy a plus one counter. We could swing it into something like a Swift Recruit or the um, attempt to clear it with the Banner Knight with Tony just to get it off the board to help minimize the value out of it. There's a great draw here in Stillwater Patrol allows him to deal with this Dream Fairy so between Stillwater Patrol and the Snow Fairy, you can control the board here, can use Tony and the Snow Fairy to deal with that Banner Knight, and then could choose to deploy the Stillwater Patrol to deal with that Dream Fairy. Yeah, because dealing with the Dream Fairy does unlock your Imperial Recruit. That was sort of banished a little while ago. Mm -hmm. um, I think we would, I think we're a card short for though from deploying both. Yeah. But yep, we are going to go ahead and play the Stillwater Patrol coming down here. Let's see if it ends up going into the Dream Fairy. And I think, yeah, we are. We're going to go ahead and swing into the Dream Fairy, clear the Dream Fairy off the board. Um, getting rid of that, and then sort of getting unlocking our peer recruit for a future turn if we want it. Yeah. So it does look like, though, we are one card short on Cape Aside from getting that sort of adversity online, but I think at this point it might just be sitting there as the Spirit Blade Ascension. Card. Yeah, you're going to need a target here. You will get a sword back. He is, uh, I think, only a Spirit Ruler deck, so Lorraine Spirit Ruler will get you a sword back, so he'll always have a target there, but of course you don't really want to flicker your sword that has five durability. Yeah. The one thing I didn't realize, that uh, actually in Cape is, is a Tithe Proclamation. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, we are running Tithe Proclamation. Um, so we could be generating that. There is the Nullfine Lantern there. We've already seen the Grand Crusader ring. Um, there is a Drawn Blade as well. If we want to banish one of the cards out of our memory to use the Drawn Blade effect to start trying to recoup our hand a little bit mm -hmm. if we're not happy with it. Yeah, he has pulled that to the front, so that looks like what he's going to opt to do. Yep. Let's grab that Drawn Blade. And this is ideally the one that you want to get rid of. He wants to grab this Drawn Blade, draw a card off of it, swing in with the rain, send it to his... 
uh, banish zone and then get that back with spirit ruler later on. Yep, so we're gonna banish one. Banish one of our two crux sites. So one of them's gone. Um, prevents us from getting back the spirit blade ascension from looping that for a little bit. Drew another dungeon guide. So this might be the turn where he decides to crash in with Lorraine, get rid of that drawn blade, plays the dungeon guide, gets that drawn blade back, and and starts the crux train rolling. Yeah. We did draw another banner, but yeah, like you said, at this point, Bull, uh, Tony's shields down a little bit with the fact that. Um, there's only one card in hand. We don't have to worry about a Frostbind. We decide to get... So imagine we are going to go to the Dungeon Guy, which is why he decided to swing in with the level 2 Lorraine with Drawn Blade. Which, like I said, Spirit Ruler will get back the Drawn Blade, allowing to draw another card, give it their uh, durability counters, and then loop it afterwards to Super Blade Ascension yep. to use for a later play. And that is going to look really powerful here. We have at least one Ascension. There's a Crux Sight as well. He might be a little bit short of doing both. Oh, I guess. Sure, that's a roll. Front Three it is. It's a roll. <laughs> So yep, three it is. We go ahead and I think banish another dungeon guide and a swift, um, swift group recruit. I, m I missed the second card. Yeah, I believe it was. Uh, it was either swift group or Zephyr. I believe he put down. Yep. So go dungeon guide. We did get back to Drawnblade, Blade. Drew another card, and now I think we now have double Spirit Blade Ascension in hand too. Am I seeing? I might be seeing. This um, one. I think you might be one card short here. Yeah, I think we do math. Oh, no, that, that math works. Yeah, I believe you yeah. do have double Spirit Blade here. Yeah, because we can Spirit Blade, and we want to get the draw card because our opponent revealing water more than likely, so we get the draw card off of that and then banish. So, yep, here comes the Prismatic Edge. It's going to resolve. It's going to come down as the 3-1 weapon. So very strong here. So, actually, we don't have any water. Oh, wow. So, he doesn't get the draw mechanic. Huge heads-up play here by the Tony player. Knows that this uh, Prismatic Edge is coming. He is going to lose a card for his trouble, but that is going to prevent Caben from casting two Spear Blade Ascensions this turn, which is massive. Yeah, so that Crux in hand is going to sit there, chill for a little bit. Same with the Banner Knight. Can't do either one. Um, we can get a couple of swings in if we want to in the face. Um, we can't really clear up the board too much at this point because you already swung a little bit with the rain. So we're going to push the two damage right now. Yeah, you can. Uh, there was one damage dealt to Swift um, uh, Stillwater Patrol, so you can use the Dungeon Guide and the Swift Recruit to clean that up. Nope, I might have missed something. There's, oh, uh, so if, uh, the recruit might never had damage count from the rain swing originally. She blade. did, yeah, yeah. That's why. Swang, and, swang into the patrol. Yep, so that's why I clear up the Stillwater Patrol and goes ahead and passes the third We're going to go ahead and get Null Final Answer, turning off the Spirit Blade Ascension, grabbing, uh, getting grabbed by Cruxite. Yeah. So this is actually an interesting use of Null Final Answer. So most people think with Null Final Answer, you're going to bring it in for, say, Erupt or the Fire Momentum or something like those types of decks. But this also really shines when you're facing the Crux opponent with the Crux Sites, as you've already seen him discard once with a Banish. You now turn off the Spirit Blade Ascension loop with reoccurring it with the Crux Sites as a whole. Yeah, and we see that he does have one in hand, so uh, really heads up play by Brawl. Yeah, definitely. So I guess at this point, we're now trying to figure out what can we do on our own turn here. We are going to go ahead and move forward with the Heavy Swing. Shields down again, swing in for six damage with the Heavy Swing. One more with the Snowfire, put up the 18. Putting Lorraine a little bit on the back foot here that depending on the next couple of turns that Tony could just swing in for an extra 10 damage easily. So, so we are just going to use that crux slate though. Yeah, cash it in. It's only going to be a card draw here. Also going to cast the Fairy Whispers. Try to get a rebuy. They do see a Ghost of Pendragon on top so they can go ahead and put a wind card on top, put the ghosts below it, and then draw that ghost for turn. Yeah, so I did also see a Phalanx Captain, I think, or a Tactical Sergeant that was put away. We are going to go ahead and reveal the Hurricane Sweep. Or it was going to get revealed, drawn in the hand, and then we're, like I said, off this turn, going to go ahead and draw the Ghost of Pendragon as well. Um, I think at this point, there is a situation, though, where you might be able to just Hurricane Sweep with a Prismatic Edge, just to clear board if you really want to. I don't think too much so. Same thing where if you had the Sword of Adversity, if you had no allies on board. So right. it might be setting up for a future turn with it. Yeah, it's good to have, and Tactical Sergeant's going to be a little slow. That's why um, they shipped that to the bottom. But I'd be very unsurprised to see um, Ghost of Pendragon just come down here and start... Uh, Start churning that card advantage. I hear that card is okay. Yeah, that goes to Pendragon. He's it's fine. he's all right. It's fine. It's fine. Um, we're probably going to see Pyle Lorraine swing maybe before the Pendragon, depending on the situation. Nope. So Pendragon's going to come down. Maybe the bounce the sort of Versi because it's free at this point. You don't yeah. really need to swing with it. Uh, draw two. Get another um, Zephyr uh, Fairy Whispers and a Swift Recruit in hand. Very wind heavy at this point. This is the sort of situation where you can start cashing in these Zephyrs that are looking pretty unimpactful just to flicker your Ghost of Pendragon. Yep. And this might be, so we're just going to grab the Surfer Group there and just keep up a couple of Interceptors because the fact if Tony does go level three, they can block this big heavy swing turn that could come in with that nine damage as a whole. Yeah, if they don't have any Interceptors and uh, they get met with a level two and an attack for nine, that could be game over. We're a little card short here to do that, but it's uh, good to play it safe. 
I think this is the part of the game where Caban wants to be in. He wants to be a level three deck. He wants to be using these very powerful Crux cards to gain advantage. So he's okay taking the game a little bit slower. Yeah, especially now that we have Devil Surfer Guru and we have all a bunch of win cards in our hand. At this point, we're just digging for either something to deal with a Nullify Land if we have it, or just trying to get in a Spirit Blade Ascension to start banishing and just re-stabilizing the board. Yeah. I mean, Pen and Dragon Loans is going to work. It's a 3-4 body. That card's hardly going anywhere outside of a Snow Fairy, and it's going to just keep on crashing into your opponent for 3 damage every turn. Right. Which, which stacks up very, very quickly. And even through a Snow Fairy, we have so many ways to flicker Ghost of Pendragon. So, yeah, he is definitely going to be putting in some work, as he is known to do. The fine card, so we're looks like going to go ahead and swing two with the Bullock Sword into the face of um, uh, Pendragon. So Pendragon is going to go ahead and die here with the sword and the Snow Fairy targeting it. And we're going to go ahead and materialize for the turn. Let's see what... I'm not sure what else we have left. Uh, we just might just keep, keep getting that sword back. Yeah, it might yeah. just keep getting swords. So as long as we can flicker it, if we hit another Pendragon, we just keep on flickering that as much as possible. Yeah, we always need something to bounce. Um, so it looks like an inspiring call in hand, a banner knight, that hurricane sweep, a fairy whispers. So we have a lot of, a lot of options here. Um, oh, is that a is that a rally the peasants? I can't tell. Um, no, I believe that's the inspiring call. I, we will we will see if it's a rally the peasants. That is a yeah, very good way to. Yeah, there is three rally the, pe the peasants. Yeah, that's what it looks like. This so we're gonna go for this rally the peasants. Try to find hopefully another cost uh, copy of Ghost of Pendragon that is for some reason a human. Yep. Hey, it's a good human card. <laughs> <laughs> it's human ghost. So we're going to go ahead and look here, um, see where we're able to find. So just think Man, that card's pretty good. Look at him. He, he did a flourish and yeah. slam dunked it on the table. I think that's the one I would like, please. Yeah, I would definitely like a pen dragon, please, and swing in for another three damage after I draw two more cards. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead, cast pen dragon here. Uh, does resolve. End up bouncing back that sort of adversity to draw two more cards. We see... I think another, was that a Reclaim? It was a Reclaim and a Favorable Wins, which is actually a reasonable draw here when you're stuck on two cards to at least be able to hold up that Favorable Wins, and at worst, you can spend it at the end of turn and use that Floating Memory for something like a Tithe Proclamation. Yep, and we're just going to keep on leaving those Surfer Recruits. I don't think those Surfer Recruits are going to get in for any more damage until there's a possible lethal turn, if that, if unless you want to play it safe and keep it on tap for the rest of the game. Yeah, you're putting on so much pressure as it is yeah. that, that it's now on Tony to become the aggressor, so there's no reason to uh, send those yeah. over to deal any damage when they can just play uh So it looks like so level two. We did get rid of that Stone of Thorns that was cast earlier in the game. A dungeon guy goes away, which is, I think, perfectly fine, because I don't think we're running the level three Tony, so don't need that dungeon guy too much. And we are going to go ahead and possibly set up a turn to try and swing in big here. Um, there were a couple of cards. I don't think there's anything in this list. There were a couple of cards that help would deal with interceptors, but I don't think it, this Tony list is running any of them. Yeah, I think the best we're looking for is stuff like Snow Fairy, but with two Swift Recruits, it's pretty hard to find a way to get through this. So likely this uh, Tenoris trigger is just going to be used to kill something like Ghost of Pendragon because Intercept does not work for your allies. So you can use that extra buff off of uh, Tenoris Might of Humanity to deal with that very problematic card while shields are relatively down by Kaben. Yeah, we do have a couple of instances where we have Song of uh, Freezing Hails on this list, but I don't think we have enough cards in our hand to Freezing Hail on top of Heavy Swing. Yeah. So unless we have one of those cards, but otherwise, as a whole, yeah, we're probably going to keep on trying to deal with this Pendragon the null, with the Null High Lantern resolved. We aren't going to have to deal with it, but I guess another good way to deal with it is Snow Fairy. It. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting choice. It does deal with it for now, but there's so many cards that flicker in Kaben's wind deck that I don't really think it's going to stick very long. Yep, and we are going to go ahead and favor win so the Surfer Group does stay alive here, takes two damage counters, keep up. I think this is pretty much the main game plan at this point. You want to keep up as much as possible Surfer Recruits. And as we see resolved here, I think it's the first one we've had on stream, is our Invitational CPRs finally being paid. <laughs> Yep, I think our opponent's double checking. Like, wait a minute, I haven't seen this art. I haven't seen that. Just <laughs> taking a look. Yeah, we're getting that tithe proclamation, which, for what it's worth, is probably a little bit more detrimental for Caban than it is for his opponent, with uh, all these ghosts of Pendragon running around. But at least right now, um, it's going to give him a card draw and allow him to sculpt his hand a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Looks like we found another one of those Crux sites, which is not going to do a whole lot here with nullifying Lantern on board. That is going to be his third draw from the turn under tithe proc. We're going to see Tithe Pock. Yep, I think he's just reiterating to the Jordan out what the draws were as a whole, because Tithe Pock on enter itself does draw, so it does count for this initial turn that comes in. So, like I said, it will be its third one, um, which I think was just being clarified a little bit to show, like, yeah, I already drew my three. Um, I think Fairy Whispers, is, I can't remember exactly, does Fairy Whispers draw? I'm not sure. I, I do believe you draw that card, you reveal a win card, and if it is a win card, you draw it, but it might say if it is a win card, you put it into your hand. Yeah, which could actually really determine a certain deadline. And we did have Banner like being pretty much slammed on the board at this point. 
you're just trying to push as much damage as possible. Your opponent has one card in hand, and you're representing about two, four, six, seven points of damage, if not well, eight, nine, depending if you want to swing in with something like, oh, we are going to see the Hurricanes. We've come in yeah, that, with the Prismatic. That, that should come in for lethal. That's a lot of damage here. That yeah. is coming in for five? Yeah, five. And then we still have the Banner on board to get a couple more extra swings. I think we might be a damage might, or two might be a, Might be a hair short, but sweeping the board, keeping your entire board is, uh, yeah, it looks like we're exactly one damage short if they decide to turn the Swift Recruit sideways. Which but it looks like he's just going to opt to pass it over again. Yeah. Under not a whole lot of pressure, he did just three for one his opponent. He has so many cards in hand, so he's just, just uh, looking to close this game out next turn. Yeah, and like I said, it's a safer play at this point. Your opponent has nothing, no reason to really push the damage through in case there might be a card you're not expecting. Because at this point, the deck lists are still closed, I'm pretty sure, to our players at this point. Yeah. So you don't get to know what your opponent's running just yet. So going with the safer line of action is a little bit better. Yeah, it looks like Cabin is going to take down that game from a, from a pretty commanding position. Um, it was a little, a little tough for the water deck to mount an offense there. Sometimes there, lots of interaction uh, can be a curse when their hand is filled with cards like Song of Frost that they don't really get to effectively use. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if they have a lot more coming in from the sideboard to see uh, if they can become a little bit more of, of the aggressor. Yeah, so as you can see on stream, thankfully, Kevin did bring in the Terra Frank from his sideboard. He's going to go ahead and throw that. Might be cutting something like the Safeguard Amulet, possibly, depending if you're fearing the Scepter combo. Um, but it doesn't hurt to leave it. You have four exercise curses, which I don't think are going to come in too much. You don't need that fast float. You don't need, more like you don't need Morgan Soul Guide. No. Nope. You probably won't need the Quicksilver Grail at this point. Yeah, so it looks like he's probably just bringing in our, our, a Terra Fring here to slow down the opposing allies deck just a little bit. Yeah, and then from Brawl's side, we do have an Eye of Argus, a Safeguard Amulet, a Smoke Bombs, a Wind Resonance Bobble, and four Morgan Soul Guides, which I don't imagine the Soul Guides are going to come in still. Um, we have Eye of Argus, which honestly I'm not even too. From, I can't remember too much what that card is. Yeah, so um, Eye of Argus gives True Sight to one of your allies, so that might come in to deal with stuff like Snow Fairy. Um, but I, I think other than that, it's probably Eye of Argus, maybe Smoke Bombs. Yes, yeah, Smoke Bombs really push through a couple of extra points of damage if you needed to, um, because you're going to make something that has stealth at this point, or maybe in this case where we saw where there's two Swift recruits, if there's a single one, you just go ahead and Smoke Bomb um, an Interceptor. Right, It'll allow you to get that heavy swing for nine to come through. Yep, so there, there's a couple of instances where I think Smoke Bomb might come in. Um, I see my rent decision where it's going to be really, really valuable, and we're going to go ahead and go, looks like straight into. We have game number two here. We're going to go ahead and rally the peasants. Yeah, we have a great turn one play as rally the peasants. Allows you to get some card advantage without actually having to commit something to the board. Yep, perfectly set up for something um, to use our memory to end up leveling for the turn if you need to. So let's see what we got. We think we have a surfer recruit off the top. Um, I think a tactical sergeant. Yeah, see so a banner knight, a tactical sergeant. Uh, looks like uh, maybe a rallied advance in there. Swift recruit, tackle sergeant, failing captain, two banner knights. And yeah, two two uh, tackle sergeants as well. And we're just going to go ahead and grab one of them. Yeah, a little bit of an awkward grip, I want to say, because you don't really want to see both uh, banner knights off the rip like that. You want to use it a little bit more later on, especially in the game um, like Grand Archive. We don't have too much of the shuffling of the deck mechanics or cards that shuffle your deck. So yeah. once you see these cards at the bottom, they're just gone. Right, those are just going to be trapped at the bottom of your deck for quite a while. Yep, so we're going to go ahead and pass the turn back on over to Brawl at this point, and we're going to go ahead and see what we We have an Esteem Knight, we have a Double Dungeon Guide, we have a Heavy Swing, a Seeking Shot, which could come into play um, later on, yeah. and Imperial Recruit as well. So I think we're sort of debating what we want to do with a grip. Oh, that's actually Triple Dungeon Guide hand. Wow. Ooh. Well, uh, maybe, maybe it's time to go to level 3. Maybe, maybe that's our play in this game, to play a couple of Dungeon Guides here. I think they'll probably, uh, yeah, push forward an Esteem Knight, maybe that Imperial Recruit to leave a couple of things on board, and if they aren't dealt with, they can go into Tony Level 1 and, and keep them safe. You tell me you didn't want to do the patented TM32 play of level 0 dungeon guiding to go up to level 1? I've heard it's not that bad. I that heard is, it's not that bad either. That I was is, pretty convinced. Yeah. So it looks like we're going to play the Steam Knight. We're going to push that 2 damage while we can, and we're going to go to, I think, level 1 over here and keep inside up to level 1 Lorraine. Going to get rid of a Reclaim here. Going up to level one Lorraine, gonna grab that very patented sword of seeking. Oh, maybe pulling the sword of adversity yeah, to sword the front. Sword of adversity could come down. We have no allies at this point, so sword of adversity could come down, get the extra two damage. But I imagine we might also leave it behind for because we do it looks like have the hurricane sweep. We might leave it for a hurricane sweep turn if it's possible. Yeah, a bit of an awkward breakpoint here that it is a sword for two, but you don't have a great way to deal with that esteem knight because it does have three health. Yep, and so we're they're going to come in for two, yep. get rid of their sword, deal two damage to that Steam Knight, and that is going to be met with a diffusive block, which is a huge uh, punish here. 
Yeah, it's going to get rid of your sword and also uh, save that esteem knight, assumingly. Yeah, another good card that gets you block two damage. Also has another class bonus floating memory, almost like the Storm of Thorns. So yeah. another reason why these Tony decks are running it, because having a two cost float at fast speed is usually pretty good. So it looks like the plan was to play a Tactical Sergeant, finish off that Esteem Knight, but the Diffusive Block got in the way, and it means that Tactical Sergeant is just coming in for one at the Spirit of Water. Yep, so, I mean, I'm sort of... Tactical Sergeant is a card I've seen for a very long time. Yeah, it used to be on our on our watch list, <laughs> and, and now it's uh, sort of fallen by the wayside and hasn't seen a whole lot of play lately, but it's looking pretty good here. Yeah, I think it was only most very recently removed. I think literally the last BNR update yeah. removed Tactical Sergeant. I guess Cape and Joey wants to throw it back on the... Yeah. Back to category one. Hey, you know, drawing a card in your memory and uh, producing a pretty hard to deal with body is nothing nothing to scoff at. Yeah, one four is a really strong body. As we were piping up two threes and one threes, one four is just as strong. Right. So we are going to go ahead and generate a Terra Fring over here from Bull's side. I'm pretty much probably trying to set up a turn where we don't have to worry too much about something lethal going to our Steam Knight because at this rate it's our only ally. Yeah, again, getting that early Terra Fring, they are going to use. Seeking Shot here, I believe, does have that level one effect. Is that correct on Seeking Shot? I might be wrong on this because it did resolve. I might be thinking of something else. So class bonus can't be retaliated. Level two is True Sight. It does have the plus three for gotcha. basic. So yeah, it's going to deal with that Tackle Sergeant and leave a, a pretty safe Esteem Knight here. We'll see if uh, Brol wants to crack this Terraforming to be wholly sure that he can keep an ally on the board. They, they really just want to, like, snowball a board, right? Yeah. If they can use the Terra Fring to protect their board and then level into Tony and protect their board again. Yep, and we are going to go ahead and see the Imperial Recruit come down. Maybe this time might be able to be able to get fostered. Um, yeah. Might be able to turn into that 2-3 body that it's mostly being paid for at this point for a 2-mana two, two cost. Right. So we are going to go ahead and pass the turn back over to Caben, and Caben is going to, I think, probably debate whether what they want to do. Like I said, there is the chance they can go level two. Learning how valuable is it? We do have that Hur Hurricane Sweeper hand. I don't know if it's in memory or hand though, and I think that's the math they're doing right now. If we banish two, do we still have enough to Hurricane Sweep this board? Yeah, taking the risk. Do they also have enough to pay through a Terra Fring? I think the answer is yes, but it would be a little bit risky. He is pulling that level two Lorraine to the front though, so it looks like he's going to go for it. Banish two cards at random. Yep. Um, like I said, I imagine the Hurricane Sweep is probably still in hand at this point, because yeah. knowing that it's going to be used later on for this exact thing. So it looks like we're going to go ahead and banish this SB1 Zephyr here. And six ends up being a reroll in card number one. And it's going to be both Zephyrs. Yeah. So both Zephyrs coming in. Um, and they are, looks like in response, going to crack the Terra Fring at the beginning of recollection to try and force him, like, hey, do you have enough cards? You have to have it. Yeah, he does. He does indeed have enough yeah. cards here. Exactly. Going to be able to sweep here for four. Yeah, I think four because of Hurricane Sweep does one, and then level, uh, level two Lorraine has three off the bonus. Two allies die, and Caven Gorns gets to draw two cards off of that. Just an in insane play here. It's so much card advantage, so much tempo, and you know we we have Brol here on on Spirit of Water while Caven's sitting over here on this level two champion already, and with more cards in hand. Yeah, especially, I mean, just being able to recoup your hand off of the level 2 Lorraine is really good value at this point. Yeah. Um, we're we're going to go ahead and go to the Wind Bobble Pie, trying to like, said, recoup the hand, but we do have that awkward hand, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, of three dungeon guides. Though. Yeah, lots of dungeon guides, and not a whole lot of ways to correctly deploy them here. Looks like, yeah, a lot of interaction, some heavy swings, and three dungeon guides, so the hand's, hand's looking a little clunky here. Yep, we do have the Storm of Thorns, and I think those are two Frostbinds. I think they're Frostbinds, yeah. I think it's two Frostbinds, Storm of Thorns, a Heavy Swing, and three Dungeon Guides. It's not the hand you want to see. No, especially not when you're Spirit of Water still. It makes it a little bit awkward. You don't really want to be going the level one off of the Dungeon Guide. Don't you think it's a good good play? Yeah, so Caben's going to grab his GCR, his first edition foil GCR. He's going to crack it and draw a card, and just sort of try to apply some pressure here. If Caben here has a dungeon guide, it's going to be I think huge. I did see one in hand. There is a, I think it's the last card in his hand. He does have an academy guide, yeah, and a dungeon guide in hand. So he might just go for a dungeon guide here. And we have Spear Blade Ascension, but we don't have a weapon in field. Actually, we can get a weapon because we did use Sword of Adversary you can earlier get your in the turn. Adversity back, yep, he's checking there, just making sure I still have that sword in my banish zone. It's going to go ahead and dungeon guide, get that sword back, and maybe start this. Prismatic Edge train, but his opponent didn't uh, didn't play any cards, so Prismatic Edge is not going to get a trigger off of his opponent here. So he might just opt to play it a little bit slow, attack with this, and uh, Spirit Blade Ascension is a fast card, so he can choose to do it on his. We actually side. have double Pen Dragon in the grip too. Oh my lord! So there is a play here that we set up since we can't Spirit Ascension. We're just going ahead and Pen Dragon leave two up for something like a Frostbind. Try to get the bounce to draw two, materialize the sword pie in the next turn, and then just start trying to get the loop going, yeah. get the engine online. 
So it looks like there is a little bit of debate. Uh, if there's a response, there is no response to the Pendragon. Pendragon's going to go ahead and send that sword back. Jaw two. Jaw into. Oh, oh, my God. Into a Cruxite and a Banner Knight. It is just magical Christmas land here for, for Kaven. He's got everything that he needs. Yeah, pretty much set up, ready to go online. Can just go ahead and start looping. I think we even have enough in our hand to just respond. Just on like a Frostbind in response to right. still pay the two. I think we're just sort of sitting in a pretty pretty strong position on this point. Such a tough spot to be in from Brol here. We'll see if see if he can mount an offense, try to find some some allies. He did find a Korhazi Trapper, which is at least something that he can deploy. Did he draw a fourth dungeon guide? Oh yeah, I think that is a fourth dungeon guide. I mean, yeah, the I question is, do you just start using them? Yeah, knowing just that your start opponent cashing them in. Yeah, or not even that, just to start putting them in memory because you know your opponent probably is going to start spirit uh, ascension looping. Yeah, that's you. fair. Like, you can play for Ozzy Trapper here, put down three dungeon guides, and... Uh, I think hopefully, that's what we're doing. Hopefully we get Cabin to resolve a Prismatic Edge so we can show him the goods. Yeah, show him all three dungeon guides, <laughs> just hold him in the grip, and yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> you thought you had me. All right, so he's going to get a sort of adversity here, and like you said, yeah, in his recollection step, he's going to cast an ascension, Yep, Put a you. prismatic edge into play, and we're going to see the goods here. Yeah, that's fine. Prismatic edge me. I have three dungeon guys look to show you. Look what I got. <laughs> it looks like Cayman's laughing in response, going, this is the second time my prismatic edge did all normal cards. I mean, so one of the dungeon guys is going to get banished. It's going to, I guess, pseudo do its job a little bit, because <laughs> <laughs> you just want to add of your hand at this point. We have the illusion of choice of banishing a card at random. It's yeah. whichever dungeon guide is your least favorite. Yep, whatever one you hate more, the lightly played one. Yeah. So we are going to go ahead, though, and Pendragon's going to attempt to swing in for three here, more than likely. And we are going to go ahead and use that Korhazi Trappa to negate three of the damage. Um, we do still have a Crux Knight in hand. We have a Banner Knight in hand if we need to, and that Crux is going to come on in. We're going to go ahead and grab the Spirit Blade Ascension to draw another Pendragon. Oh, my God. Insult to injury. Get to cast an Ascension here, get another one of those Dungeon Guides, cast yet another Ghost of Pendragon. You, you thought your Karazi Trapper did work. Yeah. I mean, it negated three, but lo and behold, I have another. Such a difficult position to be in here. I guess it's also in the position, too. Do you just want to almost get rid of your own Prismatic Edge with the um, Pendragon? Because it's a good card. You get to draw your two. But also in the fact that it saves you having to worry about something like fracturizing your sword. Yeah, I don't see why not. I, I think you just put on the pressure while you have it. Yeah, it looks like uh, we're just going to... Play a ghost. Bounce that. <laughs> draw yet another ghost. Four ghosts. <laughs> I hear that card's okay. Yeah, and Dragon's going to really put the work in this, really put the clock. I mean, your yeah. opponent's also still Spirit of Water, actually. Yeah, it's insane. So your opponent's going to stay here on uh, pretty much almost, what, 13 life? I mean, we're going to sit there and swing three. We were at eight before, if I'm not mistaken, or we would just get to eight. Yeah, I wouldn't even be surprised if, if he, you know, deploys this Ghost of Pen Dragon without, uh, without getting the on enter just to get the body on the board. So yeah. it looks like we're going to go up to Tony level one, going to get rid of, you guessed it, a dungeon guide. Woo. <laughs> Um, are we going to cast the other one this turn just to keep that life total? Maybe. Up? You might need to. But again, Kaven has played this Swift Recruit, and these Interceptors have proved to be such a challenge for Brol, where he can't even use his Tony level 2 to like clear a Ghost of Pendragon because this Interceptor... Or I guess he, he can clear a Ghost of Pendragon. He just can't can't go upstairs. Yeah. We'll have yeah. to, but I think we might be a little bit underutilized on cards, though, because the fact if we do Dungeon Guide off of it, I think we're going to be a little bit short for the Heavy Swing because you don't have a sword to, yeah, no sword to swing either. into it. So it's just going to be a pure Heavy Swing needed in order to clear off one of these Pendragons. And we're just going to go ahead and rip a Heavy Swing here. And yeah. we're going to go ahead and clear one of those Pendragons while we can off the board. You do what you got to do. Yeah, but lo and behold, there's two more waiting in the wings for him. Yeah, they just keep coming. So we're going to go ahead and pass the turn back over, clearing a Pendragon, trying to minimize the amount of damage we are taking this turn. And we might be seeing just another basic sword coming yeah. in to resolve here. Grab that sword of adversity or no, that sword of seeking. Sword so of seeking. Send it right back where it belongs with yet another ghost spend dragon. Yeah. At least this time you get one damage out of it. Yeah, you get a swing. First. You get a swing out of it. At least you don't have to worry about it dying. We are just going to play banner. We might just be going sideways here. Oh yeah, there's, there's just so much damage here, especially yeah. with this banner knight. We're going to have another ghost of Pendragon. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and play the Ghost of Pendragon here. Going to yep. probably bounce it. It looks like Brawl's going to, yep, that's that's yeah, the third. Yeah, so, seeing, seeing the writing on the walls here, unfortunately. It's a, it's a little hard to beat three Pendragons. Yeah. I mean, it's a good card. Yeah. And yep, looks like there's going to be Kasigi. Kaven's going to go ahead and go 2-0. Oh, and yeah, Brawl's like, geez, like, yeah, it's like Pendragon, Pendragon, Pendragon. It's just couldn't couldn't escape the Pendragon menace. Yeah, some sometimes, you know, playing any sort of trading card game like this, uh, the, the variance will, will kind of hit you, right? Yeah. It, it, was, it was a pretty rough start from Brol and, and a, a very strong hand from Kaben. And it, he did his best to try to find his footing, but it, it's really hard to come back from, like you said, Triple Ghost of Pendragon is, is quite a beating. You can only do so much. I mean, there's only so many responses you have. You can right. only play something like a Seeking Shot so many times. I think right. we're running two in this list we saw. There's like only a couple, like I said, answers you have, and it's hard to hit it four times in a row to answer back-to-back-to-back right. -to -back -to -back Pendragons. Yeah, excellently played by, by both of our players, yeah. but there's only so much 
you can yep. do, right? You can only draw so many answers, and when Ghost of Pendragon is a body you have to answer and also gives you card advantage, it's really hard to, to come back from, from behind like that. No, for sure. No, that was um, pretty much, I think, one of the, actually a relatively quick game, I imagine, yeah, for an ally matchup. Yeah. I, both our ally matches went pretty quickly as a whole for, for the day. Um, the game's, game's been going pretty well for the most part. We do still have about 13 minutes though in the round. Everyone's still finalizing for their final round. Mm -hmm. Um, figuring out what their record is, what record they need, but we can confidently now say that Caven has made uh, the cut to day two, so congratulations More likely to him. so. I, uh, we heard the rumors that the X2 is going to make it, yeah. but I will say at least for, for clarity's sake, <laughs> there might there might be a chance that some tiebreakers might be a little weird. It might not be every X2. Yeah, we don't want to give the yeah. commentators curse. Yeah, they don't want to give the yeah. commentators curse here because that'll be on us. We'll, we'll be witch hunted into in the parking lot of the yeah. mall here. Um, but why we have a chance here, we can go ahead. We have this glorious statistic page. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, we have a glorious statistic page. So it looks like these were, oh, these might still be a little bit older calculated. So I might be wrong on this. This might still be around for calculations. Yeah, um, you should be able to, to update them and we can get um, yeah, a little I'm, bit more of that. Yeah, that is at the end of round four, but you can check I, like that. Yeah. yeah, all right. I'll hit it. Hopefully I'm not yelled at for it. No, you should be fine. <laughs> So we'll go ahead. So yeah, we're going to take a look at um, how our champions are doing, how our elements are doing. Because um, like we said, we, we've been seeing a lot of allies decks rise to the top, especially these past couple of rounds. We've also been seeing a lot of erupting players performing quite well. So we'll uh, let's let's see how are we doing, Rev. So it looks like at the very top we have five Xanders in top five in, in the top fifteen. I did top fifteen because more than likely, we, even though we're going to cut the top thirty-two, top fifteen is a little bit your higher end of your bracket. You have I think still one undefeated, if I'm not mistaken, going into it possibly as well as a couple of the X1s, so the more top end of the meta. Mm -hmm. um, but five of Xander's, 33% conversion. We have four water, uh, imagine water Tonys. There could be a wind Tony in here for all I know. Sure. The rough one is we have 19% of Lorraine, 13% of Diana. It looks like a, only a 4% of Merlin. Yeah, that seems like it's a like a single Merlin player, maybe yeah. two there. Yeah, definitely in uh, probably interrupting. We do have a Rye on this list, but Rye's a little bit in the calculation a little bit. Like, Skews it a little bit because of the fact that Erupting does do the hybrid mechanic right. on either level one. Or yeah, level. so it's likely an Erupting deck that's playing their copy of Rai. Unfortunately, not a Storm Seer. So the um, shocking component here, because uh, we did this at the round of like round six, mm -hmm. where we had a huge conversion of Wind. Mm -hmm. Wind has one, I think, in the top 7%. It went from the top percentage deck and cutting over into the lowest. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's a tough matchup for for a lot of the wind decks, especially when you start uh, fighting these very highly tuned you know, water allies decks, wind allies deck, or um, uh, fire uh, erupting decks. It's pretty tough for wind to find their footing. They yeah. just don't have as strong interactive pieces as water does, and they're not as fast as fire does. So. Yeah. You know, they fit somewhere in the middle there. Yeah, water, as we probably predicted in most others, water has the highest conversion rate so far going into this, 53%. Yeah. And then fires at second at 40. And then going into our a little bit of advanced element stacks here, Luxem, as we most sort of predicted, we've seen Luxem being the, uh, Xander being the highest. Yeah. Is Luxem is 27% tied with Neos at 27%. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of Tony decks, something that is interesting about this statistic is it gives us a little bit of a window that there are four Luxem decks um, in, in our top 15 here that we're looking at, but there are five Xander decks, so that means one of those Xander decks is uh, assumingly a Fire Aggro deck. Yeah, which ironically, talking around, I haven't really seen too many when talking to a couple of players. I haven't really met someone yet that's told me, yeah, I'm on, F I'm on Fire Xander, I'm on FISA. Right. I've yet to actually meet, I, I don't doubt there are in here. It's a good deck. It won or well, came pretty close to winning Ontario. Yeah. Um, but it's a deck that is re re relatively good. If it gets to do what it does like erupting, it just combos off and just kills you turn two, turn three. We so did um, we did also have that uh, water Xander player that was doing right. quite well, so it could be them as could well. Could be the water Xander ally list. I totally forgot about that. We had that earlier in the day. Yeah. Um, they have three different crux. We have two Umbra. We do have quote unquote one Astra, <laughs> but erupting, sadly. Astra but, broken. Yeah, Astra broken. <laughs> So we have a really a big swing, I want to say, from what we saw earlier, like almost at the midway point a couple rounds ago, a big swing of what's being sort of represented here at the top end as a whole. Yeah, I think uh, the basic element thing is quite interesting because we've had fire be our most represented throughout most of the day, and now it seems like once we're we're getting to you know the the nitty gritty and and, and cutting out. Um, uh, to, to our top 32 for tomorrow, it, it looks like we are starting to see water decks rise above the more represented fire decks. I will say, though, we have technically three undefeated players. One's technically undefeated at 6-0 going into this round. We have a couple that are 5-0-1. Oh, 
Um, so I'm really curious to see if our undefeated player stays undefeated after this round. Yeah. I think it is. We had Steve G on yeah, stream earlier. Yeah, that's Steve-O, I believe. Yeah, yeah. so Steve-O was on stream earlier that we saw. Um, Luxem Xander. Yep. So that's one of the Luxem Xanders that we just talked about earlier. And we have we have a decent amount of five ones. And it sounds like we have, oh, are those the Sapphire Packs? Ooh, fancy are Sapphire we, Packs. Are we allowed to open Thank these? Thank you, Mr. Producer. No, oh. no, no, we can't open them. <laughs> They're very nice. <laughs> They're very nice. So these Sapphire Packs are exclusive to regional events. Yeah. So if you are uh, looking to play the game and you have a regional in your area, there are a bunch of regionals this season. Yeah, Make sure to get out. Play at your regionals. You get these beautiful sapphire packs. Oh yeah, there's a regionals yeah. tomorrow. Regionals uh, here. If you didn't make day two tomorrow, come by. Play the regionals. Get a sapphire pack. These are the cards they going. These are the cards that are starter deck only foils. You open your cosmic bolt foils. DM me on Discord. <laughs> we'll we'll work it out. But yeah, we're super excited. I'm glad that we're we're seeing a lot of support for. Um, for regionals, um, exclusive stuff to regionals yeah. is really cool. I think that's one of the greatest things that we've seen so far about this game is that one of the biggest complaints people had was there wasn't enough regionals, and now like devs are taking it to heart and really trying to expand that regional reach, mm -hmm. trying to make it more available to as many as possible. So especially with this new Omnidex season that we haven't really talked about on stream, that this Nationals was brought to you by getting an invite card from a store championship or a regional during the season yep. with the new system. You have a season, in this case we're in Alchemical Revolution season, you have a regional card and a store championship card, mm -hmm. and those are unique to just Alchemical Revolution season. Yep. And then the MRC would be a season, have their own unique, and you need those to be turned in to national points to qualify for the upcoming nationals next year. Which I think this is going to be now our first regional event for ALC yep, tomorrow. I believe so, yeah. And they've changed the way the national qualifications work. So you actually do need multiple uh, invite cards to get multiple national qualifier points. You also get a certain amount of those national qualifier points through your Omnidex participation yep. and, and your rank there. So you, you, you are really incentivized to grind a lot of these events, go to as many regionals as you can, um, yep. which I, I think is a great change yep. to, to try to encourage people to come out to more events and, and play with this awesome yep. community. Especially the fact, like I said, we, with expanding the regional reach, there's more people that can help get well. If people don't feel like in a weird situation of having to travel far, or hopefully not travel for far for a regional, and it's a little bit more accessible to more people as a whole, yep. which is really nice to see. Um, there, I think we've already had a bunch of regionals up on Omnidex. If you go on Omnidex and look at the Premier Event tab, you see a whole bunch of stores already populating with their regionals upcoming. Yeah. I think we have a bunch leading up to April right now on Omnidex. Yeah, yeah. there's a ton of events, way more than there was for last season. Yeah. So yeah, just go to omni.ga.gatcd.com. You can find the Premier Events tab, like uh, like Rav said, and, and it'll have all of your regionals listed there that you can go yeah. to. And get a glorious Sapphire and pack. And get some Sapphire packs, which I assume are mostly for like participation and yeah. stuff. So just like show up, get, get some Sapphire packs. Packs, open some sweet starter deck foils that are only in those packs, so I think they're going to be pretty rare. Yeah. Especially, you know, stuff like the material deck stuff is in yeah. there. Especially, uh, it's also with the Sapphire Packs of Regionals, make sure you go through store championships. It was announced at San Ontario. You get the store championship participation, which is the foil and stamped Star Wars Shumi of the yeah. new art, mm -hmm. which I'm excited for. Originally, I was happy for Sapphire Packs to get that in foil. Right. But now tell me, I can just go to a store championship and get it gold stamped and yeah. foil? Sure. Yeah, I'm super all for cool, it. for sure. And, you you know, of course, you want those coveted prize cards. I think it's yeah. a Lurking Assailant for store championships yep. and Orb of Hubris for regionals. L look amazing, by the way. Yeah, they're gorgeous. The, yeah. Those Lurking Assailants, so oh, oh. Those Lurking Assailants are really good, especially the fact that it's a store championship promo, and it's going to be, and it's a meta card on top of it. Oh, very strong. That's played. I can't wait to see how many people might actually start cracking <laughs> them open. Yeah. We saw it a little bit with the current ones, with the Tithe Proclamation, the Fast Gears, the Orb of Get, the Orb of Glitter, that people were sort of pseudo using them like a little bit of a slab maybe cracking a little bit right. to play but i'm hoping to see a lot more of something like a lurker stand where how right now it's a meta card yeah i'm sure you'll uh, you'll see caben with his yeah. uh with yeah. his lurking assailants we'll see, we'll see sure. cpr lurking assailants yeah, oh, next of course, time of course next time on stream without a doubt but no i know like i said we do have about five minutes left around we have some players finishing up um we're then we're pretty sure going to announce at some point either a top cut and then like I said, make sure you stick around more because we do end up at the end of the stream still have our next art card spoiler. Yeah, yeah. One more art card from MRC to take a look at. Silidar definitely promised me it's an Astro card. Yeah. He, he didn't say that. It's going to be Claude. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be Claude, yeah. Claude, Claude yeah. CSR. We were talking about Claude's <laughs> evil machinations earlier today. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're very excited to see more stuff from, from MRC, which is coming out just like way sooner than, than it feels. Yeah. yeah, and um, actually, I just got confirmation. We have the spoiler like in 30 seconds here. So, if anyone in the venue, anyone watching it live, um, make sure we are about there. to do spoiler it very shortly. Yeah, and this is our first time seeing it too, so yeah. we're we're gonna be uh, shocked and appalled just like you are. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm gonna I'm gonna consolidate Cam here as he's crying. If it's oh not yeah, a I'm, I'm sure it's not, but you know. Yeah. 
Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Retold Fortune. She's cute. Yeah, she is cute. Probably a mage card. Yeah, it looks like a mage card. It looks like a blue card. Yeah, blue yeah. card. Blue mage retold water card. Retold Fortune, huh? I don't know. Fortune, it might be a cleric, Don, actually. Cleric stone, yeah, it might be a cleric. I, I mean, it might be back to that whole scr a glimpsing mechanic as a little bit of fortune telling because that was either the earlier back in Kickstarter or one of the more. Um, cards that, that were used as a whole that said fortune telling was quote unquote the theme yeah, of cleric. Yeah. So it's yeah, but I think this could be a cleric card. I'm really excited. I really like the art. Super cute. Yeah, it looks like she's she's got you know an ice vibe going on here. So we assume it's a water card. Um, yeah, either either major cleric. She's got that big hat. You yeah, know, that very uh, archetypal. I'm, big, I'm actually big a sucker for like hat. the big mage hat. Yeah, I mean, for sure. Give me give me this on a play map. Yeah, oh, I, yeah I will use sure. this every time. Yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Can't oh. wait to. To see what it does. Get a couple different versions of foil of it. I mean, so what, you gotta ask, what do you think it does? Just looking at the art, what do you assume? I don't know. It's it's so it's so tough. Um, water card, uh, retold fortune. Maybe maybe it's a glimpse card. Yeah. Could, could be a could be some sort of glimpsing. Yeah. You think mm. it's going to be a class bonus glimpse? Yeah, maybe. Maybe it's like uh, they did a lot of mage cleric hybrid class bonus stuff. So maybe yeah. something like that. Yeah, we had a lot of cards back where it was like, oh, memory four glimpse or draw mm -hmm. mechanics in mm -hmm. ALC. So yeah, it could be something similar. I mean, this really is also proves, like I said, reiterating the fact that we are possibly hitting. Well, we are hitting all seven classes, right. and this card alone could tell us it's either going to be major cleric. It could be a hybrid card. It could be a mage slash cleric card. Yeah, for all who me knows? Now. Maybe this is a guardian card. Yeah, for all no, I mean, it could be it could be a guardian <laughs> card, and I'm just going to be really blown out and. Really contemplate how I know art. Yeah, no, I think for sure major or, or cleric. It, she does look very magey to yeah. me. It's, it's just the hat. I think if it wasn't the for hat. the hat, yeah. I would be like, oh, it's a cleric card, 100%. Yeah. But something about the hat, and it also has a like, little clockwork hat on it, as I'm now just realizing. So it has a little clockwork mechanics on top of the hat there. Yeah, what is she standing in front of? It's like a, a, a big pipe with yeah, some like sort of... Magma or something. Yeah. Could be messing with Sylvie's lava slimes over there, flame slimes. <laughs> Never she's, know. she's brewing the lava slimes in, yeah, in, I mean, inside the, the pipe. Yeah, it could be used. I mean, I mean, we do have new slime sovereign coming out. We could Slimes could be very, very diverse in the universe. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But no, I'm definitely excited for this card. Um, just, like I said, a lot. both cards spoiled today look really strong. I think we're going to have, if I'm not mistaken, a couple more tomorrow. I oh, think. awesome. A couple I, more I cards. I have not heard that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, super exciting to see art. The, the art for Grand Archive is so yeah. fantastic. I, I could also be wrong, and I'm saying we're having more spoilers, <laughs> and now I'm sort of yeah, you're forcing, I'm it, forcing to it to happen, happen yeah, now. Yeah. We're tomorrow. manifesting. Yeah, we're manifesting this to yeah. actually happen. Okay. okay. So, but yeah, it looks like, uh, yeah, so that is our new MRC art spoiler. I'm really excited. Um, we have, like I said, a, a lot of different things being shown, a lot of what it could be. Yeah, it, it's coming up. Um, just uh, right around the corner, it's May 17th, yeah. I think, is, is the release date of MRC, which at, at you know the, the time of this event yeah. now is, is just a couple of months away, yeah. right after our World Championship, where we're going to have the MRC preview event, yep. which is super exciting. And it's also more insane to the fact to me that we're just coming out, or it's sort of Rounding the corner of AOC at this point, and we're now just about to hit MRC, and this is like right. AOC feels so short ago, but you know MRC is coming out in like two months. Yeah, I think it's a real testament to how full the schedule for for Grand Archive feels. If you guys um, play Grand Archive or you're just getting into Grand Archive, they they do a great job of always having something to look forward to, whether it's store championship season or the regional season. Or the new set, they, yeah. they they keep them back to back so that we always have something to to be looking for. Yeah, to. especially like I said, we hit the spoiler season very shortly after the set of our new release. So there's always something that people are asking when you're always getting up to date in some form, shape, away of something upcoming. Right. So, so yeah, I, I believe our spoiler season officially starts for MRC in May. I think it's May third. Yep. Um, so you do still have to wait a little bit, but hopefully we'll have some more art to show you, and yep. I'm sure. Uh, you know the Weebs team will will be sharing little little bits and and, and stuff uh, as we get closer to mm -hmm. to the launch day. We'll be getting trolled again in Discord of uh, Neos <laughs> Elemental being spoiled corner by corner, right? Yeah. For Perfect. three hours and for three hours, ever, everyone's waiting on edge, wondering what the card's going to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, it keeps us it keeps me excited, um, keeps me up to date on all the spoilers and everything else I'm seeing. I mean, keeping up on spoilers is probably one of the major things that. I try to do for the community as a whole yeah. um, and just try and keep everything up to date there. So seeing all the spoilers come out and a little bit and a little bit being tweaked. And then, I mean, you yourself has also done some spoilers because of you know, making your own podcast. So seeing all the spoilers come out and then giving to people like you to spoil the cards is really something I really enjoy. Yeah, I think uh, the, the community is so great for Grand Archive and I'm, I'm glad that 
uh, they're often given opportunities to do stuff like spoiler cards and, and other cool things with the team. Yeah, very keeping everyone engaged. Like I said, it's what I think really helps grow this community and everyone in here pretty cl close knit because most people can interact and know sort of each other in some form, shape, or way from the game itself. Yeah. And doing stuff like that and keep your content creators into it, the spoiler cards also really help really reel everyone in to feel more internet and entwined with each other to sort of be able to interact and have a good time playing the game. Yeah, of course. But something in the short term that we can be very excited about is our uh, cut tomorrow. We're yeah. going to be doing the day two top 32 cut tomorrow. We're going to be doing four rounds of Swiss followed by our top eight cut. And if we haven't stressed it enough, the players this week kind of playing for so much. Yeah. It's a $15,000 tournament. There's also, of course, uh, product prize support being given out, I, I think, down to top 32. I'd have to double check on that. You have that. to double check that myself. Um, but of course, also, the top eight players of our North American Nationals event do get a uh, invite to the World Championship, and not only an invite to the World Championship, but they also get a paid accommodation yeah. to go to I mean, the which, which is also is terrific. Yeah, not even to understate it. The fact that your flight will be comped over, your hotel stay, right. all that being comped just adds to the prize pool on top of it, so it makes it so it's a little less of a burden for your qualified players to go. They're not having to pay out of pocket to fully have something right. available to go play a card game that they won and hard fought qualified for. Yeah, yeah, such, such a terrific thing for, for the Weebs team to do. So, yeah, we can't wait to, to crown our, our first eight players um, invited to the World Championship. And then, of course, later, I believe this month, we'll have both the Oceana um, and the SEA Nationals events, where the top four of those events are going to fill out the rest of our uh, 16 Worlds players. Yeah, like I said, I'm really excited to see how this whole thing curves out. And then, like we've reiterated enough, we have the actual event world. We have the Ascent Worlds for... Everyone else who doesn't qualify, which also lets everyone come back in for another big community event, still interact with everyone as a whole, and then sort of keep keep the way, you know, sort of keep everything active as they can. So we are just sort of, um, like I said, we have a little bit of overtime here in the final round. People are finished up with matches, with a little bit of reporting. So yeah, we're, we're just waiting on a couple of matches to finish so that we can have our top 32 finalized. Um, like we said, we are going to be streaming that top 32 tomorrow. It is going to be uh, 9.15 is when we're starting. Uh, the stream's going to be up at 8.45, so you guys can get in and, and, and start you know, chatting. And then 9.15 is when our, our round is going to start. So look forward for, to that tomorrow. I have gotten confirmation that you were right. Yeah. We are going to have a couple more spicy things to spoil tomorrow. I've been, not been given any sort of official... No, I manifested. I was, I was right. I manifested it. We just forced it. No. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't remember if I, I manifested it. Don't worry. I, it's, the, it's the magic powers. Yeah, so we're, we're just going to we're gonna hang out, make sure we get all of our top 32 lists so yeah. that you guys have an idea of what you're looking at for the event tomorrow. The great thing about the new update to Omnidex, which is our organized play software for Grand Archive, is that it's all digital lists, and yep. everybody can look at those. I believe they're going to be public after... Um, after day day one concludes here? Possibly. I know there's a couple of ways it goes live as well. We're going to be, at least the greatest part about Omnidex as a whole as well, the fact that we do have, like I said, the digital deck list, I'll pull it up, and then um, we do still have some finalized games happening. I mean, this is also the high stake point at this point. Right. For some people, this is, like we just saw the last game, was the play-in. Yeah, this so is, many winning ins yeah, going on. Here, you had yeah. the winning in. We're about to hit the last 25 seconds here in time of overtime. If there's a rough spot if you're at a couple different draws there's a lot of different tiebreakers that come to calculations i mean thankfully the omni deck system does it for me i don't have to do math <laughs> yeah because uh, yeah let's not even talk about doing all the tiebreaker math here. yeah always the worst part as a to is when somebody comes up to you and they're like this is my record am i live for top cut and i'm like oh, I, don't, I don't i can't do math i, I let the program do it yep. so thankfully omni deck is doing all of the the heavy lifting for us to find out who our top 32 players are yeah we're gonna go ahead and bring everything to you as much as possible the deck list sort of who sort of qualified for day two and see how the because i imagine we have a little bit of a player announcement too so people know who's qualified as well off of omni deck so they can figure out what's going on yeah um, which is what I think most of our players here are waiting for at this point. The overtime timer has just ended, mm -hmm. so we're probably finalizing it in those final matchups in, enter them all, refresh the system, and then everyone's going to find out what's going on, and then sort of determines whether or not you're playing in the regional tomorrow. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is a regional tomorrow for anybody who is at Nationals here that, that did not uh, perform as well today as they wanted to, um, which is awesome. Like we said, it's going to be our first ALC regional. Yep. So I, I believe they're rewarding those new prize cards. Yeah, uh, rewarding the new prize cards. Um, like I said, you have the Sapphire packs here. You have the very nice mats, by the way. I think you yeah. have the lone gunman ranger, I think, is the entry one. Correct. Yeah. You have the bishop is the finalist? 
Perhaps, yeah. And then I know the last guard, I think, is the Into the Fray, the um, Rose Green wind, wind Guard. Correct, yeah. What? Yeah, I, I think that's the finalist, or I don't remember the finalist map, but I believe that is the champion map is Into the Fray, yeah. They're gorgeous maps. If, yeah. if you guys haven't seen the Grand Archive maps in person, I highly recommend yeah. you get out to an event and see them. Good quality, good overall. The image images print is good. Really, like I said, the maps are really nice as a yeah. whole. I mean, we are sitting on a six foot, or not yeah. even sitting, I should say, but using a six foot long tablecloth here of Grand right. Archive mat, and it's amazing, yeah. amazing feel. It's probably one of the better quality mats I've seen from any TCG yeah. supply site. Yeah, absolutely a great turnout this weekend. Yeah, um, we, had, we had 163 players at our event, um, which is great. This is one of the, you know, this is only North American players for the most part. There's maybe a couple of wild card players here, but it's it's mostly North American players. But it is one of the strongest yeah. uh, tournaments that that I've seen for this game. The the top, you know, X. We're looking at the standings from last round are. It's just every you know name that you've you've heard yeah. of from this area, especially so. in the point two of the game. Finally, not finally, but sort of turning that corner where you're going to start stabilizing your quote unquote pro players, your players mm -hmm. who are usually topping all your events consistently, and your little bit of people who are starting to grow into those methods as a whole. So these are one of those events that you're seeing that finally could truly come to fruition. I was talking before, Caden was top eighting the, right. the, the regional. I mean, all the uh, sense. So you said it's like we know that's a stabilized player. We have the rest of his team, which is pretty stabilized for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, I think between Isaac and Terry are topping events as yeah, well. So you have those people who you sort of recognize now when you go down the sheet and you go, oh, I know this player from this. I know this player from this. I know you start having those name brand recognition players, and those are coming up as well. And this is like one of the first events that's really setting that foothold of who is your quote-unquote core pro players in the game. Right. Yeah, I think one of the coolest things about GA is that it's such a fairly low-variance game as far as trading card games go. Yeah. So so these very talented players, like you said, uh, the cream really does rise to the top, right? Yeah. Like, they are using that skill advantage. Um, you know, they're using their, their deck-building talent to really come out on top of the competition. So, yeah, you're going to see a lot of these same names of, of people that are just such talented Grand Archive players performing really well at these events. Yeah, so like I said, we are sort of sort of waiting for the final little bit of the top 32 here. You might see me refresh a little bit on stream every now and then to see if I have an update, but I don't. Yeah, the, the most <laughs> stressful overtime yeah. of the uh, of the evening. So yeah. I think if anybody's in overtime, they're, it's five minutes. They're taking their five minutes because they yeah. want to make sure that, you know, a lot of these games, like like you said, Rav, are, are they're playing their winning in to yeah. make it into day two. And, you know, top eight is, we're, we're talking a whole lot about top eight and the world's qualification, but top 32 is nothing to scoff at. No. You get, you know, you get um, uh, a promo for that. I, I believe it is still... Is it, is, it the, is it the new promos for, for this event? No, I know you get the Beseech one for Top 8. I think, do you get the Foil That's Spirit Blade Ascension for Top 32? Yeah, it's the Foil Spirit Blade Ascension, a playset of the Foil Spirit Blade Ascension promo for Nationals, which is super cool. Yeah. Um, and I think they're doing some some other yeah. prize support for that as well. Which is great to see. And like I said, this is also the high stress moment. For also, for even the TOs at this point, because the TOs yeah. got to make sure every single thing is inputted correctly, make sure the system worked at normal, right. um, make sure there's no weird issues with tiebreakers. So this is, like I said, it's big stress on top of everybody because it's our first, it's our biggest system for yeah. Omnidex or GA as a whole to finalize these types of results. Because the scents are huge. You know, really, the scents are huge themselves, but this is like, this is the national, this is what's giving you the world. So you have so much more money on the line in this probably one entry than you could probably ever right. think of. <laughs> yeah, I can, uh, I'm sure some of the lovely TO staff can hear me across the venue, yeah. so I'm, I'm, I'm here to give a curse that the uh, the event has been very smooth thus far, <laughs> and I feel like there really haven't been a whole lot of problems, mm -hmm. so I apologize for putting that out. He into said the ether. it, not me, <laughs> don't come after me, it is all on Cam. Cam but. had thrown that curse on you. And, but it's going very well. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're very happy that the event has it's been very smooth thus far. Yeah, everything's been smooth. I've enjoyed our time here in the Castle booth. We've had a very good time. Um, the streams are going smoothly. I've been. This has been a very good day one. I've been really excited. I mean, at this point, I think we're nearing 8.15. And honestly, like, at least to me, it doesn't feel like 8.15. It's like I, 9 a.m. <laughs> yeah, I like, I, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go for another five more rounds. Well, we get to go for seven more rounds tomorrow. So. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> no, count me out. I'll, I'll go for it all day. But no, I'm super excited. Like I said, everyone's now sort of crowding around that TO table, as I could see from our through our little cam over here. Everyone's just crowding around the TO table, just waiting for those top 32 yeah, results. Yeah, we're going to get that. You know, I, I, I'm a big fan of the, the paper sheet that, that, that the TO brings <laughs> yeah. over. He pastes it up on the wall. You get your top 32 standing. I love that Ascent Houston. Because the greatest thing about these two events, me, was watching when those stands go up. And then you literally have, like, the whole mass of yeah, people just yeah. follow that judge around with the sheet right. as they're going to go to hang it up. You know, just a, just a little parade. So yeah, we'll we'll get, we'll get that for you guys shortly. Yeah, like I said, imagine it's a lot of last-minute checks. I don't know. 
if there is like a weird random deck check happening as well with the top 32 cut. Some, some, some events do, but this is still Swiss, so I'm not exactly sure how. Yeah, I'm not sure. We might be dealing a little bit of a deck check too, though, um, just because it's the top 32 in such a big event. If, if there is an issue and such like that, it will come into play here. So I don't doubt we might be waiting on results for that to also be finished. Yeah, just making sure that all those I's are dotted, you yeah. know, T's are crossed. All I's dotted cross T's is in some weird written card or something like that overall. Right. Um, but yeah. Like I said, a lot of our players are still um, pretty much just waiting around here, trying to wait for that final result as much as possible. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to say celebrating. Yeah. We're trying not to. Sorry, put, I saw, saw someone cheering about something different, and that's why my, I almost said celebrating. I just like, wait a minute, this is yeah. not what's happening. We don't want to <laughs> don't want to put that curse on anybody. No. You know, good luck everybody that's that's sweating it out for Top Cut. I know there's there's going to be a lot of people that are like right on that bubble, or that are really going to be sweating to see if yeah. they make it into that top 32. Well, I mean, even if you bubble in this event. I don't even think you feel bad about it. You came in versus 163 of the best pie players in North America. It's such a strong run. And you bubbled. And that's like still a super strong yeah. showing. That's stronger than uh, most people probably that you can compare it to. You're stronger than people, at least the reason why I'm sitting in the casting booth and not out there playing. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, granted, I also didn't even earn myself an invite. Right. <laughs> so it's still a great showing, and it just shows that you have that potential to do that again. You have yeah. the potential to make that cut and make that threshold in the next event. Yeah, and it's great to be in sort of on the ground floor, right? Grand Archive is such yeah. a new game, and you know all of our players here today are. This is our first ever national championships. We yeah. haven't said that enough. Yeah. But this is not only national championships for North America in 2024, but it is our first yeah. nationals. And so. I, I can't wait to see the turnouts of our other events at this point. So I do hear some. The crowd is starting to get a little bit rowdy. Yeah, so. I'm hearing some rowdiness. Am, yeah. I, am I supposed to refresh? I might be refreshing here. Let's see. Oops. We will get confirmation. Oh, we do have a possible screenshot going up. Yeah, the results are in. Um, I'm not going to spoil anything because we do have a screenshot going up. Yeah, so. Mr. Producer is going to get us our top 32. So yeah. you, can, you can share the excitement, the, the energy in, in the room right now. So, yeah. uh, so electric. Everybody's really excited. Yeah, probably some people who might have been really pushing that envelope a little bit and really debating on if they were going to be able to make it um, and just... Being, especially those people at you know, probably a little bit like you know you bubbled in or bubble. It's, right. uh, it's one of those things that's he was, he was celebrating. And it looks like we do have the list. It's almost ready to go here, and we'll be showing that screen pretty much momentarily. Yeah, but we're uh, we've got the sneak preview yeah. here, and it is such a strong list of players. So, so you can see on your screen here, this is the the, the top of our uh, top 32. So, so okay congratulations business. to all these players. So okay business is our only undefeated yeah. going to the event six zero one. We have Matt, Stevo, Steve did but looks like losing the last round. Um, then we have Cactus, Andy ended up being 5 one one who had on stream earlier. Uh, for Nathan, it's 5 We have a lot of 5-1-1s, actually, more than I expected. Yeah. Like, that's, there's a lot of ties into this, even the top 16 here. A lot of, like we said before, a lot of names are recommending. For the, so for those who aren't aware, the little icons next to the names are showing how active they are in playing events. It's a little bit of an omni-ranking type deal and you're able to show how participant they are. So we have a lot of names we do recognize Main here. Main deck Dan made 32nd place. He is no longer ninth place. He bubbled in this time. He did Let's not go, bubble Dan. out this No time. bubbling out from Main deck Dan. Congrats <laughs> over there. Yeah, you guys can see a lot of familiar names here yeah. if you guys have been yeah. around the scene. It looks like two of the two champion members ended up making it. Pickle Sword ended up making it, who is our Yeti Regional, one of the innovative decks we have, um, Rupting Matt G. Um, I'm pretty sure that that was near the top, if I'm not mistaken. We have, we have Jimmy Lee. Made, Jimmy Lee, who ended up finalizing after. Um, like I said, a lot of these names I am recognizing. Right. Um, Andy is also a recognizable name. Don't let the bronze rank confuse you. The guy's <laughs> too busy running events to actually play Grand Archive. Geo Extraordinaire is yeah. allowed to play one event, and he's yeah. in fifth place. So. Yeah, so that's really, really, really strong. Like I said, we have a lot of names that we're recognizing here, which is really strong. Show everyone congratulations. Um, looks like that two loss threshold was the cutoff a little bit. Yeah. We have a couple of 4 2 ones that ended up bubbling in. So congratulations to all those players here. So yeah, um, huge congrats to everybody that made made top cut of, of our first ever North American Nationals. So congrats yeah. to those top 32 players. They're going to be sweating it out tomorrow. We have four more rounds of Swiss tomorrow morning, followed by our top cut. Um, our stream, like I said, is going to be starting at 8.45. Round one's going to start at 9.15. So, so get in here. The, you, you don't want to miss it. Yeah, you're going to find it time. right back here on the main Grand Archive YouTube channel. Um, I'm pretty sure we already have already a live page already set up, ready to go. Yep. So you can have that prepped on your browser, mobile device, whatever you end up watching this on. So you have it ready to go. As soon as we go live, we're going to be here with you. Yeah, we are excited. Excited to be back. So I think that is all that we have for you guys. Of course, thank you guys so much for watching the stream, for watching our coverage this weekend. We are so excited to be here, and we can't wait to bring you more action tomorrow from North American 
Grand Archive Nationals. Yeah, can't wait to see you all here tomorrow. Can't wait to come back and cast tomorrow. We're gonna we're gonna be a little fancy. Yeah, a little, a little, little, little bit fancy. Little spoils. Yeah. A, little, <laughs> a little fancy. But yeah, can't wait to see you all here. Can't wait to see everyone, all the players back here tomorrow. And yeah, we'll see everyone tomorrow. Yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you.